I did a debate a couple weeks ago against a, a preacher who seemed to have not only no understanding of science, uh, but no appreciation for it, didn't care, didn't care if he was fairly representing it. As a matter of fact, I think there's a chance you might have uh, stood up and accosted him at some point, because he literally stood in front of me and said, oh, that evolution stuff, it's not like anybody's ever banged sticks and rocks together and got a puppy. <laughs> he said this twice during the debate. The first time, uh, we're in a debate structure, so I'm trying not to interrupt. You know, I need to mm -hmm. follow the rules of the debate. And the second time, I just halted and jumped right in, and I was like, you're right, that's never happened, and no scientist has ever portrayed anything like that happening. And it, luckily, we were in high school, and the students seemed to get it. But how do we work past not only just willful scientific ignorance, but this, we seem to have built communities where there, we haven't instilled any appreciation for it or any appreciation to treat it reasonably. Mm -hmm. let's, let's just throw up a straw man and call it nonsense. I don't often quote Tony Blair. <laughs> but he said, education, education, education. Um, there is staggering ignorance of what evolution is all about. And, hello? I think we're, we're live, living in a simulation right now and it's, it's failing us. So, so, Richard, what do you do with this underlying misunderstanding of, of the role of randomness in evolution? Can you, can you well, inoculate um, us against that problem? Mutation is random, only in one sense, actually. Mutation is random only in the sense that it's not directed towards improvement, specifically. It's non-random in other senses. Uh, natural selection is quintessentially non-random. That's exactly what natural selection is. Anybody who thinks that you could possibly explain the beauty and the elegance of living things by some kind of random process would be stark raving bonkers. Anybody who thinks that we think that has got to be stark raving bonkers. Of course it's not random. The whole point of the scientific enterprise in this case is to find an escape from randomness, is to find a, a solution to the problem of how you get these staggeringly non-random things which are living creatures out of the laws of physics. And, and that's, what, that's what we're about. I mean, to explain that by postulating a creator, now that is uh, in almost resorting to randomness. That's saying that, that complexity, non-randomness is another word for complexity, comes into being spontaneously by sheer luck. God just happened to be there. What natural selection, what evolution does, is to explain how you get there from simple beginnings, which are easy to understand, and how you work up gradually, gradually, gradually up a kind of ramp of improvement until you get to complexity. That's the whole point. Mm -hmm. uh, we're trying to escape from randomness, and natural selection is the only escape that anybody has ever suggested that will work. Yeah, it strikes yeah. me, you know, I, was, I was thrilled that the students, this was in a public high school, although I believe it was a charter school, uh, mm -hmm. because it's, it's going to be unlikely that a regular state-sponsored public school is going to invite me in to debate a preacher, uh, although it was a debate class. But I was, in, I was inspired that the students seemed to catch on to what was going on, so at least I, I'm, I'm a little optimistic that they were reasonably educated on the subject. But how do we deal with adults, this minister? Uh, he's not going to go back to school. He's not going to pay any attention uh, to what, us. And what did speaking. he actually say? I, I didn't quite hear the, cat, the final word of what he said. He portrayed evolution as if scientists were saying that you bang sticks and rocks together and you get a puppy. That sort of ridiculous over the top. <laughs> That's going to be a meme, that face right there. I'm just lost for words. I, Although, truth be told, the, the details of procreation are almost that strange. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, if you've ever had a child, and I mean, it, it could not be more alien. The, the, I mean, if, if, if we watched a horror movie, and this is how the aliens 
produced their offspring. It could not be made stranger than, than it is. That was not an anti-sex tirade, by the way. That was just... If anyone thinks that the great majority of scientists are so utterly idiotic and naive that they think that, what that the way you get life is by banging sticks together and stones together, I mean, doesn't it give him pause to think that actually the vast majority of scientists have uh, a fully coherent theory that fills library shelves of volumes of books of, of, about it? If it was that simple, if we're just banging sticks together, that's not the way it would work. But what do you do with the, the underlying improbability of the whole process getting started in the first place? So this well, 747, the, 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 the yeah. tor tornado going through a junkyard yeah. and assembling a fully working 747 the, argument. The, the first step, the, the origin of the first self-replicating molecule, the origin of the first gene, that was a necessary first step before natural selection could get started. And that is a step that nobody has yet solved. There are quite a lot of theories about it. Um, we may never know for certain, because it happened a very long time ago. Uh, we know the kind of thing that must have happened. And that is a big barrier. That is one of the main questions that remains. Once that's happened, that, that was a fairly simple start. Once that's happened, then the mm. whole panoply of life, the whole branching, complexifying beauty of life then gets, then gets going. We do need a theory of the origin of life. But once that starts, then everything else follows uh, with great um, logic and persuasiveness. Hmm. And of course, until we get to the point where we have a good understanding, uh, then the answer that we should give is we don't know yet, rather than pretending that we do and that right. there's some, you know, godlike so, governing force. Exactly. I mean, scientists are, are yeah. We, 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 we like to say we don't know because that gives us something to do. Mm -hmm. <laughs> incredibly good job security for the curious. One of the things that troubled me is uh, having, all of us have dealt with religious minded individuals in debate type formats. Uh, here's a preacher who knew nothing. Uh, and it was uh, proudly on display. And there's a part of me that says, should this individual be allowed to speak to children at all? And yet, I have to defend this idea of freedom of expression, that people get to share their ideas. And that puts us in a place where we're constantly in a battle of ideas. How badly, how badly informed should somebody be before we just stop paying attention to them and work on the people who perhaps are reachable? Well, the problem in that case is that you're, the, the preacher represents in the U.S. what? 35%, 45%, depending on what his convictions are uh, of the population. So it's, it's not, you, you have to, you can ignore the preacher, but you can't ignore the fact that a significant minority, and on some questions, a majority of Americans hold just patently absurd ideas. So it's the ideas that really matter. He knew nothing, but he was proud of knowing nothing, it, seemed, it sounds to me. I mean, well, a, a lot of us are ignorant of lots of things. I mean, I'm ignorant of very many things, and I'm sure you are as well. Um, but we don't. I've never heard it put so nicely. We don't. <laughs> <laughs> but we admit when we're ignorant, and we don't um, try to pontificate about things of which we know nothing. Whereas he, he was doing exactly that. In a way, it wasn't so much that I don't think he thinks he's ignorant. I don't think he's proud of his ignorance. I think he thinks he's convinced he has the right answer and that we are all engaged in a scientific fairy tale. So there's, a, there's an, like an extra layer of smug superiority mm. over the top of it where he gets to dismiss the work of countless scientists uh, that have taught us the best current understanding of the diversity of life and he gets to shrug it off with sticks and rocks. Well, and if, we, if we ever have to convene gatherings like this in hell, we'll know <laughs> We did something wrong. <laughs> I'm, I'm pretty sure a part of that was yeah. in hell, yeah. but I maintain my composure. I mean, that, that really is the thing. That, that's what completely changes the equation. The moment you believe 
you are certain or even just have very good reason to believe that this life is just a, a way station on the way to some eternity that you could get very, very wrong or very, very right, depending on what you believe. It just it is that, that being your master algorithm, that makes a mockery of every pretense to human knowledge, no matter how technologically useful it is, no matter if you, know, you you're, it doesn't, it doesn't matter if we cure cancer with some future biology and, and prayer has never worked for, for that. If you believe in heaven and hell, that, that really governs everything, it seems. So. In a way, I don't think I mind his believing what he believes. What I mind is his thinking we believe what he thinks we believe. Yes. Because <laughs> how could anybody be so stupid as to think that you can... <laughs> He simultaneously presented a straw man of evolution and evolutionary scientists and anybody who fell into that, you know, I, I accept the reality. Mm -hmm. I'm going to straw man you all with sticks and rocks. Now, we, we can laugh at it and, you know, if you feel like laughing at it some more, by all means. There's been lots of discussion about uh, how best to engage on these, how much, for lack of a better phrase, how big of an asshole should you be, how much pushback should there be. How seriously should you take them? And quite frequently, someone will come up and present the idea that there are sophisticated theologians, that this preacher that I had a debate with is in one category, and some other academic, erudite theologians are in another category. Hmm. Is that the case? Well, well, there are sophisticated theologians who accept evolution, of course and have no problem with that. And so they, their, our argument with them is a quite separate argument. Um, I, I, I have met sophisticated theologians who believe pretty astonishing things, like believing literally that Jesus turned water into wine. Um, and I thought sophisticated theologians had written all that stuff off and said, oh no, that's just metaphor, that's just uh, a nice st story. We don't really believe that any anymore. But I have spoken to very, very highly qualified, sophisticated theologians, highly educated, uh, they accept evolution totally, but yet they think Jesus turned water into wine and walked on water and rose from the dead and was born of a virgin. Um, all very unscientific ideas, and still they call themselves sophisticated theologians. You know, my, well, first we should acknowledge that sophistication is better insofar as it means moderation and less of a commitment to the most dangerous ideas. But my problem with, with so-called sophisticated theology is that no one ever admits where the sophistication is coming from. It's coming from a loss of faith in specific doctrines. I mean, it's getting hammered into them from the outside. So... so. It's coming from science and, and, and a modern conception of, of ethics, uh, you know, a universal conception of human rights, a, a sense of how unseemly it is to think that anyone by virtue of being born in the wrong place is going to spend eternity in hell just because they didn't happen to hear the, the good word from their, their parents. So, that, so they, they, they lose their purchase on those dogmas and yet they retain this conviction that, that Jesus was born of a virgin or was resurrected and will be coming back. And the, those are just the, it's, it's, a, it's a God of the gaps argument in certain cases, but it's, it's a, you know, there's just certain questions where science hasn't yet closed the door to belief, and so they're putting all of their chips on those, those questions. We, we might have slightly different views of what a sophisticated theologian is. Yeah. Uh, which is probably a testament to how it's actually not sophisticated theology, but obfuscated theology. Uh, because when I hear someone say, oh, you know, you take calls on the atheist experience and you get people who couldn't present a reasonable argument at all, why don't you take on real sophisticated theologians? And my answer is always tell them to call in, here's the phone number, they can call in whatever week they want. Mm -hmm. And they'll say, well, you know, oh, but here's this, you know, academic who's presented this particular version of the, of the ontological argument, the moral argument. And it's, you know, you've got Ray Comfort, the banana man, on one hand, and they pretend that there's something superior with regard to argumentation on the other. 
And at the many years I've been hosting the show and doing debates, what I find is what gets labeled as sophisticated theology is the exact same thing. It's not like the arguments of these sophisticated theologians are any more sound than the arguments of Ray Comfort. It's just that they're better speakers. They well, have they're better actually less sound in one way in that they don't... So the, the, the belief system is still anchored to a, a belief in revelation. They're still fixated on the texts, but they have ignored much of, of what seems untenable in the texts and they don't have an argument about why that's okay. Because if, if God wrote any of these books, and nowhere in the book does God say, well, you could ignore the first half, because I'm, now I'm getting to the good part. <laughs> it's, it's all God's word. So it's actually a less principled position than fundamentalism. And that's, that's, that's why it's always, in my view, unstable in the face of fundamentalism, because the fundamentalist is always on, on the side of or always has the advantage of saying, listen, I'm going to read the whole book, I'm going to take the most plausible interpretation of it, I'm going to read every word as literally as possible, and that always begins to, to uh, fixate on, on uh, you know, more divisive, more doctrinaire, more irrational ideas. At least with the fundamentalist, you, you know what you're arguing against. Yeah. You're not yeah. arguing against a wet sponge. No, there's a, there's a, there's a um, it, it seems perverse to say it, but there's actually more integrity to the most fundamentalist position because it, there's, there's simply one irrational move, which is the, the belief that this book is perfect in every word. But the moment you believe that, well, then it, it, it is in fact rational to try to connect all the dots as, as reasonably as possible. But sometimes they really don't say anything. They say something like, well... God is the ground of all being, um, right. or God is the essence of isness, or something. Um, well, I, I have a soft spot for that kind of. Ah, uh, yes. I mean, I don't like the, the God, the, the, the theistic version of it, but and this is this is perhaps the only, the only uh, argument I can adduce in favor of, of so-called sophisticated theology, which is there's an experience that people have. You know, Christian contemplatives, say, or, or um, I mean, really contemplatives in any tradition, and, and have had for millennia, which does start, it does provoke those sorts of noises from people. I mean, the, the problem is you, you, you get far enough into any of these contemplative traditions, and everyone begins to sound like a Buddhist, and then they, you know, if you're in the 14th century uh, in Christendom, you know, the, the, the Inquisition shows up at your door, uh, as they did to Meister Eckhart. Um, who happily died of natural causes just in time. Uh, but there's, there's an experience that people have of you know, losing their sense of self, say, and feeling at one with the universe or the world, uh, or having some kind of ethical, just a full ethical reboot of their hard drive where they feel love that they didn't know was possible, right? A, a kind of self-transcending love. Yeah, I'd enjoy that, I think, if I... Yeah. Well, uh, yeah. So I, I'm not. Uh, I'm not sure I would. We can help. And I'm not sure that it's a good. What, what is? What is it that's a good thing about losing one's sense of self? Well, that's a, that's a big question. Well, when you, when you look at, well, when you look at just the mechanics of your own suffering, when you look at just what self concern gets you psychologically, you begin to. You can begin to feel that most of your your suffering is not actually, it's not directly tied to bad things happening. It's tied to all this whole uh, just machinery of self-concern, you know, anxiety about the future and regret about the past and worries about what people said of you or think of you or will think of you. And, uh, and there's so, so much of our neurosis is taking place just in the, in the conversation we're having with ourselves. And that's all predicated on the legitimacy of this starting point of feeling like there's a self riding around in the head who who is carried through from one moment to the next in life that you are you are the same person you were yesterday so the the thing that embarrassed you yesterday that you're now remembering that and now feels terrible that it's the it's the uh, the psychological continuity there and the, the durable continuity that seems to to mandate that you suffer over 
precisely the thing that you were, that you were su suffering over yesterday because you were that same self carried through moment to moment. And just that, have everybody watch Frozen and you can just let it go. <laughs> right, well, that, yes. Because I, 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 I think the sense of self is actually something that's incredibly valuable that, you know, our, we have a, a, a preservation motivation. We have a, a desire to understand the world that we inhabit. That mm -hmm. is, it, it may even be the case, uh, as, I've, as I've argued and others have, that there's no such thing as altruism in a true sense, but that you could have altruism from a purely selfish standpoint uh, yeah. and still do good. Yeah, but I, mean, I wouldn't call it, I mean, that, that begins to play with the boundaries of the, quote, self. I mean, the, so so if, the moment you begin to feel that your selfishness extends to everyone being happy, right, because you actually care about everyone, right, and you feel better when you see people smiling rather than, you know, weeping, uh, if you extend the circle of your self-concern to everyone, well, then, you know, that's not normal selfishness. That's, that's you know, sainthood in, in a... If I'm doing it because sense. I feel that good when people smile, that doesn't mean I necessarily care about them. It means I might care about that good feeling that I get. Well, that, but that, well, yeah, except it's... Um, the I get part is, is vulnerable to inspection. I mean, the sense that you, there's an I who's appropriating that in every moment is... It's just, it's a project which can be accomplished in, in a moment or, or, or you, know, you can fail to accomplish it after many years of looking, but there's the sense that there is a, I mean, it's, it's, it's useful to, to define what we mean by self because most people don't feel identical to their bodies. So when, when, I, say, when I say the self doesn't exist, I'm not saying that people don't exist. I'm not saying that you know, nobody's here and you know, this is all an illusion. Uh, but, and, and there are contemplative and religious and spiritual traditions that can sound like they're saying something very much like that. But I'm, I'm saying that the, the sense that we all have of being a subject in the head, riding around in the body as though it were a kind of vehicle, right? Because I mean, this really is most people's starting point. They don't feel co truly coterminous with their bodies. They feel like they're in their head and that you know, their hands are down there in some sense. And that sense of being a subject in the head is vulnerable to inspection. You can lose that sense. And on one level, you can, you can just be identified with your body. I mean, that, that is actually progress in this, you know, on this, in this course of you know, self-examination uh, because simply to feel like a body in the world is different from the way most people feel. Most people are, are kind of... Con and this is what we're running into. Most people are common-sense dualists. They feel like the mind can't possibly be identical to the brain. The mind is something altogether different, and it just feels like it's in the head as a kind of, there's a sort of locus of attention that's emanating from the head, but this body is a machine that can malfunction, to, and, and it's changing over time. It's clearly not what I am, and I am probably a soul then. I'm probably a spirit. I can probably drift off the brain at death, and, that's, and that sense is, um, I think, uh, you know, and, and, the, and all the ways in which that sense can be played with by fasting or, or prayer or meditation or psychedelics or getting crazy ideas that you find emotionally very animating, the, 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 chain, the, 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 the sort of adventures you can have in dualism are part of the problem here because you... Adventures you, in dualism should be yeah, the title of your next book. Right. Yeah. <laughs> I didn't know if you want to jump in on that at all. I have all. nothing to contribute, no. Yeah. <laughs> well, I, I, I sit here and I listen to this, and I, and I, I think there's like a four-hour fascinating for me conversation. You might, mm. might not think so much, because I have no problem with the idea that the mind is the brain. Uh, but I know that there are people who do. But, but, do my, but it doesn't feel that way. I know. I, I know yeah. it doesn't feel that way. Yeah. And, and, I, and I, I, I don't know that it's necessary, and I don't know what the right path is. I don't know that, that for example, um, losing this sense of self could be a great thing. Well, or one thing not. I would add is that I, you lose it all the time because it, it actually isn't there. I mean, that's, this is, you know, it's, it's, you are losing it all the time. How can you, you are, lose something that's not there? Because you're, well, so yeah, because it, it seems, it always seems there retrospectively, but when you're really paying attention to something, you know, you're, when you're so-called lost in your work, 
or you're lost in some athletic task, or you're, or you're, or you're just lost in thought. You're, like you're, you're actually you're, you're thinking about something and you're not aware that you're thinking. That we're, we're constant. That this this sense of 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 our own kind of central presence in our heads is constantly being undercut by attention being diverted to something out in the world or to some, some experience. And you can become increasingly sensitive to how it's being interrupted. Well, moment I, I would love to get to the truth, and I, I love the fact we're on the pursuit, but irrespective of what the truth is, Richard, something like consciousness, which we still, some would say we understand and some would say we don't. I, I think we don't. Mm -hmm. But how... What would be the evolutionary advantage in the process by which we get to consciousness as we, as we have it, as we seem to have it, that, that might distinguish us from other animals? It's a, it's a big mystery because uh, you could build an animal which did all the sophisticated things animals have to do, hunting for food, um, avoiding predators, looking for mates, doing everything that an animal has to do in order to survive and propagate its genes. And I don't think it would have to be conscious at all. I, I think it could all be done uh, in the way that a computer would do it. I mean, when you talk to Siri or, or Alexa, they sound conscious, but you know they're not. Um, and for, for an animal to survive with, with a nervous system, it doesn't, it seems to me, need to be conscious. And uh, I'm very glad I'm conscious, and I, I'm pretty sure you are as well. I, mean, I, think, I think other people... Um, <laughs> I'm, I'm not a solipsist, um, ah. but, but I, I, do, I, um, I, I do find it a bit of a mystery why, why we have consciousness at all. Yeah, yeah, I would agree. I, mean, I think it's, as I wrote somewhere, it's the one thing in this universe that can't be an illusion, including the universe. I mean, this universe could be a simulation on some alien hard drive. Or, I think I mean, Descartes said something similar. To you. Yeah. Although I got 40 emails last week that says we've proved that that's not true, and I don't necessarily yeah. buy those emails either. Right, yes, that's exactly what the simulators would say if you were... <laughs> uh, but I mean, consci the consciousness as the, just the felt sense that something is going on. The fact that there's an experiential quality, whatever this is, whether you're a brain in a vat, whether you're in the matrix, whether you, you are, you, you, the consciousness is being produced by interna information processing in, in your head, uh, as seems reasonable to believe. Uh, consciousness is always the first fact before any other facts can be discussed. And it's also the, the most important thing in the universe. It's the only thing that makes, at least in my view, it's the only thing that makes the universe important, is the fact that the lights are on, the fact that it's possible for the lights to be on. If we, if we knew that this universe, if you told me there's a universe somewhere that's got stars and planets, but, the, but it's, it's got, the constants of, of, of nature are tuned just a little awry so that conscious life is impossible. Uh, that is a deeply uninteresting universe, and it's the consciousness is the only ground for any moral dimension to our lives, too. And yet, I, I'm with you in feeling that it's not clear that it does anything, and it's not clear that it would be, it's not clear how that it would be, how it would be selected for, because in, I mean, if you just look at your own experience, everything that you're conscious of, Anything that you seem to be consciously deciding or you know, any place where it seems that consciousness is necessary to integrate information behaviorally, you know, to have a complex goal, say, for someone to say to you, well, you should really get to the Orpheum Theater at 8 o'clock to, to hear this talk, for, you, for that to become a behavioral plan, let's just say that that's, that is, in fact, something that can only be done consciously in apes like ourselves. Still, it's not clear why, well, it's, as you said, it's not clear that that should be the only way that it, it gets accomplished, and, and we could easily build robots, one presumes, that could, that could do these things without it being something that it's like to be those robots. But even in our own case, if consciousness really is just what it is at the level of our neurophysiology, it's only effective in virtue of what it is at the level of neurophysiology. So the fact that there's a, a, a subjective side to it doesn't matter. I mean, the fact that, it, that you're having this experience now 
which again is the, is the most important thing in, in, in anyone's life, the, the, the experience side of it is not what is actually behaviorally effective if in fact consciousness is, yeah. at, has, a, has, a, has a other face, which is its neurophysiology and its information processing dynamics. Nicholas Humphrey suggested that um, the, uh, one of the most important things we have to do is to second guess other people. We, we, we swim through a sea of, a, a, mm. a social sea. We, we, we have to make our way through very, very complicated relationships with other people and we have to second guess what they're going to do. All the time we're, we're having to predict what, how this other person is going to react. And so he postulates what he calls the inner eye, which is looking inwards to yourself as an aid to second guessing what the other person might do. You need this extra sense organ mm. um, to, to help you to predict the behavior of the other person. I still don't think that, right, that, that does it. I, somehow I wouldn't have been as surprised by the last presidential election if I was doing that yeah. correctly. Yeah, and I was here before the election and predicted that there was no way Trump could win. And as somebody who occasionally pretends to read minds and make predictions for a living, boy, was that a mistake. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I think what Richard's talking about is something that I've heard elsewhere is the, in, the intentional stance. What if it's the case that consciousness, which gives rise to this sense of self, uh, in a way that goes beyond mere self-reflection and consideration, leads us to connections with other people. And this is what provides the evolutionary benefit. But it also leads to something else that I thought we'd talk about, which is tribalism. Mm. This, our lives as individuals become merged obviously with our family. We have this immediate connection to our family and then we extend this and we extend the definition of family and we begin to form tribes. And there was a time and a place where that may have been the best thing. Is it the case that, I mean, obviously these could all be side effects of just what happened and, and I would think that I'm, I'd be okay with the idea that consciousness and tribalism and everything are, are side effects of what happened. You know, there doesn't have to be a guiding hand. But in the process, in viewing it from natural selection, what were the benefits of tribalism and have we actually outgrown them or are we maybe taking a step back? Hmm. Well, if I'm not mistaken, Richard, I think altruism, the, the, the evolutionary rationale for altruism really only makes sense in a tribal context. So that like one of, one of the silver linings of internecine tribal conflict was that in-group altruism got selected for. Um, I don't know if there's any recent work on that, but that's, that was my reading of things some decades ago. Uh, yes. Now, that's not to say that we're stuck with we're stuck with tribalism as the only rationale for altruism, but in terms of how apes like ourselves became as altruistic as we are, it's thought that, that competition among tribes was uh, the basis well, for Well, I that. suppose a Darwinian view of altruism would go back to a time when we lived in small tribal groups. Uh, and um, there were two things about living in these small groups. What, one was that you were completely surrounded by kin, cousins, second cousins, siblings, nephews and nieces, and so on. And so there would have been a Darwinian incentive to altruism towards anybody you meet, because anybody you meet is a member of your own village, your own tribe, your own, your own clan. And the second thing, the, the other Darwinian engine, motor of altruism is reciprocation. And reciprocation depends, or largely depends upon encountering the same individual again and again. Yeah. And that again happens within the village, within the, within the band, within the tribe. So um, there would have been a selection pressure in favor of within group altruism and out group hostility, xenophobia. Uh, so we, we, can, we can expect that there, that there should be this tendency to despise the out, the out group and to be, be altruistic and cooperative with the familiar 
in-group, and that could be defined as people you've known on your life, people you were brought up with, people who look like you. Mm. There are all sorts of ways in which the rule of thumb for how to behave could have latched on. And it's a pretty depressing outlook when we've moved out of our tribal past and moved into big cities where we're no longer in small tri tribal groups. But we still have the same rules of thumb which work, and that is a good thing. We have a rule of thumb that says just, in general, be nice to anybody, empathize with, with any, anybody, because in the distant past, anybody would have been defined as your own tribe, your own, your own clan, your own kin group, your own reciprocation group. So yeah. I wonder if it's to our benefit to, there's a couple of potential ways to go there. One is to get everybody to realize that everybody still is part of our clan, that we, we are one human clan. Hmm. Uh, I don't know, I don't have the magic solution to, to end the various divisions, uh, but the others, may, maybe to get people to recognize that they can be a part of a number of different clans that overlap. This, this is how we build societies. Right. You know, I care more about my immediate family than I do my neighborhood, but I care more about my neighborhood than, than I do you know, the broader world, but I can't diminish my my caring for things outside my scope to zero because we know that we have an, an impact on each other, even at great, great distances. Peter Singer wrote a book called The Expanding Circle yeah, yeah. Uh, in which he starts out by talking about this, this in-group, kin, kin group, and then talks about the altruism broadening itself out to um, wider and wider and wider groups. And he would, would like that to include non-human animals as well. Uh, that, that psychologically we can extend our tribal loyalty to um, all sentient beings. Yeah. yeah. There were some folks out front with pictures of both of you actually lobbying for something along those lines. Oh yeah. Which, which, was, which was nice. <laughs> no, I, uh, think, I think Singer's heuristic is, is the right one, that, that moral progress is generally synonymous with expanding the circle of moral concern to not just your family, not just your society, not just your race, not just your nation, but you just you know, outward, outward, and to the point where ultimately you're concerned about the suffering of conscious creatures insofar as they can suffer. So it's not just humans, and it's, if, it, if we discovered that pigs suffered much more than cows, well, then it would be appropriate to be more concerned about pigs than cows. And, and it's just that we actually care about the experience of, of conscious systems. So as we do this, it seems to me that there's an issue that we, we probably will talk about here. Um, no surprise to anybody, we're all pretty much politically on the left. We are godless heathens, we are atheists, we are secularists. And, and so are you, most of you, a, a good job. And the, in the, in the atheist community, the secular communities at large, have been growing leaps and bounds. The nuns are one of the fastest growing demographics. And because of that, on occasion, there is infighting. And I kept reminding people as I'd go out and talk, you know, try to listen charitably, try to mirror what people are saying, try to see nuance, but also recognize that these are natural growing pains, that it may in, may in fact be viewed as a good thing that there are little divisions, because at one time the atheist community wasn't big enough to be able to afford risking any mm. division in the same way we, we did with tribes. But this idea of I'm concerned and there's a circle that radiates out produces, to me, a problem where someone else's circle is different, but they view me as if my circle should be the same. This, this fallacy, fallacy of relative privation, that the thing that's most important or, or the greatest risk for them should also be the greatest risk and importance for me. And I can tell you that while, you know, Islam may be the, the mother load of bad ideas and the greatest threat to freedom worldwide, it's not necessarily uh, it's not necessarily the greatest threat in my living room or in my neighborhood or even in Austin, Texas. How, and you guys have both experienced this, as have I, where someone gets, someone on the left, in the atheist movement, 
has a mission, has, this is, this is my pet thing. And anybody who doesn't fall completely in line with that gets labeled as if they're an enemy rather than that they're just not as pure an ally as they might be. How do we start, or do we start, do we, do we just allow the divisions to continue, or do we start building bridges and t talking about this issue that what's important to you is important to me too, but it may not be as important to me because I'm dealing with this. I think you put that very well, and I, I, I mean, it, it's, a, it, it's sort of ridiculous in a way that somebody can't see that just because we different m people concentrate on different things, that doesn't mean that we uh, don't think other things important. I mean, exactly the point you've, you've made. There are lots of different issues around which we can, which we can tackle. Some of us are, are interested in one, some of us are interested in the other. We don't have to despise people just because they're preoccupied with a different one from us. But, but I think you're also talking about disagreements in the atheist community. Yeah. So, so I, what, what I'm hearing, or what, what I've noticed in, in, among atheists that concerns me is, is really seems like a, a, the consequence of identity politics on the left bleeding into the atheist community, or, or insofar as the atheist community skews left, it, it inherits a lot of the, the, um, the, the, the very liberal and in, in many cases regressive convictions of people on the left who think that to criticize Islam is tantamount to racism, say, and they don't really think too clearly about that, or that the only reason why, as an atheist, you could be more concerned about Islam than Anglicanism, say, that, that has to be at some level of an, an expression of your own hostility and xenophobia toward Arabs or, or people yeah, from the Middle East. Yeah, why do you guys hate brown people so much? Exactly. That's, I mean, th this is the sort the of oversimplification. Yeah. I remember it goes back, you know, why do you hate the troops and all, all these other things that were done in a humorous sense, and now they're being done in a serious sense because you, you two aren't as ideologically pure as I am, or you're not as ideologically pure as Sam, you know. But it's not, it's not just a difference of emphasis. It is a, a, a to, to put it charitably, a difference of opinion about what it means to focus on, in this case, on Islam. But I, you know, in my view, it's just it's complete confusion about the, the nature of the focus and, and what it is that would cause someone like me or Richard to, to be more worried about uh, jihadism than uh, you know, what the Scientologists are up to or, or um, the Mormons. You shouldn't have said that. Uh, I mean, I'm worried about many things, but I'm worried about some things more than others, and I accept that you might be worried about other things more than others, and they're we're, all important. We're also just confused by the label of atheism. That, that, that's why I think atheism is not always the best construct here. But if you are, rather than think of promulgating atheism, just think of opposing dangerous, bad ideas. And... And that will of necessity put you in opposition to many, many, many religious ideas, but some religious ideas aren't all that dangerous, or they're not all that well subscribed, or you just you, you barely encounter them ever, right? And so then so you can't really prioritize those. I am tending to prior, prioritize the ones that are showing up in the news every day and are clearly, absolutely just there can be no doubt about this, and yet there seems to be doubt everywhere. They're clearly the proximate cause of some of the most horrific human behavior, and it is behavior that would not happen for another reason. I mean, this is the, another source of confusion. People think that the world is just filled with bad people who would do bad things anyway, and they're just finding religion as a pretext, right? So the, the, you know, the, the Christian scientist who is not giving insulin to her diabetic daughter, you know, would do something equally crazy anyway yeah. without religion. That, there's no reason to think that. And that's, yeah, that's spot on, absolutely yeah. right. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's, yeah. And by the way, if you guys, it, we're probably pretty close to maybe bringing the house lights up a little bit and lining up to begin questions as we kind of 
uh, talk about this, but it, it, what you're saying, I, I agree, it, it would be just like saying that somehow or another, the people who hate homosexuals just managed to all be part of the Westboro right. Baptist Church rather than the Westboro Baptist Church cultivated these ideas. Yes. Uh, somehow or another, you know, the, 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 when we were putting labels on things earlier, it was in the United States, uh, it's, it's not, uh, not all Republicans are racists or are white supremacists, but pretty much all white supremacists align themselves with the Republican Party. So, you, it would be silly to think that there's not something there that at least waters these ideas and maybe nourishes them as well. Yeah. And, and the people tell us ad nauseum these are the reasons why they're doing these things. It's not, they're, they're not hiding their motives. So it, it, it takes a heroic act of, of self-deception and, and willful ignorance to say, despite everything these people are saying, despite the fact that they can point to the passage in the book yeah. that justifies the behavior, their behavior is coming from some other source entirely that has nothing yeah. to do with, with the, how they're the, accountable. The suggestion that these are just evil people who will find a way to let their evilness come out, and if it's not religion, it's something else. They're not that evil. They're actually, they're righteous people. They think they're righteous. They think they're doing good. They think they're doing the will of their God. Uh, exactly. And they think they're going to go to heaven for it. They don't think they're evil. Well, but worse than that, they're actually not evil yes. in those cases because, because they're just wrong. Yes. Right? And, and <laughs> you're quite right. So I, I, th I think we're at the time where we can start lining up for questions, and, and until the lights come up and people start taking their places, uh, I'll kind of ramble on this point just a bit more. And that is that I think we can talk about the origins of religion, but I'm more concerned with how religion spread, which is why what I focus on, I don't necessarily go after a specific religion all the time. And of course, I'll get the email that says, why are you afraid to go after Islam? Screw you, I've made Muslims cry on my show. It's, it, at least one. Uh, but I want to get to the, to the crux of where these bad ideas are coming from, which is why I'm constantly advocating for skepticism, critical thinking, uh, encouraging humanism. Uh, because if you build the sort of communities that allow people to not feel alone and yet encourage decency and reasonableness, I think you will have a platform that could rival what religions have done because they co-opt families. They not only take people who are fearful of things already, thank you, and give them the sort of uh, belief that they can get rid of their fears, but they actually encourage fictional fears that mm -hmm. only they can cure in order to build their sense of community. It's, uh, the, the line which I've said many times that people would say, you know, that uh, religion poisons you and then offers you the cure, but I think it's worse mm -hmm. than that. Religion convinces you you're poisoned when you're not and then offers you the homeopathic remedy. That's. <laughs> But if we can't get people past the fear, the one question I get asked, or one of the questions I get asked most frequently is, when you replace religion, when you get rid of religion, if you were to have the fantasy world that you want, Matt, and there's no more rationality, there's no more religion, what do you replace it with in order to give people hope? Science, art, poetry, music, love, sex. <laughs> Uh, on that note, especially with sex in the mix there, I, I think we're uh, good to go for questions. And it's, it's still a little difficult for us to, to see folks up here. I'm going to start uh, on the right. If you could, questions, by the way. Hey, this is, oh, now I can see. Uh, this is where I get to be like the asshole that I am on the TV show. Thank you. And that is, uh, I will hang up on your ass in a heartbeat if I have to. Uh, questions in and a question mark. They don't start with a dissertation or your life story. If you have a question for the full panel, that, yeah. Uh, if you have a question for all of us, we will do our best to be succinct. If you have a question for a specific person, just say so. Uh, and please just start with your name. We may not remember it, but we'll try. Please, sir.
Hey, I'm David. Hi, David. And uh, my question is for Sam. All right, so my goal is to get you to nuance your opinion on free will. So in each moment, we have a neurophysical chemical moment, uh, you know, which is our, our, our neurons, our, our body, etc., and a moment within consciousness phenomena. Now, there is a kind of next universe canyon between what a neurophysical chemi chemical moment is and what a moment of consciousness is in, in phenomena. So, within consciousness, we experience freedom. For example, I can decide to put my hand to the right instead of to the left. So, well, that, that's where we disagree, uh, but okay. Uh, as you said, you know. Uh, and this is sounding like a dissertation. I will tell uh, you this. Consciousness is the. I, I will tell you this, and then, and then you got to get to the question. Uh, Sam and I are doing three more events over the next couple of months, and free will be, will be something that we at least discuss in private, because I, I think I've got a nail in the coffin for this, but okay. get to the question. So Sam, you say consciousness is the only thing we can be sure of, mm -hmm. so because we have an experience with, with, uh, within consciousness, which is next universe different from a, a neurophysical chemical moment, because we experience freedom in, in, in consciousness, hand here as opposed to there, do we have to take this feeling of freedom seriously? There we go. Okay. Well. This is what's especially seditious about my argument against free will, because most people think we have this experience of freedom, and the trouble is it's very hard to map that onto the, the, the mere causality we see in the universe, and that's, that's the mystery of free will. But when I look closely at my own experience, I don't see evidence of freedom. So, so for instance, my experience of answering this question now, of, of hearing myself speak, like my struggling to get to the end of this sentence and <laughs> my ability to do it or not do it based on the, the neurochemistry, my uncertainty about whether it is yet a grammatically com complete sentence, <laughs> the little stumble you just heard in my mouth uh, on that last Can't word. Forget the sentence. Okay. Uh, no, but decide to put your no, hand no, 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 no. Every, absolutely everything in my experience is compatible with the absence of free will. And if I, if you, to take your example of deciding to move my right hand or my left, I could deliberate about this for a year. <laughs> and if I went back, no matter how many times I went back and forth, and no matter, I could, have, I could write a dissertation about why it should be the right, and then at the last second say, fuck it, I'm an existentialist. <laughs> uh, you know. And the, the proximate cause of that most voluntary behavior would in every case be mysterious, subjectively mysterious. It would be pushed to the fore, and I, as the conscious witness of the process, would be a spectator. I would witness the final efficacious product of neurophysiology, and why it was one thing rather than the other, why it came at precisely that moment and not a moment before, why I just said this last sentence and didn't stop 20 seconds ago. All of that is mysterious. But, so, no, no, would you, no, 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 you're done. Reality. That's for Julie. Some, someone, well. And consciousness. There's a ton yeah. of people in line and we're not going to do a debate. The, I'm going to move This over. may come up again because this is a, this is a concern of many people. But, and, and, but thank and you, you can question. rest easy in the sense that I am a la Dennett, a compatibilist who, who disagrees with Sam and thinks he's actually a compatibilist, he just doesn't know it, but we'll, we'll tackle that some other day. Yes, sir. Hi, this is Armin Nabobi from Atheist Republic. Um, hey, hi. I can recognize you. <laughs> um, Sam mentioned that, um, I don't know if he still thinks that, but atheist is a word that shouldn't even exist, um, just like the word non-golfer. Uh, but if golf was forced on us, wouldn't it make sense for us to have a word like non-golfer for non-golfers to find each other and unite against people that are pushing golf on us? And <laughs> <laughs> and, you, and you mentioned, well, we should fight all bad ideas, but some people want to focus on animal rights, some people want to focus on racism, some people want to focus on God. Isn't it, some, you know, if our passion is to fight one bad idea and God is the biggest of, bad, of all bad ideas, doesn't it make sense for us to have a label, to have the atheist experience, American atheists or atheist republic as ways to find each other and make a movement out of it? Well, it's not that it's 
a mystery as to why we have the label. I, I understand that, it, that people find it, it, it to be a political necessity uh, or might find it to be a political necessity. I, I just don't, and I see a downside to it. And this is a place where I think Richard and I may disagree as a matter of, of strategy or, or tactics. Um, I just see it as ultimately, I mean, yes, yes it, is, it is a shocking fact that not believing in God and being public about that disbelief is a more or less a deal breaker politically, at least in the United States. I, I don't know about in Canada. Uh, that's just, that's totally unacceptable, and we should marshal some kind of political response to that because the people who don't believe in God are, it's not an accident, some of the most informed and intelligent people in, in any society uh, because they're just following the evidence. So, so the fact that that's stigmatized is a problem and it's a political problem, but I, I just think you can, you can fight for science, you can fight for evidence, you can fight for reason, you can fight for logical coherence, you can fight for all of these things without ever labeling yourself. And I, I just have this fundamental distrust of identity politics at this point, and I, I don't think we win by, by forming our own identity. Thank you. My name is Barry. Um, this is a question I'm directing at Sam and, and Matt uh, because we've already got a pretty good sense of what Richard thinks of it from his uh, book, Unweaving the Rainbow. Uh, the question is, do you feel that it is inevitable that the humanities will be hostile to the sciences? Uh, and if so, I might not, you might not agree with that, but if, <coughs> excuse me, if so, what can be done about it? Why and what can be done about it? I don't, I don't necessarily think that there's any reason to suppose that there's a necessary hostility. Um, I'd like to think that the more we understand the universe, the better information we have across the board, um, that this would improve both the sciences and the humanities. Yeah, I, I mean, there's this famous notion of, of the two cultures that, that is, um, I think we're in the process of outgrowing. I think more and more a, a love of science, I mean, now I'm talking among well-educated people who are not being indoctrinated into one or another religious cult, uh, but there's a love of science among people who are not themselves scientists is, is more and more contagious. Uh, and it's just a myth. I mean, apart from, I'm sure you can find some scientists who don't care about the rest of culture and, and w w would disparage the humanities. But um, for the most part, scientists are, are, they love art and music and, and fiction as much as anyone else. They just don't love intellectual pretension and scientific ignorance and the marriage of those two. So it's really what postmodernism did to our intellectual lives, where you had some part of every university committed to the idea that there's no such thing as truth. Yeah. And that, that drove a wedge, uh, which, and I, I think we're still recovering from that. But uh, there's no, there is no boundary between, I mean, it, it just comes down to not pretending to know things you don't know. Amen. So, you know, was, was Shakespeare Francis Bacon? Probably not, but I don't know, right? So it's like, it's, so it's, like it's, it's not, why pretend to know for sure that, that he, he was Francis Bacon when the evidence is, is non-existent? That's a, a question of history. That's a question of, I guess, for scholars of literature. That's a, you know, that's a, it's, a it's also a question of biology, really. You know, like which ape wrote those plays? Uh, so there is no real boundary between, in my view, between science and valid claims in the humanities and even journalism. I mean, these are just, we're just having a fact-based discussion about the world. You know, and I'll, I'll kind of leverage this to go back and add an addendum to your uh, response to Armand, where he had mentioned that, you know, why not go after God, because God is the, most, the biggest, most pervasive bad idea. Uh, I'm not sure that's the case. It may be the, the most pervasive bad idea is that you are a reasonable judge of reality. That may be the foundational, you know, that we all assume that, 
oh, well, I wasn't fooled by this and I wasn't fooled by that, so I surely am not being fooled by this other thing, and yet we are. Mm. The second you think you're not being fooled, it's already too late. Yes? Hi, my name is Robin Boostrom, and uh, thrilled to be here tonight. So in your book, uh, Waking Up, Sam, and this question is directed to you, you touched upon the usefulness of psychedelics in introducing people to new avenues of experience. And as our nation prepares to legalize the use of marijuana, what do you think is the, going to be the aggregate benefit in having people introduced to these new experiences from a drug such as marijuana? Uh, well, it could, it could be a terrible mistake. I, uh, I mean, th this is, I should say, I, you know, drug use can go oh, uh, many different ways, right? And it's, it's, not, um, it's not crazy to be concerned about a society that is just using drugs ad libitum you know, of every sort, uh, unconstrained by any prohibition. I mean, it's, it's, it's easy to see how we got to prohibition. Now, I think prohibition is the wrong, really always the wrong answer because it has all of these external effects that are terrible. It creates organized crime and black markets and, and junkies who have to, you know, First of all, it creates a total lack of awareness that, there's, that these drugs, that, quote, drugs, are very different from one another, and some are addictive and, and just intrinsically harmful, and some aren't addictive and can be incredibly useful. So there's a, we, we're just misled by this one word, drugs. Uh, so what we should have is a society that, that prioritizes education around just the, the pharmacology of, of consciousness and you know, the, you know, is it good to drink alcohol and, 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 and who shouldn't drink alcohol and how much alcohol is too much and what are the health effects of drinking alcohol regularly and, and that, should, that should extend to everything in our lives and we should have a, just an, again, an honest conversation about what seems, seems good for human beings to be doing and it is it's clear that almost any substance can be misused, and marijuana can definitely be misused. You know, you can, you can smoke too much and do more or less nothing else but smoke, and that's not, you know, that's no, no one's conception of a, a life fully actualized. Uh, so, uh, or at least it shouldn't be. Uh, yeah. So, but I mean, I think, but, but prohibition is a disaster, and it was a disaster for alcohol, as, and we, we we realized that a hundred years ago, and yet we are still struggling to, to learn the same lesson with, with other compounds. So. I expected much more applause uh, when it was mentioned that it, about legalization. And I don't, I don't, no, 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 you're going to ruin it. I just didn't know if you were being polite to the person who asked the question and if you're all baked. Uh, <laughs> so. Yeah. Hi, uh, my name is Randy. Um, my question is for Sam. I wanted to know what role meditation has played in your mental health, I guess. Have you been more resilient to depression or anxiety? Because it seems like you're always kind of being attacked by somebody, either Batman or, on your, or having Charles Murray on your podcast. Because I'm at a point where I'm kind of done with antidepressants, psychotics, mood stabilizers. We'll get there. Um, I just, so I want to try something new. So what's your take on meditation as a mental health like, treatment? Uh, well, I, th I think it is. It can be incredibly useful. I, I think there are certain people who probably shouldn't go on intensive, silent meditation retreats. So I, I think it's it's not. I wouldn't recommend the most intense experiences of meditation for everybody. And, and there are people who 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 find uh, you know sun going into silence for a week or a month, you know, destabilizing. And that's and it's a tiny percentage of people, but. You should be aware that, that it's possible to have a bad experience doing a lot of meditation. Uh, but no, meditation is, I mean, the kind of meditation I recommend is just learning to pay much more careful attention to what it's like to be you. And when you pay attention, you begin to notice all of the ways in which you are suffering unnecessarily. So it is, it, it, there's a very the universe didn't have to be this way, but it just so happens there is a direct connection between seeing more of what is actually happening in your own mind and 
ceasing to suffer in in many of the ways that are that are unnecessary. And and so it's you know it, it is the honestly it is the most important thing I've ever learned. But it's not it's not necessary to learn most other things, right? It's not, it, it, is, it is kind of orthogonal to almost everything else we care about intellectually. But it's um, in terms of you know, having some kind of... Um, it's, it's not that I don't suffer in all of the ordinary ways I've suffered before I, I, I learned to meditate, but the half-life of suffering, the half-life of, of something like anger or... Uh, Anxiety or embarrassment or fear or whatever whatever the negative mindset is, it, it's it's cut way way down, and the, and also the the behavioral consequences of those negative emotions are are the, the the door is closed to those. I mean, when you think of the difference between being angry for ten seconds and then actually letting it go, and being angry for an hour, right? It's it's an enormous difference because in that hour you can get up to doing all kinds of life deranging things on the basis of anger and feel good about doing those things, right? Because, you know, you damn well should be doing those things because you're pissed, right? And so, so just, just shortening the time course of, of all of these negative states is, is an enormous benefit, and, and meditation is a great tool for that. Although, although sometimes when I'm angry, that's when I'm most productive. Cause it, it, yeah, well, then but, you can, you but I was wondering, sublimate you it, know, right? I know the question was directed to Sam, but, but just for my curiosity, I don't know, if Richard, have you explored meditation in the way that Sam's talking about at all? I did once, I did once do a course in uh, transcendental meditation. Hmm. I'm sorry to say it did absolutely nothing for me. <laughs> well, well, it, it uh, on a somber note, I would argue that transcendental meditation, at least in some sense, killed Doug Henning, which will make me pissed off at transcendental meditation, at least until I can meditate to let go. But, yes? Hi, my name is Leah, and I just want to say welcome so much to Sam and Richard, hey, both for hey, coming back you. to Vancouver. Yeah. Um, and I would just say on meditation, Sam recommended that I do a 10-day meditation retreat, and all I can say is it did wonders for my marriage that I was quiet for 10 days. <laughs> so... Um, uh, my question is future focused um, and in two parts. Um, so you had me at hello with atheism. You have had me at hello with uh, your book, Waking Up on Consciousness. I very much agree that it just sure looks to be a lot better to focus on how we can actually just be better and nicer and focus on those qualities that are measurable. And I have a question, the first part is, um, what are the biological or societal uh, hurdles or roadblocks that we need to get past in our evolution as humans to do more of that? I already agree that you know, religion hasn't helped, but what are the other sort of case studies that you can pull up biologically or culturally that we could use to make this faster? And secondly, um, it strikes me that resource, the second part is resource allocation has been a challenge and that's been um, one of the drivers of tribalism is that in the, in the quest for resources, we've not been nice to each other. Given the abundance that we are seeing that technology is creating and sort of the democratization of that abundance, will that solve some of these problems and leapfrog us ahead in evolution? I find your yeah. questions as yeah. long and leading as mine. Yeah. <laughs> Um, well, briefly, I mean, there's a, there's a lot there, but I think the, the problem, one of the greatest problems we have, and there's an obvious, this connects directly to what, what Richard was saying about evolution, the evolution of tribalism, uh, we have our, our, our moral, our morality, most people's morality is anchored to social emotions and, and quintessentially moral emotions that are not good guides for living a good life or building a good society. I mean, emotions like disgust, right? I mean, so some people find homosexuality disgusting or the idea of gay sex disgusting, and that is the end of the argument for them, right? It's like that, that, is, that, is, that is enough to pass laws on, right? That's enough if you're in a... In a in a theocracy, that's enough to justify throwing people off the top of buildings. Uh, uh, so it's uh, so so disgust is a very bad guide 
for for our you know, uh, you know morality and and desire is a bad guide as well. I mean, we have we have things like lust and disgust and fear and you know, xenophobia, um, which is you know just fear in, in a certain context. Uh, these are we have to be able to to have a a reasoned conception of the good life, both personally and collectively, that gets beneath these ape-driven, uh, uh, you know, lim limbic arousal argument, non-arguments, which are just, just, uh, uh, which all, is is how all of our moral thinking gets coded psychologically, and that's uh, that's just it's a problem. We get, you know, you can see every conversation about a, a charged issue leading people to get moral, emotionally hijacked in the midst of the conversation, and then they're not processing arguments anymore. And so we have to find mechanisms to get around that. And it, I mean, on the final question on, on just resource allocation, one of these moral emotions that, that we have, I mean, if, you, if you imagine a world of real abundance, like a world where you know, we have, we've built the right AI that's just pulling wealth out of the, the atmosphere, and no one really has to work anymore, right? Because we, we literally have machines that can build machines, that can build machines that are all powered by sunlight, that do everything better than we can. Now, why wouldn't that be some kind of utopia? Well, it wouldn't be a utopia because we have these very uh, uh, weird emotions, or many of us do, which tell us, which, which give us an ethics that, that, that make it seem like it would be wrong to spread the wealth around. It would be right, like, we, we, there, most people are living as though they want to live in a world where there's a few trillionaires living in compounds ringed by razor wire and everyone else is sort of starving to death. You know, it's like a winner-take-all scenario. And so we have to find a new ethic whereby people are no longer, their, their, their purchase on existence is no longer uh, justified by, by doing profitable work that other people will pay them for. I mean, we have, in a world of true abundance, you shouldn't have to work to justify your life. You should be, you should be free to enjoy the wealth of the world. And, that's, and, and if we're going to get to that place, we have to change our ethics around that. Hi, I'm Kumaran. Um, my name is Kumaran. Um, quick question, uh, mainly to Sam, but I guess it applies to others as well. Uh, you've talked a little bit about how you've gotten some strange bedfellows by some of your views on Islam, for example, have resulted in people that you may not agree with that are essentially just xenophobic sort of following you and becoming sort of part of your fan base, or whatever you'd call it. And similarly, you wrote a letter to a couple of feminists a few years ago that got in an argument with you that has been re-quoted pretty extensively by people in sort of the more red pill, kind of crazy men's movement crowd. How do you think about those things? In terms of, I, I can, I know that you don't agree with those actual views espoused there, but you, you know, especially in the world of social media, you start getting yourself, you know, it's hard sometimes where the, the tail can wag the dog over time. Well, if people... I'm embarrassed to say I don't even remember w what you're referring to in terms of the, the letter to feminist. Yeah. Oh, was it was this my blog post? I'm not the sexist pig you're looking for. Yes, exactly. That okay. was it. Um, yeah. That was it. Okay. Um, well, yeah, it's just you can't be, if you, if, if you take the time, to, I mean, you, can't, you can't fully explain yourself and close the door to every possible misrepresentation of your, your utterances in every single utterance, right? So you, get the, like, you, just, you can't condense a book into a paragraph and you can't condense a paragraph into a single sentence every time. I mean, maybe, maybe you can occasionally do it, but it's just, you, if people are determined to take your words out of context in a way that is designed to mislead people as to what they actually meant in context, right, that there is no, there is no way to, to prevent that. I mean, I'm just convinced that it's, it's impossible to prevent that. And I, I can be much more careful than I've been in some, and I am more careful than I was in some of my earlier books now in general because I, I, I'm less interested in writing something that's provocative and entertaining and I'm more interested in not experiencing this, this deluge of, of misrepresentation. So I'm, I'm trying to, to I, I am more careful than I used to be, but it's, it's still impossible. I mean, and so it's, it's not, um, I, I, I can't take it seriously if somebody 
creates some meme that completely misrepresents my view and then some Nazi nutcase likes it, uh, I don't know what to do with that, all right? Wow. So Richard dealt with this with regard to the fleas and your detractors. How much attention do you pay to the people who are saying negative things about you or, or trying to misrepresent what you've said and, versus how much do you let your words stand on their own? Well, Sam is absolutely right, of course, that, that it's, it's extremely um, hard to condense a, pa a paragraph down to 144 words, whatever it is, <laughs> the characters. Um, and in, in some cases, misunderstanding with hindsight can be understood. You can see where, where the misunderstanding came from. In other cases, I suspect there's a kind of active searching for the opportunity to misunderstand. Um, active searching for offence. I think there are offence junkies who just love to be offended. Um, I, yeah, I mean, I, I, I agree with Sam that, that, that we have to be, to be careful. You can't rely upon people interpreting your words in the way that you intended them to be inter interpreted. And you, can, you must have to expect that quite a lot of people are going to misunderstand, in some cases possibly even deliberately misunderstand, which is sad. This is why the, the principle of charity is so important. If you actually want to understand somebody's position, then you will always be interested in their efforts to clarify it, right? But what we're noticing in our discourse, politically especially, is people don't want, really want to understand your position. They want to catch you saying something that can be construed at, in the worst possible way and then hold you to it. And then they claim to understand what you think better than you do. Yeah. Right? They, 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 they pretend to be mind readers. Yeah. That's okay. among the many things that I, I caution people about is don't pretend you can read people's minds or their motivations. Uh, even those of us who pretend to do it on stage, are, we're just fake and we're not as good at it. I used to toil over this, and it would, basically what, I, what I've stopped doing by means of a solution is, I pretty much don't read any comments that come in on YouTube. Um, maybe a couple over the first day or so, just to make sure I didn't like post a video that didn't have audio, or you know, the famous, my left ear loved this, because I didn't you know, convert the, the single channel to mono. Uh, but for me, the line's really simple. I've stated my position. Somebody either didn't understand it or found fault with it. If there's fault, I'll keep going back and forth as long as somebody's making a reasonable case for what they think is wrong with it. Because that's a debate. That's what I do. If I've explained it and explained it again, and now it's just getting in the way of me actually getting work done and reaching the people who already understood this and may understood the next five or six things, if it's getting in the way of me learning something from somebody else, if I'm just sitting there spinning my wheels, now it's no longer worth my time because that person may not be reachable at all, but they're clearly not reachable by me right now, so I'm going to leave it for somebody else because I've got better things to do most of the time. Uh, thank you. Uh, my name is uh, Dan. I'm from Calgary. Um, Sam, I, I find your books, uh, your podcasts, and uh, your talks uh, um, are kind of like a torch of reason um, for civilization. Uh, in some sense. Um, and yeah, I just wanted to first send our appreciation for that. Thank you. Cool, thank you. Um, my, my question's to Richard and Sam. Uh, what was it like to stand on stage next to Christopher Hitchens? I suppose he was the most eloquent speaker I ever heard, uh, had a, a magnificent voice which he deployed beautifully, had amazing resources in terms of memory, in terms of quotations, in terms of historical allusions, um, reading. Uh, I, I once wrote, if you are invited to have a debate against Christopher Hitchens, decline. <laughs> Uh, but he was, e even a a as he was, a ruthless uh, debater. Nevertheless, he was also very courteous 
and he would go and have a drink with his victim after slaughtering him. <laughs> um, uh, I didn't agree with him about everything, um, but if you, if you wanted to disagree with him, you better be well prepared with arguments because he's a very, very hard person to, to argue against. A, a wonderful gentleman, much missed. Yeah. Yeah, I, I, obviously he was incredibly articulate and it was just, it was amazing and incredibly fun, but also somewhat galling to hear someone speak exactly as he wrote. And uh, he was such a good writer. And the stories about him uh, apparently are true. He could just go, you know, and just type a thousand words and it wouldn't require any editing and it would, that would be his next essay. So, um, Who would he, dare edit? He was amazing. Yeah, he, he, even he wouldn't dare edit, apparently. He just <laughs> got it right the first time. Uh, so I actually, I just, as you were asking the question, I, I just recall that he had said, he had made the point I was just trying to, to make at great length about people uh, um, pretending to know what you think better than you do and not actually wanting to hear your, your, your position. And he said, uh, he said he was, I'm going to butcher his quote, uh, even trying to, to remember it, but he, he said he, he felt he was constantly surrounded by people who, who, in detecting your lowest possible motive, were convinced they had found your only possible motive. And even that, isn't that, that isn't quite right, but that's basically that. He, he, was, he, he was remarkably... Uh, clear uh, on just the, a, a breadth of issues that is just amazing to consider. And, and you, you should read his books if you haven't. Read Hitch 22. Read God is Not Great if you haven't. Read, read Hitch 22 to, to understand what a, a life he led, I mean, the kinds of the people he met and the amount of fun he had. Uh, I mean, he loved this. I mean, I, I am, I'm perfectly happy to be here and talk to all of you. I, I, I am, I, uh, it's an honor to be here, uh, and it's, a, it's a, always an honor to share the stage with Richard, but Hitch loved this experience. I mean, he, he would just get on the road to, to talk to people, uh, and his love of it was, was palpable. And so I, 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 I did one book tour, and, you know, as was signing books, half the people who came up during that book tour were just just express, expressing appreciation for Hitch. I mean, this is before he died, was, but his cancer was known. Uh, and it was amazing to be on the receiving end of, how, of that um, love for him and his work. And it was, it was, it was being driven by him because he really, he really loved this. That's it. Hi, I'm Aaron. Um, so Richard, in one of your books, you wrote about the, the moral zeitgeist and how morality has evolved through time. And um, Sam, in some of your recent podcasts, you've had Charles Murray and you've had Cass Sunstein on, you, on your show, and you've talked about polarization and groupthink and how uh, today, especially in the world of social media and Amazon and news, so often our views are reinforced and self-fulfilling in their way. So I'm curious your thoughts on uh, the advancement of the moral zeitgeist in a time where we are constantly uh, reinforcing our own ideas and the tools that we have at our disposal to uh, cross boundaries there and potentially uh, if we are all digesting media, say that is self-fulfilling, um, should government maybe have a role in helping advance this further as that is a tool that is, still, uh, national, that is still across all people, potentially. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm interested in the moral zeitgeist because people often talk about uh, religion as a necessary basis for morality. And I think that's fairly easily refuted by pointing out that uh, the current, not just deep morals, but little, little details, little uh, superficial details, like the amount of um, different kinds of prejudices that there are and things, these things change from decade to decade, uh, let alone from century to century. 
And this is sort of documented in books like Stephen Pinker's The Better Angels of Our Nature, where we are clearly getting better, getting nicer as the centuries go by. And this has nothing to do with religion. Uh, the, the moral attitudes of somebody in 2017 label them as 2017 as opposed to just 50 years ago uh, when they would have been subtly different. There would have been more racism, more sexism, uh, and um, it, it prompts the thought of what's going to happen in 50 years, 100 years' time, I, I suppose. But the, 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 the moral zeitgeist changes in ways that have nothing to do with religion. It's hard to say what they are due to. It's tempting to use a phrase like something in the air, whatever that means, but it, it almost feels as though it is that, a sort of consensus of journalism and political discussion and legal cases and uh, books and dinner party discussions, discussions in pubs. We just kind of move on steadily, in, and it pretty much in, in one direction. That's what I mean by the shifting moral zeitgeist. Mm. Yeah, I think a lot of it comes down to behavioral economics. I, I think if you get the incentives right, even pretty mediocre people can behave really well. If the incentives are wrong, it takes an absolute moral hero to behave well. And, 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 we, and we should want to design societies and systems and institutions where you don't actually have to wake up every morning and be you know, St. Francis of Assisi just to get through your day without killing somebody, right? <laughs> and that's, and there, there are conditions where you basically have to be that. For, you have to be a saint not to be absolutely vile. I mean, when you look at just how, how people have to live in maximum security prisons, right, and just the incentives there are all wrong. They're all pushing people toward, you know, just the, the most brutal tribalism, you know, even if you're not a racist, you have to align yourself with your race in a prison. Otherwise, you're, you're just going to be the victim of everyone, right? So uh, we, we want systems and societies that are less and less like maximum security prisons. And, and we're still just trying to find our way toward to, to engineering those. And, and we're, you know, it's, we don't have a thousand years to get it right. Hi, my name is Blaine. Very close to the microphone. Uh, I'm very excited to be here. And uh, my question is for Richard, although I hope Sam may be tempted to add something as well. Uh, what are your thoughts on the Darwinian roots of creativity? And what neurological investigation might we do to learn how to program this into AI? I think it's remarkable how um, far hum humanity in civilized uh, um, situations has advanced beyond what anyone would have predicted from our Darwinian roots. Um, we, we are African apes naturally selected to survive on the African plains uh, as hunter-gatherers and somehow we, nowadays we produce Shakespeare and Beethoven and great scientists, because there's a lot of creativity in science as, as well, of course. We do seem to have brains that are laced with emergent properties, which go far beyond what, naively, you might think you'd need for Darwinian survival. And this builds cumulatively over generations, over generations of cultural evolution, where each, each generation builds on the previous, on the culture of the of the previous one. So that's not a Darwinian process, that's a kind of pseudo-Darwinian process. It's, a, it's an evolutionary process that doesn't work by natural selection, at least not by genetic natural selection. It might work by some other kind, kind of cultural natural selection. Um, I, I do, it's not an easy thing to say that creativity, as we understand it today, would have had survival value. I would think that perhaps something a sort of brain, a, a neurophysiological equivalent of what we call creativity today might have had survival value of a very different kind when we were subject to the cutting edge of natural selection. Could it, would it be something in the, in the line of, I tend to look at creativity as, as a, 
uh, branching out from cleverness, of problem solving, of non-lateral thinking and problem solving, uh, that clearly has an advantage, being able to find better ways to build a mousetrap. Um, wouldn't that, I mean... Yes, I mean, having, having, I having ideas, having hypotheses, when you're, if, if it's how, how are we going to... Um, capture a buffalo. I mean, you, you, could, you, could be, you could be sort of creative about that. You could have ideas, you could have, um, but you can make suggestions which are then knocked down. But, so that's the kind of creativity. But somehow it's flowered into something so hugely greater than was ever directly useful. Wouldn't it be terrifying if, crea if, if the way creativity has changed is actually the reason why we haven't tackled as many of the problems? We used to have to solve problems to survive, and now we're enjoying our creativity, which may be preventing us from solving the problems that are right in front of our face right now. Mm. I'm not knocking the arts. <laughs> just, just thinking out loud. Yeah, and the question of whether AI is going, I mean, AI is already doing it in, in rudimentary ways, I mean, in, in game playing, for instance, in chess or Go or, or uh, even in just basic video games that AI is, is playing, it's finding creative moves that, that masters of those games Composing music in the style of Mozart? Yeah, yeah I mean, so I, I, just, I don't think there's anything magical about our wetware as far as creativity goes. I think we'll, we'll, we'll recognize it in, in our intelligent systems insofar as they become intelligent. So at this point, I'm, I'm going to be the bearer of bad news to some people. We have about five minutes left for Q&A. So that, at the current pace, if you're more than like a person or two back in line, we are probably not going to get to you, but go ahead. Sam, I love you! <laughs> yeah, thank you. Thank That's you. not a question. Uh, my name is Peter. Thank you for being here. Sam, you often speak about the importance of intuition. You had a podcast with Gavin De Becker that placed intuition front and center in a life-saving way for many people. And yet, in the person of President Trump, and this question is not about him, uh, we see the dark side of intuition, a man who says that his gut guides everything he does, and so that's got those of us who believe in intuition feeling a bit shaky. Can you please reassure us from an evolutionary standpoint or otherwise that intuition is uh, something uh, we can value? Thanks. Yeah. Well, it sort of depends on what you mean by intuition. For, for me, intuition is when you can break down your knowledge of a thing no further, the, the, the step you take is intuitive. So when I ask you, how is it that you understand that two plus two makes four? Right? So at some point you were taught this, but now you get it, and you can't see it any other way. And if, when someone says two plus two makes five, that doesn't feel right. No, it makes four. Uh, you believe it. You you know it. It's it's a, it's, a, it's a mathematical intuition at this point. It's 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 basic. It's a basic building block of anything. If I told you, you know, I, I have a bag here, and I put two oranges in it, and then I put two more oranges in it, you'd form it. You'd helplessly form a picture of of there being four oranges in there. And if I told you, oh no, there's there's six in here. Well, then you're, you would, something didn't add up, right? And that's, uh, th th this is, you know, our knowledge of the world, our knowledge of causality, our knowledge of anything, our, our sense that the, 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 the present bears some relationship, however lawful, uh, to the past, all of that is cashed out intuitively. And, and so you can't get away from intuition. Everything is built on it from, you know, log basic logic and mathematics on up. Uh, but we, we recognize that many of our intuitions are bad, they're faulty. We, don't, we, we, have not been, we did not evolve to have common sense intuitions about the way the universe works, at, especially at the smallest scale of, of, of atoms, and especially at the largest scale of galaxies, and especially across vast stretches of time when you're talking about billions of years. So our intu we know there are areas where our intuitions are very, very bad, and we correct for them with other intuitions that allow us to correct for them, like, like mathematical ones, where, you know, I, I mean, this is an example I, I gave, I think, in my first book, but if I asked you, you know, if we, if we had a newspaper the size of this stage, and we could just fold it in half again and again and again, and we folded it in half a hundred times, right, how thick would that, the resulting 
block of newspaper be? Well, most people, if you imagine it being the size of this stage, they imagine you would be able to fold it in half upon itself 100 times. And they imagine something maybe the size of a cinder block or you know, a very large brick. But the, 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 you fold a newspaper in half 100 times, what you have in your hands stretches, uh, you know, is measured in light years, right? I mean, I forget the, the exa exactly what it is, but it's, it's, it's probably bigger than, than the galaxy. Um, so that's a, that's a very bad intuition we have there, but the intuition that allows us to recognize that it's bad is that this very simple mathematical operation of, of exponentiation it, it actually works, right? That if you raise something to the, the hundredth power, uh, two to the hundredth power, you know, and multiply by the, the thickness of a newspaper, you, you have a very big number. Uh, so we, we just, intuition gets stigmatized as a, as a word, but, but science is the product of, of intuition. And every, every gesture toward knowledge is the product of intuition at, at bottom. I, I did that paper folding demonstration when I gave the Royal Institution Christmas lectures. Had uh, children come out and you can't get more than seven folds. It, 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 stop, it stops there. But, but I mean, I, th I think the, the, the purport of the question when, by mentioning Trump is that um, it, when you have two people whose intuition differs, then you can't argue by saying, well, that's my intuition, that's my intuition. I feel no. this, I feel no. that. That's what's really dangerous. And we want to get away from that kind of thing in public policy, in government. We do not want people who just do things because they feel that that's, it just feels right oh, to yeah, them. Yeah, yeah. But, <laughs> which is to say that you need an argument, but, I, but my, my noticing whether or not your argument runs through is again a, a based on logical intuition. That's you, a much more sophisticated yeah. point. And, uh, and yeah, yeah, but, uh, but that, one the that President Trump wouldn't get, by the way. No, no, yeah. <laughs> well, no, I wasn't focusing on Trump, but. And, and we'll have, have to save that for another time, too, because when, when Sammy mentioned that, you know, intuition is, is the foundation of, of logic, I think it's the reverse. <laughs> that logic and mathematics, these things, are, where we're making direct appeals to the facts of the universe. But we use critical thinking, we use this examination to train our intuition. You can get better. Yeah, you can get better, well, but your you intuition can't get... can approve. And so when you have, as Richard was pointing out, you have two people whose intuitions are in conflict, uh, the solution is never going to be a third intuition. It's going to be let's make an appeal to the evidence well, and well, retrain no, no, no. everybody's intuition. It is, it's often a third intuition. I mean, often you bring in the mathematician who actually knows what he's talking about. And I, I wouldn't uh, call that intuition. Well, no, well, but, but again, the intuition that, again, intuition is, is this, this move that you can't justify without pulling yourself up by your own bootstraps. I mean, if I said to you, well, justify this idea that events need causes, right? The sense that when something happens, there must be some causal explanation for it happening. That's an intuition that is deeply held, and that's the foundation of science. And there, ah. there are actually areas in science that, that seem to violate it, right? And, and then we're left actually not understanding what's going on, but we have other reasons to protect that area of confusion because, you know, in, in, in the case of something like quantum mechanics, it just works. It, it's so, it has such predictive utility that even though we don't have a clear, realistic picture of what's happening, we have to say, in some sense, this is the, the math works out, and, and it's right. Uh, but th these areas of science are, l are less than perfectly satisfying because we're, we, we're struggling to form a picture of reality, and, we, and our, our intuitions, are, we're, we don't have the right intuitions for it. And that's, and that's not a surprise because we, after all, are apes at first. But African apes. Yes, African. I think there's a, a lot more to explore there. Unfortunately, I've been told that our time with all you fine people is actually up for this evening. Let us pray. <laughs> <laughs> All right, no, that's not where the evening is headed. Um, did you want to say a few words or?
I'll say a few in a, in a moment, but, but carry All right. on. So uh, I wanted to give a little bit of an orientation to where we are this evening. I think this is actually uh, a unique opportunity that we have. Richard and I are both evolutionary biologists, dyed in the wool, and we come from um, a lineage of thought, and that lineage of thought has brought us to many of uh, the same conclusions. But there are places in which our thoughts depart from each other. And so tonight we're going to talk about biology, and especially, I believe, what it has to say about human beings and the manner in which they evolve. Um, the fact that we disagree over some important things is, uh, you know, potentially fraught, but I'm hoping that to the extent that there is a confrontation between ideas here, that it will be a friendly confrontation. I believe we are both from a tradition in which we believe that uh, honorable disagreement is important and it is essential to society functioning well, and so um, I hope that even if the disagreements um, are intense at times, that, uh, that it is in the context of, of friendship. Good. Right. All right. Good. So. <laughs> We're on the same page. Uh, maybe I should also say that um, I am at something of an advantage here because Richard has done such an excellent job of documenting his thoughts on evolution in his many excellent books. And for the 14 years that I taught evolutionary biology at Evergreen, I without fail assigned the selfish gene to my students. And the selfish gene you wrote in 1976, am I correct about that? You were 35 years old? Yeah. So Richard wrote that book as a young gun, and I find it shocking that I have to say this, but I think that that book is still cutting edge. The reason I assigned it to my students was that I thought that in general it presented the best encapsulation of what we understood about evolutionary dynamics that was available. And while there are a few things that aren't in it that have emerged later, I still believe that to be the case. And so one of the things we may end up talking about tonight is why it is that there has not been more progress after the huge burst of activity that we saw in the late 60s and early 70s, why uh, my era has been much quieter with respect to important discoveries about evolution that we all agree are true. Um, do you have anything to add? Yes, I, I don't quite know why you find it shocking. I mean, of course we all pay lip service to the idea that progress is good and, and we should be changing all the time, but what if we're right? And so um, it, do, it doesn't necessarily follow that uh, that what people thought in the 1960s and 70s is still largely believed is a bad thing. Maybe it is actually right. Well, I think this is a, a very interesting perspective, and it's one that I held to. Uh, when I was in college, I was a student of Robert Trivers, who's a contemporary of, of Richard's. Um, and as his student, I looked at the landscape of questions, and I felt it wasn't resentment, but I felt some sadness that it looked like Richard and Bob's generation had run the table and they had solved all of the big issues in evolutionary biology and that they had left only small issues for us. And over time I came to realize that that wasn't the case, that there were major issues left unsettled that we had stopped talking about because there was no progress. And so um, I, I took up looking at those issues and saying, what is it that we have wrong that has caused us to stop making progress on questions like why do females in many species require males to, to engage in elaborate displays uh, before mating with them? That question is still not answered. There are plenty of ideas on the table, but as for one that we all agree on, nothing has emerged. Why are there more species when you get closer to the equator and fewer species as you move towards the poles? Why do we grow feeble and inefficient with age? These are all questions on which some progress had been made, but that progress seemed to me to have stagnated. So I don't disagree with you that your generation got an awful lot right, but what I wonder about is why progress has slowed given the number of large questions that remain, and a related question is why there does not seem to be a generation of biologists that followed you that appear to be working in a way that would allow them to solve big questions in the way 
that R.A. Fisher had, or you did, or Bob Trivers did. I don't see that generation of biologists that are capable of wielding tools in the bold way that, that you all managed. I think then the onus is on you. Let, I mean, let's talk about a particular example, like say the, se the sexual selection one you raised, um, and say, what is it that you think uh, hasn't been, well, obviously you're right, it's still going on and there's much controversy going on, it's a very flourishing field, there are lots of people working in the field, uh, doing work in the, in the, out in, in the field on sexual selection. There are two major strands of theory of sexual selection. Um, perhaps you could just trace them to Fisher on the one hand and, well, Wallace, um, Zahavi, um, Hamilton on the other. And they're both um, very interesting theories. They both, they, they probably might, might both work. I mean, what, what's wrong with that? Uh, uh. It's a great question. Um, here's what's wrong with it. So okay. what, what Richard is referring to, uh, and I believe both you and I would come out on the Hamilton side of this argument, and we would both, I would imagine, be advocates for a good genes Well, no, I mean, I, I, I would be, do we need to explain what this is? I mean, yeah, maybe. <laughs> Yeah, um, uh, Darwin noticed that uh, many biological characteristics, and animal characteristics of males especially, are apparently advertising to females. Peacock's tails, um, gorgeous feathers, beautiful fish, that kind of thing. And Darwin was content simply to say, that's what females like. It's an aesthetic thing, a matter of female whim. And so in order for a male to reproduce successfully and pass on his genes, he has to be attractive, and therefore genes for being attractive get passed on to the next generation because females choose them. Wallace, the co-discoverer of natural selection, hated that idea. Uh, Wallace was more of a utilitarian and believed that um, beautiful characteristics like peacock's tails had to be useful. Uh, it wasn't enough just to simply say females love them. You had to say this is somehow an advertisement for a good male, a male who's going to be a good father or a good, provide good genes. Wallace wouldn't have used that phraseology, of course. And that divide between Darwin and Wallace has persisted from the 19th century through the 20th century. Um, Wallace felt that to invoke uh, female taste was bordering on mysticism. Uh, and Darwin's idea there was rescued in the 1920s and 30s by R.A. Fisher, the, one of the great founders of modern population genetics. And R.A. Fisher made the, da the Darwin theory respectable by allowing female choice to be under genetic control just as much as male anatomy, male tails, etc., are, uh, are under genetic control. And Fisher produced uh, a, a model which must have been a mathematical model, although he didn't lay it out in mathematical terms, it must have been there, in which natural selection simultaneously works on genes in males for being beautiful and genes in females for liking beauty. And when you realize that both baby males and baby females inherit the genes from their father for being beautiful and the genes from their mother for liking beauty. Those two go together and can produce something like a peacock's tail. That was the Fisher theory which has been brought up to date by modern mathematical biologists. But the Wallace strand of theory, uh, which Brett favors and, and to some extent so, so do I, um, agrees with Wallace that beauty has to be useful and adopts the idea that what a female is doing when she, when she is beautiful is advertising to males that she, sorry, what a male is doing when advertising to females is advertising to females, for example, that he's healthy, that he's strong. In the extreme version of the theory due to Amos Zahavi, a male is, is advertising that he has, he's such a, a good fit male that he's capable of surviving in spite of having this ridiculous tail. Um, <laughs> which should have killed him because it's vulnerable to predators, you can't fly very well with it and so on. Um, and less extreme versions of that theory are attributable to W.D. Hamilton, who thought that um, uh, health was the primary virtue which a male is advertising to females, and a beautiful tail 
is an advertisement to a female, this is a healthy male. He's not suffering from parasites, he's resistant to, pa to parasites. Otherwise he wouldn't have this beautiful, glowing, sexy tail. So, um, uh, that was just an interruption because we were talking about um, the, 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 the Harvey Hamilton type theory which Brett favors. I'm sorry, okay. So, no, that's perfect. Yeah. Um, and it actually shows exactly the point that I was trying to make, which is that you've now heard a lot. There's plenty of good work um, that suggests that this could be handicap um, that would demonstrate uh, the, the genes have to be heritable in order for females to be favored to be selecting for them. But the problem is that there is a rotten piece of this theory right at the heart which is that females are choosing to inflict this burden on their male offspring, which is ecologically certain to be costly to them. So if females are attempting to find good genes by putting males through a test, then they are inflicting bad genes on their male offspring. Those bad genes will be transmitted by their female offspring, but not expressed, so the females will not suffer the cost of that handicap, but there's a question of how it is that females recover enough of a benefit for their female offspring to justify the cost for the male offspring. So there's a way in which, although one can make a mathematically compelling argument for a handicap idea or, or a good genes idea, um, that it has to account for a very large benefit for female offspring, and what's worse if you imagine a species, like let's say we're talking about peacocks. Peacocks, the female, the peahen, inflicts this marvelous tail on her male offspring by choosing fathers that have it. In peacocks, like all creatures that have these elaborate displays, males contribute nothing other than genes. So if she's picking something valuable, it has to be encoded in the genes. Um, so she inflicts this cost on her male offspring and presumably then acquires a benefit for her female offspring. But they do this each and every generation. Only a small number of males in each generation mate. Females choosing these tails pick the same males again and again. So that ought to leave the number of bad genes in the environment very small because females are eliminating those bad genes each and every generation, which means that after a small number of generations, there ought to be very little advantage in picking males with beautiful tails because there are no bad genes left. And so the question is, if one of these good genes hypotheses is correct, why is female vigilance constant? It should be females select against bad genes, the number of bad genes drops, female vigilance now has no value, female vigilance should drop, bad genes should crop back up, female vigilance should rise again and we should see an oscillating pattern, but we don't see it. What we see is generation after generation, females choose the males with the most elaborate tails. So it doesn't matter what the answer is here. The point is this is a question that year after year remains with us and we make no progress on it. We are still fumbling with explanations that have one value but don't completely answer the question. So why is that? But this is a matter for mathematical modeling, and it's being done. And there are various different mathematical models, which um, we can't go into now. But, but, but I mean, th this is something that is an active field of theoretical research, well, and it's going on. Um, I must say I have become something of a skeptic of mathematical modeling because it suffers from two kinds of errors that are pretty obvious. One is it will sometimes give you an answer that is not viable in reality. In other words, if we were to mathematically model the way a sphere sits on a razor, as long as there are no other forces input into this system, we will be told that a sphere will balance on a razor. But we all know that a sphere doesn't balance on a razor. Right? Mathematical modeling will tell you that uh, a cup of coffee in a room will take an infinite amount of time to equalize, that it will approach the temperature of the room and the room will approach the temperature of the coffee, but they will never reach each other. We know that this isn't the case. So mathematical modeling has a way in which it can fool us into thinking that we have the right answer when we don't. And the other problem is that these mathematical models very frequently have so many parameters in them that you can match any natural behavior, even if the model isn't the reason that the natural behavior is what it is. So um, I am... 
I'm a little actually surprised to hear you defend... But the, 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 but the remedy for that is better mathematical models. It's not throwing out mathematical models altogether. And, well, and I don't know. I, I had a, uh, a mentor um, in graduate school um, who was himself a mathematician, and he said something striking to me one day. He said that um, math is the language we resort to when we don't know how to explain something. And so I would argue, yes, mathematical models can reinforce an explanation that is itself sensible, but if we don't have an explanation that's actually satisfying, the fact that we have a mathematical model that suggests that I don't find especially compelling. Because there are lots of ways you can get there. Well, to, to go back to what you first started saying about the uh, the difficulty with the Zahavi theory that the, that the, the, the female inflicts on the way you, you, you put it was right, the female in, inflicts upon her, her offspring the, 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 the handicap as well as the, as the benefit. I mean, that's exactly what I said in The Selfish Gene when I ridiculed the Zahavi theory. And mm -hmm. I was wrong because my student, uh, Alan Graffin, who's now a fellow professor at, at Oxford, did produce a mathematical model which does show that as a matter of fact the Zahavi theory can work and we were, we were I was wrong everybody else was wrong and and Gra Graffin showed that, that we were wrong by producing a mathematical model which shows that the that the, the Zahavi handicap theory can work um, and uh, I not being a mathematician myself have to bow to that I understand the model and I think I think it works I think it's a, it's a very good one and I et humble pie. I, I said I was, I was wrong, and, and my student Alan Graffin was right. Well, but I think, I think you are too hasty to accept that you were wrong. And in fact, I'm, I'm not certain of this. It's been a while since I have read it. But if I'm correct, what you said about Zahavi in The Selfish Gene was that this didn't, am I right, that you said it didn't sound like the way natural selection works? I think I was a bit ruder about it than that. <laughs> That's likely. <laughs> Um, but I'm not quite sure what, I mean, wh how could you p possibly argue the case without, I mean, there, there are some cases where you on the whole not use mathematics myself, and I've done verbal argu arguments, and so I ought to be agreeing with you about this, but there are times when I have to say, um, a verbal argument simply isn't enough. You've got to actually do the sums. Well, I think a verbal argument has to um, be proven out by data, and one way to get data, it's, I have to say, not my favorite, but one way to get data is to generate a model that is sufficiently robust that it will spit out um, a behavior that mirrors what you see. But I, I also think that, in a sense, the field has adopted this modality of proving things because it has forgotten what to do. That there are actually features of the modern academic environment that are, that effectively rule out the kind of wonderful work that R.A. Fisher did or that you did. And so I think it is very much the fashion to, uh, to defer to these very powerful tools, but that the powerful tools actually have yet to, um, to reveal answers that are compelling and do predict things about nature that we, uh, that we do not um, know to be true at the point that we build the model. So if we can take the example of um, George Williams and his famous paper on the evolution of senescence. The wonderful thing about this paper is that it says if, if I, George Williams, am right about the cause of senescence, senescence being the um, the feebleness and inefficiency that accumulates with age. He said, if I'm right about the cause of this, then you will see these patterns in nature. And we knew for a long time, before we could find the genes he had predicted, we knew for a long time that, that his hypothesis was correct, in other words, that it was a theory, because when we looked at nature, we saw the exact pattern he had described. And so I'm a fan of that kind of work. You say, well, here's an observation, Here's the hypothesis that would explain it, and if this hypothesis is correct, this is the pattern we will see in nature, which we don't know if it's yeah. there yet, and then it's, it's there. I, I think we need to pause and explain George Williams' theory of senescence, um, because otherwise I don't think that sure. um, makes sense. Um, the, the problem of, of why natural selection favors 
um, growing old and dying of old, old age. And um, there had been wrong ideas, things like, um, it's for the good of the species that the old ones die off and make way for the young ones, something like that. Well, that, that doesn't work. That's not the way natural selection works. Um, P.B. Medower, and then refined by, by George Williams, came up with a much better genetically based theory, which is that if you imagine a gene, you, you, you know that any, any gene has its effect at a particular time of life, mostly during embryology, but genes go on maturing, making, making their presence felt at different times of life. Now, if you imagine a gene for um, giving you a, a fatal cancer when you're 10, and another gene for making your, giving, yourself a, giving you a fatal cancer when you're 20, another one when you're 30, another one when you're 40, another one when you're 50, etc., which one of them is going to get through to the next generation? A gene that gives you cancer and kills you when you're 60 has already got through to the next generation by the time it kills you. A gene that gives you cancer when you're ten and kills you, does not get through to the next generation. So there'll be natural selection in favor of late-acting fatal or sub-fatal genes. That was the Meadower version of the theory. The Williams version of the theory was a nice refinement of that, which is that the genes are modified by other genes. And so any gene which has a, um, a Good effect when you're young makes you makes you fit when you're when you're young, but kills you when you're when you're old, um, is likely to survive, and the the reverse is not likely to survive. So there's going to be a pressure in favour of um, perhaps uh, rushing around and and expending all your energy when you're young in order to get your genes into the next generation when you when you're young at the expense of um, becoming um, uh, more likely to die when you're, when you're old. Um, so that's a rather bad summation of the Williams theory, but now we need to go back to... No, it's, um, it, it's pretty good, actually. I don't know um, if you know that I worked on this puzzle in graduate school. I saw I didn't know that, no. Oh, yeah. This is the place that you begin to understand what history really is, and it actually lends a great deal of power to your point about the need to rebel against selfish replicators. I mean, let's look Very at... Very much so, yes. Yeah. The, the Second yeah. World War. Yes. Right? Even the terminology. You had the fatherland effectively raping Mother Russia. I mean, that's even the terminology, right? So what this was was a lineage-level phenomenon in which a population uh, went after two other populations, one that was internal to its borders or its near neighbors, and one population that was distant but had a great many resources. But the point is, understood from the perspective of German genes, uh, vile as these behaviors were, they were completely comprehensible from the level of fitness. It was abhorrent and unacceptable, but understandable that Germany should have viewed its Jewish population as uh, a source of resources. If you viewed Jews as uh, non-people, then whatever resources they had could be uh, appropriated for German genes, and likewise, the future of Germany lies in Russia. All of the resources of Russia, and how many million, is it 20 million Russians it took to turn the German war machine around? So what you have are these population against population conflicts. If you view it as group selection, it makes no sense, but if you view them as lineages, it makes a great deal of sense, and the belief structures that caused people to step onto battlefields and fight um, were uh, clearly comprehensible as adaptations of the lineages in question. I think nationalism might be an even greater evil than religion. And I'm not sure that it's actually very helpful to talk about it in Darwinian terms. I think it's um, perhaps here that this might be a case where we do need to defer a little bit to historians and non-biologists and think about it in other ways. Why? I'm curious well, as to why you'd be resistant. Um, because I think human affairs are so complicated and, and so, uh, although ultimately we are evolved creatures, we have, uh, our, our human affairs, our historical affairs, our social affairs are so um, distantly 
related upon a superstructure of biology that it's probably better not to ex try to explain them in simple biological terms. Ah, so I think this is then why we disagree on the importance of this. And I would say it's absolutely vital for us to confront this in biological terms. Um, if one imagines that we are remote from evolution by virtue of the fact that cultural evolution has taken over and is not, uh, is not furthering the interests of the genes, then this does become a complicated matter um, that is uniquely human. If, on the other hand, human beings are engaged in a fundamentally biological phenomenon that they do not consciously understand, then in order to confront it, I really believe we have to look at what we are and that your point about rebelling against the selfish replicators is the key. That if, I mean, here's my feeling. If I'm a robot that is programmed to be willing to put other people in a gas chamber under the right circumstances, but I as a conscious being find that idea horrifying, then I as a conscious being have to look at that uh, program and say, under no circumstances will I be party to it. I don't care if it's biologically advantageous. It's not for me. And so um, the ability to resist the will of the replicators, I think, requires us to stare in the face what role this has played in our history uh, up until the present day. Well, I think we agree about that. I think we've run out of time, haven't we? Um, well, that's a question for the audience, really. <laughs> Keep going. So, all right, what we're going to do... Wait, wait. The... Okay. Uh, um, well, w we, should, we should vote, and we should give people but, but, a chance. But the, 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 the alternative is questions from, from the audience. Yeah. So what we're going to do is we're first going to ask how many people would like to go to questions from the audience, and then we're going to ask how many people would like the discussion to continue uh, in the way that it's going. So first question is how many people would like us to move on to questions from the audience? Uh, shout if you want questions from the audience. All right, and how many people would prefer that the discussion continue as it is? <laughs> that sounded unambiguous okay, to me. Right, yep. um, you, again, you've got uh, your microphone coming off your ear. Um, okay, I don't know if you wanted to respond to the, the last point. What I was saying is effectively that we must, as ugly as it is, we must confront what we are programmed for if we are to resist a recurrence of those patterns in the future. Okay, let's let that one go. Okay, right. we'll let that one go. Um, all right. Number six, adaptation can directly explain obligate homosexuality, suicide, and celibacy in humans. Well, I think we do have, uh, as Darwinians, we do have an obligation to try to explain things which are, which are frequent enough to be um, not regarded as just mere aberrations. And so um, homosexuality in humans is frequent enough that it and 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 indeed it is it is a genetic thing and so so we cannot um duck our responsibility to try to so at least it, it deserves to have a, a darwinian explanation um we know that there's a genetic component from such things as twin studies and uh and we know that it's frequently it's frequent enough that it's not just a result of recurrent mutation so yes there has to be some sort of darwinian explanation yeah. And there's also fascinating pattern um, that also suggests a Darwinian explanation, although um, confusing. So I would point to the uh, older brother right hand rule. Yes. The more older brothers you have, the more likely you are to be gay, but only so long as you're right handed. Right? That's a very interesting pattern that has been replicated multiple times. And it suggests that there's something going on with homosexuality more than some uh, failure due to novelty. It suggests that there's um, some sort of structure to it and a, and a meaning that we haven't yet uh, figured out. So how about uh, suicide? Do you see that one as um, explicable? Well, uh, I'm not, I haven't thought about that to the same extent. Have you thought about it? I mean, um, um, yes. Okay. So, uh, all right. I mean, I can easily think of psychological explanations in, me in mimetic explanations, perhaps. Um, Genetic explanations for suicide, do, do you have them? 
Well, uh, I think in principle, many of these things come back to the same couple of places where our field has um, instantiated a bad assumption. And so the assumption about individual selection where lineage selection might be um, a more powerful concept has caused us, I think, to miss the boat on all three of these uh, characteristics. What I would say is, let's just take a, uh, an example of the Middle East, for example. Let's say you have two populations in the Middle East, and both of them correctly recognize that 500 years from now, they are not both likely to be there, that it is likely to be one or the other, but not both. Were that the case, then any fitness that was realized in the present day would be more or less meaningless if you were in the population that blinked out 200 years from now. So you would find a rational investment in behaviors that discounted individual fitness and prioritized lineage fitness. In other words, you would see extraordinary levels of self-sacrifice in the interest of ensuring that the population to which the individual doing the sacrifice uh, belonged was the one that continued to exist. I don't know how clear that was, but the basic idea is in extraordinary circumstances, like for example, a piece of land that isn't getting any bigger and is fully inhabited and has competing lineages uh, that cannot simply live peaceably together, that um, suicidal self-sacrifice might be rational. Now again, naturalistic fallacy being what it is, just because something is doesn't mean it ought to be, and I'm not defending it as a good thing, but I'm saying, can we understand it rationally? If we think about adaptation occurring at the lineage level, I think it's not hard to see cases where um, suicide, I mean, really it's one step past getting on a ship and going over the horizon to see if you can find a new landmass that nobody's discovered. That's a near suicidal behavior that's somewhat comprehensible. Actual suicide can make sense if um, the circumstances are extraordinary enough. And I would also say, closer to home, that if we look at cases where people uh, commit suicide in our own culture, very frequently they are beset by the sense that they are beyond worthless, that they have no value, that their existence is simply taking up resource. And so you can imagine that this could be a matter of kin selection or lineage selection. That if you, and I think most people who believe that uh, in our culture are not calculating correctly, they have bad data on what, the, what value they might contribute, but nonetheless, were you to be triggered to imagine that you had no value and that you were simply burning up resources, then this is a rational course of action. I do not think it's helpful to couch this kind of explanation in Darwinian terms. Da Darwinian evolution is about the natural selection of replicators. And the primary replicators we're talking about are genes, and the vast majority of biological evolution, and you've been advocating the priority of this genetic selection, um, producing bodies and brains the way they are. And now we come on to things like nationalism, things like um, individuals sacrificing themselves for the sake of the long-term future of their lineage, their society, their nation. Um, th this is not Darwinism. This is, this is something else. This is, this is a, a, a complicated mixture of human-level affairs, which historians deal with, sociologists deal with, psychologists deal with. This is not Darwinism. It's not helpful to... It, it's, 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 it's not helpful to try to couch this in what, what sounds like Darwinian terms. Well, let me ask you a question. Let's just see where it is that we disagree. My claim is that if it is true, and I obviously can't say if it is or it isn't, but if it is true that things like xenophobia, genocide, suicide are products of adaptive evolution, that in order to address these things going forward in a useful way, understanding their nature is likely to be beyond helpful and may even be essential. So to give 
one example. Let's say that the impulse to genocide is something that lurks inside human beings, awaiting certain indicators that it is the moment for that program to be triggered. Were that the case, you would want people to engage that question ahead of time when they were in possession of their full faculties and to recognize that they might have a program within them that violates the values that they believe are their, their guide. Yes, but I think I would prefer to say that these impulses are byproducts of something primitive and evolved. So something like genocide. Um, we know that chimpanzees, for example, um, do practice genocide against rival groups of, of, ch of chimpanzees. One can make a genetic evolution case that says something like this. In our wild ancestry, uh, using the Hamilton idea of living in villages, living in small bands, um, the companions that you know that are familiar to you from day to day, everybody you know is a, is, a, is a relative, strangers or not. And so killing strangers, uh, genocide, killing neighboring bands of people like happens in some parts of the New Guinea Highlands, for example, um, that could be regarded as a byproduct of genetic natural selection. And something like the, um, the Nazi atrocities could be regarded as a manifestation of that genetically evolved um, tendency. But it's in a totally different context. And um, of course, I agree with you that the, the, we need to resist, the, we need to rebel against the, the selfish genes. But I prefer not to talk about the things that we do in our modern society in a sort of straightforward biological way, but rather to say these are relics, byproduct relics of our genetic past. And one can do, th do this all the time, and I think that we do it, we do it a lot. We do things like um, the desire for business executives to have a bigger, thicker office carpet, that kind of thing. This is all, um, you, can, you can interpret that in a sort of biological way as, being, as representing something like uh, something that came from our biological past. But you have to be very careful when you do it. Mm. And uh, I don't, I, I think it's very often not very helpful to try to apply Darwinian ideas directly to um, the sorts of things that we, we get in, in modern society, whether it's horrible mechanized warfare or, or executives demanding bigger desks or, or whatever it is. Um, I, I just think we've got to be very careful in, in applying. I mean, I, I am in favor of evolutionary psychologists who do this kind of thing, but I think they do do it in a, in a careful way. And, and I, I think we've got to be very cautious in the way we do it. Well, you and I are in 100% agreement that we need to be extremely careful in applying evolutionary logic, and it is possible to get carried away. I, for example, would not argue that we can apply evolutionary logic to anything so new that we don't know if it stands the test of time, right? So um, I have a test of adaptation that just simply tells you whether or not you are uh, on solid ground to presume that something is adaptive, and it involves looking at whether something has a complexity, whether it has a cost, a variable cost that could be reduced, and whether it persists over evolutionary time. So wanting a bigger desk is I think you and I would agree, certainly a manifestation of something evolved, but it's very hard to analyze desks with Darwinian tools because desks are new. Um, but something like genocide is not new. Warfare is not new. And yeah. so these things are complex, expensive. We're seeing a history that goes into antiquity and beyond. And that, I believe, not only gives us license to apply Darwinian tools, but I would say, A, it is the most parsimonious explanation, and B, it is our best hope 
of ending these patterns permanently. If I didn't believe that, I would be much less enthusiastic about what is revealed by these analyses. I would say they are justified, but I might not be a champion of doing it, and I might not be so interested in doing it personally. But to the extent that I would love to see an end to genocide, I think facing what it actually appears to be is essential. Okay, but su su suppose... But so suppose you take the example of the of the Nazi in invasion of the lands to the east, which you did before. Um, you've got uh, you've got a, a, a nation taking a decision, which is a, a dictator and advisors and a parliament and and all, uh, it's a complicated matter of a state taking a decision to invade an, an, another state using modern weapons and using the um, weapons of diplomacy to argue the case in, 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 in international um, courts and so on. Um, and then you've got the individual soldiers going out there and killing people. And the, the psychological motives of the individual soldiers are going to be so different from those... I mean, they're not the ones who are actually taking the decision to go and invade Poland. Um, they are doing quite different things. They're obeying their officers, they're, they're perhaps giving vent to uh, revenge motives because their comrade was killed in a previous battle or something of that sort. These are very, very complicated mixtures of, of motives, psychological motives. Um, and yes, they are, all of them, products of brains which were honed by natural selection. Um, but I don't think it's helpful to to unite them all and say, well, this is, this is all um, one biological impulse to do, do something or other. They're, they're different things at different levels. Well, I do think you're, you're right about that at, in one level. So if we look at uh, um, the genocide between Hutus and Tutsis, these distinctions were actually um, phenotypically imposed. In other words, this is the rare case where you have a genocidal impulse that appears to be triggered by the artificial, and now it may mirror an actual lineage phenomenon, but what you had was people measuring noses and eyes and things like this and imposing the sense that these are your people and those are the enemy, and it triggered a genocide. On the other hand, what I think we need to be aware of, uh, and I, this is a dangerous topic to open, but I would say during the last presidential election, uh, we had a cynical fella um, who began to intone some of the same ideas that lead people to some sort of nationalistic fervor. And to the extent that that program that is looking for the moment in history at which this is the correct way to behave, that those detectors might have been up and waiting for somebody to use that kind of rhetoric, that we may find ourselves dragged into something we could anticipate but won't if we don't confront it and that it is much better to understand, for example, that when you move from a phase where you have growth or something that seems like growth that makes people feel comfortable, makes them keep their head down, makes them treat their neighbors basically all right, when that breaks down at the point that you run out of growth, the natural impulse is to become tribal and go after those who aren't so closely related to you. And so to the extent that we can be taken advantage of by a leader who would cynically or otherwise um, lead us into some sort of tribal warfare, we need to recognize that danger and say, actually, is there a way out of here that is novel? Can we do something that isn't evolutionary, but actually matches the values that we believe ourselves to hold, the values yeah. that are defensible. I, I think that's right. I, th I think that, that it is important to recognize things like tribalism. I think that, that's a probably a real, a, a real phenomenon which is important and which can be and is played upon by um, demagogues. And um, so, yes, uh, tribalism and there are some other things like that which, which are important. Um, and when I say that they're distanced from the biological, or some of them are more distanced than others, and, and some of them are pretty naked, are pretty, are pretty close to the surface. And I think that, um, that the tribalism which is invoked both in the case of the uh, Hutus and, and the Tutsis and in the case of the recent election 
disaster. Um, <laughs> that probably is, suf is sufficiently close to, to, um, to, the, to the surface that, it, that it's not unreasonable to use biological terminology and make uh, and, and notice resemblances to, say, the battles between New Guinea Highland tribes, that kind of thing. Good. Well, I guess then that suggests that there is something that I don't, I don't think I've seen, which is, is there a, uh, a program in which people are seeking what are the legitimate boundaries of discussion for Darwinian selection, and when do we move into phenomena that are not amenable or don't benefit from that kind of perspective? So I think I hear you and me converging on the idea that this is dangerous territory, it is quite possible to extend it too far, but that there may be great value if we wish to avoid the worst instincts that human beings have in understanding what their Darwinian underpinnings are and how we might, you know, in the same manner that you invoke uh, birth control, family planning is, uh, I think we both agree, um, contrary to fitness in many cases. Um, how can we take that model where we have stepped away from a biological imperative to increase fitness at all costs and we've done something more reasonable, family planning, how can we apply that same kind of logic to things like warfare and genocide and demagoguery? It is a useful model because um, contraception is a case where we have stepped back from biology and we, so it shows that we can do it. Yes, and, yes okay. it does, yeah. but it also shows us um, this arbitrary nature of uh, when you can, because the reason that we can do it with birth control is an accident of evolution, which is that sexual pleasure and sexual reproduction are not synonymous. We have been wired with a program that causes us to seek sexual pleasure in a way that results in reproduction, but because they aren't the same thing, they can be technologically decoupled, which makes family planning an almost trivial matter. You can engage in it without engaging in a fight with yourself. Um, had would, would, would you say tribalism is de decoupled, uh, has been decoupled in sports, um, football hooliganism and... Um, uh, Yes, I would say this is a place actually where you loyalty, see... Loyalty to your team and... and yes. yes, not necessarily productively, but that it is a case in which you see people's tribal impulses being applied to what is effectively one corporation battling another on yeah. a field. I mean, that's what they are. A corporation buys a bunch of players, another corporation buys one. It's not like two towns are fighting each other, but people get involved in it like it is. And so, yes, I think it is, it's a place where it's been decoupled almost by accident. Have you noticed what... Um, soccer players do when they've just scored a goal, they throw a spear, they, go, they, they, they rush around, they throw like that. <laughs> That's good. That does seem like what they do. <laughs> All right. Um, shall we move down the list to even more infuriating things? All right. Number seven. I, I really want to know your reaction to this one. I've been waiting all night. Um, Catholics, are you social? Does everybody in the audience understand what the claim is? That you have a non-reproductive caste within Catholicism. Other religions too, but Catholics are uh, kind to us in that they make everything so elaborate that we can... Well, worker bees don't reproduce. Right. Neither priests do theoretically don't. Yeah, priests theoretically don't, and neither do not. Well, I think most of them probably don't. <laughs> don't you agree? Yes. Yeah. So, all right, the question is, you know, you allege in The Selfish Gene that a celibate clergy is a failure of Darwinian selection. My claim here is that this isn't a failure, that this is adaptive celibacy, that it serves a lineage-level purpose. It's meme-level. That's what's going on there. It, the but if it's meme-level, then each of those priests and each of those nuns is involved in a spectacular loss of a reproductive opportunity. I mean, this is the argument you lay yeah. out. So the question is, why are they so vulnerable to accept? I mean, most people couldn't forego uh, romance and sex if they tried. And yet you have a group of people that is triggered to avoid these things, and they do so in the service of a bunch of ideas that, yes, are literally 
false. A bunch of ideas, that's exactly right, a, bu a bunch of memes. So, memes that make some individuals, in, in Ireland for example, it's, it, it has traditionally been a prestigious thing for one member of the family, one brother, to become a priest, a, a, celib a celibate priest. So the priest devotes all his energy to proselytizing and spreading the meme mm -hmm. and, the other, and all the, all the other, other memes. It's the better to persuade other Catholics to have more children than they should, and so that... Ah, but then that... Uh, isn't it interesting that this person who, uh, according to you, is involved in a failure of Darwinism, just so happens to behave in a way that his genes are likely to be spread by virtue of the fact that he's encouraging... Not his genes, his memes. No, his genes. He's part of a lineage. Oh, as it happens in, in Ireland, as yes, it's true. Well, um, but I mean, it, th this is my claim, is that it is almost always going to be the case in any persistent religion that where you have people engaged in what appears to be some spectacular failure of Darwinism, that they just so happen to be spreading ideas that will result in the genes that are allowing them to fail as Darwinian entities to succeed by the lineage that holds those they, beliefs. They spreading devote farther. all their energies to spreading Catholic memes and they, they don't have to bother with the, the time and the responsibilities of a family. So they're, they're wholly devoted to spreading Catholic memes, including, incidentally, more than incidentally, the meme for celibacy. Well, they so spread the meme for celibacy, which my claim, I mean, if I'm right about this, then my point would be that Catholic, uh, Catholic lineages would actually do less well, well if everybody reproduced, that there is an advantage to having individuals who have stepped out of the reproductive market and therefore become capable of speaking on behalf of the lineage. That somebody who is outside, I mean, think about a priest can't make a ton of money, right? And they can't reproduce, right? At least not out in public. And so the point is that takes them out of two modes through which they might be corrupted. Somebody who can't be corrupted because they're not in a position, even if they were to accumulate money, they couldn't spend it without calling attention to themselves. And they're not in a position to be sexually corrupted, at least not out in public. And so those two mechanisms just so happen to put them in a position to speak for, uh, for the lineage. So what are we disagreeing about? I mean, I, I, I don't know, no, maybe no, nothing. No. <laughs> but if, if that is the case, so, all right. You say, what are we disagreeing about? Is Catholicism a mind virus? Well, it, 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 it's a complex of mind viruses, yes. That's what we're disagreeing about. Okay. Okay, my claim is that Catholicism is a complex of adaptations, that they are lineage-level adaptations, and that they are, in large measure, responsible for the success of lineages that hold this set of beliefs, having spread around the globe and having been so successful, efficient at creating adaptations of all types, sort of argument. Let, let me attempt to um, place my worldview in a few sentences, please. Um, Darwinian natural selection is all about the differential survival of replicators. There are various kinds of replicators, of which genes are some, and memes are other, and they are all um, engaged in a kind of tussle with each other to survive as replicators using vehicles which are bodies and which are brains and which are all sorts of other artifacts and things like that. Our separate genes, although they are, we, we, we unite them together under the one word genome, are actually, I regard them as similar to viruses in that they are um, changing their partners in every generation and you can regard the whole um, genome as a massive collection of viruses, massive collection of um, independently tussling replicators who survive better because they go around together as a gang. They survive better in the company of other such replicators. And that's why we call them genes rather than viruses. There are others which survive better not going around in gangs, but going around by being sneezed into the atmosphere, or uh, whatever it is, by, by spreading around by other means. The only difference, the fundamental difference between those replicators which we call genes and those which we call viruses are 
that the method of transmission to the future of what the ones that we call genes are through our sperms or our eggs and therefore they have a, an interest in common to preserve the body in which they share because that's the only way they're going to get into the next generation that minority of them which are not destined to get into the next generation get into the future via sperms or eggs but by being sneezed into the air or um, defecated into the sewage system or, various, or, or left as blood lying around or something like, like that um, we call them viruses and the only difference is that their hope of getting into the future is not to cooperate with others in getting into an egg or a sperm but getting out of the body in a different way by being, by being sneezed. Now, um, memes are more of the latter category. They don't go through sperms and, or, 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 or eggs. They do, however, quite to a, quite a large extent, go down through generations longitudinally. So though it's not sperms or eggs, they do go from parent to child. But we, we, we live in a great soup of replicators which are floating around. Some of them are memes, some of them are genes, some of them are cooperative genes which go th through the generations through sperms and eggs. Some of them are cooperative memes that go through the generations in the form of, of parents indoctrinating children or schools indoctrinating, in, indoctrinating children. But everything we see around us is a soup of replicators and their phenotypic tools of replication, among which are extended phenotypic tools of replication. And that's my piece said. Okay. So I, have a, of course, agree with most of what you said. I, I uh, in my own mind, think of genes at the moment that the zygote is created. They may be very uneasy with each other up to that moment, but th at the moment they are fused into a zygote, that single cell that then becomes a 30 trillion cell human, let's say, um, they fall in love because, as you say, they have no mechanism for reproducing other than creating such an effective, coordinated creature that it is capable of reaching a moment of reproduction. And so it is that being trapped with shared fate that caused them to, causes them to behave as an organism that is united in its, in its purpose. So I, I think we yeah. agree on that. Um, in order to explain my perspective and where I think we differ, um, I need to borrow a concept from you, and I think you have described it as your most important contribution, and you just invoked it, the extended phenotype. Do you want to explain what that means in brief form? Can you do it? How long have I got? I mean, I can do it pretty briefly. <laughs> well, um, the normal, the normal word phenotype applies to bodies and the, the gene sits inside its body and influences the phenotype by means of um, embryonic, embryonic processes. So wings and noses and, and toenails and hairs and things are all phenotypes. Extended phenotypes are outside the body and they include things like beaver dams and termite mounds and birds nests. They are they're not part of the body but they are every bit as much to be regarded as phenotypes, adaptations by genes for the propagation of genes. So although the genes don't actually live inside the nest, or don't actually live inside the caddis fly house or, or, the, or, the, or the, the beaver dam, nevertheless the, these artifacts are all phenotypic devices for the preservation and propagation of the genes that created them. You generalize that then to parasites influencing hosts. Uh, for, the, for their own benefit. Parasites that cause their intermediate hosts to be more likely to be eaten by their final host and therefore passed on to the next part of the parasite cycle. The genes of the parasite are exerting phenotypic effects on the host so that parasite genes have extended phenotypic effects on host bodies. Extend that further and you have things like cuckoos who manipulate their foster parents into feeding them, um, the genes that make the baby cuckoo effective at manipulating and persuading the foster parent to feed it are exerting extended phenotypic effects on 
the behavior of the parent. Generalize it further, and when a bird sings, when, an, when a nightingale sings and influences the hormonal state of a female nightingale, when a canary sings, and so on, then the effect on the female body of the male song is extended phenotypic effect of genes in the singing male. And that's the story of the extended phenotype. So, let's take your example of, of a beaver pond, just to make this crystal clear. So, a beaver is a rodent that creates a dam by cutting down trees and blocking the waterway. That dam is necessary to its ecology. It uses the water to preserve wood that it can eat over the winter. Um, and your point in the extended phenotype, which I think is brilliant, is that the pond is every bit as much a part of this story as the molecules inside the beaver. That the genes inside the beaver create a system of physiology that is the beaver's cells, but it also creates the pond, which is part of the beaver's ecology, and it is artificial to divide the pond from the beaver. That it is the extended phenotype of the beater, beaver that is in the pond. I agree with this. My point would be, memes are extended phenotype, and that the claim that memes are competing in their own meme sphere is a little bit like saying that ponds reproduce themselves using beavers, which you can definitely make that argument, but it's not the most parsimonious explanation for beaver ponds. Beaver ponds are created by beavers to facilitate their own ecology, and they are passed down to next generation beavers, right? This piece of ecology is handed down, sometimes over the course of decades or even a hundred years. These ponds, these alterations of the landscape are handed down as an inheritance to future generations of beavers. And that to me looks very much like a lineage handing down a belief system that results in it being ecologically effective at doing things like holding a piece of territory, excluding others from it, taking over new territory by dispersing. And so, memes are extended phenotype. My way of thinking is they should not be analyzed on their own, they should be analyzed as serving the interests of the underlying genome the same way ponds are serving the interests of the underlying beaver genome. I'm familiar with the fallacy. Uh, that, that is absolutely wrong. Um, uh, there, there, there is a succession that goes beaver gene pond, beaver gene pond, and so on. And, and you, superficially, you could say that either one should, could be regarded as the phenotype of the other, the replicator. But the, the key point is that ponds don't mutate and therefore are more likely to survive than not. Genes do, and that's the fundamental fallacy in this, uh, this argument. I call it Bateson's fallacy, who, who said that, that birds are just a nest's way of making another, another nest. Um, it, 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 it's, you've got to look at the replicator is the one which mutates and as a consequence produces more copies of itself which, which survive. That's what genes do, that's what memes do, but that's not what ponds do, it's not what beavers do, it's not what nests do. Well, I mean, I must say that when you turn this back on me and you say that ponds do not mutate, I'm just tempted to, to take up that challenge because I think they do. And I don't think that this is a good way to understand them. This is my point, is that we can treat them that way. Beaver ponds actually do empty when they, a no, dam but breaks. Then, but then they don't give rise to daughter empty ponds. Well, but the point is, a beaver who builds a pond that empties is much more likely uh, to suffer starvation Precisely. during the winter. Precisely, and it's the, it's the, it's the, the, beaver, the beaver that does the building. You're making the my point. The beaver gene that makes it. This is exactly my point, that the way to understand something like Catholicism is not a thing unto itself. It is a program that runs on the computer inside the head of a Catholic. And so the way to properly understand it, the way to get the maximum power, is to understand it as extended phenotype of the creatures in whom the program is running, just as the way to understand beaver ponds is to understand them as extended phenotype of the beaver. They are a means to an end employed by beavers to preserve food over the winter, among other things. I can only quote W.B. Yeats, you are still wrecked among heathen dreams. <laughs> Wait, I don't Sorry, think look, I speak look, English look, well enough to understand what you just accused me of. <laughs>
The fundamental logic of natural selection is that there are replicators which mutate yep. and which produce copies which may or may not survive because they're good at surviving. The way they're good at surviving is by building phenotypes. Genes mutate, ponds don't. That is absolute... When you say ponds mutate, you, you didn't really mean that. What you meant was that ponds change. Of course they do. They drain, they, go, they, they burst their dam, they do all sorts of things. But that doesn't replicate. That doesn't give rise to a new generation of defective ponds. Oh. What does give rise to a new generation of defective ponds is a mutant gene in a beaver who builds a bad, a bad dam. We don't, we don't disagree about We this. don't, indeed. We agree about the beaver example, and what we don't agree is how to map it onto the example of people and belief systems that exist over a long period of time. That's the question. We agree that it is an inferior understanding of beaver ponds to imagine that they mutate and either do or don't pass themselves down based on the quality of the information encoded there or whatever. So the question is, what is the best way to understand somebody who says something perfectly at odds with what we can discover in a science lab, but that in saying this thing, they are highly successful at uh, recovering resources from their local ecology and spreading into new habitats and taking over territory, excluding others, all of these things. And my point is simply, that is the extended phenotype of the creature that is engaged in this behavior. And to the extent that it persists over evolutionary time, what it's telling us is that in spite of the fact that those beliefs are not literal, that they are effective. I think you can make a case that um, ideas, uh, for example, you're now talking about religious ideas. Yep. Um, religious ideas spread because they're spreadable. It's tautological, just like natural selection. Um, and the reason they're spreadable is that they appeal to people, they appeal to people's psychology, etc. That's, that's why they spread. Um, you are trying to say, what are you trying to say, extended phenotype, that, the, that, the, um, that a, a meme is an extended phenotype? No, a meme is a replicator. It, it is a replicator, and I'm not arguing that absent any other system, that there wouldn't be a trivial competition between memes. In fact, we see a trivial competition yes, between I, memes on the internet. I agree. It, it might be trivial, and, and I, I don't think I ever wanted to make the case that there really is an important evolution resulting from the natural selection of memes. I think there might be. It was a hypothesis that there might be. I just wanted to say they do function as replicators. I think it is unhelpful to call them extended phenotypes. They're not phenotypes. Is it time? Okay. Yeah. Well, let me make one more point, then you can make the final point, and then we'll, we'll close this down. The key question and the prediction of the model that I'm presenting is that memes should show no interest in passing themselves down when it is not in the interest of the creature on whose minds they are operating. So, for example, we both agree that a language is a meme complex. And my point would be, if you move to another country that doesn't speak your language, you will have trouble adopting the language of that country. But your children will not experience a tension between their ancestral language. They will actually very easily acquire the language of the new habitat. Why? Because their old language is not struggling to survive they are struggling to survive, and the very best tool that they can have to survive in this new habitat is the language that allows them to interface with the people who are there. So the question is, if you are right about the nature of memes and that the point of their stickiness is about their own propagation and is orthogonal to the propagation of the genomes of the creatures that have these cultural structures, then those things should fight like crazy to stick around even in circumstances where they have no value. In my model, those things will gladly disappear in favor of superior meme complexes when it is advantageous to do so in some local circumstances. So it actually predicts a different behavior. I don't know whether, I don't know whether a meme, differential meme survival really is an evolutionarily important uh, effect or not. Um, all I'm saying is that what matters in natural selection is the differential survival of replicators. In the case of gene replicators, then we know about the phenotypes that may cause them to survive, and it's, it's very clear, we understand it pretty well. In the case of memes, we don't know, 
and it may be that um, maybe the meme level natural selection is only in its infancy, maybe the internet will see it developing further. Um, but I don't see any reason at all to regard that if there is a, a reason why some means spread more than others, among those reasons is likely to be the predispositions provided by genes and genetic selection, but that's not the only one. The memes exist in an ecology of their own and they might very well spread whether or not the ecology in which they spread is, as you would put it, the prior favorable one of that provided by gene selection. It's an important component, but not the only one. All right. Well, this has been a fascinating discussion, and I must say, I think we made more progress than we might have. So. Let's give a huge round of applause to Richard and Brett Weinstein. Before we started, we were sitting down uh, in one of the dressing rooms and we were having a conversation about, you know, the communicating science of reason and fixing issues. And one of the things that, that popped up that I thought we might start with, um, the internet seems to have given power to people, which is a good thing, I would say, and power to ideas and the opportunity to share ideas. None of us can become an expert in everything. You just don't have the time or the bandwidth. So how do we deal with the issue of trying to figure out which experts, what criteria should people use to figure out which experts are worth listening to in an age where everyone has been empowered to become their own expert and just become science deniers or, or fact deniers, alternative fact deniers? Richard, you've been at this longer. I'll let you start this. It's a really difficult problem. Uh, in science, we have peer review, that kind of thing. We have methods in place for um, not respecting authority necessarily, but we know that a, 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 an article that's written in a reputable scientific journal has been peer reviewed. We know that the findings will be, uh, if they're important, if they're controversial, they will be replicated, and if they're not repeated, it'll be a matter for suspicion. Um, no scientist has the knowledge to understand all other science. I mean, reading even a journal like Nature or Science, um, I can read the biological papers, some of them. I can't read the physics papers. So you have to rely on authority to some extent. And it's a very difficult problem because we, we pay lip service to the idea that we don't actually uh, um, respect authority just because it is authority, just because it's professor so-and-so, professor has somebody, something who has FRS and so on. Um, so it, it, it is a difficult problem, and when I uh, try to understand physics, I have to, to some extent, obviously, rely on authority. As you say, Matt, the internet raises problems that everybody has a voice. And fortunately, not everybody has quite the same reach as everybody else, but nevertheless, um, it, it is a problem, and we, we get politicians telling us things like, you are the experts now. Well, I'm not an expert on most things, and nor are you, and nor are you. Mm. Um, nobody's an expert on, on, on everything. And so it, it is a, a difficult stage we're in where people are being treated as though all opinions are equally valid. Yeah, it actually strikes me as a fairly subtle and difficult to communicate point that in science and in intellectual life generally, we don't rely on authority except we do up until the moment we repudiate authority. I mean, you, you have to be competent to the conversation in order to completely subvert the, the, the status quo. And so, uh, you know, it's, it's, all, it's true that science advances by discovering that the authorities were wrong, at least on, you know, important marginal points, and, and sometimes just wrong wholesale. But it's... It, just as Richard says, I mean, it's impossible to, to have the totality of human knowledge uh, self-authenticated. And the only reason why we're confident that anything is the way it is, is because we are content to rely on authorities 
most of the time. And, 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 and the reason why that, that faith, to use a loaded word, is, is valid is because these authorities are functioning in, in a culture that is, in, in the best case, uh, and science really is the best case here, continually purifying itself of error. And it's, it's, it's not being driven by ideology, and it's not being channeled by accidents of birth. You don't have a, a Japanese science and an American science and with nationalism getting in the way. And, and so, so there's, there's, a, there's a process that, that we rely on, and, and both things are true. We rely on authority, and, and, and we don't. So I, I'm fond of pointing out that, you know, I don't have faith. I, don't, I won't use the word to describe this because I think what I have is uh, a, a confidence level, a trust that is, to, to borrow from Hume, proportional to the evidence that supports it. And there are people who would just say, well, you're just, you're, you're, not only are you picking and choosing your experts, but you might be picking and choosing the evidence you want. Is it the case that as, as, as science is the single most consistently reliable tool that we have for discovering things about reality. But we've taught people about the scientific method, which is an inaccurate way of looking at it because there are multiple methods. And we realize that the way we get to new information is by challenging and overthrowing the existing information. And so you get the people who are like, oh, you laugh at me now, but they laughed at Newton or they laughed at you know. mm -hmm. have we Have we constructed um, a system inadvertently uh, where we're going to be constantly fighting this battle and it's just amplified by our current access to massive amounts of, op of opinions and information. Well, it's amplified and also the, the capacity to detect error is also amplified. I mean, I, I, this is just the, the dual effect of the internet, which you know, half of which is perverse. That is, if, if you want to remain a slave to confirmation bias, you can forever, apparently, on the internet. But if you, if you actually want to discover if you're mistaken, you can also do that pretty quickly. So there's also what we see in social media, which all of us make use of it, that the algorithms that you see on Facebook and stuff basically feed you more of what you've already liked. Mm -hmm. And so we're creating bubbles. And there's mountains of concern in this room and everywhere else about the sorts of bubbles that we're creating and how do we start I mean obviously we're not going to go maybe we can go to Mark Zuckerberg could you maybe Richard could go to Mark and say hey let's change these algorithms I think it, this is an interesting point because in, in our wild ancestry in our primitive state we lived in a village 150 or so people and um, we, we met the people we, we, we knew and opinion was just shared within this group of 150 people and now that's broadened out to the whole world, except that in a way it isn't, because as you say, we live in bubbles. And so we each live in our village, but our village is now distributed spatially, geographically, uh, and it's no longer uh, enclosed within, within the village walls. It's, it's, um, it's got a, it's a kind of virtual village, which is, which is interesting. And it's a real discipline. We have to, we have to try shake off the bubble mentality, the village mentality, and reach out to... to um, other circles that we wouldn't normally encounter. And the degree to which we're in bubbles, uh, I mean, I've never appreciated as much as since the 2016 election. Yeah. Uh, this is a point I've made on my podcast a few times, but it just, it, it, I, I find it continually astounding, so I'll, I'll make it again. I realized, I, I had heard that smoking cigarettes in the states, at least, it might still it might be true in the UK as well. But smoking cigarettes in the states correlates with many different variables, uh, and also uh, the communities of, of people who smoke and don't smoke tend to to be quite separable. And I realized that with a shock that Hitch was the last person I knew on Earth who smoked, <laughs> uh, which I mean, which is a measure of just incredible isolation socially. Uh, and it's done, I've done very little to remedy it, I must say. Uh, but it's, um, it, you know, who knows what else, I mean, in fact, we know a little bit about what else segregates with that uh, isolation. And my complete bewilderment that we have uh, President Trump is a symptom of, of that isolation, I think. I, it amuses me because as a former smoker, mm -hmm. uh, I know 
that you're constantly being shoved outside. So you end up outside with a group of other people who are already pissed off that they're having to go outside to smoke. So now they're in this angry headspace and then they begin to share and connect. So maybe smoking doesn't just kill, but smoking creates insular communities that are sharing their anger and vitriol outside the door. Yeah, they're all weighing along the, along the platform, um, along the pavement outside all the shops and all the places, all these there's a long ribbon of the smoking community, this haze of blue smoke. Um, Just to be clear, we're not blaming all the world's problems on smokers or <laughs> Trump uh, on, on smokers. But that, this issue that we're, we're kind of dancing around with, we've kind of moved on to something that I know that each of us repeatedly deals with concepts around free speech and who, is, who should be allowed to talk, not just who should we listen to as an expert, but uh, what kind of things should go on at our universities. Uh, clearly, the free speech laws that I'm used to in the United States are different uh, than, than they are here to some extent. I, and, I, and I don't know because I'm not an expert, uh, but there are places that are outlawing offense, the causing of offense as if not just in the sense of blasphemy, but you know, serious offense. That bothers me almost as much, if not more, than what we're seeing happening in our halls of higher learning. Where do you think we are? How did we get here, and what needs to be done to fix it? You're welcome well, for the fix the entire problem at once question. Well, it, it, I'm a little uncomfortable talking about this in the UK, where you don't have a Bill of Rights. Uh, so we're actually we're in very different situations, or, or importantly different situations in the US and the UK, and your libel laws are, are the inverse of ours. I feel like in the, in the US, we have a, a, a slightly better balance, as frustrating as it is to uh, contemplate suing people for slander and then realizing there's absolutely no way to do that. Whereas here you can you can sue and, and well, the yes, burden is on I, them to I defend themselves. My cost is, um, yes, I, I find for me the issue is not so much about free speech as freedom to listen. And when uh, people are um, denied access to when when they're deplatformed, as I have been, have you been mm. deplatformed? No, so, no. no. Um, it's quite fact, an honor. What's, quite, what's, yeah. what's strange is, uh, and this is you'd think we would have similar experiences here. I've actually never had a heckler. I've only had one. Yeah, so so don't, don't, don't be the first. <laughs> that doesn't count. Yes. I, I've, I've, I've only had one. That was in Oklahoma. Somebody who said, yeah. you are, you've insulted my savior. And uh, yes, I'm sure you have. I was quite keen to engage with him, actually. But yeah. unfortunately, the security people dragged him out. But yeah. I, I was, I, I, I was deplatformed in Berkeley, California, and this hurt me because this, these were, as I thought, my own people. This was KPFA, which is an ultra-liberal radio station in Berkeley, California. When I lived, I lived there for two years, and I love KPFA. I used to be a subscriber. They're subscriber only, mm -hmm. and I, I subscribed to them. And so I felt uh, hurt by that. I didn't think it was a free speech issue, actually. I mean, they're entitled to, it's a radio station. They don't have to have me on. But I did feel it was a freedom to listen. And uh, people had paid to come to an event which I was billed to speak at. And I thought, this comes up again and again in universities. And, and I, I do feel that you know, Berkeley, of all places where the free speech movement started, universities of all places are places where students ought to be exposed to opinions that they disagree with, opinions that they find distasteful or hurtful. And I think it's a betrayal of everything that a university stands for, that people are being deplatformed by students mm. uh, yeah. and prevented from, um, and, and other students are, are prevented from hearing um, what, yeah. what they want to hear. And I'm actually very glad that you made that point. So one of the things that happens is uh, we announce an event like this and somebody's like, oh, there's massive disagreements between these, how did they get on the same stage and blah, blah, blah. 
there were people who would have, been, would have been convinced that you and I had a difference of opinion on this deplatforming thing. And in reality, I think we're almost side by side because my view is a university gets to invite whatever speaker they want. They can disinvite whatever speaker they want. People can go or not go. They can protest or not protest as long as they're doing it peacefully. Uh, it's when they dishonestly go about trying to deplatform somebody. So it's the method that they're using to shut someone down is what I object to more than people exercising their right to listen or, or, or attend an event. And in many cases, we've seen um, the, the people who run the venue have no idea about the nuances and whatever bickering has been going on in the community around this. And they'll get a message from somebody, it happened at a, an event I was at yesterday, oh, you're putting this group, women in danger, by having this speaker here. And as the owners of a venue who have to listen and have to have insurance, this is a tactic that works to get speakers removed when it actually has nothing to do with the content of what they're saying or a fair representation of the conversation that might have been. Yes. I mean, that is exactly what happened in the, in the, in the Berkeley case. That they, they, they were phoned up by, I think, one individual, and, and, they, and they just acted on that. They, you, as you say, they, they feel they have to act. Well, the problem is it does work, uh, and especially when there are security concerns involved. There, uh, you know, I'm in touch with this group, the ex-Muslims of North America, which has been, you know, for reasons easy to parse from the title, uh, have security concerns, and when they try to book an event at a university, they're now finding their events canceled the moment people figure out, you know, who they are. And, and but it, it, it is the, it, you know, they have the legal right to free speech. There's no, you know, there's no law against criticizing Islam, but people have just discovered that it's so inconvenient to incur these security concerns that it, you, you have a de facto loss of that freedom. It, it makes me wonder about, uh, this actually came up in a couple of discussions. I had Mohammed Syed on, on the show mm -hmm. recently, and yesterday I moderated a debate between uh, Faisal and Azra Namani. Um, we, there's a lot of different perceptions about what Islam is and what Islam isn't. If I'd have said that faster, it would have been a good tongue twister. Mm -hmm. you, you would think that if we exercised our moral outrage against problems fairly, that it would not be the ex-Muslims, the ones who are trying to point out the problems, who end up deplatformed. That there would be enough, I, I realize I'm being a little idealistic and, and, and wide-eyed, that there would be enough uh, genuine concern about humanity that we could have conversations on important topics and not be sidelining the people who are actively trying to work to fix the issue because not every ex-Muslim is, is, you know, reactionary. Some of them are reformers or attempting to. Mm. Well, of course. Um, there was a terrible episode in London School of Economics when Mariam Namazi, who is, I suppose, the leading ex-Muslim exponent in this country, uh, was make, having, giving, giving a speech, and she was barracked and heckled and more or less the thing was closed down by a group of Muslims who came and um, I think tore out her microphone, tore out her PowerPoint so she couldn't speak, um, and she courageously soldiered on. But what was truly distressing about that was that the feminist society of LSE came out in favor of these Muslims. Feminism, all people who, should, who you would think would be disgusted by the sorts of way uh, it, women are treated by Islamists. Uh, that, that, I think, was what was truly awful about that episode of, uh, um, at LSE. Yeah, it's, it's, it's a point that people don't tend to notice, but the, the ex-Muslims are actually the most vulnerable and beleaguered community because apostasy, as I'm sure everyone here knows, is thought to be punishable by death under Islam, certainly most interpretations of it. And uh, so here you have a community that is threatened by their, the religious community they've attempted to leave, and many of these people are in the closet, they can't use their real names, and yet this is precisely the, the community that is attacked as Uncle Toms or racists or, or you know, colonious shills by so-called liberal non-Muslims. So it's, they get it from both sides, and they have, they have 
virtually no sanctuary but the, the secular community. This came up yesterday, and because I mentioned reformers, I thought maybe I would toss it out there. You may or may not have a strong view on this. Is there value in encouraging reform of Islam, and, and particularly extremist varieties of Islam? Um, or is that like trying to reform young earth creationists so that we end up with old earth creationists or day age creationists? Is it, is it a better tactic to just continue to demand evidence for bad ideas and expose them? Or, or are we willing to accept a softer, gentler version of Islam? Well, I think, it, I think we can move on both tracks at once. I mean, so my, uh, my friend and collaborator Majid Nawaz is very much on the reform side. And his answer to this is, if you think uh, reform is hard, just imagine trying to get 1.6 billion Muslims to apostatize, which is really the, the alternative. Uh, but obviously some people will apostatize when they're convinced that there is no God or no book could have been revealed by him. Uh, so uh, I think, you, I think you, you can make the argument both ways and, and simultaneously. Yes, I mean, the same argument comes up in the uh, cre creationism d debate. Should we, should we ally ourselves with relatively sensible Christians who, who actually accept evolution? And, or or should, we say, should we say the whole of religion is bunk? Um, and I mean, I, I have c collaborated with bishops in opposing, cre in, in opposing creationism. But on the other hand, I get what Matt is saying. If you, if you, if you encourage the sort of soft, um, wishy-washy Christian who actually accepts evolution but thinks somehow God had something to do with it somewhere along the line. Um, maybe that's more damaging and it's better to come out with all guns blazing against religion altogether. And I've done it both ways and I can't decide uh, which is the best. <laughs> the, uh, the Reverend Barry Lynn is, is the current or former president of Americans United for Church-State Separation. and. We shared a, state at a stage at a Secular Student Alliance event, um, and I, I like him, and we get along, and he's working on behalf of church state separation, so it's great, but we disagree vehemently on whether or not there's a God. And, and so I told him uh, that I have a goal of changing the entire world. I'd like to get rid of bad ideas, including religious ideas, wherever I find them. Uh, but I told him that his soul was safe from me because I want him as the theist supporting church state separation that I can point to. So his will be the last soul that I try to debunk so that we can continue to work together towards a good goal. So if, if it's the case that we can work down multiple tracks, one of the, the things that came up is, do you, I, I talked about intractable minds, the, the ones that may not change. The thing is I can't tell the difference. If there's two people standing in front of me and one of them truly has a mind that will not be moved and the other one um, could be changed, I can't tell which one's which and I'm not necessarily sure that it's true that neither of them can change their mind. So I go with this assumption that their mind can be changed even if it's not by me or not right now. Mm. Uh, and if there's somebody who I can't affect, my goal becomes to try to change the world around them by dealing with the minds that can be changed. In, for, for both of you, when you, you've both had conversations with people who could best be described as brick walls, that, that you might as well have had the conversation on your own rather than to engage with it. What do you take away from that? How do you, is it, does it get discouraging? How do you battle the frustration of the perceived futility in the moment against the, the clear advances that we might be making. Unfortunately, Dan Dennett is one of my brick walls on the topic of free will, uh, and I'm, I'm his. Um, well, I, I think the, the one thing to notice is that, as you say, it's not always about changing someone's mind in the moment. I mean, people tend to like to change their minds in private, uh, and that's, uh, I mean, there's a kind of a, a faith-saving aspect to this, and there's just, you know, a kind of the water on the rock process where you might not be the, the, the final moment that changes their mind, but you're part of a process. Uh, so you, I'm, I'm always impressed, and I think we've talked about this as well, how 
few experience I, experiences I have where it's, it's clear that someone came into a conversation with a very strongly held opinion and by some process of reasoning they at the end of the conversation totally disavow it. I mean, this is, I, can, uh, I think I can count on one hand <laughs> it's, it's the number of times I've seen that happen. Yeah. Uh, but uh, you, know, you and I are, are just inundated with the testimony of people who have changed their minds yeah. on these core issues yeah. through some process and then the process all, often entails reading books or hearing debates or I mean, so it's not it's, it's like watching a you know seeing a supernova go off or something I mean they're going off all the time but we're not we're not seeing them. A few years ago there was a, a talk at one of the atheist conferences by a man whose his talk was called don't be a dick <laughs> and um, he, 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 pro he produced what he thought was an absolute slam dunk argument. He said, how many of you in the audience, if somebody called you an idiot, would change your mind? And of course, nobody would. But I've, I felt that was a very unfair tactic because if I, if, if, if I tell somebody he's, a, he's an idiot, and I don't do quite those words, but if, but if, if it, the effect of what I'm saying is that he is, a, is an idiot, I admit I'm not going to change his mind but if there are a lot of other people listening in, say it's a radio audience, I mean, I've, you've probably done, um, I know you've done um, things where you're talking to one, one person who probably is an idiot, and yet you know that there are, that there are hundreds, thousands of people in the radio audience lis listening in. Yep. You haven't changed the mind of the idiot, but you've probably changed the minds of all the other people who are listening yeah. at the same time. And so this... <laughs> it's, per it's precisely the situation that, that I deal with both on the atheist experience and off. I'm not necessarily trying to change the caller's mind, although I'm happy for that to happen. I'm having the conversation for all the people out there who agree. Who would have used those same arguments? Because we know that on some occasions, if you can be shown to be wrong, People will sometimes double down, especially if they've made a public profession mm -hmm. on behalf of something. This just becomes flat denial. But we also know that through, I don't, I don't want to go down the mirror neuron route because you'll probably correct me. Uh, but at least with respect to empathy, if you see someone presenting your arguments and they are uh, humiliating themselves, not just, you know, I'm not necessarily humiliating, they're humiliating themselves. This affects that individual who's watching in a way almost as if it had happened to them and that they, yet they have the safety of not having been on public hum yeah. humiliated. Yeah. Yeah, I, I might be wired differently here, but I, I have a different reaction to being called an idiot. If there's a... I don't think uh, you're ever called an idiot. So. Well, no, no, I mean, well, <laughs> virtually so. Uh, no, I'm, uh, well, if the per... If, I guess the source is relevant, but if, if the source is someone who you find credible on other topics, and that source tells you you're wrong on topic X, uh, that becomes very interesting to me. You know, if, if Steve Pinker calls me an idiot, I'm very interested. And so, and, and, and the offense really has nothing to do with it at that point. So it is, I guess it's more of a sourcing issue because you know, the, the people who tend to call you an idiot are usually disconfirm their, their authority. When, when, I was, when I was an undergraduate, I, I, was, I read The Phenomenon of Man by Pierre Teilhard de Chardin, and I was completely taken in by it. I thought it was wonderful. Mm. Uh, and then um, I read Peter Medawa's review of yeah. this book. Recommend, it's the, the finest negative book review ever written. Um, <laughs> read it. Um, and I finished this review and I said, I'm an idiot. I was, yeah. I was completely that's, fooled by, by that's that's that idea. moment of awakening. I've talked before, it's not so much being wrong that affects people because you think you're right. So it's, you know, it's not like anything to feel that you're wrong. It's the discovery that you're wrong that is sort of the testament of your character. Because for me, finding out that I was wrong is, 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 is joyous, not that I was wrong, but that I don't have to continue being wrong, mm, yeah. that, that I've made this actual discovery. And there are, you know, people who will write in will say, oh, Matt's wonderful on religion, but terrible on topic X. And without too much exaggeration, I could probably pull up 100 emails, and all of them disagree on what X is. Matt's right about everything except X. 
I want to get all of them together in a room so they can argue with each other because the, every one of those X's is covered by somebody else. You might be wrong about everything. I, I am. <laughs> That's just compatible with the data. At, le at least I can't show that I'm not. Uh, I, well, it's, it's interesting psychologically that I mean, we all have this experience of being proven wrong, and that's interesting. But I'm more interested in what we do with this sneaking feeling that we might be wrong. I mean, that's the, psychologically and culturally, that's that is a, a far more well-subscribed state of mind, and it's I think very consequential uh, because well, obviously when you're you're unequivocally wrong. Well then, you know, you know, I guess some people manage to ignore this, but uh, it's that's there's not a lot to, to do. To, I think I just lost. Oh, there we are. There we go. Um, but most of us, most of the time, live with opinions that are not so well vetted, you know, and and it's I think it's good to be skeptical of of thoughts that come out of your mouth or, or hit the page or you find yourself affirming which, which uh, you know, if, if suddenly a, a very smart expert in the relevant area stood before you and said, well, have you really thought that through? You know, if you break out into a cold sweat at that point, it, it's worth sort of calibrating your, your conviction on those points, I think. I, uh, I think there's a phrase that I've heard over and over that feeds right into that exact moment. Because theists' arguments, or at least the ones that I deal with on the show frequently, there's almost a script. And my job or my goal most of the time is to get them off the script because I care more about getting them to think about it rather than parroting what they heard from some apologist. And when you start getting them off the script, it seems to me the most common reaction to that, which may be them mulling over the possibility that they could be wrong, is to just say, oh, that was a trick question. There's a, there's a defense mechanism there, as if there's, I don't, and I'm not even sure what a trick question is. I asked you, you know, okay, please explain what you believe and why. What was tricky about that? And yet this seems to be perhaps a defense mechanism that creeps in at those times. If we, I don't know how many others, uh, how many more defense mechanisms, mechanisms like that we might find, uh, but I'm constantly looking for ways to combat them, constantly looking for ways to have a better, discussion. Doesn't mean I'm going to have a good discussion with every single person, but if we see these same trends over and over, how, how do we, or maybe there's no answer, but shouldn't we try to identify those trends in the actual thought processes and attack those perhaps more than the facts surrounding the, the underlying belief? Yeah, it's more about process than about facts, because the facts change and your I mean, there's, there's always new ones coming in, and so it's, it's the process by which you are vetting your opinions that I think is, is crucial, and I think it's, it's useful to ask yourself, and it's useful to ask someone you're arguing with, what would have to be true of the world for you to admit that you're wrong? Yeah. Like, like what would, how, in what sense is your view on this topic falsifiable? Uh, and often there's no answer to that. You know, often that there's, often there was, and in, especially in the case of religion, you, you'll get people who actually sign on this dotted line, they'll say, you know, the, 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 there's absolutely nothing in the world of my experience that could change that would falsify my belief in Jesus, say. And if, and if that's true, well then, that's proof positive that it's actually not based on any engagement with, with the, the world of your experience. Although what I'll hear sometimes, the people who will do that have true and unfalsifiable position, but they'll go then to personal experience. For example, Ray Comfort will tell you there's no way you could prove to him that Jesus doesn't exist because he's as real to Ray as his wife. And even when I tried to point out, you can introduce me to your wife and I can you know, meet her and talk to her, right? You can't do that. It doesn't phase. And when I, not to continually use my mother as an example, sorry, mom, not that she'll ever freaking see this. But she, she will say uh, she doesn't care about the Bible. She doesn't, or what she, I mean, she does, but she doesn't care if you can point out problems with it. Doesn't care about philosophical arguments. Doesn't care about the logical arguments. She sees Jesus working in her life every day. And even if I were to try to go down the route of, I'm willing to accept that you have experiences that you are claiming 
and attributing to Jesus, I, I just wonder what the justification is for that. That has no impact on her. It may be me, that I, I should never have these conversations with my mom. Mm. Uh, but that's the path that it often goes down when, when they start seeing this, this doubt mechanism coming in of, oh, no, no, it couldn't be true because of this, of this experience that I have. As skeptics, as critical thinkers, I, I would, I don't know, in much the same way that I, I talked about perhaps not addressing the facts as much as the mechanisms, I think there's a, a value for a campaign to teach people to stop being so confident about their interpretation of their personal experiences. Because all of those seem to be an argument from ignorance. I, I experienced this, I have no explanation for it, therefore it must be God, or therefore it's a ghost, or therefore this pill worked, or this whatever worked. Yeah, well, uh, that, 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 yeah. You know, I, I think, I have to confess that if I'm asked what it would take to falsify my non-belief in God, or what it would take to convince me of anything supernatural, I find it very hard. I used to think it'd be easy. You just, you just, you know, God would appear in clouds and, and, and chariots of fire and things. Well, that's a start, but, isn't it? I used, I used to think that, but, but I, I mean, I've seen so many good conjuring tricks and, and, and uh, where, where, where you absolutely swear blind it's supernatural, mm. um, and yet we, we know it's a trick. Um, I suppose if, if, if Jesus came down in a chariot from a cloud, that would do it for me, but um, I, 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 want, I want that piece of video excerpted and put on YouTube. <laughs> um, I, I still think, actually, a more plausible explanation than anything supernatural is natural we don't yet understand, and so a, 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 a trick wrought by an alien civilization that we don't know about yet or something is actually as implausible as it is. It is more plausible than the laws of physics have been violated, which is what we're kind of talking about when we talk about. Yeah, this, this issue, is, you and I uh, discussed this in Vancouver and Lawrence Krauss and I did as well, because quite often people will say, ah, well, what would it take to change your mind about whether or not there's a God? And I, I, I used to give fairly glib answers of Jesus coming down from the clouds and whatever, and I realized that what you were just talking about, so my answer changed. I have no idea what would convince me that a God exists, but if there's a God, he should absolutely know what should convince me. Yeah. And he hasn't done that, which means he either doesn't exist or doesn't want me to know he exists. Either way, it's not my problem. Yeah. I, I want to, we're, we're going to keep talking. I want to give people the opportunity to, to start. Don't make a mad rush, but you can start lining up for questions at us. But I, I had some for Richard that we both kind of talked about earlier because it came in. Um, Sam had tweeted out, hey, what, what do you want us to talk about? And one of them that came in, which I have virtually no input or, or thoughts on, is the future of human evolution, what we might see in the future. Um, both that, from I guarantee that will come up from the audience. It always I, I, does. I, I'm, pro I'm preempting it so that those people don't have to walk up to the microphone and we can talk about that in the interim. Okay. <laughs> well, if you're talking about uh, a real major evolutionary change comparable to, say, the increase in size of the human brain that's happened over the last three million years. Uh, if you look three million years into the, into the future, would you expect the brain to have sort of ballooned out like the Mekon? Um, and the answer is yes, only if the selection pressure in favor of braininess is maintained. There must have been, uh, during the past three million years since Australopithecus, um, there must have been a selection pressure such that the brainiest individuals survived better and had the most children. Is it the case in our world today that the brainiest individuals... <laughs> okay. Mm -hmm. Enough on that. Um, I suppose you could, you could imagine that if we colonize distant planets, uh, maybe even Mars, such that there's very little gene flow between the home planet and the colony living in greenhouses in, on Mars, 
that you might expect to get some interesting evolutionary change due to the reduced gravitational field, more spindly legs, um, mm. a, a more sort of spider-like form of the human body rather than the rhinoceros-like form that you would get if you were colonizing a planet with a very much stronger gravitational field. Um, but the trouble is really that in our world today, uh, reproductive success is so, or survival indeed, is so much cushioned by the civilized conditions under which we live that it's almost impossible to say that there will be a consistent selection pressure in any particular direction. Um, I've, I've sometimes jokingly, on the many, many occasions when I've been asked this question, um, I've sometimes jokingly suggested that uh, a, a large number of people are probably born because their parents were incompetent at the use of contraceptives. Yeah. <laughs> That's the wrong selection pressure. And therefore, it, it, therefore, if, if this in, incompetence sort of fumbling with, with, with the with <laughs> you, you might expect future generations to be more and more incompetent in this. We'll, we'll forget how to make latex entirely. That, 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 that kind of thing. But, but I mean, but that, that's really an absurd example to, to illustrate the, the point that since we live in conditions when, well, in particular case, what it takes to be incompetent is going to change by the, by the decade, let alone by the, by the millennium, let alone by the million years. So in a million years' time, uh, conditions will be so different because of civilization, conditions will be so different if we're still around at all, which is a moot point. Um, that, that it's unlikely that any selection pressure that's going on now will sure. still be recognizable then. And so, and so I would not even begin to make a forecast as to what's going to happen. So let me throw on my quasi-creationist beanie. And instead of speculating about perhaps features or what might happen, uh, because they try to make a distinction between species and kind, whatever, uh, what time frame, let's say we, we, we colonize Mars and now there's no more interbreeding, what kind of time scale are we looking at to where we might be seen as completely different species, independent? That means the time scale until the point where we can no longer interbreed, yes. Um, well, it, it, it could be as, as quick as 10,000 years, I suppose. What's the time scale for no longer wanting to interbreed? <laughs> Surely, that's measured here. Yeah. Yes, yes. Actually, no. That would, would, isn't it it, it's the opposite problem. lesson based yeah, on what the, we we yeah. apparently did with the Neanderthals, or they did with us? Yes. Well, yeah. we 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 now know that we did interbreed with them. Yes. Yeah. Uh, well, Richard, just to follow on that, what are your thoughts about the the artificial evolution of of engineering our genomes to be? That's also different. guaranteed to come yeah, up. Yeah, but, uh, <laughs> um, we might as well do it here. Yeah. I, I don't have any great... I mean, it's, 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 I think it's both an exciting and a, and a frightening possibility. Um, if, you, uh, if you had to guess the, the, about the time course of this, well, what do you, what, when do you think it will I, I t really tell you one thing. Common? I mean, we, we've been manipulating evolution in agricultural animals and plants for thousands of years and we produced dramatic changes in cabbages, in dogs, in cows, in pigs. Um, I mean, when you think that a Pekingese is a wolf, uh, and, and we've been doing that by, by the selection part of the Darwinian equation. Um, we're now talking about the mutation part of the Darwinian equation, about actually manipulating the genes. Um, we have, during all those thousands of years, we have never changed humans in the way that we've changed dogs and cabbages and, and, and horses. Um, so in a way you might say, well, since we haven't done it by the easy way, which is selection, why would we suddenly imagine that we might start doing it by the hard way, which is genetic manipulation? Maybe we will. You don't think the hard way is gonna become the easy way fairly quickly? It could be, yeah, it could be. Are, are you, is there an implication there that there are certain genetic pathways that are more amenable to change uh, that maybe how rigid of a path uh, have humans become? What, what, 
are we just assuming that we can manipulate things and implement changes? Maybe we're in a rigid structure where we can't, couldn't possibly do the same thing that we do with dogs. No, I mean, I think, I think it, 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 as Sam says, I, I think it, it will become easier. And um, then, then society is going to have to decide what, what to, to do about that. Mm. So on that note, I, I'm going to have them bring the house lights up so that we can see the people who are waiting for questions. And uh, just for clarity, I'm the asshole. By that, uh, I think we're all aware that questions in, in a question mark and don't begin with your life story or, or your dissertation or anything like that. Um, and to spare either of them any public embarrassment, if you've gone on too long, I can go back to Austin and London can hate me if I cut somebody off a little too quickly. Uh, but we, we want to take questions and just remember there's a lot of people lined up. I, I think we'll, if we can get the house lights up, we'll start over here off to my right. And, and by the way, sorry, I'm good at interrupting. I do it on this show all the time. Uh, you can say your name if you want to, but if you have a question specifically for one of us, please say so because we're going to avoid all three of us answering everything so that we go on all night. Right. And could right. we please have the house lights up? Yeah, I, I just want to say that I'm really thankful that you had already addressed the question of what would change your mind because I had a dilemma which question to ask coming in. Um, I consider myself agnostic, and my question is uh, regarding the future of agnosticism and atheism and this whole difference. I myself, however, have never read the Bible, nor the Quran, nor any other religious text that uh, says, uh, claims a lot of, uh, has very scientific, unscientific claims in it. But I, I also know a lot of religious people who believe all these crazy claims, who have never read the texts. So my question is, does one really need to have read those texts uh, to be in one or the other category? And what do you think will happen in the future when we have virtual reality and crazy entertainment which would make people less likely to read the, the books that sounds like what was 100 or 1,000 years ago? Okay, that, that's two questions that may not necessarily be in the same. Who, who wants this? Well, well, do, do you need to read the holy yeah, books? No, I mean, clearly people are getting their religious worldview from more than just the books. And there are, as you say, there are people who might even be fundamentalist in their religion who are, are pretty unschooled in what is actually in the text because they're getting it in church or, or synagogue or mosque. Uh, I think it's in the U.S., you might know this better than I do, but it's something like 50% of the population can't say who delivered the Sermon on the Mount. Uh, that's impressive in a country where 83% are sure that Jesus rose from the dead and will be coming back to earth. So uh, there's, a, there's a mismatch there. But I, I think it's, it, it's useful to read the books because it's not, so much what's, it's not so, so much all the bad things that are in the books, from my point of view. It's all the good things that aren't in the books that an omniscient being definitely would have put in there. I mean, that's, that's the deal breaker as far as uh, the, 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 the credence given to the claims of, of revelation. It would be so easy to write a better book than any of these books, especially if you were omniscient. And there's just, there's nothing in there that demands uh, an omniscient God as, as author. Yes, I, I was going to say um, the, 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 the best cure for religion would be to read the holy books. But, but, um, but Sam kind of preempted that. Um, Turn. And, to, and, to, um, and, and, ju and just to, to cap the, the, the story about the Sermon on the, on the Mount, uh, my British foundation, British, uh, the Richard Dawkins Foundation for Reason and Science, did a survey uh, of in 2011, immediately after the census, the week after the census, we took just the people who ticked the Christian box in the what is your religion. So these are people who self-identify as Christian. And, among the, and we gave a, a, an, a, an opinion poll for these people. And among the questions was, can you name the first book of the New Testament? And we only gave a choice of four, Matthew, Acts, Genesis, and Psalms. I think only uh, somewhere in around 30%, I was 39% of the, 
of the people who ticked the Christian box were able to identify Matthew as the f first book of the New mm -hmm. Testament. Um, so they don't read the Bible, and I think it actually would be rather a good idea if, if they did. Hey, so, so first of all, thank you. Um, my question's for Sam. I, uh, I voted leave in the Brexit referendum. <laughs> given... <laughs> thank you very much. <laughs> But given your uh, friendship with both Richard and um, Douglas Murray, hmm. if you'd had the vote, which way would you have voted? Uh, I guess I, I get, well, does that, my brain has to segment in two there. Um, I, I really have to plead ignorance here. I, I, I have a- Exactly, uh, on, exactly. No, no, Wait, no, 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 no. Uh, <laughs> If you so, had to, if can, you had to. Can I ask the, 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 the question, do you have a degree in economics? Uh, no, I don't, but I, no. but I trust people like Douglas Murray, who I think is a genius. So I yeah, well, I, I, I am an immense fan of Douglas's, and, and he may even be here tonight. Um, I, um, I, I have to plead ignorance on this point. I really don't, I'm, I don't consider myself informed enough to know what the likely consequences were at the time of the vote. I mean, what, what a, a truly intelligent person and well-informed person would have thought at the time of the vote, but um, nor do I know where it's all going. But I, I have a bias, which is that an integration of our world is, a, is a, a, generally speaking, a good thing. Uh, and a... A, a populist backlash against integration is a sign of, of good things not happening. Uh, and, the, and so we, we, when you think about the, the solutions, the likely solutions to, to problems that exist at a global scale, I think those are, are almost certainly, this is almost a tautology, those are almost like, uh, guaranteed to be global solutions. And if we can't if we can't integrate enough to, to actually execute on global solutions in a, in a timely way, that, that's going to be a disaster for us. So I think my bias is definitely toward, toward integration. And so, I, I, again, I, don't, I can't say that I know Brexit is the, the death knell of civilization. But, um, <laughs> you know, just if I had to toss a coin, I, I would, it would probably come up on the side of, of uh, being, being worried by, by that trend. So. Thank you very much. Mangle a metaphor. Yeah. Hello, uh, my name is Andre. Thank you very much for being here, Sam. I'm a, I'm a big fan. A uh, question for you, for Sam. For Sam. Um, we are nine months in from Trump presidency. Don't you miss the days when the biggest issue was creationism, not so much tribalism, social justice, and so on? And what should it be if the next presidency would be Hillary Clinton? Uh, to do in order to change those voters, that those voters should not vote for Trump again. What should that president do for those voters? Did, did you just suggest that the next president might be Hillary Clinton? No, <laughs> like, uh, like the Democratic Party, I mean. Oh, um, what, are the, what do the Democrats need to do to yeah. avoid Yeah, there, there, there are a few things more impossible than that the, the Hillary Clinton might be president. <laughs> uh, uh, I, I, I don't, I'm not sure I understand the question enough to, to satisfy you. I, I, I think I, we, we need to, clearly, we have a problem on the left. I mean, there's a, kind of, there's a, there's a tendency for, toward a, a swing into what's now being described as a, a kind of authoritarian left uh, in liberal circles. Uh, and an intolerance of free speech is, is, is the most salient symptom there on, on college campuses. Uh, and that. It, definitely worries me because it's, that's precisely what is not going to give us an answer to, to populism and authoritarianism, authoritarianism on the right. Uh, it's not, you know, Trump, uh, Trump wins, uh, has every advantage in his response to that kind of irrationality on the left. So if you want to, to amplify Trump's power, uh, and you want to, to give further voice to the, to the most odious people who celebrate his power, what you should do on the left is become absolutely focused on identity politics and 
uh, this, this species of, of leftist unreason we're seeing. So I, I think we, we need something that at one point I call the new center. Uh, the, the, this, this phrase has, uh, has exactly no traction. But <laughs> it's not an accident that the right answer to many questions and the right, the right answer to just how you have a rational political process of compromise is rarely at the extremes politically, and, and so I think we have to find something that is animating about, about not being an ideologue on the left or the right. Uh, if I may interject, just a, a second question for uh, Richard, please. Well, do you, well we should probably oh, go one at a time, to yeah. be fair. And, and actually, it, it, to spin off of something that Sam said, and I don't know that this is a significant point of disagreement, um, I'm definitely on the left. I don't think that'll surprise anybody. However, I've also been attacked by people on the left. And among some of my friends who raise legitimate criticisms about the manner in which some people on the left are engaging or encouraging disengagement, they move to a new center, or let's define this. I don't do that. Um, I stay on the left, I'm clearly on the left, and then I point out all the crap that's wrong on the left. I spend as much time probably addressing irrationality and, and dishonest argument from the left as I ever would on the right. And the same thing applies with regard to religion. Uh, dealing with theistic arguments after 13 and a half years of doing the show, it's trivial. It, it, it's almost boring if I didn't make a game out of it, which we can talk about another time. But I find myself engaging with other atheists, other skeptics, other secularists because I hate bad arguments, but I hate them most when they're coming from the people who are ostensibly part of my group or yeah. agree with me on the issue. I don't want lack of belief in God to be so poorly argued for that we're providing ammunition to the opposition. And I can be opposed to fascists and opposed to Antifa and not think they're the exact same thing or just like I can be opposed to cancer and athlete's foot and, and not... But, but the thing is, if, if the people with the truly bad ideas that are terrible for the world, objectively terrible for the world, are working within the bounds of the law and are less likely to cross boundaries of reason than those in opposition are, who are engaged in hyperbole and zero nuance, and if you are not absolutely in agreement with me, you are the end of the world. I've been called a Nazi sympathizer just for suggesting that maybe I shouldn't run around and punching people that I disagree with. That was enough. So, but I'd rather stay on the left and point out the problems on the left rather than trying to create a new center, which I would still think would be defined as like old left. That new center is old left. Yeah. Hi there. Um, first, I just want to say thank you, um, Richard and Sam. Your books and your videos have been talked about enough flat for years. Um, I had to write an essay on something which society um, considers taboo or disgusting, anything I wanted to kind of write about, and I had to try and justify it. And what I was kind of came up with is um, the topic of incest. Society thinks it's disgusting, it's weird, it's odd. Um, so this is my question, really, and I talked about this in my essay. Two sisters. <laughs> you see, it's an odd subject. People, Is this a penthouse letter? You've got our attention. <laughs> it's an odd subject. People automatically think it's disgusting. But two sisters, they're in love. You're they're off to a good start. Uh, yeah. Well, I'm hoping you'll talk about this and not also say it's disgusting. But um, two sisters, they can't produce children which are disabled, they're in love, and they're not harming anyone. So my question is, apart from saying it's disgusting, weird, and therefore wrong, can you give one good reason? as to why two people are in love and not harming people shouldn't be together. Just one good reason that's not, it's disgusting, just like people said against homosexuals. Okay. It, yeah, it, it's, it's, a, it's a very clever device to, to make it two sisters. I think that's brilliant. Uh, because, um, and I think that this, this beautifully points up the difference between absolutist morality, where you just say it's disgusting, the yuck factor, um, and um, utilitarian or consequentialist morality. Um, I think you're absolutely right. I can see no reason at all why, uh, why the, these two sisters shouldn't, shouldn't marry if they, if they want to. So, <laughs> it's another or, great or clip. If they, 
I suppose if... Yeah, no, I think, I think that, that stands, yeah. That's, uh, that's going to be great on YouTube, Richard. <laughs> we um, could make it better by just agreeing with him. Well, I, uh, one, one thing I, I would add here is that disgust as a moral emotion is... is obviously, this is part of our evolutionary inheritance, but it is a very bad machine for, for producing moral wisdom and, and, and what is disgusting in one context or in one you know, cultural context is uh, often not in another and I, you know, I'm not, uh, I, I think there is a, a truly universal way of solving the question of how to maximize human well-being. Uh, as it's, not, it's not even to say that there are, there's only one right answer, there, but there, there's certainly wrong answers. There can be many right answers and there's certainly many wrong answers. And they're wrong not just for you and me and everyone in this room, they're wrong for everybody. You know, cutting the head off your child is a bad way to raise that child to be a, a functional adult. Uh, and so that's one wrong answer number one. Uh, but this, this issue of, of uh, incest, in, in this case, I mean, this is a thought experiment that, that the psychologist Jonathan Haidt has, has used to great effect to produce a phenomenon that he calls moral dumbfounding, where he'll ask, he'll, he'll, he'll produce an example like that, and he'll ask people whether it's right or wrong, and they, they'll have a very strong disgust-based sense that it's wrong, but then when told to give a, a rationale for why it's wrong, they, they basically come up with a, this, this very lawyerly opinion that, that is just a, it's a kind of confabulation. You know, it doesn't, really, it doesn't really intersect with any kind of moral philosophy. Uh, I think the, the one, other, one other consequentialist point I, I, I would make is that uh, in the local case, it might inf well be not wrong for two people who can't have kids and can't suffer in any way to be you know, prosecuting their, their taboo love for one another. Uh, but there's, I think par part of the consequences are the, just what happens to society, what happens to other relationships, what happens, I mean, there's a, you're, you're in dialogue, you're not in a moral solitude, usually, with your behavior. And um, so, I mean, another example is, you know, why, when someone dies, why don't we just chuck their body in the garbage, right? I mean, so it's all the same to them. There, there's, you know, there's no one to suffer that desecration. But that the point of treating a dead body well is because of all the good it does for the living. Right, the, the way it honors our relationship with the people we're, we, we still uh, love and, and, and have spent our lives connected to. So, some, and, and some... not just the people in their life, but that individual as well. This, this question's come up to me. Yeah. Sam and I advocate for very almost identical versions of consequentialism. Uh, if you live in a society where you know that there's a likelihood that your body's just going to be thrown in the trash, or that your organs are going to be farmed out and this isn't what you want, you have a particular view. This diminishes the quality of your life while you're living. If you live in a society where you understand that we're going to respect the wishes of people after they're dead, this increases the, the, the well-being of your life while you're living. That is in, not inconsequential. That's something that you have to consider. It's yeah. not just about the other people in their life. It's about the quality of your life leading up to the, your death. If, if you were living in Logan's Run and you knew the secret, Oh, sorry, spoiler, they're, they're going to be killed. It, it would change how you lived those years prior to that. And that's, we, we tend to, uh, consequentialists come under fire um, by people who, from my point of view, seem to only be able to look at things myopically as, oh, this is how it affects me right now. And, and like in your example, I don't have any objection to your example, but I'm in agreement with Sam that there may be extenuating circumstances in the complexities of a society that might make it not a good idea. To and slippery sure. slope arguments can be perfect, perfectly good as well. I mean, yeah. The argument against eating human road kills um, would be um, a, a, where, where there's nobody to mourn them. Um, there's probably an argument about, against using the phrase even, I would think. That, <laughs> <laughs> um, it, it, I mean, uh, slip, slippery slope, we have a very good taboo against, against, against cannibalism. Yeah. In the case of the taboo against incest, I, I was about to say, I remember I stopped myself, maybe there's a slippery slope, but I can't actually think of it in that case. Um, I can't think of this case of two sisters marrying, 
what the slippery slope would look like. I think Matt just gave it. If, if behind every closed door there might be two sisters having sex, that would diminish our quality of life while alive. <laughs> I'm not quite sure that's what I said, but I'll go with it. There, 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 is, a, there is a slippery slope. I mean, if you allow two sisters, then what? you kind of have, then you get mother and son arguing for it, and of course that's not right. Sure, yeah. but we're not going to spend the rest of the night going down that slippery slope. I, <laughs> I thank you for your question. Thank you. And I want to move over to the side. Thanks for waiting while we talked about all kinds of stuff. Good, Good evening. Um, paraphrasing uh, Lawrence Krauss, science is changing the playing field in a way which makes people uncomfortable. And you gentlemen are three prime examples of this ever accelerating trend. So Richard Dawkins says we are survival machines meant to propagate uh, genes in the gene pool. Um, Sam Harris says there's the self is an illusion and there might not be free will. And Matt Delahunty says there's no God. The um, universe doesn't have, the, have a purpose and doesn't owe you anything. How do we address this discomfort and nihilistic views that some people might have when transitioning out of religions or dogma and maybe you have sometimes this this thoughts and how do you fend them off thank you i'm glad you asked this uh yeah. i i don't know how well you paraphrase any of the three of us because we're all going to nitpick this but this this issue of meaning was something that we talked about that we wanted to address tonight issues about death and, and nihilism and the fears of oh my gosh you you are insignificant to the universe how can we better deal with those well, we might, might have slightly different answers to this, but I, I think it's worth acknowledging that, that it really is a problem. I, I mean, the, way, the way I view secularism, it, secularism and, and even atheism specifically, these are not answers to the problem of living a good life. And, and, that, and that is a problem every one of us wake up in the morning trying to solve. I mean, you, you have to... Uh, you have to find some game to play in this life that is satisfying. And it's a genuine question, you know, how to get what you want out of life. And there's a deeper question of, about whether or not you want the right things, right? Is there a deeper game to be playing that you're not aware of or you haven't learned how to play? Uh, and I think, there, I think there are right answers to those questions. There, there, it's possible to not know what you're missing. It's possible that you are in a circumstance where your life could be much better than it is, but it's not going to be that way because you're tending to live as you did yesterday. And the problem with secularism and atheism and even humanism is that these really aren't answers to that question. These are just ways of clearing away the bad answers offered by religion. And the, 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 the religious answers are bad for many reasons, but they're, but they're bad because in, in, in their substantive particulars, they're, they're almost certainly untrue, but they're also, there's a, there's a, a diversity of religious answers which are, are, are in zero-sum contest with all others, and therefore they're divisive, and they're, they you know, amplify the tribalism we see in the world. So uh, this problem of how to live a good life is a real one, and into that space cleared by secularism and atheism and, and the, the, the criticism of ancient bad ideas has to come something. And for, for some people it's science, for some people it's art, for some people it's, it's uh, some secular version of, of you know, what I've in terror and, and shame and in scare quotes called spirituality. Uh, but the, you need something, and most people on earth are living as though there's, there's um, either there's no basis to find something apart from religion, uh, or having lost religion, they're, they're living as though the answer is just to be eating a little less sugar than the average person your age, and watching a little less pornography than the average person your age, and trying to be responsible and well-educated, and there's, there is nothing sacred or profound left. Uh, and I think that's, that is a real deficit of, of the secular conversation, and I think we need, we need a, a secular version of profundity that, uh, again, this is a place where we may, may differ. I, th I don't think science and art and fun 
fully capture what we want in life. There's something else. The particular, the particular example, the question that threw at me was my view that we are survival machines for our, for our genes, which many people think is bleak, and Sam's view that we have no free will is, is, is bleak. I think there's a nobility in that bleakness. Uh, I, I'm inclined to say, if somebody says to me, oh, well, somebody did say to me, actually, after The Selfish Gene was published, um, that he couldn't sleep for three nights uh, after after he read it. Um, and uh, another man told me that uh, was a Canadian professor said that uh, a young woman student of his came in to him in tears having read The Selfish Gene because it made her feel that her life was, was meaningless. Um, I mean, my inclination there is to say, well, tough. Um, <laughs> maybe your life... Maybe your life is meaningless, but <laughs> you need to change the way you look at your life because, the, because what's true can't be changed. I'm reminded of the 18th century wit, I forget who it was, who a, a lady said, I accept the universe. And he said, by gad, she'd better. That was one of my sort of first first reaction, but actually accepting the universe, accepting the truth of the universe, accepting the truth about life, bleak as it may be, there is a nobility. You, you stand up and face into the keen wind of the truth, and I think that is a, a noble and a, an actually aesthetically pleasing thing to do anyway. So I don't want to hide from the truth. I think that the, that the truth can be hard, but there is nobility in accepting it. And I think Darwin, I mean, that's somewhat the meaning of Darwin's famous closing words of the origin of species. Um, there is a grandeur in this view of life. Uh, so I think that uh, maybe I differ slightly from Sam on, the, on that. Oh. Yeah. I, well, I, I, would, I would just add that there's nothing unscientific in what I would propose no. We need to honor the, no, the profundity true. of our circumstance. Sure. I, I, it's not that you have to believe anything on insufficient no, evidence, yeah. but I just feel like there, there's more to, to a rich human experience than merely not being wrong, of course, or not or, or having correct you know propositional knowledge of the world. And I, I, mean, I know obviously you share that view. And it may not be one answer for everybody. I, I tend to look at it, by the way, as uh, religions. I think, by and large, have come from flawed thinking trying to answer the questions about reality, including about our fears and death and life and what's, what's the meaning and purpose. And because of this, and because they've become so pervasive, they have absolutely infused every conversation. Even if you're not a religious individual, you're surrounded by people and, and they've passed on as memes to, to address, oh, well, you can't have meaning unless it's this type of meaning that is encapsulated within religion, when there may be other meaning that's valuable. Oh, we, we by, by poisoning the well with religious ideas of the way things ought to be, it, it seems to increase this frustration when we find out things don't work the way religion thinks they ought to be. And it's the example I heard somebody say once that um, religion poisons you and then offers you the cure, and I, I changed that to say that religion convinces you you're poisoned when you're not and then offers you the homeopathic remedy. <laughs> And instead of going down that route, it's going to be difficult to take people who have had these ideas that everything, where the, the entire conversation has been colored by religious claims about the way things ought to be, uh, it's going to take work. And that's why I hear from people who've been atheists for 50 years and wake up with nightmares of hell or frustrations about nihilism. And I would say, I'm sure we'll get into this at some point, maybe not tonight, but uh, Dennett would point out that the conversations around free will have been similarly poisoned by the things that we want about free will, uh, that we want to have moral responsibility. And I don't, I don't think that free will in any libertarian sense is required for that in the first place, nor do I think it exists. So I'm, I'm kind of in the middle ground on that, and I don't want to go down that path since we all answered this one, but we'll... Yes, sir. Hi, um, this is a question for Sam. You're all 
talking earlier about authority in science and in social media, who to trust. Um, I was wondering who you thought had more authority in general when it came to metaphysics, an expert scientist or an expert philosopher? Um, well, it's, it depends what you mean by metaphysics. People use this word in a wide variety of ways. Can you, can you um, unpack that? I guess the reflection on physics as a whole. So would, would someone who had first-hand experience with experiments and stuff as a physicist have some sort of greater authority in that regard? Well, it's not really a matter of uh, granting authority to any one discipline over another, any, or one person over another in, in any kind of generic sense. I mean, if, uh, the person who has the most authority for me is the person who's making sense at that moment. You know, so, so, and the moment, the, the, even the greatest authority stops making sense, right? He, he or she's got about two sentences to solve that problem before my faith in their view of, of, of at least that topic begins to erode. So you're sort of as good as your last sentence in this game. Uh, and that's, and that's, a, um, that's what makes it thrilling to actually have public conversations with people uh, who are smart and uh, who, who have a lot of knowledge to bring to bear on, on a topic. Um, as far as the contributions of philosophy, I'm not somebody, I mean, I said something that was fairly, that was read as fairly denigrating of philosophy in the moral landscape, but it actually, I, it was misinterpreted, and uh, I'm a huge uh, fan of philosophy. I don't think philosophy is going away, and insofar as we're making an effort to resolve conceptual confusion in our science, you know, that, 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 that's always going to be the work of philosophy, whether it's done by scientists or philosophers in each mo moment. And, uh, you know, metaphysics in the, in the philosophical sense is, is often working in the background of any kind of uh, uh, assertion about our beliefs being in, in register with reality when we're, when we're doing science. So I mean, the, the, the work of a philosopher is, is always there to be done. Point, ooh, I lost my mic there. Yeah. I wanted to point out we've got about 15 minutes of questioning left, and as a reminder, there'll be book signing up there for those people who are part of that. But uh, so I will do my part to, to keep my answers uh, maybe even non-existent, but at least brief, and and we'll try and do the same by keeping questions short so we can get to as many people as possible. Yeah, I'll, I'll give you an easy one. I just wanted to bring up the animal issue. I'm not like a militant vegan or anything, but. Um, Richard and Sam, you've both interviewed Peter Singer, who's somebody who intuitively I sort of not sure about, and then I find myself really unable to sort of disprove or uh, things which he say seem quite logically sort of consistent. And I was just wondering, talking about brick walls earlier, uh, are we all brick walls on this topic? Why are we sort of why is society so stuck, and where do you see it sort of going forward from here on this issue? Specifically on the food issue, or. Um, well, this particular question comes from an argument I had over foie gras, which I guess is quite oh, yeah. well, you an are, extreme case. You <laughs> so, are a hard case. Yeah, yeah. But, but it's a continuum, I guess. But yeah, um, yeah on, on the, the food, go on, whatever you want. Right. Surprise me. You, 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 weren't, <laughs> you weren't eating that foie gras with Nazis, were you? <laughs> uh, well, Singer, I, I, Singer is can make you very uncomfortable because his arguments uh, take you to an extreme point of, of criticism with respect to your own daily ethics, uh, and yet it's hard to find fault with them. I, I think his, his shallow pond argument is among the best in, in moral philosophy, and I don't think there is an adequate response to it. This doesn't relate to the, the issue of food. Uh, it's just for those of you who don't know the shallow pond argument, it's worth a moment. The singer asked us to contemplate uh, what it would be like to, let's say, I, I told you now, I, I came to this auditorium and on the way I passed a, a small child drowning in a shallow pond, uh, but I was late so I just left her there to drown. Uh, and actually my, my most important concern is I didn't want to get my shoes wet. You know, they cost you know, a couple of hundred dollars and you know, I, I, I you know, this seems a shame to waste a pair of good shoes. Uh, now, you would rightly view me as a moral monster for, for having that sort of inner life. Uh, and yet, if I told you, 
I received an appeal from UNICEF or some valid charity which said, if, you know, if only you gave us $200, you could save uh, a human life, just like this one. And, and they, they even provided a photo of a child. Uh, and I told you that you know, I, I get those appeals all the time, and I, you know, I, I sometimes send money, but sometimes I don't, and I happen to throw this one away. You, you, that's, a, that's sort of the common experience of humanity at this point. We're all that moral monster. We know there's something we could do to save a life that we didn't do today because the mechanism is there to do it. And then Singer asks us to square that, that um, seeming paradox. And it's, it's only, uh, the, the paradox is only reduced infinitesima, infinitesimally when you, when you add things like, well, this is, this is a life that's near to you versus one that's far away. Uh, I, I think the, the, the future for truly, a truly moral species is in getting, taking more and more of Singer's arguments on board institutionally, where we are, we are allocating resources in a way that could withstand that kind of analysis, and we're doing it, and we're not requiring each of us to be a saint moment to moment, but we're just requiring that, that our systems function with, with that degree of moral wisdom, and I think we're, we're a, a far away from doing that, but I, that that is the goal. So I think he's, he's ultimately right on, on most of those points. I, I think Peter Singer is a very good example of philosophy at, at its best. And, and um, as Sam says, it's extremely difficult to fault his arguments. They're immensely persuasive. Um, I'm not quite sure why you need to be a philosopher. You just need to be a clear thinker. I mean, you, don't need to, you don't need to actually have read a lot of the history of philosophy, I think, to be able to come up with arguments as he does. Um, question I asked mostly about the animal issue, and um, you know, I'm, I'm struggling with trying to be more vegetarian than I was, and, I'm, and at, at home I'm pretty much entirely vegetarian now. Uh, I tend not to be vegetarian in, when I go out to dinner with other people. So it, it's a sort of step in the right direction, but it's not a big, big enough step. Um, I think I'd like everybody to be vegetarian. Then, then great chefs would start creating dishes that are less boring. <laughs> but I, but I, 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 do feel a, 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 I do feel a moral guilt about uh, humanity, about, about myself. And I feel it particularly when I see um, those lorries with going off to the slaughterhouse with eyes peering through those little slats and um, animals being crowded And there, in might, there might be a technological fix for that, too. And there's this movement now called, it was called cultured meat, it's now called clean meat. And there's some startups in the US, maybe there are in the UK, that are trying to, to grow actual animal protein well, that would be in wonderful. a bat, yes. a, you know, not associated um, with that. That would be wonderful. And by the way, that's, that could re we could revert to an earlier discussion about the, the yuck factor. There's no reason at all, of course, why you shouldn't have tissue culture of human uh, meat. Um, another and, and point that, that would, again, that would be we will see on YouTube. So instead of human roadkill, it's human lab kill. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, human that's lab just kill. the kind Although, of question that moral philosophers like to deal with, and, and rightly so. Yeah. so. Yes, sir. Uh, yes, um, I would like to hear your thoughts about the um, distinction between a set of ideas and the uh, people who subscribe to them. Because I know that when you're criticizing a set of ideas, you could be called stuff like uh, gross or racist. But um, the standard response seems to be that, oh, I'm not criticizing people. I'm criticizing the ideas. But I think that while it's true to some extent, it's also a bit of a cop-out. Because if a set of ideas is truly horrible, then the person subscribing to those would by consequence, be a, a horrible individual, and well, no, no, I mean, not because necessarily. Look, think of what happens when someone actually changes their view. I mean, there, there are yeah, people I, who were. I, I don't mean that uh, it's not uh, open to change, but um, well, I, I was just wanting to hear your thoughts about that distinction and the uh, controversy surrounding it. I but, tend to try not to assess people in that sense of you're a good person, you're a bad person, and. Uh, instead, it's you're advocating for good things or you're advocating for bad things rather than trying to sum up 
I don't, even in the heated discussions or something, you might say, oh, you're an idiot or that's moronic or whatever else. And, and I've done it. I've done it, uh, surprise, uh, on the show. But it, it is still a give up move. It's probably born more of frustration. I've always advocated for addressing ideas instead of the people. I try to avoid summarizing that. I'm going to fail. But I, as Sam was interjecting, the fact that somebody is currently advocating for bad ideas, that alone isn't enough for me to determine the content of their character. I can only address the content of those ideas and say, because if you change their mind, and their mind is changed perhaps relatively quickly, as some of us changed our minds, that tells you far more about the actual content of their character. The fact that we, there are people with bad ideas uh, is independent of, of the, you know, an assessment of their whole character. But listening to the question, I think what lay behind the question was the very frequent occasions when criticizing Islam is taken as criticism of individual Muslims. I think that's where it's totally different from what you've been talking about, Matt, because there, what I would say to that is that individual Muslims are usually the, the most severely maltreated victims of Islam. And so we're not, we're not talking about whether we, uh, we should um, respect people who have bad ideas, but we're talking about people who, have, who are the victims of bad ideas um, and who uh, are, are not necessarily, I mean, they may propound them in a, in, in a certain way, but, but I, I think that's what lay behind the, the, the questioner. Yeah, I bet. and more generally, I, I think there's this confusion between criticizing the ideas and hating groups of people for reasons of racism or xenophobia or some other animus. And I mean, this is this so clearly doesn't map on to what real critics of Islam are doing. I mean, real critics of Islam are 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 trying to help Muslim apostates, right, who share all of the racial and ethnic and and national backgrounds of their former co-religionists. Uh, so if, you, if you're, if you're uh, prejudiced against Arabs or Pakistanis, well then, you know, it's kind of strange behavior to be becoming best friends with, with Pakistani or, or Arab ex-Muslims, right? Um, and in, in terms of just how fully people can redeem themselves, I, I think you, it's just, we, we shouldn't undersell this. Like Majid Nawaz, was, was, he was an Islamist Right, and he's one of the, the the greatest people I know now, and yet he was he can he can point to a a moment on the calendar where his mind changed, you know, and and, and as an Islamist, I couldn't really imagine collaborating with him nor nor him with me, I'm sure, but but he's an absolutely fantastic person and a friend, and we sort of stumbled into a friendship friendship by by virtue of first meeting under conditions that were that seemed quite hostile to conversation. So this really can, you can really fully converge with someone who at one point you would have totally disagreed with. I endorse that. Majid Nawaz, I think, is a, is a real hero. Oh, yeah. And I want to say there's, a, there's at least a chance that your question is the last one not to put any pressure on you. Okay. <laughs> um, this is a question for anyone to jump in on, um, and it's basically revolving around, um, around comedy. A lot of um, comedians say that like, the reason that jokes are funny is because they have like, at least an element of truth to them. So I want to ask what you all think of um, the role of ridicule and satire in changing people's minds? I think ridicule and satire is great, and, and, and I, I, think it, I think it's our, it's our greatest weapon uh, against, against religion. You, I mean, there's so much food for ridicule, there's so much opportunity. Uh, it, it kind of touches on the last question about the difference between ridiculing individuals and ridiculing ideas. Exactly. I, I'm, a, I'm a fan. It, and if an idea is ridiculous, it's deserving of ridicule by definition of uh, the, the absurdness of it. But it, it values, it, it, it atta attacks the issue in a way that may be safer than a straightforward 
oh, this is wrong and here's why. It may not only be more effective, but it may be safer because we can laugh at stuff. We can laugh at, you know, transubstantiation or, you know, when Elvis died for my sins, he stayed dead type of things. The, the, the ideas are, are fi I'm fine with ridiculing. I love it. I, I love satire and all that. I don't know that it's the starting point. But I also don't know that it's not the starting point. We had in the secular and atheist community for years, and probably still, disagreements over whether there should be firebrands or diplomats. And then it was, they started labeling who's a firebrand and who's a diplomat. Well, I'm both depending on the, in, the situation and who I'm talking to. And I think that we need as many different honest avenues of attack um, as we can find because people believe for different reasons and they're going to stop believing for different reasons. There are people, who, I'm, I'm never going to convince that Richard's going to convince. There's people who neither one of us are going to convince um, that Ricky Gervais is going to convince with a joke. Why not? What, what's the problem with having multiple paths of attack instead of saying, ah, well, you firebrands, you're, you're the bad atheists. Or you diplomats, you're the you know the conformists, the the they're, they're the the peacemakers. You're letting them get away with the softer version of their religion. I think that's a time. Oh, one more. I can't see that. We'll do one more on that side, real quick. Or is it? So first of all, um, all the people behind me, we're we're at a celebration of reason. And they believe in miracles. Um, <laughs> Sam. Um, I'm a fan of yours. I've, uh, I'm one of the small percentage of people that uh, pays to enjoy your podcasts, and uh, I even uh, I even tweeted you to invite you out to dinner in London. You spoke before about the two possible tracks in terms of influencing a um, uh, change of Islam reform or just abandon it. Surely you, you might be missing a trick, which is that these 1.6 billion people. Um, their religion is wrapped up in their culture, in their identity, in who they, who they are, their food, their communities, uh, their values, or their perceived perception of those things. Mm -hmm. And surely, and, and, and it plays into the question of before, who stood here before me, when, when we are engaging, whether it's you know, on YouTube or, or on a conversation with, with somebody who professes to belong to that community, whatever their beliefs, we need to be sensitive to the way they, they perceive themselves. So for example, a Muslim person considers themselves, may consider themselves to be a Muslim in this, in, and, and it, there's nothing they can do about it. They were born that way in the same way as I was born as a Caucasian. Um, and, and doesn't that come back into that question about um, people feeling pers it's personal against them when you attack their religion or their belief or their, their lifestyle? Well, it's understandable that people would feel that way I mean, that's, so that's the first concession. Yes, it, attacking Islam in a very abbreviated form without a lot of context or without an ability to, to, to um, explain the issue, that can be expected to offend some number of, of Muslims, no doubt. But uh, we're talking about a, lo a longer conversation that, that the culture has to have with itself and only uh, in the best case, uh, people in the culture c can have that conversation. I think only they can have it uh, effectively, ultimately, for, for reasons that you allude to. But there's nothing, uh, the, the, the worst beliefs can be dissected out of any religion, or they can be just uh, ignored. I mean, they don't even have to be edited out of the books, necessarily, although that would, that would be convenient. Uh, and it is a problem that they're not edited. It's a problem that there's a tradition that, w that we can't edit these books because they're a matter of revelation, because then fundamentalism becomes kind of like a, you know, the reboot procedure on, the, on culture. If you just put people on an island with a copy of the Quran, the, the Islam they will very likely create out of assiduous study of that text will be the, uh, the sort that, that we should be most apt to criticize. Uh, so it's, it's a problem that you can't battlerize scripture. But no, when you look at the, the life of an ex-Muslim who still has a, is, is very much in the community, who has a relationships with current Muslims and speaks the language and loves the food and loves the, the architecture, and I mean, that's their world, uh, that's, the, that's the front line of this 
conversation, and that's and that clearly is that's a change that's happening and, and can happen. And then, and then there's again the, the other track, which is the the Muslim reformer, the, the the person who hasn't disavowed the faith necessarily, but for whom this is a person for whom it's absolutely clear that we don't want to live in a world where you cut the hands off of thieves, right, or uh, uh, kill apostates, or even even more edgier still, you want to live in a world where women are the political equals of men, though you can find precious little reason to do that on the basis of a study of the Quran and the Hadith. Um, and that, you know, even in Saudi Arabia, some, some people just woke up to a world where women can now drive, you know, as, I mean, so the change is conceivable. And once that change happens, it's, it's harder to roll it back, I think. And so I, I think I wouldn't underestimate how much progress people can make within the culture. And you also shouldn't underestimate the effect of people like ourselves uh, outside the culture making the, the offensive noises we make. Because I mean, when I was with Majid in Australia at, at a book signing, uh, someone came up to me and said, listen, I, I just want you to know, I'm, I've, I've come like, straight from Pakistan. I was in a, an absolutely fundamentalist context. All my friends and family are, are Islamists, if not jihadists, and yet your YouTube videos reached me. And I, I, saw that, I say that not to congratulate myself. I'm just saying that, that I, I was bowled over by that. It never for a moment seemed possible to me that that would, would happen or have any positive effect, really, in, in that context. And yet. It does, and if uh, Majid wants to attest to that somewhere, he, he, he can. Yeah. Can, I, can, I put in a, can I put in a little boast as, as well? Um, there, is, there is no official Arabic translation of the God Delusion. There is an illicit uh, bootlegged mm. PDF uh, of the God Delusion in Arabic, which has been downloaded 10 million times. Yeah. And right. and, and a, third of, a third of those in Saudi Arabia. Mm. On, uh, on that note, my apologies to the people standing in line. I'm told there's a young man about five up that line that we're just going to move to the front and give to the final question to. Hello? Hi. There's one way to find out if I sound like a mouse on helium. Okay. Um, <laughs> First, I'd like to state that I am a member of the ACA, so, curtsy. <laughs> but my question for you is, I've had Christian prayers come into my school. I've had um, Christian priests and even a Christian pop group come into my school. I'm wondering what you would think if I were to say that maybe a Muslim pop group were to come in my school. What do you think that teachers and everybody else in the school would be supportive of that, or would they see it differently from anything else? I, I don't really understand. So, uh, I, I should, I'm probably the one least qualified to answer this, because in, in the UK, they don't have the same type of church state separation that we have in the US. And it's been very effective because when the Christian groups come into schools to do things that they ought not be doing, but nobody really cares about because we're just going to go along with it because our culture. One of the most effective uh, counters to that has been Satanists. <laughs> Satanists have been coming into the United States, schools in the United States saying, hey, if the Christian groups can do it, we can do it too. And they put out these awesome coloring books that have nice moral messages in them. And as soon as they start handing out their stuff, all of a sudden the Christian propaganda just vanishes. There's a difference with the issue of potentially having a state religion as to whether or not that same sort of tactic could exist here, um, but it might. I don't know, I can't tell you how the teachers would react, but I'd encourage you to give it a go. <laughs> We're spreading Satanism to the youth now, apparently. <laughs> 
considering the other things we spread tonight, yeah. Satanism's yeah. pretty up there. First, I, I, let me just uh, express how amazed I am that, that you are here and that you asked a question that well. It gives me uh, yeah, yeah. hope for the future. Yeah. And your, your parents should be great. Yeah. Well <laughs> Thank you, that means a lot to me. I'm on top of the world, Ma. <laughs> <laughs> All right. If there's nothing more to add, is anybody, did you guys have a closing statement for the crowd that you wanted to make? Nope. <laughs> Been a great thank, crowd, thank you very much. Thank you all for coming. Thank you guys so much. There'll be book signing up there. <laughs> Sam Harris, Richard Dawkins. Woo! Thank you. All right, Calgary, how's everyone doing? Wow, what a crowd. First of all, thank you all so... Well, first of all, I have to say, what do you think of my space pants? Uh, it's mixed, mixed response. Um, I have to thank you all so much for coming out and supporting this event. Uh, this is our first big event in Calgary, and I've just been blown away by the level of support here. So please give yourself a big round of applause for coming out today. And for those of you who don't know, my name is Travis Pangburn, and I'm the creator of Pangburn Philosophy. And we travel around the world and, and promote art and science. That's what we do, and we do this in many different ways, and some of the ways that we do do this is through large-scale live discussions like this. Um, Carolyn Porco's in the house tonight, and this is our first event with Carolyn Porco, which I'm so excited for. So just a couple things. We will, uh, after about an hour and 15 minutes, have uh, a Q&A. There's a Q&A mic on each side of the audience down here um, that uh, will let you know when you can come down and stand in line if you have a question for Richard or Carolyn tonight. Um, and then there will also be a book signing in the lobby for those of you who have a book uh, authored by Richard Dawkins. Um, so feel free to uh, take part in that if you do. Um, what else? I think that's it. That's, that's all I have. It's becoming popular to think. We're able to fill venues like this all around the world, and I think that, that uh, means that we're heading towards a great era in humanity. So thank you all for being a part of that. All right, I can't wait any longer. I'm going to ask you to put your hands together again for Richard Dawkins and Carolyn Porco. Hello, Calgary. So, okay, well, I thought we would start with a little story of how Richard and I met, because this is not the first time we've been. We'll hear Carolyn's version first, and then we'll see. <laughs> so, uh, I think it was 1998 or 1999, which puts it at about 20 years ago now. Um, we both were invited to. Uh, Warner Brothers Studios in LA uh, to participate in a panel discussion about the way that uh, Hollywood was portraying scientists and science. And there was quite the panel. There was Richard and I, who did not know each other at that point, um, James Watson, okay, DNA yeah. man, um, a couple of people from Hollywood who were big names. One guy was the executive producer of NYPD Blue, which at that time was a very successful uh, show about policemen, and he really like got it all right. You know, it was very gritty, showed really the true side of what being a cop was like. So he was the, you know, the wonderkind of the moment. He was really lauded in Hollywood. And then there was a guy who was the executive producer of ER, 
Uh, there was a guy who wrote the book, Is It Big Man, Little Boy, about the atomic bomb. Um, and others were there, and then there was Richard and I. And so we had this um, just discussion, and one of these people, I'm not going to say which one it was, went into this tirade about how um, scientists were basically evil. <laughs> and he never met a scientist that he could look in the eye without, you know, wincing, or uh, the scientists without wincing. Um, you know, just painting scientists as if they were these dweeb people. He, uh, he said, you know, everybody knows the scientists never got the beautiful girls in high school, and on and on and on. And <clears throat> I was getting hot under the collar about all this. Um, and I eventually, I don't know if I can use this word in Canada, I eventually called him an asshole. <laughs> well, the, what, 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 what happened was that, um, well, first Jim, Jim Watson said, are you for real? <laughs> you sound like an escapee from the Yale English department. <laughs> and, then, and then Carolyn, I think, said something. Whispered. Whis whispered something, and then he yelled out, Oh, so now she's calling me an asshole. <laughs> yeah, so you can imagine, it went downhill from there. Um, but it was, it was really this battle between the Hollywood people who thought they did not owe science anything. They were not honor-bound to present science the way it really was, and they could do anything they wanted. And Richard and I were on the same side of the argument, saying, well, but, you know, science is the most valuable thing we have, and... Um, it really should be portrayed accurately, and even just stories about the pursuit of the truth would, would carry, you know, as stories that would be, uh, you know, you'd get an audience to watch and so on. So Richard and I kind of bonded at that point and became, you know, pals because we were on the same side of the argument. Yeah. So anyway, that's how we come to be here. So I thought that we would start, I have a whole list of topics, it goes on for three page, four pages of what we might talk about. I don't think we'll get through it all, but we're going to start with basically what Richard and I have in common, and that is that um, we're both scientists, but we're interested in life. That is, what is life, the process of life, and how did it originate, and how do we go in search of it? And so it's important to first talk about what it even is, and that's important when you want to go search for it to know what you're looking for, and it's amazingly difficult to find a definition for it. There's no one group of people who could come up with a definition that satisfies all those organisms that you would call alive. Uh, some would have the attributes that you, or meet the definition that you might put together and others wouldn't. You agree with that, right? Yes, I mean, I, I think um, <clears throat> it is a remarkable fact that without ever violating the laws of physics, uh, at least on this planet, uh, there have grown up objects, entities, which are exceedingly complicated, uh, I mean, staggeringly complicated compared with, with anything that physics alone can do, and which have the very, very strong illusion of being designed for a purpose. It's no wonder that most people in the history of the world have been creationists, believed that they were created by a divine creator, because we look designed, all living creatures look designed, we, we have Every attribute you'd expect, if somebody had designed us, by us I mean trees and kangaroos and, and lions and, and, and us and fleas and bacteria, um, working with great complexity and detail to further an end, which is survival and, and, uh, and reproduction. So I suppose one way to put the question is, if we found life on another planet, how would we know it was there? How would we recognize it? And I think it would be, it would be complex and it would be um, purposeful, designed for, for a purpose. Many people don't understand it. They'd, I mean, my tie, for example, is got, you probably can't see it, but um, these are leaf insects, and they look uncannily like, like leaves. leaves. You couldn't possibly think that happened by accident. It didn't happen by accident. It happened by natural selection. But not by a designer. But not by a designer. Yes. Um, and it was Darwin's great triumph to realize that design, this prodigious illusion of design can come about without a designer. Right. So this whole thing about how you get to that stage uh, is going to be the next topic. But let's first just talk about this. What, what are attributes of life? 
right? You know, it has um, certain architecture. Life is built modular, like Legos. You know, you can start small and build something big from common elements, like common chemical elements. All life on Earth is built of certain common, uh, common chemical elements. Um, cellular. All life on Earth is cellular, right? Would you say? I mean, it is, but does it have to be? And I think it's an interesting question whether, whether life always happens to, or always has to be, to be cellular. Okay, um, but when we go and search for things anywhere, either on Earth or in other planets, which is my business, you have to know what to look for, right? And it's, so yes, it's, it's, it's not obvious that, that when you're going looking for life that it should be made up of lots of little units. Um, it, I mean, maybe it has to be, but that's the case it has to be made. I think it's a very interesting question to ask. What are the attributes of life that just have to be true because there's no other way to do it? And cellularity might be one of them. Um, replication, right? Replication, I would bet, is one of them. Um, sex probably isn't. Uh, um, because we, we, we have creatures that, that are not sexual. But I would like to know how much of what we know about life on this planet had to be true, because that's the only way it could be, and how much just happens to be true of our form of life. And our form of life is uniform, it's all based on DNA. The fundamental machine code of every living creature we've ever looked at has been the same, and it's sort of the superficial details that are different. And I would like to know, is it necessary for life to have a genetic code? Does it have to be digital, as ours is? Does it have to be a one-dimensional digital code, as, as ours is? Or could you imagine a two-dimensional matrix? Um, does it have to be very highly accurate, as ours is? I think it probably does. These are all questions which you can ask about lives, in the plural, in general, even before we've even been to look for others. I would, I would put my shirt on, all life having to evolve by natural selection, some form of natural selection. And that implies there have to be something like genes. But does it have to be DNA? Does it even have to be based on carbon chemistry? I think it does. Do you, would you think so? Well, I don't, I don't really have an opinion about that because I don't know enough about the chemistry to say. But I'm saying that you've just laid out on the table a lot of uh, questions that, you know, if we're going into the solar system or we're looking at exoplanets, and we want to know what, in our business, we call biosignatures, what we look for. Some of those are just almost impossible for us to, to grapple with. We, that's why you hear, you know, the mantra at NASA is follow the water. I mean, we are starting in kindergarten. We're going after the kind of life that we know how to recognize. Uh, and so um, it's looking for uh, those attributes or those... Uh, chemical processes that we think could be attributed only to yes. life. But, but you bring up, you, I mean, obviously that's the more interesting thing to think about, is how different could life be elsewhere? Could you have life? Okay, so just let's take two examples that um, I think about. Uh, having just completed the Cassini mission, I led the imaging team on the Cassini mission, and we found uh, the, the Cassini project found that the small moon Enceladus, no bigger than England, uh, small icy moon, um, actually, when we got there, we found a plume of material erupting from its southern pole. And over 13 years, we found that that plume was really 100 geysers erupting from fractures in the ice shell underneath which is a global ocean that is as salty as the Earth's, is laced with organic compounds, uh, bears evidence of hydrothermal activity like that found on the Earth's seafloor. Uh, and so this was wildly exciting. And, um, and that is an example of the kind of environment that we would expect life to uh, certainly survive in, whether it originates could originate in such an environment is another question because we don't know how life originated. But certainly it's a watery environment, so it's, you know, it's really got us very interested. How, how many people here have seen Carolyn's magnificent pictures of, of the um, Cassini mission to the Saturn system? <laughs> Carolyn, well, would, Carolyn would, would you mind if I described you as 
the female Carl Sagan. Would that, would that be? <laughs> I'm not going to. I'm... <laughs> I'll I take love, it. I've been called worse. <laughs> I, love, I love the way, I love the way um, you feel, although you haven't been to the Saturn system, Cassini has, and you talk about when we went and we turned around and we, and we, and we, we orbited this and we did that. You must have felt you were actually there. Always. Is that right? Always. I feel like I lived my life in the outer solar system. And how long so much you? so that I had a hard time keeping up with what goes on down here. Yes, just as well, I think. <laughs> just as well. <laughs> So how, how long were you exploring the Saturn system? Well, okay, we were there for 13 years. But frankly, the, the mission got started in November of 1990. So basically three decades of like being committed to this. And how long did it take to get there? It took uh, seven years of travel, but it yeah. took us seven years to design and build the spacecraft yes, and the instruments yeah. and launch it. Seven years to design and build, seven years to get there, and then once you were there, how long were you actually exploring? Thirteen. In... Thirteen years. And, and so... you could take a decision, I think we might go and look at so-and-so now. Let, let's go and visit Enceladus, shall we, now? Or, well, or... We, we, planned, we planned the whole trajectory years in advance. Okay. I mean, like, our nominal mission was four years, and... Um, we did that, we started planning that soon after launch. I mean, that's quite a job because we planned like every, I forget, so don't quote me on this, but every five minute interval in four years had to be planned. What are we gonna be doing? Which instrument's gonna be prime? What data are we gonna collect? How are we gonna turn the spacecraft? Uh, but could you so decide at some point, let's go back and have a look at so-and-so? Okay, so the reason why we could do that, I mean, to a singular degree with Cassini was because uh, we were in orbit. It wasn't like the Voyager mission, which I was also on in the 1980s, where we flew through the giant planet systems of Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune. We spent about a week in close proximity, gathering as much information as we could in a hurry, and, uh, and then that was it. It was off to the next one. You know, years. It took us years in between. Uh, with Cassini, we were in orbit around Saturn, so we had the leisure of finding something like the plume on Enceladus and deciding, okay, this is so exciting, we gotta really come back and take another look. And thankfully, we were given mission extensions. The mission was supposed to be only four years long, and then we kept getting extended, obviously, for another, whatever that was, nine years. And, um, and it was in the extended mission that we really honed in on Enceladus and had lots and lots of flybys of it, even flew through its plume, grabbed up material to sample, and so on. What so, was it like when you first saw these plumes? It must have been an incredibly exciting experience. Uh, it was. It was, um, it was at first puzzling. We had to be absolutely sure were we seeing it or not because our first pictures weren't like the best. But when we finally got up close, we knew oh, we need to go get closer and take a closer look. Um, we, had, we took a picture where you see just dozens of these narrow, discrete jets erupting from the surface. How and high can, do they go? Oh, well, as discrete jets, they probably go about, I don't know, uh, 50, 100, 200 kilometers, but they feed a plume. No, that's... No, 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 no. They, they feed a plume that goes tens of thousands of kilometers and ends up supplying uh, particles that make, in cell, uh, make Saturn's E-ring. So this big, diffuse ring of material that Enceladus sits in is created by the spray that's coming off the surface. So, um, where was I going with this? Well, you wanted the, to know... There was a, you, I'm sorry, I... But the, so, you so wanted we, to know what it felt like. Yeah. I'm just saying it felt... I felt... It sounds like maybe this sounds like, a, I don't know, an exaggeration. I just felt like, wow, what must it have felt like to find the geysers of Yellowstone. Imagine the first person, whoever that was, who oh, saw those. Oh, it's much those. bigger than that. Well, it's bigger. It's, <laughs> it's, it's, it's bigger, but, but I don't know. It's just this, you know, this geological phenomenon no one had ever found before. That's the thrill of being involved in space exploration. You can actually do and, things and, like that. And you think this was salt water coming from an, underwater, from an underground ocean? Well, we weren't sure at first. Well, you know, we, the imaging team, I'm very proud of this, was the first to say, we think this is coming from liquid water. But eventually, over those 13 years, we pinned it down to 
the fact that there was a water reservoir under an ice shell, and that reservoir eventually we realized was a global ocean, uh, and we also realized because Cassini flew through the plume and scooped up material and measured its composition, that's when we found that it, it was salty, and there's organic materials, there, um, in fact, there are organics. We now know there are organics that are bigger than, <coughs> excuse me, than the average biologically useful amino acid. Well, I was going to say, because um, Origin of Life Research received a great boost uh, in the early 1950s when the uh, Miller-Urey experiment um, <coughs> replicating what was thought to be the chemistry of the early Earth with, with flasks and, and lightning strikes, little electric sparks and things. And they and the world was extremely excited when their uh, flask ocean became filled with organics. And in, in a way, that, that experiment, although it caused a big stir at the time, is, is now completely redundant because organic materials of that sort are everywhere. Are everywhere, I mean, including on Enceladus and, and in meteorites, in as, meteorites. as well. So we, we know that the universe, or at least the solar system, presumably the universe, is filled with organic substances of the very kind that the Miller-Urey e experimenters were so, e so, so excited to I know, to but Miller-Urey didn't find... I just read somewhere, I think it might have even been in your book. Uh, <laughs> so it, it must be right. Um, that um, it, it, they have found in some, no, maybe it was in some experiment, they, they were able to make RNA. Not in the original experiment, but... No, no. not that, no, but yeah. later on. But presumably there's not RNA in, on, in, on Enceladus. That no, no, but I'm saying it's, it, yes. it's, that, it's that easy to make, they were able to make yeah. it in the lab. Yes. Um, yeah. So on Enceladus then there mm. are... Um, did you say there are um, amino acids? Or, no, no, no I just said no. that we know, we don't know, we couldn't, we didn't have the equipment on Cassini to identify particular molecules no. uh, because we're very limited in the, in the masses that we could actually identify, but we are able to determine that there were compounds that were larger than an, okay. the average amino yeah. acid. Well, what it takes for life to begin is something rather special. It's not good enough just to get uh, some organic comp compounds like that. You've got to get one that's self-replicating. It's got to, it, you've got to get a molecule which makes copies of itself, and not just that, but it, they've got to be heterogeneous copies. They've got to be more than one kind, which, which breed true, so to speak. Because only then can you get the competition that's, that's required for natural selection. Wait, wait, wait. You're saying natural selection even in determining what ends up being the genetic molecule? Well, by definition, the first replicator would, you could call a genetic molecule. Right. But I don't think anybody thinks that DNA was the original one that started off here. Right. Because DNA is it's been called a high-tech replicator. It, it requires a, a complicated infrastructure of, ex, of pre-existing biochemistry to get going. So the original replicator that started natural selection off almost certainly was not DNA, uh, but was something simpler than that, and probably nothing like such a high-fidelity replicator as DNA. And DNA They called then, that RNA. RNA is the one. Could have been RNA, but would have been a, a better candidate, and that's the kind of vogue idea at the moment, the so-called RNA world. Okay, okay, well, so... But you, you, you want to go back to Enceladus because you think that's the best hope for finding life in the solar system? Well, okay, only because, again, in our business, it's, you know, we want to maxim, you know, you put a multi-billion dollar mission together, you want to, like, convince people you, you're going to return results. So, um, you know, we want to know what we're doing. And so we, uh, we know there's water there, this is... a very promising in what we found. We know more about the ocean on Enceladus than we know about any other extraterrestrial ocean in the solar system. And so it means that we are in the best position possible to design experiments to go and test uh, if there are things that, you know, evidence of life, okay? Yeah. And so, um, 
that's why some of us think that it's the best place to go. It, it, I'm not saying, I don't think we can say whether or not it's got a better chance of having life in its ocean than, let's say, Europa, but we just know more about it. It's an easy environment to work in, and so we want to go back. Doesn't mean we'll find anything, and this is, this is interesting. It brings up this thing that you uh, have made a point of in your books, that you think, um, well, okay, let me back up. People are excited about Enceladus, not only because of its ocean, not only because of the organic material we find in the spray that comes from it, but because of this evidence of hydrothermal activity, okay? And that's like the hydrothermal activity, that's what we have on the, on the brain, is that we see on the, on the seafloor of Earth. And we know there's lots and lots of organisms that live there, and they live there because there's hot fluids laden with minerals that come out of the seafloor, um, and there are animals that have evolved. Probably the first organisms that evolved didn't use oxygen because there was no oxygen. They just live off minerals. And so, and the, the, the energy and the energy gradients that are there. So we think, okay, well, this is very promising. Let's go see if there's any evidence of such life there. But there is this suspicion that life cannot actually get started in liquid water. And yeah. this is an interesting thing to talk about. There's well, the, there are two camps. There's two camps. One says you first have to start, and you first have to build the big biomolecules. You are in that camp. You say you, the, first, the first life will be a replicator. It will be a genetic molecule that can reproduce itself, right? Yeah, that's got to be true because, because only then can natural selection get, get going. Okay, but then there's the other side that says, the other camp that says, well, we really should be going where there's lots of energy and energy gradients because life couldn't exist without that. They're not alternatives, but... Um, well, they're not really alternatives, but when it comes to what should we be looking for, yes. that's where... Well, I, I found it convincing that, I mean, it'd be very nice to find geothermal activity on Enceladus or Europa because um, they're a very long way from the sun. And, and you need an energy source. And you need an energy source. And so, whereas we've got plenty of sunlight here... Um, on the surface. Th it's a pretty good idea, I mean, quite a fashionable theory now, that life, even on this planet, ari ar arose from the energy source of volcanic en energy rather than... Um, I mean, un under, in, in these... Ge ge these um, what do they call them? Black smokers. Um, um, uh, okay, so you, um, you call that volcanic. I wouldn't call that volcanic, but that's volcanic. Well, it's, call it. it's, it's heat from, from inside. Okay, okay, geophysical um, heat. And so the, re the reason why you might not expect to find life originating in the outer solar system is it's so far from the sun, but you've got a very good, good reason why it should have originated there. Uh, if, if you can form the genetic molecules in liquid water, and there are I've spoken to organic chemists who say it's very, very difficult to do. And DNA and RNA live in water now because I guess they're supported by it in us, because they're supported by other chemicals which make it possible for them to do what they do. But to talk about the first one, absent all the machinery around it, uh, it's difficult to form such a molecule. By the way, you bring up <clears throat> an important point about does it have to be DNA? Um, and could it even have a different structure instead of being a long linear yeah. chain? But they, there are people who, um, one group in particular that I'm thinking of, that is trying to do this in the lab. There is another way to talk about the origin of life, and that is not only to do it theoretically and think about it, not only to go search for it elsewhere and maybe find it and then make a comparison, but actually to try to make synthetic life in the lab. And one group I know is trying to make a synthetic genetic polymer. And just to throw in a little history, the father of quantum mechanics, Erwin Schrodinger, wrote a book in 1944 called What is Life? I think is uh, the name of the book. And I found this very surprising. I only learned this in the last couple of years. And he actually discussed, this is before, what was the DNA structure, 1953? 53. Yeah. This was some 12 years before they actually determined what the structure of DNA was, Schrodinger said it had to be like a crystal. It had to be this repeatable structure that maintained itself after every replication. 
And so, um, and, and James Watson and, and uh, Crick. Crick, what's his first name? Francis. Francis Crick. <laughs> um, they, were, they, they said they were inspired by Schrodinger. They, they had his, yeah. his ideas on the brain when they went to try to determine the structure of it. Anyway, I digress. So there is a group here uh, on Earth that is trying to make a synthetic polymer. And the idea is that not only, and they've elaborated on Schrodinger's idea, saying not only does it have to have a crystalline structure in the sense of repeatable molecules, but it has to be a structure that maintains its shape and also has the same physical and chemical behavior with every repetition. It can't like fold like a protein or else it won't. That's right. Right? And so he, <clears throat> the guy who, who's the head of this group, his name is Steve Benner, um, he says it has to have, uh, it has to be like DNA in that the phosphate group in DNA is, or each one is electrically charged. And that means that these phosphate groups kind of repel each other and they keep the molecule rigid. They keep it from folding. Okay, so yeah. he's elaborated on this idea of Schrodinger from 1944. He's added some other criteria and they're trying to build other molecules like that in the lab to see if yeah. they work. So that's another avenue of research that is, um, that's happening in this. But I, I do, I'm not gonna, <clears throat> I do wanna get to complexity. Complexity is something that just fascinates me. Do you mind? Okay. Okay, so you alluded to this at the beginning. You said that um, it looks to the, you know, someone at first blush that there's design. Like how could you get something so ornate, so regular, so even bilaterally symmetric, like those leaf insects? Well, more than just that, they look like leaves. I mean, bilaterally symmetrical is easy to get. Lots of crystals do that. But, but, but to, to, to look like a leaf um, has got to be done something very special, which, which is natural selection. Which is natural selection, mm -hmm. which is something that um, leads... It, it, it's, the whole thing is just amazing to me, that complexity even turns up in the physical world, and it's basically order coming out of chaos. And um, Schrodinger mentions this in his book. He talks about this process of diffusion, how you could just take a gas and it just eventually just diffuses away. But if you had a gas that was uh, dense enough, it can be modeled as a, an ordered process. And this random motion actually uh, doesn't, it doesn't, it's not random anymore, it actually will move in a way that you could describe with an equation. I mean, it's remarkable that you could get order out of that. The same thing happens with gases that emit radiation. If they're dilute, the radiation will be, you know, just singular uh, photons of a singular wavelength. You make the gas molecules very, very numerous. You make the gas dense, and then the thing will shine. We call it black body radiation. The radiation that comes out of it is continuous in wavelength. You see radiation or photons at every wavelength, and it has such a particular form, you can describe it by equation, an equation that only depends on temperature. I mean, it's remarkable. You get order out of chaos. And this, is it not what has happened to life as it has evolved? I think it's, a, <clears throat> that sort of complexity is small beer compared with what you get in life. And I think it's, a, it's just a many, many orders of magnitude more complicated. If you think about the complexity of just one cell, let alone the trillions of cells which are, which are, which are in us, the complexity of the way the, the brain is wired up, the kidney, the heart, um, the way muscles work, but even a single cell. I recommend there's a wonderful animation which is prepared at Harvard University of the interior of a, of a cell. I don't know whether you've seen it, but it's worth... It's worth I know Go what you're Googling. talking it's about. It's an absolutely fabulous thing. It, the machinery, like you see molecules That's right. doing There's this, a, a walking. Wa walking, a, a sort of walking protein. Walking. I know, it's, it's, excuse me, it's a, 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 Along like that, and you, and you say, if you're, if you're naive, you say, oh, there must be a God, there must be a God who's done that. Um, <laughs> and what is so magnificent is the, the achievement of Darwin and his successors is to show that you can get that kind of complexity um, from nothing more than physics and natural selection. But, yeah. and, the, and the way it, it, it works in, in em embryology, it's 
let me put it this way. You often read in biology textbooks that the DNA is a blueprint for a body, and it is not a blueprint. It's the last thing it is, it's a blueprint. It's a, it's a program, it's a, it's a recipe. A blueprint would be something which has a direct sort of one-to-one -one mapping to the body itself. You could, you, you could make a blueprint of a body by doing serial slices and, and putting into digital coordinates the, the, um, the, the picture of each slice. You could make babies that way, but it's not the way it's done. <laughs> um, it's done by little local rules which are obeyed at, at, the, at the micro level. So at every stage during, during the development of an animal or a plant, little local rules are obeyed at the cellular level, within the cellular level. Things go on locally on a small scale, and that all adds up in the end to the prodigious complexity of a body. So there never was a blueprint. DNA is not a blueprint. That no blueprint exists. It's all done in the same kind of way as an ant's nest or a termite's nest is built by each little ant, each, or each little termite, obeying little local rules. And the local rules are, are qu quite simple, but they add up when you take all of them together to make a termite mound, which is not that complicated, or make a human body, which is just fantastically complicated. And that's, um, that's achieved by natural selection. Natural selection chooses the DNA that controls these little local processes. But there is no, no blueprint. It never was designed either by God or even by natural selection. So it works. It works because it's just almost like nature does Monte Carlo, you know, crapshoots. Like, let's... Well, that's the it mutation just, stage. It, yeah. it, yes, but yeah. the, the, it, natural selection working on mutations. Yes. And it takes lots and lots of these experiments. Some of them give the organism advantage in its environment. Others impede the organism or don't do anything at all. And the advantaged organism is the one that wins the day. And that's how this proceeds. It's just all these steps and the only, it seems like it is an incredibly inefficient process. The only reason why it works is because it's got all the time in the universe, right? Yeah. I mean, it's... it's but it can go very fast sometimes. It's quite surprising how quickly it can go. Well, it goes fast, though, only when you have an organism that only reproduces every, like, 30 seconds. Well, right? yeah, no, uh, well, yes, and that, of course, that helps, of course, but, but um, <laughs> um, I mean, one rather spectacular example is the, the fish fauna of Lake Victoria. The what? The fish fauna of Lake Victoria, the, the cichlid fish, because we know... <clears throat> that Lake Victoria is young, unlike the other great African lakes, Lake Malawi and Lake Tanganyika, which are, which are very old. Lake Victoria is only about 100,000 years old, or maybe even less. And um, all the cichlid fish in Lake Victoria are descended from one ancestor, which got into Lake Victoria less than 100,000 years ago. And now there are thousands of different species. Um, specializing in all sorts of different, different niches. And this, is, or, this takes place of the order of tens of thousands of years, not millions of years. Which is, we, if that can be achieved in, in tens of thousands of years, think what can be achieved in hundreds of millions of years that actually have been available for the evolution of life. So, but, but are you contesting the statement that, you know, for an organism to evolve another adaptation to its environment. There had to be a lot of organisms that, that were tried and failed. Oh, no, no, that, 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 that's true. All, all, all I was saying is that it can be, um, that you, you said we've got plenty of time, and we have got plenty <clears throat> of time. We've got more time than we need. And oh, so, okay. Um, so I mean, Lake Victoria shows that we've got more time than, than we need. Well, this is interesting because in my business, there's this big debate about, you know, how long does an environment, how old is an environment like the ocean on Enceladus. How old does it have to be in order for us to, to at least find it reasonable that we could find life there? And a big deal is made about the fact that it took something like 300 million years. Well, it didn't take. We have an upper limit to how long it took life to evolve on Earth of something like 300 million years, yes. right? 
uh, from yeah. when we think the environment on the surface of the Earth was quiescent enough so that if life got started, it didn't get wiped out with an incoming projectile that just blew everything away, uh, to when you find the first fossil. It's something like the oldest fossil. That's something like 300 million years. So that's like the canonical number. Can you have, do we know that the ocean on Enceladus is 300 million years old? So uh, some of my colleagues make a big deal about that, but I keep saying, and others keep saying, but we don't know how long it took life to evolve. No. That's just the upper limit. Yes. It could have, I mean, any thoughts on this? You know, how long, I mean, you, how long did it take to get the first replicator? Could that have been? Well, as you say, with the, the first fossils we, we, we find are so, something under four billion years, so three, 350, between 350 and uh, four, four, four billion years. Um, so, and the, the world was formed, what, 4.6 billion? The Earth, well, yeah, something um, like that. So, um, it happened pretty quickly. It took a lot longer to get multicellular life, and even longer still to get the sort of life that's capable of being detected by a SETI program um, elsewhere. So it, it may be that um, the universe may be teeming with life of a bacterial kind, um, but life of our, at our sort of level may be extremely rare. We well, okay, that. so this, how, how contingent upon the geological history of the Earth is that timeline? I mean, it had to take multicellular life, do I have this right, uh, started with oxygen. We needed oxygen, or did it create, I forget, how's that work? I'm not sure we know that, because, because there are multicellular bacteria even. Um, bacteria meaning they don't use oxygen? Is no, that no, saying? no, um, sorry, they, some, many, many of them do. Um, but um, I think you would say about um, two billion years, perhaps, to get multicellular life, and then to get really interesting the... multicellular life, like, <laughs> like in, the, in, the, in the Cambrian, the sort of things that you recognize as being big, big animals. That, that was, oh, um, 600 million, something like that. Incidentally, we were just talking about this before we came on stage, uh, uh, yes, on stage. West of here is the Burgess Shale. Do you guys know that you live near the Burgess Shale? Okay. So, um, okay, but two billion years ago was about the same time of, of oxygen, the well, oxygen uh, the, event. The, the really big breakthrough was the origin of, of the eukaryotic cell, where, where you had bacteria oh. and, and ar archaea coming together and forming the sort of complex cell that is us and plants and fungi. And many biologists think that that was a huge step. Before oxygen, there was not oxygen utilizing, they weren't? Um, oxygen came with, with blue-green bacteria. Um, but which... does that precede the eukaryotes? Or... Yes. Oh, it does, yes. okay. So yeah. the eukaryotes were utilizing oxygen? Uh, yes, um, but blue-green blue ba bacteria discovered photosynthesis, and then blue-green bacteria got incorporated into eukaryotic cells of, pl of plants. And the, and the green of plants, green, green plants, is made by the descendants of those blue-green bacteria, now called plastids. So our, our whole, both, both plants and animals, are using, borrowing the biochemistry of those bacteria, mm -hmm. which came together in symbiosis uh, about two billion years ago. Why did it take so long? Or, or what's well, so special it, about maybe, that? Maybe it took so long because it was a very, very improbable step. And that's what I'm saying, that, that maybe um, there, there are people who think that um, bacterial-type life may be quite common, but the huge step was the formation of the eukaryotic cell. And then maybe another huge step was the formation of nervous systems. And it's quite interesting to make out, to look at these, the major steps which, which led up to the sort of complex life that we have today. Okay, but so, okay, so maybe intelligent life is rare. Uh, in the yes, in which, in which or, or case... Or at least, at least rarer than bacterial life. Well, I'm sure of that, but... Yes. but, uh, but um, yeah, I guess I'm sure of that, I mean, too. <laughs> Even on this planet. <laughs> Perhaps we could talk about SETI a bit, because... I am, uh, yeah. You, we're yeah um, um, I, I've always been rather pessimistic about the possibility of finding any kind of life in the solar system. I've always thought <clears> the origin of life was rather an improbable event, but I was rather inspired by your suggestion of going back to Enceladus to look for 
presumably bacterial level kind of life. Yeah, yeah. Um, but uh, I, I've always thought that the, the, the best prospect for detecting life was, well, the, the one foreshadowed in Carl Sagan's novel, C Contact, get, getting a radio signal um, from intelligent life somewhere, because you don't actually, actually have to get the physical body. Radio waves travel speed of light and, and in all directions, and so um, uh, it would the, the idea of detecting life by, by listening out for radio signals does seem to me to be a serious possibility. Well, there, you're not alone in this. So yeah. there's various thrusts in, in this business of searching for life, and us, uh, we solar system people, um, of course, are concentrating on planets. Astronomers who look beyond the solar system uh, are interested in looking at all the exoplanets that are being discovered by now uh, at this point. I mean, do you, do you know now that we, there are more planets in the solar system than there are stars? And because there are more, um, there's more, more, more planets I'm sorry, in, in the more, universe, well, in the galaxy. Or in the, sorry, what did I say? There's more planets in the, solar in, in the <laughs> there's more planets in the Milky Way galaxy than there are stars. Um, so we live in a universe teeming with planets, and um, those those uh, astronomers who look beyond the solar system are finding exoplanets. And they're interested in finding what they call Earth 2.0, and that is just a carbon copy of our planet, so that you know they can examine it uh, spectroscopically, which means look at the chemistry of its atmosphere. And you know they are putting together what they would consider to be biosignatures, like what would they see in the spectrum of an exoplanet that would tell them that they found life. I think this is a very very hard sell because I don't know that they'll ever, not, not their fault, it's just the nature of the game, it's very difficult to separate a chemical, to look at a chemical signature, even if you had a whole array of them, and know for certain that you've got the chemical signature of life when you're not really completely certain what the environment itself is. You're not there, yeah. and the environment can be com more complex than you could imagine. So there is a camp of people who agree with you and they think in the search for life outside the solar system, the real biosignature is going to be, if it should it ever happen, the interception of an intelligent signal. Yeah. And then you will know. Uh, so Can I ask first, can you, can you distinguish spectroscopically, can you distinguish the chemistry of a planet from its star? Because I just thought the star would kind of swamp it. Um, Yes, because there would be things in a planet you wouldn't expect. Stars are hot yeah, and, okay. and planets are cold. So you'd, you'd be looking for oxygen. That would be a, a pretty good telltale, wouldn't it? Well, I say no, because oxygen, oxygen can be produced abiotically. And um, people say, oh, what? it disappears so quickly because it's yeah. you know, used up by everything else around it. So you wouldn't expect it to be there, really. But you could happen upon something. You could free, be free seeing oxygen, it. Not, not, not free oxygen. Free oxygen. Yes. Free oxygen. Yeah. But you yeah. could happen upon a planet in a big state of, of disequilibrium. Our planet went through disequilibrium, yeah. too. So, mm. so it's going to be hard to come to, for exoplanet people to say with 100% confidence that they have found life. But the SETI people have a chance if they can find a signal, which brings us to the, the evolution of intelligence, which is yeah. something I wanted to talk to you about. Yeah. So intelligence, obviously, is a result of incomplete, increased complexity. Right? Increased brain size and so on. Um, and it's driven by a competition for resources and natural selection and so on. And I guess I first should ask you, I, I assume you think that natural selection and Darwinian evolution are universal, right? Is, is, that, is, is that basically the only way you can get evolution? Or have, have you given any so. thought to um, this? I think so. I wrote a paper some years ago called Universal Darwinism in which um, I argued against... One, Ernst Meyer was one of the great founding fathers Who? of... Ernst Meyer, M-A-Y-R, um, one of the great founding fathers of the neo-Darwinian synthesis in the 1940s, the 30s and 40s and 50s. Um, and he said that um, Lamarckian evolution uh, 
which is the, the, the idea of, of the, the pre-Darwinian idea of evolution, which was that of uh, the Frenchman Lamarck, who suggested that evolution could be driven by two things, um, use and disuse. The, the, the more you use a bit of your body, the bigger it gets, or the better it gets. That's the principle of training. That, that, that's why you build up your, your muscles by, by, by training. And the second Lamarckian principle was um, inheritance of acquired characteristics. So he imagined a form of life in which uh, those animals that strove, that worked hard, those individuals that worked hard to achieve something, built up those bits of the body which, uh, which, were, which, which grew as a consequence of that, and then their children inherited it. Um, Ernst Meyer said that there's nothing wrong with the Lamarckian theory, it's just that it isn't true. <laughs> um, and I wanted to go further than that, I did go further than that, I said that, that even, if it, even if it were true that, in, that acquired characteristics were inherited, which they're not, but even if it were true, then the theory is not a big enough theory to account for evolution. Um, and the sort of way I put it was, was, it's all very well talking about your muscles getting bigger when you train, that's true. And so if, you, if children inherited the enlarged muscles of a, of a weightlifter, then you could get a form of Lamarckian evolution. But imagine doing the same thing for an eye, say. An eye is this immensely complicated, intricate piece of machinery which focuses, a, focuses light with a lens, an adjustable lens, on a retina of millions of, of light-sensitive cells, um, corrected for aberration, color vision, an iris diaphragm that opens and shuts uh, as, a, as a light meter. You could not get that by the principle of use and disuse. It's, you can't train your eye. You could, the, the lens doesn't get clearer as a result of photons washing through it. Um, the natural selection is the, I argued, is the only way, certainly the only way that's ever been suggested, which could in principle give rise to evolution. So Ma was wrong to say that the only thing wrong with Lamarckian evolution is that inheritance of acquired characteristics. It couldn't work, not even on any planet. Okay, so no one's come up with any and better and nothing substitute. Else, no one's come up with anything else. So if you, I mean, the only other thing is design. And of course, there's enormous complexity of design on this earth in man-made machines. Um, computers, cars, planes, watches. Um, but they are simply, um, they're artifacts of life. So if you found something like a computer or a car on a planet, then you'd know that was life. It doesn't have to, it's not living itself, but, but it's diagnostic of life. So natural selection or the products of natural selection are, the, are I think, the only way you could get the orders of magnitude more com complex things. Um, okay, so, so, so then, you know, A leads to B leads to C. Uh, it, intelligence um, evolved on this planet. We, in, in, we, I we, think, yes. We should expect it elsewhere in the universe. Yes, but I, I, think in, I think that intelligence, complicated nervous systems, evolved as a result of what I call evolutionary arms races. Um, some of, some of evolution is, is just about um, adapting to changing climate, say. When, it gets, when there's an ice age, um, natural selection favors thick, shaggy coats, and when, there's, when it's hot, it favors losing them. Um, but that doesn't give rise to the, to the enormous levels of complexity which we're now talking about. What does that is arms races. The arms race between, say, predators and prey. Adapting to the weather is one thing. Adapting to the climate is one thing. Adapting to predators is another. You need, that's where complicated eyes come from, ears come from, running limbs, flying wings. These all come from um, the need to outwit and outpace predators, prey, parasites, hosts. And, and this argument makes quite clear. The only ones who uh, it was only those organisms that had those capabilities that lived to reproduce. And exactly. That's how it was. Yes. Okay. Yes. Continue. And 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 so all the all the sort of complicated evolution that, that we see is a result of arms races, um, and then there's simple evolution as a result of adapting to things like rainfall and and. Okay, but and the difference between a predator and the and the climate is that the predator is out to get you, and the and the climate merely is inconvenient. 
Right, so it, 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 it puts a finer point on it. Yes, yes. <laughs> okay. And, and the, predators are, the predators are getting better at it all the time, that's the point. Okay, okay, so intelligence obviously conveyed um, uh, an advantage to surviving, okay, which is why it's done so well. It's why yeah, it's, yes, I suppose. I mean, you have to point out that there are not, not that many... I mean, we're the only species that, e that even comes close to the sort of intelligence you'd need to be detected by a SETI listener uh, in another planet. Okay, okay, but still, um, yeah. my, the point is um, that intelligence, it seems to me when I look at the, you know, I look at Homo sapiens, is a double-edged sword. It, oh, yeah. it helps us cooperate, right? I'm assuming it's part of the reason why we cooperate. Um, it's... Uh, I mean, is that, is that a correct statement? Are there, are there organisms less intelligent that cooperate? I guess they do. Oh, yeah, do. Oh, sure. Yeah. Yeah. Social insects, for example. Uh, insects, yeah, okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, I'm, I'm just, it just seems to me that through intelligence, we're able to... I, I want to put, it may not be correct, I want to say in, along with intelligence and all the wonderful things like cars and computers and spacecraft come the ability to be um, capriciously uh, violent towards our own kind. Well, the, one, of the, uh, one of the arguments for why um, the, the answer to the Fermi paradox, where are they, why don't why we... They killed, they they killed, killed, each, killed each other. Um, uh, it, it could be that all over the universe there are little islands of intelligent life winking into existence and then winking out again as they destroy themselves. Uh, well, this it, is, maybe there's this... a brief window of opportunity between, between the arrival of technological expertise and then the destruction self-destruction by that technological Well, expertise. this is where I'm going with this. I think, I'm wondering if that's going to be inevitable. You know, the, our own destruction because we can't consistently work together for a common goal. And then on top of this, this is something you and I have spoken about. I don't know if, I don't even know which book of Jared Diamonds it appeared in, but he wrote a book, Jared Diamonds is an anthropologist, uh, and he said that the size of our brains limits the number of relationships that we can keep track of. And for the, the brain the size of ours, it's about 150, I think, is the number. So we are limited to the number of people we can have relationships with and, I guess, feel some kinship for, even if they're not our genetic kin. Or, or I don't yeah, know what That's the, called the Dunbar number, yes. Okay, um, okay, so put that together with the fact that intelligence has not only the good side but the bad side. Maybe it's not surprising that we can't come up with a global, uh, a, a unified global response to climate change or species extinction because it's just we're not capable of it. We're literally no. not capable of it's it. Already, we're asking too much. It's already very astonishing, though, that we are capable of doing so much, given that natural selection bred us on the African savanna to hunt and gather and avoid being eaten by lions. Yeah, but they didn't have to do that in Africa and in Canada and the no, but, but, but the and Indonesia. But the fact that having been bred for that, we are now capable of developing quantum theory and... and How uh, many people work in quantum theory? I bet it's less than 150. Well, yes, yes, fair sure enough, but nevertheless... Uh, nevertheless you're, you're missing my point. You're missing you're my missing point. Mine. You're missing mine. No. <laughs> <laughs> okay, go ahead. Uh, uh, I'll let well, you go first. Um, I, 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 do think, I do think it's a genuine mystery that the human mind, admittedly only a very few human minds, but, the, but there are human <clears throat> minds which, as far as natural selection is concerned, were only ever bred to hunt and gather and avoid being eaten by lions. Nevertheless, that brain power is capable of producing an Einstein and a Max Planck. Um, and never mind about Einstein and Max Planck, I mean, just people capable of designing rockets that can t take you to Saturn. I'm, I'm in awe of that as much as you are, but I'm saying that has not been able, that is obviously not translated uh, to large groups of people being able to see each other instead of as one tribe against the other no, tribe. No, that's, that's, that's a terrible truth, and I agree with that. It's the and terrible truth. You, you so said it, maybe it's inevitable. I mean, we've got to try to edit it as far as, as, far as we possibly can. <laughs> Thank you.
I, I agree with that, but I'm just posing the question, Richard, that I think I just, you know, let's discuss this. Are we asking too much? Could we possibly be asking too much? It's just we're not capable of doing it. And this gets into my feeling, this segues to the next thing. I'll just jump to it right now. Um, there are those people who think that it is absurdly dangerous and irresponsible to send messages to the cosmos like uh, Frank Drake did in 1964 with the message he sent from the newly uh, refurbished Arecibo telescope, the biggest radio transmitter in the world, and he sent a message, basically, I forget what the message said, it described what a human was, really simple, it was just kilobytes in size. And um, others have tried this, and Carl Sagan and his collaborators put a message on Voyager, uh, these kinds of things I just love. Uh, but there, were those, there are those people who are just hell-bent on claiming that this is irresponsible because we should not be advertising to the galaxy where we are because we don't know that aliens would look at us benignly and they could come and destroy us. No, that's us. right, but... but that's it, right? Well, no, no, sorry. Um, no, 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 no. I, I don't think that's right. I mean, I'm just saying that that's right. That's what they say. No. Um, uh, I, I, I've never really been worried by that because it's one thing for radio waves to go out but then actually coming here. It's ridiculous. Yes. Um, so <laughs> no. so I, 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 I don't okay. worry about that. Okay, so this is my take on this. It's, it would require so much effort yeah. to, to mount that kind of expedition yes. and, and to do so with capabilities for... Just, you'd have to be seeking to destroy whatever it is you find yes. in order to... Now, there, okay. there is one way it could, it could happen, and this was the way that, that Carl Sagan raised in his science fiction novel, and Fred Hoyle also in his novel, A for Andromeda, where you don't actually come physically. You send a radio signal and tell us to build a computer, which then, which then does its bidding. I mean, that's the only way it could happen, I think. Okay. okay. I mean, that, okay. That, that was the Carl Sagan plot. Okay, but it, okay, well anyway. Um, <laughs> I guess, I guess. You, you, you I, don't have to come physically, in other words. Okay, but I'm still, okay, so I'm still saying though that um, to do that, by the way, to even send a radio signal that could be that powerful requires a lot. Yes. Uh, a lot of, you know, capability on the host, on the planet that's doing that. But I'm, I'm saying that not only does it take effort to do that, but I'm wondering if intelligent civilizations you, you said it already, if intelligent civilizations even live long enough yeah. to get to that stage. Uh, so I'm not paranoid about, you know, evil aliens coming to, to get us. It just, it sounds, you know, to worry, to have that kind of paranoia sounds almost like the vision statement of the National Rifle Association. <laughs> So I think we have probably another 10 minutes. I, I don't know. We were supposed to get some kind of signal, but let's see. What should we talk about? So here, uh, let's talk about that. Seven minutes. Okay, very precise. Um, so I have a topic here. My last, one of my last ones is the future of life on Earth. It looks bleak. Um, <clears throat> So uh, let me just read my little preamble here. Uh, I think our tremendous success at surviving and even improving on evolution has come to us at tremendous cost. Life forms are becoming extinct all over the planet. There's a horrific loss of insect life. I've just only read this over the last several decades. There's been drops ranging from 50% to factors of 60, which is a drop of 98%, depending on the species of insect and where you're talking about on the globe. Um, and this, of course, brings about the consequent loss of insect-eating species. Insects are the planet's custodians. They're, what, they're the ones that you know, keep it in good working order. They're going away. And there's no end of bad news about macro species either, like elephants and rhinos and cats. I mean, it, it's, um, it's unbelievably depressing. And of course, disastrous and maybe irreversible changes to the climate. Um, so as someone who's devoted himself to wanting to understand life on Earth, how do you feel about this? I feel very much the same way. And, and, and um, I, you know, subscribe to these elephant charities and things like that. I'm, 
Um, it's partly an aesthetic thing. I mean, some people say, oh, well, species have always gone extinct and, and the great majority have gone extinct and so on. And, and I don't warm to that at all. I mean, I, I think um, that when a species like, a, like the African elephant, say, if it goes extinct, it's a major tragedy. I would love to see um, genetic engineers bring back the woolly mammoth um, and the thylacine from uh, Tasmania and... Um, actually, in the Andertal Man, I'd like to see it brought back as well, but that's more controversial. Um, I, I, so I, I have a very, very strong aesthetic um, judgment in the same way as, as, as you have. I think that um, the rise of, of, hu of humanity over an astonishingly short time, historically, it can be seen as like a, a major plague on on the, on the, on the we're, earth. We're the, we're the primary invasive species. On, yes. On the other hand, um, some of my friends and colleagues, uh, Matt Ridley and Stephen Pinker, for example, are somewhat lone voices crying in the wilderness, but they are optimists who've written books. Um, Stephen Pinker's, um, well, two books, The Better Angels of Our Nature and Enlightenment Now, which only just come out, and Matt Ridley is the rational optimist, um, who have enormous faith in the power of science to um, conquer the problems that are going to arise. They don't deny that these problems are arising uh, and, and will increase, but they also point to the enormous success historically of science in solving problems. And so um, I don't know where I stand on that. I would, I would like to believe the optimists uh, if, if I could. Well, I just, I, I, I know a lot of this dis discussion about how, you know, Steve Pinker talks about how great things are and we shouldn't, you know, despite how we look at things and see they're so bad that really they're better, but oftentimes they're, all those kinds of discussions are aimed at human life. It's better for human life than yeah. we yeah. tend to think of it, but uh, I think Losing the damage we're bringing about to the biosphere, I mean, if you're going to be human-centric, could have bad consequences for us that we're not even able to divine right now. Yes. So, um, and this is why I keep thinking about, do we really have it in us to solve global problems like this, or, uh, you know, is it just beyond what we're capable of, of doing? But anyway, that's kind of a depressing note, but I guess we'll... <laughs> We'll, uh, we'll stop there. Are we, is it time? Yeah, okay. Can we have the lights right. up then? So I think we're going to go into a question and answer period. Thank you. Am I audible? Yep. Yes. Professor Dawkins, um, is there any hopes in the future of you helping us establish more debates such as when you were in Sydney with Cardinal, or Cardinal Dodge, or George Pell or um, on Al Jazeera or Sam Harris with William Lane Craig? Can we see any of those in the future coming? Um, and on a side note, is your wife still painting your ties? <laughs> and for Carolyn on the side note, um, with all your experience coming to you in the last you know, three decades, can you imagine some way of interstellar travel that you could see in the future? Thank you. Uh, well, this, this tie is one of Lala's, and, and I have many more. Um, I've also got an, a, a, a new source of ties, which is a, a young Italian artist who pan paints ties. His name is Leonardo. <laughs> <clears throat> and I've got three of his ties. Um, uh, debates. I don't actually like the debate format very much. Obviously, you do. Um, uh, uh, I don't think I'm bad at it, but I'm not very good at it either. Um, and I'm not sure that it's the best way to get at the truth, um, because there are some people with great rhetorical skills who are talking absolute nonsense, and they, they get... You crossed your spell. You crossed Well... <laughs> but George Pell... Well, he was described to me as a bit of a bruiser, um, which he is. Um, and um, he's been in a bit of trouble now, isn't he, I think? Yes. But I, don't, I don't do schadenfreude. Um, 
I think one of the problems with having debates with creationists is that <clears throat> often they have their own audience there, and the audience um, doesn't really know any better than to be snowed by the false arguments which are, which are being put. So I don't do debates with creationists. I, I do sometimes do them with so-called sophisticated theologians. Um, <laughs> my, um, my colleague, the Australian biologist physicist Robert May, who became the president of the Royal Society, a very distinguished scientist, he's got a good answer to, to when he's invited to have a debate with a creationist. He says, that would look good on your CV, not so good on mine. <laughs> Um, the interstellar I, yeah. question, you're going to be surprised at this, but I'm not in favor of interstellar travel because I don't think there's a good purpose for it. I haven't heard anyone articulate a really good reason why we need to go and find another planet to live on. If we had those kind of resources, we should fix the one we're on now. That's how I feel about it. And, and as long as you've... As long as you've given me the opportunity, can I just elaborate a little bit more on this? We'll, we'll take everybody's questions. Um, I just want to point out that, I mean, it may be obvious, but it may bear stating anyway, that how, how would interstellar travel happen when you're talking about actually sending people and not our robots? Um, maybe there would be a party of 100, maybe 1,000 even people that we would put in a spaceship Probably we'd have to figure out a way to get close to the speed of light in order to make this even feasible. We don't know that that's even physically possible. But let's say we do that and we send them off and then we bid them goodbye and maybe for some period of time we hear from them, just the way we hear from spacecraft, you know, like voyagers, you know, out in the interstellar medium from now, uh, right now we hear from it. Um, but eventually they will be out of reach right, because we'll get older and older, they'll get further away, the light travel time will make it so that you never hear from them. They'll be notional. You know, maybe you'll be, you know, in the morning washing your hands, shaving, and you'll be thinking, oh yeah, there's that party of, you know, people we sent out, humanity, humanity 2.0, you know, and you'll think about them and that's it, you'll go about your life, which is to say it will matter n not a whit. I shall argue with Carolyn on this. Um, not I'm now. not done. Not now. I'm not we, done, though. No, not now. We, we, we've got two more gigs to do, one, one in Memphis and one in Dallas. And so, Dallas and Nashville. 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 That's right, Nashville. Um, so we shall take this up there, okay? Okay, okay. Okay. <laughs> okay. All right, well, but, but you heard my, my yeah. take on it. Yeah. I want to I fix this planet first. Does that mean I'm up? Yep. Uh, what a pleasure to be in the same room, uh, Professor Dawkins, as you. The, I'm a little disappointed. They, I, I wore my blue shoes. <laughs> or socks, I mean. Uh, because you were so famous in wearing those multicolored socks of yours. Um, I wanted to thank you very much for the, um, uh, the in intention you have of writing a child's book to help children understand that um, woo-woo is not necessarily reality. And I'm hoping that one day that will, that, that will come out. My the answer question to your question is yes. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I hope very soon. Yes. Um, my question though is this, that you're here in Canada, uh, uh, CFI, uh, doesn't seem to know where Canada is because when they, when they outlined all of your speaking engagements, uh, this one was not on the list. But having said that, you're in Canada, and as you know... <laughs> you noticed! Uh, yeah, yes, yes, we've noticed. We we'll hope the rest of you do. But um, here we have an issue uh, that came up a number of weeks ago with uh, an event with Christia Freeland. And she and our Prime Minister uh, took to task the uh, Arabian uh, Prince, uh, Crown Prince, with his uh, issue of uh, incarcerating uh, Rafi Badwa. Have I got that right? 
I think Rafe Badawi is R name. Rafe Badawi and his sister. And uh, uh, there isn't a nation on the planet that supported Canada in that initiative. I'm sorry, who? What's the and, question? And the question is, and, uh, and now we're finding that uh, the same Crown Prince um, was probably involved with a premeditated murder. No, no, I, I, I have no intention of saying that. Involved no, they, they with just a premeditated to... murder of a um, reporter. Obviously, Carolyn and I both deplore it very heartily. That's the answer to, to, to your question. Yeah. <laughs> Anything about it? Okay. <laughs> test, test. Okay, this does work, actually. Carolyn, I would just like to say I was actually here for your talk. I think you're brilliant. Thank you. Um, I think everyone, she should deserve a round of applause. She is very brilliant. If, you're not, if you don't know who Voyager or Cassini is, please look it up. It's actually very lovely. So my thank question you, for thank you. Thank you very much. I was beginning to feel like chopped liver. <laughs> I, I had to educate a few people. I'm like, do you know what Cassini is and Voyager? I'm like, oh, okay. I will, I, this is why I'm no longer allowed at parties. So, um, my question for you um, would be, I'm very startled being in, like, in a little right. bit of the spotlight, sorry. You're doing okay. <laughs> Thanks. Um, it would be, uh, do you think that there would be, should we explore life in one of Saturn's moons instead of Mars? <laughs> <That's>, um, <clears throat> yes. <laughs> yes. <clears throat> Yes. With Mars, you're going to have a lot of the radiation, a lot no, of, no, like, no. there's some things No, over Mars there. is not a radiation issue. Uh, in Europa is a radiation issue, and we decided to send the spacecraft to Europa uh, because that was all we had, so to speak, before we got to Saturn with Cassini, but then we found Enceladus, and Enceladus is just so much better for doing that kind of uh, observation, going to look for biosignatures than Europa is. But even Mars, the surface of Mars, is toxic also for a different reason. Uh, having to do with ultraviolet radiation. There's nothing that prevents ultraviolet radiation from getting down on the surface. Uh, and any life there is going to be subsurface. And so you have to dig for it. And so, oh, and then also we just recently found the surface is covered with this salt called perchlorate, which is like the most saline thing we know of. Uh, and life can't live in extreme salinity. So, you know, it's... We started going to Mars, and, and it, the whole program got started. And so we, you know, it's like momentum. We're still doing it. Uh, and it's just been difficult. We found organic materials. They finally have found large organic molecules a few inches below the surface of Mars. But they can't tell you whether or not. They, they just don't know. It's not like they're hiding it. They, they, uh, it's not known whether those are molecules that were delivered on the backs of meteorites, or they were produced abiotically, which means without biology, or they are the remnants of former organisms. We just don't know. Um, I want to say, though, we don't know that we're going to go to Enceladus with the right kind of experiments and find life there either. We just don't know. I mean, there's no promises in this. It's just right now promising, very promising. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Here. So, uh, during one of your Christmas lectures, you had described life as being a brief moment in the spotlight. And what I was wondering from both of you is if you could tell me, uh, during your brief moment in the spotlight, what has brought you the most joy? Well, That's you. I didn't, well, give, <laughs> I didn't give any Christmas no, lectures. But, no, I didn't, but, but you had a... You're a star in the spotlight, so, so. <laughs> who, who the, the, did, the, the point, the point no, let, let, let me explain, let, let, let me explain. Um, I was trying to make the point that um, in, the, in the sweep of time, um, the time that we, we live is extremely small, and I, and I use the analogy of a spotlight moving along a great ruler of, 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 of time. Oh. And so it was almost 
the probability of your being alive is extremely low because, it, because the vast majority of time you're dead before you're born and then yes. dead after right, you're, after, right. you're, um, <laughs> after you're dead. Um, <laughs> and um, so he's, he's fishing for us to say something, something about the greatest joy we've had in our brief moment in the, in the, in the sun. You go first. I was hoping you'd go first. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I'll go first. I'll go first. Um, I, I feel like I have led a charmed existence, and I mean that. I say this all the time because of what I got to do in life. I was, I was on the Voyager Project, which was the most far-reaching, most... Um, most far-reaching, most historically significant, and most iconic mission of them all. And I don't think it's hyperbole to say that Voyager was the Apollo 11 of the planetary program. That's how significant it was, and also the, it, it has that kind of status in the, the imagination of the public. So I was on that project. And then immediately after that, I was chosen to lead the imaging team on Cassini, two of the most profoundly successful missions of all. And, you know, I, it's really true that I have felt, and this is common in our business, I fe felt that I was an explorer actually there. You know, I, I know all I did for three decades was sit in front of my computer terminal typing, but it didn't feel that way up here. Up here, I was living on Saturn, and I got to be part of, not only be alive like all of you were at a time when we did this, but I was lucky enough to be part of that and even lead the team of scientists who were the documentarians of our travels at Saturn. So, I mean, how, you know, it, it was rough. I'm not going to lie. It was actually a very, very tough job, very demanding. But I know when I die, I will, you know, I will know that I lived my life in probably the most significant, meaningful way that I could have. Yeah. So that gives me a lot of joy. Mm. I agree. Yes, I, I, I think that, that during the short time that, 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 that we have, for me, the privilege of being allowed to understand why I exist in the first place, which is what a, an evolutionary biologist does. I mean, it's an astonishing thing to, to say, here, here we are, it's as though we've just woken up. It's as, in, in, imagine that you were transported to another planet, and you, you, you stumble out of the out of the spaceship and you find yourself surrounded by all sorts of weird and beautiful things, alien things. That's the situation we're in when we're born. We don't stumble out of a spaceship, we stumble out of our mother. <laughs> but if, if you think of it like that, then it's an amazing privilege to live on this, on this planet and to be born at a time when we very largely understand the process that brought us here, the process of evolution from their physics up through the billions of years of evolution to, to, to give rise, rise to us. And it's only really in the last couple of centuries that it's been possible to say that, and, it's, and the pace is, is accelerating. And so as a biologist, I, although my feet have been on the ground, so to speak, I haven't been to Saturn, um, I, I feel a similar kind of excitement to the kind of life that I have led as an evolutionary biologist. Uh, Richard, I'm a member of the Clergy Project, so thank you for your role. In that, that deserves a loud round of applause. Yeah. <laughs> there's, um, there's two others of us uh, here tonight. Um, I'm, I'm very new to this, so I'm wondering how did you meet, uh, you know, this four horsemen thing? How did you guys get together? Did you know each other beforehand? Uh, what was the connection? How did, how did you guys bubble up to be the four horsemen? Well, let me first of all say a little bit about the clergy pro project, which, you, which you're on. Um, this, this is a project which we started some years ago to help people in the clergy to free themselves from the yoke that they were under and to find an, an alternative life. And so congratulations on being a member of the clergy project. Um, the Four Horsemen, well, that's an accident. I mean, we, we, we never called ourselves the, the Four Horsemen. We just uh, wrote books at roughly the same time without collaborating or, or conspiring together or anything like that. We just, we just wrote our books. 
um, we had a meeting, the only meet time we ever met as four people together in the same room, um, uh, in Washington DC in Christopher Hitchens' flat and recorded that and it's available on, uh, on, on our website, uh, Richard Dawkins Foundation website, but it's also, um, we just about to publish a transcript of that entire uh, discussion. And the book is to be called The Four Horsemen, and it has uh, new essays by the three of us who survive, plus a new foreword by Christopher, sorry, Stephen Fry. Um, so that's going to be available, I think, um, any time now. Uh, so, of course, I want to start by thanking you very much for joining us, but also wanted to quickly say it's so great to be in a room with all of you as well, people who share the same interests, so thank you all very much. Uh, I appreciated the time spent on describing the similarities and differences between Lamarckian and Darwinian evolution, and I was hoping you could touch briefly upon epigenetics, the way that the environment expresses genes, uh, expression, and even transcription, and more broadly in terms of scientific communication. How do you go about explaining these sort of processes to a public audience? Because I've seen far too, too many advertisements for epigenetic yoga, and I think that has to be wrong. <laughs> <laughs> Epigenetics is the flavor of the, well, I almost said month, I'd, I'd rather say week. Um, uh, it, what epigenetics actually is, is, is the differential turning on of some genes rather than others. So epigenetics happens all the time in, in embryology, in, in development. You start with an egg, it, it splits, it splits, it splits, it splits, and then you get different tissues developing. Different genes get turned on. So in any one cell, only a minority of genes get turned on. Others are switched, switched off. That is epigenetics. Now, it's become a vogue word to mean something rather different which is a kind of pseudo-Lamarckism, <clears throat> which is a, a passing on to, to subsequent generations of which genes are turned on and which genes are not. So it may happen, it may occasionally happen. It's not a big phenomenon, it's not a very important phenomenon. What is an important phenomenon is epigenetic differentiation within the embryology of every one of us when we, when we were in our mother's womb. Um, but the, the vogue word epigenetics, which has now been taken to mean a kind of neo-Lamarckism, is overrated and needs to be uh, put in its place. <laughs> hello? Yes, hello, hello? we can hear you. Oh, awesome. Uh, <clears throat> thank you both for coming. I don't know how long you're in Calgary for, but I definitely recommend checking out the Royal Tyrell Museum. I've in been Drumheld. there. Okay, been, excellent. Been there, done that. Awesome. Okay, cool. I've got a really cool picture of myself standing in front of that dinosaur on the outside. Oh, hell yeah, nice. Yeah. On my Did you web... go up top? No. Oh, it shakes. <laughs> like... <laughs> Stone jump. Um, so, Professor Dawkins, you said uh, the only other option is design. Uh, are we in a simulation? <laughs> Sorry. Uh, what do you say? Are we in a simulation? Oh, like a, an ancestor simulation. Are we in a simulation? Um, I mean, th there, there is a theory which, which I first of all met in a, book, in a science fiction book by Daniel F. Galloy called Counterfeit World, which suggested that yes, we are indeed in a simulation. And that has been revived more recently by um, Max Tegmark, I think. Is that right, the, the, the cosmologist Max Tegmark? And Elon Musk. Sorry? And Elon Musk. And Elon Musk. No. That's what he said. Really? <laughs> Oh, maybe, okay, maybe, maybe Elon Musk. Um, <clears throat> and the, 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 I think Max Tegmark, have I got it right? It made, no, it's not him, it's, it's Nick, Bostrom. Nick Bostrom, that's the one, Nick Bostrom. Um, he thinks that future humans will have developed the technology to simulate us. And so he thinks that we are in a simulation done by our remote descendants of the future. And he makes the point that we couldn't disprove that. But <laughs> um, yeah, well, um, I'm I'm open to all new ideas. Okay. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> I'm
I just have a uh, just a nice question. Uh, unfortunately, I became an atheist two years after Christopher Hitchens passed away. So I was just wondering if you would uh, share a particular memory of Hitch that you wanted to share with us. Did you know him, Carolyn? I, I had only met him. Um, I, met him. I mean, I, I, I wasn't a close friend of his. I, I, I also only met him sort of after our, our books on atheism were published. Um, I, I, I admired him enormously. I, I thought he was in many ways the finest orator I ever heard because he he not only had a very good voice, but he also had an enormous store of erudition and knowledge and was able to come out with facts at, at command whenever he needed them. So he was a very, very effective debater. I, I, I once um, wrote a blurb for one of his books saying, if you're invited to have a debate against Christopher Hitchens, decline. <laughs> uh, he's a, 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 very, a very tragic loss. I didn't agree with him on everything. He, was, he was, um, uh, had very different views on abortion, for example, from, from, what, I, from what I hold, um, and on the Iraq war, of course. And but, he made some ridiculous statement about how women aren't inherently funny. That's right, yes. <laughs> uh, I think he was a contrarian, although he explicitly denied it. Um, <laughs> <clears throat> and I particularly, in, I particularly enjoyed his answer to the free will question, which I hope we don't get tonight. Um, and when he was asked whether um, he had free will, he said, I have no choice. <laughs> <clears throat> Thanks. Okay, so. Richard, <clears throat> Richard my, my question was very similar to the last gentleman's, but I became very interested in in, uh, I'll say your friend and colleague, Christopher Hitchens, some time ago, and was astonished at his, his knowledge and skills of evolution versus creation. And I'm curious about your first meeting with him and what you talked about. Well, I, I, I met him at backstage when we were going to go on as a debate um, t together in London. And... Um, that debate was, was a, that occasion was notable because he was the subject of a false memory, I think a most dramatic false memory, um, in which um, we were debating against three theologians, and one of the theologians said something silly, and he, <laughs> and, and Christopher said, how dare you, how dare you, <laughs> only he didn't, and that, that was the false memory. Um, and what, 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 what actually happened was that much later, um, a question from the audience provoked him to say that. What the, what the woman on the, on the platform said was, was also silly, but, but not that silly. And, <laughs> and he, his reaction to it was not actually audible. Now, I, I discovered my false memory by watching the YouTube video of the occasion, which proved absolutely conclusively that I was wrong in remembering when he said, how dare you? Well, that's not particularly remarkable. False memory syndrome is a well-known phenomenon. What is remarkable is that I then later met Anthony Grayling, who was also at, at the debate on my side, sitting next to me. And when I, I told him this story, because I thought he'd be interested in false memory, and his jaw dropped, he said, but I have exactly the same false memory. <laughs> Thank you, Richard. I, I do recall that YouTube as well. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> no need to app applaud every answer. <laughs> so, uh, Mr. Dawkins, I have a question. What uh, do you think of the uh, what I would call egalitarian slash true atheist argument that there is no God or gods or devil or devils or whatever what have the if only, because there couldn't be, for we are all equal, though we are not the same, no exceptions or exemptions, period. I don't really get the argument. Um, what, why could there not be a God just because we're equal? I don't, I don't see, I don't get that. Well, like, for example, in Star Trek, uh, Captain Picard <laughs> says to Q, you are not God. Right, the whole premise would be 
the whole nature of the argument is it doesn't matter if this or that would have whatever quote unquote supernatural powers if only because well we are all equal or we are not the same I, I may be the only person in the room who's matter. never seen Star Trek Carolyn you, you, you've seen Star Trek did, did you, can you answer that can I answer this I, it, it sounds like you're asking Richard what his opinion is of an argument that if we're all equal there can't be a god because then that means God is in we're all God is that exactly what in a sense. It's a stupid argument. Doesn't sound like a good argument to me. Yet. <laughs> no, it isn't. Well, yes. There's, 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 better, there's better reasons to dismiss the existence of God well, than that. Well, of course, but I'm just asking in that, with that particular argument. I think we answered, right? Didn't we? Yeah. <laughs> okay. All right. Thank you. Hello. Hello. Um, first of all, I think we all agree that Richard Dawkins is one of the most, has one of the most beautiful minds of this past century. And so my question relates to. Wow. Well, let's give him a round of applause first. <laughs> Tell him one that come on. <laughs> my question is about consciousness in terms of an evolutionary sense, and then specifically bio entanglement, and the idea that biological organisms follow the same kind of processes that you find in quantum entanglement what? and the idea of like non-locality in terms of um, obtaining information faster than the speed of light. So I, I, I was about to say, I, I was about to say, I, I don't do consciousness, um, but I'd rather do consciousness than quantum entanglement, I think, because... No, no, no. <laughs> he said well, bio-entanglement. Bio-entanglement, that biological Could, organisms do a similar thing. Yes, he's, but, but you're, uh, are you talking about Roger Penrose and, and, no, what? I'm talking about, um, you know, even in RNA, um, there's entanglement there, there's um, physics that, you know, just simply the, um, the quantum entanglement to being the spin of two photons, when you can separate them between, let's say, a galaxy, and if so, you change the spin of one, you change the spin so of the are, other. So are you saying that, the, that quantum entanglement might have some relevance to biology? I'm saying that consciousness, and I know you hate consciousness. No, no, <laughs> no, I, 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 think you're, I, think, are you, I think you're talking about Roger Penrose's idea. I'm I, not sure. Um, what is Roger Penrose's idea? Well, he, he thinks that, that um, consciousness is, is not not explicable by, by, but the, by the ordinary sort of data handling models of, of um, com computers and things like that, and that, and that something, something mysterious is going on in neurons to do with quantum theory. And I, obviously I don't understand it. Can, I, can I ask you a quick question? Are you familiar with synesthesia? With who? Synesthesia. Oh, yes. But I don't think that's what... Nothing, that's nothing to do with quantum well, What is synesthesia? Synesthesia Syn is, is, is when your senses get confused and... and A blending and, of the and, senses. And, and, and you, you hear you colors. Hear co yeah. that, that, that what about thing. Niels Bohr when he said that there is a... Um, a, a spirit, a community of spirit, and when he was talking about... Neil deGrasse Tyson talking about... How are you? <laughs> Sorry, guys. I know, I only ask it because you're coming up to... A conference with Brian Green coming up here November the first. I think we're talking about a lot of different things here. I mean, um, but just in like the specific bio entanglement sense, I, if it's one percent chance that there's other dimensions outside of space and time, and if you look at an event horizon, when you reach the event look, horizon of a look, black no, hole, there is no time. No, like, uh, really, is it not worth investigating, even if it's worth I, like I one percent? I think this is this is a kind of just a whole lot of sciencey sounding words that don't have much connection with each other. And, 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 and I'm sorry. I, I, think, I think we better go on to the other yeah. questions. Okay, we, okay. we have to be done in about hey. six minutes. <clears throat> um, okay. My question is, um, how did you guys pick your careers? Was it really easy for you or did you have a lot of interests? In, uh, how does someone who's like 20, 30, 40 pick, like, go through that decision? 
In my case, it was starting off pretty much as an accident, but it was an accident. I was, I'm delighted that it happened. I, I, I didn't plan it. It, it just sort of... I, I drifted into it and couldn't, and couldn't be happier that that's where I ended up. And in my case, I just have always, ever since I can be, remember, been very curious about the natural world. So I took all... You know, I just did science, even in, as a young kid, just went in that direction. And... Eventually, I realized I was interested in space and astronomy, and um, that actually started with more of a religious quest, trying to, what I call an existential crisis, trying to understand at the age of about 13 what was the meaning of my life and what was I doing here. I don't know how many went through that stage when you're a young teenager, you know, you're trying to make sense of the world and yourself. And that basically evolved into, okay, well, where is here? And I turned to astronomy, and I feel the same way. I, feel, I, I just never had any question. I was not one of these people who was torn, oh, do I want to be, do I want to write, do I want to go into medicine? It was just, I always just did what I, you know, followed this drive. So I don't know what to advise people who don't really know what to do. But I'm just telling you that, I like Richard, I just feel like having spent my life as a scientist is hands down the most interesting thing you could do with your time. I just wanted to say it's an incredible privilege to be in the room with both of you and listen you. to you tonight. Thank you. Um, I, I, my question for Professor Dawkins, um, of any arguments or discussions you've ever had with any theo theologians, wondering which one would you consider to be the most sophisticated? <laughs> And uh, also curious for um, Professor uh, Porco, uh, wondering if um, you have any uh, insights on the latest news from the climate uh, change being much worse in the next century than that just came out recently. Uh, what would be the best um, technology or, or science and research that is currently being done that would provide some hope for that? Okay, you want to go first, Richard? The most sophisticated doesn't mean the most valid, of course. And um, I, I, I have never come across any good argument from a theologian of any kind. Um, so, some may sound sophisticated, but that often is because there's really nothing there. And, and, it's, it's, um, uh, and, and it, it, it may sound complicated and, and, and it may sound difficult, but I think it, it's, 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 it's either non-existent or empty. Okay. And um, obviously I'm incredibly alarmed, uh, but frankly not surprised that things are worse than uh, we had been, uh, you know, told whatever, 10 years ago, five years ago, because in those past announcements of the status, you know, where we were in the climate change situation, there was always, scientists always said, well, you know, we've modeled A, B, C, and D. These are the five scenarios. It could go in this direction under these assumptions. This would be the worst under those assumptions. But, you know, mind you, we don't really know what methane in the permafrost, uh, what effect that will have, and we don't know this, we don't know this. And so now we're finding it's much worse. And I just heard, I don't know if it's true, but I heard someone who's a noted uh, climate journalist say that we have now put so much CO2 into the atmosphere that we could even prevent or it would dominate the Milankovitch cycle. So in about, don't quote me, something like 10,000, maybe it's 20,000 years, we'll go through another ice age. That would be what would return ice to the poles, assuming we lose it all, right? But we've put enough CO2 into the atmosphere already that it could it might possibly prevent that from happening. So it, it's very, very serious. And I knew even before that announcement was made, just reading the Paris, uh, not the Paris Accord, uh, reading a book that was produced by, um, it was a, a combined effort from the Royal Society in England and the National Academies of Science here, uh, and it said, its last statement was basically that um, we've already put enough CO2 in the atmosphere that even if we brought down emissions, what did I say? Did I Nothing, speak? no, it's my stupid alarm. Oh. <laughs> I, I thought I missed, you, 
put CO2 into the atmosphere uh, that if we brought emissions down to zero now, the sea levels are still going to rise somewhat, still going to get hotter. So it's been clear to me for a while, it's even more clear now, that what we have to do is remove CO2 from the atmosphere, bring emissions down as close to zero as we can, and remove CO2 from the atmosphere. Okay, I just have this feeling, like I said already, I'm not sure we're up to it because it has to be done globally. You gotta get China to do it. You gotta get Africa. You gotta get all the developing countries that wanna be, live the lifestyles that we live. You gotta get them to do it. You've gotta get rid of a president who says it's a hoax. Well. <laughs> but, but you're kind of making my point. How did he get there? He wasn't elected. Our election was hacked. That's why he's there. Okay, so yeah. we, we're facing enormous, enormous problems. And, um, but you ask me what technologies, everyone thinks technology is gonna be the answer. It's not the only answer. We have to have you know, political will behind it, but we have to remove CO2. That's what we have to do. It's for your inspiration. Uh, uh, how much longer we... One, is it last? Somebody say last question. Okay, so I guess it's over here. I'm sorry. To... Yeah. <clears throat> Hello. Hello. <laughs> uh, my question is for the both of you. Uh, I've heard uh, there's an opinion going around that science and religion can't coexist uh, in a professional laboratory, for example. Do you think that's true? And if you do, what is the branch of science that can uh, work the closest with religion, if you know what I mean? The cl closest what? Uh, what is the branch of science that can potentially work the closest with religion? Well, it, it, in, in, in one sense, they must be compatible because there are individual humans who manage to do both. Mm -hmm. uh, but I don't find that a very profound answer. Um, I believe there is a, a very, very deep incompatibility, and that's perhaps more so as a biologist even than a physicist, because biologists are constantly aware of having an explanation for the existence of massive complexity which doesn't involve any kind of um, intelligence or, or, or creative um, design. And so if you have a... Um, if, if, you're, if you're a scientist who believes that, that in spite of all your science there is a creator too, then, as it were, you've betrayed the entire scientific enterprise because you've undercut the whole massive enterprise of explaining things. You've, you've, produced, you've, you've smuggled in a non-explanation at the very place where you ought to have an explanation. And so I believe that science and belief in God anyway, some people you define religion differently, it's just, you know, um, thinking beautiful thoughts and things like that. that that's fine. <laughs> Um, but, um, but, 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 but religion in the sense of believing in a supernatural creator of the universe, the laws of physics, biology, whatever, um, that I believe is deeply and fundamentally incompatible with, with science. I agree. One more? Ten more? We're going to do ten more minutes. Okay, okay, so, yes. Okay, go ahead. That's great, okay. Okay, Professor Porco, I recall you saying that you feel you've spent so much of your life looking up into the universe, it's sometimes hard to keep up with what's happening here on Earth. Do you think influential women scientists have a responsibility to address gendered social issues within the scientific community? Or should it be acceptable to stay quiet and maintain their focus on major scientific work as is a male scientist's privilege? And are you annoyed by questions centered around your gender instead of your remarkable, <laughs> remarkable scientific work? Well, um, <clears throat> I'm annoyed that these issues exist. I'm certainly, you know, it's hard to believe it's 2018 and we've just gone backwards um, in this thing. Um, I don't make a big deal about it. I don't want to, you know, I, I, here's the thing, here's the thing about it. I know why women want to talk about women in science. I get it. They want to just, for the, young, the next generation, they want to show, look, you can do this, and it will be empowering to them. It probably would have made a big 
difference to me or would have helped more to have had women role models when I was young, because I didn't. Um, but for those of us who are held up as poster children, you know, uh, it's actually not such a good thing because I feel that it kind of cuts my accomplishments in half. It's like saying, it's like saying you, we're going to hold you up as a woman in science. We're going to make this arena over here. Oh, there's all these women, and you're a woman in science, and you've done great that way. And I feel, well, damn it, I, I was here with the big boys over here in the big arena, and, you know, I kicked butt. Yeah, yeah. You, you didn't really have to do that, but it's okay. <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not trying to pat myself on the back. I'm just trying to make a point that, um, you know, you, Morgan Freeman, I think, said the, say, a similar thing when I think he was asked, you, you know, how do you feel ab about being a successful black actor? He said, I'm not a successful black actor. I'm a successful actor. Yes. And I feel that way. I feel like I'm a, I'm, I'm a scientist, damn it. Forget my gender. If you're calling out my gender, you're undermining the very thing we're trying to like get, I mean, you're, you're calling out the very thing we're trying to get rid of. So Precisely. It's a, it's a double, it's, I get both sides. I get that young girls need role models. But, you know, for the people who are held up in this way, it's kind of irritating. And I'm not the only one who feels this way. So I would say to women in science, you know, if you want to hold conferences with, you know, have lots of women speak or all women speak, do it. Just don't talk about it. Just, yeah. <laughs> you know? Or, or better yet, you know, make sure you have women and, and throw in men too, just to prove that, you know, oh, here's the other thing. Oh, you're gonna get me started on this. <laughs> here's, the, here's the other thing that's a little bit irritating. And, you know, we say to men, you've excluded us, damn it, all this time, you know, you're, God knows, you're making deals, you know, in the men's bathroom, we're excluded from that. <laughs> You know, and, and so on. But to say, oh, we're going to just have women in science and all these groups of women are going to get together, it kind of excludes them. We're kind of doing exactly what we said that they did that got us angry. So, you know, I don't know what to say this, what the solution is, except just, you know, keep on keeping on. And just, I, you know, I think that the rules are in place. I've said this also a lot. The, the, um, this, the strategic battle has been won. The rules are generally in place. Women have to be, their proposals have to be reviewed. They go, people go out of their way to make sure that, you know, you were treating, we're looking at uh, female candidates for a job as well as male candidates for a job. So I, I think that's, we've made large progress there. Still, I think that the battle is the tactical battle. When you're in, you know, you're in a, around a table and you know, there's mostly men and you're the only female, it can be intimidating to offer your opinion knowing that chances are you're gonna get dissed. You know, no one's gonna pay attention. So, I mean, I don't know what else more to say about this. I mean, I, you know, I get it, I, I get it, but I'd rather you not do it for me. <laughs> I'm, I'm a scientist, that's what I am. Okay, and, I hope one day we don't have to talk about it. Thank you so much, have okay, a great night. Okay. Of you, both of you have uh, studied networks on the cosmological scale and on the biological scale. Uh, what would you, from each side, apply to how humans interact with our, you know, our environment around us that would make the world a better place? Are you talking about like the biosphere? Is that yeah. what you mean? I just regard it, just respect it. You know, just don't bulldoze everything down. You know, limit the population. You know, that's a serious thing we have to contend with. There's too many of us. When I was born, which is a long time ago now, there were 2.7 billion people on the planet. Okay, now there's 7 billion. That's outrageous. That's outrageous. We think of this as, no, this is the new normal. Everywhere we go, there's people all around. We think of this as the new normal. That shouldn't be normal. There's too many of us. You look at me like she's out of her mind. Not at all, man. Oh. <laughs> so I, I'm, I'm very concerned about the way we interact. I don't know. I feel like I want to go back and be a Native American Indian. I feel like maybe they had a much better uh, you know, attitude and respect for the natural environment. We're missing that. We're really missing that. So, so I, I mean, I don't, I don't know. I, I, I'm, I just recently tried anyway. I'm not completely there. I've, eliminated meat from my diet. Don't eat beef. 
Don't eat beef. Okay, the single, I'm, I'm told the single most effective thing you could do to protect the environment is reduce beef from your, from your diet because cattle, raising of cattle is very destructive. Um, you know, just do something though, do something. Professor Dawkins? Okay, is this like the cattle ranching province in Canada? <laughs> Oops. Well, look, I said it. I just, you know, that's the way. Professor Dawkins, Caroline, it's a pleasure and honor to talk to you both. My question is for Professor Dawkins. Um, uh, it's time and times we see that in your debates, um, people want to imply that uh, Einstein, for example, believed in God. And, of course, you try to educate them how they misunderstood the quotes. So my question is, in a bigger picture, how is it relevant to the truth if Einstein believed in God or not, since we can see scientists uh, surprisingly on both ends of the spectrum? Thank you. Yes, well... Um I, Einstein, of course, did not believe in God, although he used the word God a great deal uh, as, a sort of, as, a, as a metaphor for that which we don't understand. So things like, what I really want to know is, did God have a choice in designing the universe? He meant, is there more than one way for a universe to be, or is there only one way? And similarly, when he said he didn't believe God, that, that he plays dice. Um, and he, he became very irritated by people misunderstanding him as believing in God, and he said so explicitly. And um, I think one letter that he wrote in German has just come up for auction again quite recently. It's going to be it's raising some huge price in which he explicitly denies he believes in God. Um, you say there are, there are scientists on both sides. There are a few religious scientists in the sense of people of who really, really do believe in Jesus or resurrection, virgin birth and things. There are very few. Most scientists who say that they're religious, if you actually ask them what they believe, they're kind of spiritual. I mean, they sort of, they have a feeling of what they call awe and wonder, which is kind of a bit of a cliche, but it, it means what it says. And Karen and I both have it in a big way. Um, the, 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 the Carl Sagan kind of re religiosity, which has nothing to do with supernatural, but which is a feeling of reverence, awe, wonder, um, a, a sort of burgeoning feeling in the, in the chest when you look up at the, at the stars or look down a microscope. Um, and there are people who will use the word religious for that. And so when, a, a, when you hear that there are religious scientists, ask them what they really believe, and you'll find that it's pretty much likely to be that. Just a few fingers of one hand or, almost among really distinguished scientists believe in the resurrection of Jesus or the virgin birth or something of that sort, but they, they are very rare. Does it matter what Einstein's personal belief was? Well, it shouldn't really matter because, because what matters is the evidence for, for what's true. But it's, it's rather hard not to be influenced, nevertheless, we're human. It's rather hard not to be influenced by um, the opinions of people that we, that we respect. And, and so, um, uh, although it wouldn't in any possible way demonstrate the existence of something just because Einstein believed in it, um, if, if he did, you know, it'd give you pause. You, you want to ask him why. You say, well, tell me, Dr. Einstein, why do you believe in God? And, and you, you'd listen to what he said, at least. Thank you. But he didn't, anyway. <laughs> <clears throat> this is the last question, by the way. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Make it good. Okay. Make it good. That's a lot of pressure. Um, I'm uh, uh, one of the founding members of the Atheist Society. Thank you short people, um, Atheist Society of Calgary, and our central, yeah, our, one of our central missions uh, is to um, build community, and I'm just wondering what some of your thoughts are on some ways that we might do that, some ways that we might build our community here. Yes, um, th there, there are m movements afoot to, to have sort of atheist churches where you meet on Sunday and... and, and um, <laughs> And, and I mean, I, I respect that. I, it's probably quite a nice thing to do. You meet, meet friends and maybe have lectures and book clubs and things. Um, uh, it, it, it's, not, it's not my way, but, but I, I, do, I do respect it. And I think it's, it's very good for people to, to meet up with other pe people like mine and just learn that there are other, other people like yourself. Um, I guess in a, 
enlightened country like Canada, it doesn't much matter. But, but if you go to um, Texas, say, or somewhere, um, <laughs> uh, I mean, one of the things I, I find when, when, I, when I lecture in the deep south of the United States is that I, I, t I do get quite large audiences, and I get the feeling that what they get out of it is, is each other. I mean, they, they come and they are surrounded by people. They realize they're not alone. Um, they are part of a community that they didn't re realize existed. And so my guess is that the sort of thing you're doing is, is very valuable from that, from that point of view. I congratulate you for doing it. Thank you. I <clears throat> don't have a last word, Karen. Okay, so I get is oh, we're doing one more. Okay, uh, hello. No. Let's do one more. Okay. Okay. Just one more. Uh, my name is John. I'm from Turkey, and in Turkey, evolution is removed from the biology textbooks in high school, and uh, it, it's it's really sad. Uh, not just not just Turkey. Not not just like not actually, the Turkey is re like really important like for me because it, the founder of the Turkey made mandatory signs for the children, and I owe this um, to my friends, like, talk, talk about this situation. So, like, what are your options? Yeah, okay. Right. What are your opinions about uh, this sad situation in Turkey? I, I think it's tragic, um, because, as you said, t Turkey was, was founded by an, an, an enlightened leader, um, Ataturk, uh, who believed in, in science. Um, the, um, one of the things going on in Turkey at the moment is that there's a sort of James Bond villain character called Adnan Oktar, who has, who has published great big coffee table books on creationism. Um, uh, he, he, uh, um, they're fraudulent books. Um, the, the technique is you have um, a, a beautiful color picture of an animal on one side of the page and on the other side of the page another animal. One of them is a fossil. One of them is a modern animal, and the message every, every page is, here's a fossil, and here's a modern animal, and they're exactly the same, so evolution hasn't happened. Um, which is obviously a, a silly argument, but, but what's even sillier is when you look at the detail, because sometimes, the, in many cases, the fossil and the modern animal have nothing to do with each other. I mean, there's a, there's a fossil eel, I think it is, which is said to be identical to the opposite side, which is actually a snake. <laughs> and there's one which is a fossil insect, um, in, an insect in amber, and the modern insect, which it's supposed to be identical to, is a fishing fly. <laughs> oh, my God. Made of feathers, and it's got a, s a steel hook sticking out of its <laughs> back end. Um, and this is a, le a leading creationist intellectual in Turkey. Um, so, um, yes, it's a tragic situation and your countrymen need to fight it. Okay. All right, everyone, please give a huge round of applause for Carolyn Porco and Richard Dawkins. All right, thank you guys so much for coming. Uh, those of you who have a book, uh, a Richard Dawkins book, there will be a book signing in the lobby. Um, please get home safe. Again, thank you so much for coming and let art and science inspire. Thank you. I went to the Ripley Aquarium today. I'm, you guys been to there here in Toronto? My wife and I go to lots of aquariums, uh, and we enjoy them. And it prompted a lot of questions uh, that I thought might get us to talk a little bit more about evolution, about the public understanding of evolution, and what the roadblocks uh, to that understanding might be, if that's... Great. I'm glad you say aquariums, not aquaria, by yes. the way, here. We're well, speaking English, not Latin here. Oh, see, and I, 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 was, I could so could steal a joke from Judah Friedlander right now, but I won't. Uh, about English. I keep missing my thing. So we were 
we were at the Ripley Aquariums, and we, of course, saw many wonderful animals there. And of that, for my wife and I, prompts a discussion about what we used to believe, or whether or not, because I can't recall if I always accepted, I know I was taught about evolution in school, but I can't recall if I always accepted it. It seemed to always be colored with this idea that there was a god in there monkeying around somewhere. Is there any realistic probability that any thinking agent could have been monkeying around in the process based on what we know uh, at this point? No. Uh, <laughs> um, I, I have to be careful here because I was once being interviewed on television by a dreadful man whose name has mercifully escaped me. And he... Um, he, it, I, I didn't realize that he was a sort of plant for intelligent design. And he, he asked me whether I could think of any conceivable, what, what's the, the best scenario I could think of for life on this planet being intelligently designed. Um, and so I thought, well, I'll give him the best shot, which is directed panspermia, the idea that um, Francis Crick and Leslie Orgel put, put, put out, which was that some alien civilization in a distant planet wanted to preserve their form of life. Perhaps they were going extinct or something of that sort. So they put bacteria of their form of life in the nose cone of a spaceship and sent it off into space. And it landed here and started life here. Now, I, I, I said, of course, I don't for a moment believe that, but you've asked me what's the best, uh, the best possibility for life to be designed in this um, by, an by an alien. And he said, wait a minute. Richard Dawkins believes in little green man. <laughs> and this has dogged me ever since. And, and, I, and I regularly get on Twitter. This is the guy who believes in <laughs> aliens seeding life on this planet and so on. It, this is something we've spoken about before, where it seems that there are some people who are going to either intentionally misunderstand or misrepresent what you've said, what anybody said, uh, or they are so horribly confused uh, that they don't seem to understand the basics of the English language. Now, I know that many of them are from the United States, and we've kind of butchered the English language. Uh, but as, as I walked around the aquarium today, aquariums today, and I, I made that note, too, that there were multiples. Uh, my wife mentioned something to me that you see just at the aquariums a broad diversity of life. And I can understand how someone who hasn't been trained and taught you know, about natural selection and the process and the, and the length of time involved could look at this and just say, I give up. I don't understand. Uh, it has to be magic. Somebody has to have done it. How I, I, we should be teaching this. I know there are schools in the United States that don't, even though they're supposed to. Uh, apart from just saying this needs to be the curriculum, what can we as a community do to, to encourage the sort of teaching and training on, on evolutionary theory that we need? I think I give up is a, actually quite a respectable response because it is astounding how complicated life is and how beautiful it is, how diverse it is, and how it, it looks designed. And so. I could well imagine people saying, I give up. However, to say it must have been created, I mean, that's just illogical, because it's no more easy to explain the origin of a creator than it is to explain the origin of the complexity of life itself. It's a total and complete non-explanation. So before Darwin came along, it would have been perfectly respectable to say, I give up. It's incredibly complicated. There's, there must be an explanation, but I can't think of it. And then Darwin came along and did think of it. Um, but to say, therefore, it must have been designed is a total and complete cop-out. It doesn't explain anything. It's actually contradictory. If you say, I give up, it must have been designed, then you're not, you haven't given up. Yeah. You've, you've offered an explanation. And exactly. You can, and you yes. don't even care if it's true. Exactly. So you, so you asked me, what can, what can we do to, to teach it? Well, um, you can write lots of books, as I've done. Um, that's... <laughs> But then, of course, they've got to read them, and which, is, which is more of a problem. Um, 
you can um, you can do television. I suppose I've done a bit of that as well. Um, it is very difficult to get across. I mean, one of the problems is the sheer time involved. Nobody, nobody can grasp the immensity of time that, ge that, that geology allows in which evolution has happened. It is absolutely colossal. And so all our intuitions about the rate at which evolution might go let us down. We can't, we can't really understand how you could g go from, uh, from one species to another, let alone from a, a microbe to mammalian life. So getting across the sheer time scale is one thing. And there are various analogies, you're probably familiar with them, um, lots of them. One that I rather like is the, the one where you stretch your arm out. This, I didn't invent this, somebody else did. And you say, the middle of your throat, the middle of my tie here, um, is the origin of life. And the tip of my finger is the present. And the, the time involved, you've got the dinosaurs didn't come until about there. We say way, way near, near the present. Um, he, human, he, the, the Homo sapiens ar arrived at about the, my fingernail there. And the whole of human history, the whole of recorded history, the Egyptians and the Babylonians and the Persians and the Jews and the Greeks and the Romans and all of human recorded history flies away in the dust from the stroke, from one stroke of the nail file. So we're accustomed to thinking of human history as, as long. We think in the mists of time back to the ancient Greeks, back to the ancient Egyptians. We think so long ago. It's nothing. It's, it's just, as somebody else said, it's the just before the stroke of midnight on the, on the clock face of the geological time. Yeah, there's, there's a couple of difficulties there. Not only our inability to properly grasp the time scales, but also our ego and our sense of self-importance. It, it, it seems strange that everything we know about humans could vanish in that analogous yes. stroke of an animal. I mean, an another analogy, I think, it, I can't remember, it might have been Mark Twain who suggested the layer of paint on top of the Eiffel Tower. That's, that's humanity. But the time scale involved is, is one thing. Another, another point you have to get across is that it is not chance. There are an awful lot of people who think they can simply dismiss evolution because it's the theory of chance. Well, any fool can see it can't possibly be a theory of chance. I mean, chance couldn't possibly give rise to the, the beauty, the elegance, the, the, the sheer designedness, the apparent designedness of living things. It cannot be that. The whole enterprise is to get away from random chance and to substitute something else. And Darwinian natural selection is the only substitute that has ever been proposed that could work. The, the idea that there may be, maybe there's chance involved in when, when and how a mutation occurs, or there may be chance involved in which weather storm might separate someone. But in the broad scheme, this is physical law acting on matter, following, you know, the, the, not, not prescribed by an intelligence, but following the natural order. Yes, there has to be chance, of course, in, in, in mutation and the weather and things like that. But the, the, the driving force towards the uh, illusion of design, the beauty of the design of an eye or a wing or a foot or a heart um, and the diversity of life, the driving force is non-random natural selection. Now, I, was wondering, I always wanted to ask you, there are people who grasp things more clearly at different ages. And I know young kids who are thrilled to learn good science and are fascinated with dinosaurs. And Darwinian natural selection just makes sense to them. It's like the first time you hear it, it's, well, of course that's the case. For others, it, it seems to be a little more difficult, either based on their upbringing. I, I, I don't know what all the factors might be. But when you see a, a fish that is demonstrating amphibian-like qualities. It's coming up onto land and it has flippers that are close to fin. There are people, pe or close to feet, there are people who would look at that and say, wow, I get it, I get how yes. this. Yeah. And there are others, like one of my wife's relatives, looked at an example of that. One of my relatives would do this too, so I'm not just beating up on her family. But she looked at this and she said, isn't it wonderful what God can create? Yeah. Th those fish are lovely because they're, they're doing m much more recently. They've re-evolved uh, what our ancient ancestors did in the Devonian era. 
And so they, they come out of, of, of the water, they walk around, they jump, they even climb trees. Uh, it, it's wonderful to see these, these fish. Um, they have various names like frogfish and things like that. But I, I always just presume that you as a young boy just immediately got this. No, no I didn't. Um, I, I think it was my father who first explained natural selection to me and I, I understood it, but I didn't think it was a big enough theory to account for the elegance of life. It was only later that I ap ap apprehended that. And it's going to be a different answer for everybody, but do you, do you, do you know what it was that, that made the change in you from, okay, that's interesting, I don't quite get it, to, oh my gosh, this is a profound statement uh, that people aren't grasping? I don't remember that, but it, it is a profound statement, and it, 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 it has to be in a way because it took so long for humanity to get it. I mean, it took till the middle of the 19th century, and I've always been baffled by... Uh, why, in a way, people like Newton and Hume and Aristotle didn't get it, because it is actually a very simple idea. It's not like relativity or quantum theory. Um, it, it, it's not profoundly difficult, but it's, I suppose, profoundly counterintuitive. I think, as you suggested, Matt, it's kind of... Um, you almost can't believe that something so complicated and beautiful as life could possibly come into being by such a simple idea as the non-random survival of um, random variation. So I think that may be why it took until the middle of the 19th century for Darwin and Wallace independently to, g to get it. And I expect they had resistance to it when they first thought of it. And how fortunate are we that it's become sufficiently understood that now school children can you know, grasp this and have a good understanding of it. I think one of the reasons it seems so, so strange to me, I agree with you, that it seems like someone should have thought of this earlier, because we had domesticated animals, we domesticated crops, yes. we had been doing the things that nature does. Exactly, and th this was one of the main points Darwin made. Darwin used domesticated animals as his, his sort of introductory argument. He said, look at how powerful selection is, look at how we've managed to change rock doves into all the various breeds of pigeons, look how we managed to change um, flowers, d wild, fl wild roses into, into domestic roses. Um, wolves have become dogs of all these different breeds that are totally unlike wolves. And yet they've been transformed from the wolf in just a matter of centuries. So what Darwin did was say, look what can be done by artificial selection. Now all you need do is that mental flip that says, you don't need a breeder. You don't need a human breeder to come along and choose the dogs to breed from. Nature will do that for you. So the power of artificial selection is harnessed um, in a slightly different way by nature. And nature is the breeder that produces all of life. There's a confusing array of creationist models. Um, there are the people who think that the world was created in seven literal days and, and that these represent ages. I can understand the people who, I don't understand why they think the earth is six to 10,000 years old now. That's an untenable position, but if that's what they believe, I can understand why understanding evolution would be more difficult for them because they don't even accept that that time is there. But I'm more baffled by the apologists and creationists who think, oh, of course, you know, the universe is 13.7 billion years old, the earth's 4.5 billion, but that's still not enough time when we have the evidence. Yeah. Um, there, are, there are people like that. Um, uh, there was a, a, a nice story told by J.B.S. Haldane, the great uh, British geneticist, one of the founders of the Neo-Darwinian synthesis. Um, and after a lecture, a lady stood up and asked him a question and put exactly this point. She said, Professor Haldane, I simply can't believe that there's been enough time, even given billions of years, to go from a single-celled ancestor to something like me, in a, a multicellular cre creature, trillions of cells with the heart and lungs and brain and kidneys and bones and things, just doesn't make sense. Madam, you did it yourself, and it only took you nine months. <laughs> <laughs> to, to which, of course, she could have retorted, ah, yes, but... Um, that in that nine months, the process was supervised by, 
DNA, or she would have called it genes in those days. Um, and, and that, of course, is correct. And, and what evolution does, what natural selection does, is to choose those genes that supervise the embryological process that does that amazing trick in nine months. So in this, in this process, one of the key aspects that we come up against is transitional forms. And people have different views of what that means. So a creationist might say, oh, you haven't found any transitional forms, or you haven't found a missing link. And for years, uh, when I'm asked this question on the show, for, well, first of all, I point out that, uh, this, that you're calling into the atheist experience, and I'm not a biologist, and if you, you know, maybe you're talking to the wrong guy about this. But I had always responded that everything is a transitional form, that all of us are a tr transition between our ancestors and our progeny. And, and this, I don't know that this has the impact on others that it had on me. Because yeah. they, seem to be they seem to be looking at it backwards. Backwards, it's a little easier to say, oh, this is clearly a transition. Yes, I mean, everything is potentially a transition. Not everything actually is, but potentially it is. Michael Schober makes rather a nice point, which is that when there's a gap in the fossil record, which, which there is in quite a number of places, because fossilization is quite a rare event, so that we have this gap, and they say, ah, oh, there's a gap. Um, and then somebody finds a fossil right in the middle of the gap, which is a transitional form. Now we've got two gaps. Yeah. And then they told two friends, and they told two yeah, friends, and so on. It's, it's interesting to me that so much emphasis, I think, in, in the, as people were battling against this idea in the modern era, because we're trying to teach it in schools, and of course there are religious people objecting, this idea of a missing link kept yeah. coming up. Well, the missing link was often, was in Victorian times, that meant the missing link between apes and humans. Uh, and there were no fossils, it, uh, no, no hominid fossils in Darwin's time. Darwin looked at the modern anatomy of chimpanzees and gorillas and correctly inferred that we are African apes, that we, we evolved in Africa. And since that time, of course, there have been lots and lots of fossils discovered in South Africa, in East Africa, uh, and even North Africa. Um, so we have lots and lots of links. They're not missing anymore. They're missing on the chimpanzee side of the, of the divide. We have a common ancestor which was lived about six million years ago. And then it branched and went down one side towards chimpanzees and bonobos, which branched again there. And then the other side went down to humans. And we've got plenty of fossils down the human line. So there's no, no dearth of links there. They're no longer missing. There aren't any fossils down the chimpanzee line. And that's regrettable. It may be because they're forest dwellers and it's more difficult to fossilize in, in forest conditions. But there are plenty of missing links, no longer missing. But you can't know, you weren't there. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yes. <laughs> How do you deal with that kind of thing? Um, yes, of, of, of course. Uh, and what, one analogy that I like to use to that is to say a detective comes upon the scene of a crime after it's been committed, more or less by definition, and works out what happened. Sherlock Holmes, Hercule Poirot, they look at fingerprints, they look at footprints, they look at all the cues that are available around the window open or the window closed or whatever it might be, and you work out what happened by looking at the clues. That's sort of what we do. But the difference is, whereas Sherlock Holmes or Hercule Poirot had a limited number of clues, we have millions and millions and millions of clues. We have fossils, we have the geographical distribution of animals and plants on islands and continents of the world. They're distributed in exactly the places they should be distributed if evolution had taken place. Um, we look at fossils, we look at molecular, uh, comparative molecular um, sequencing. The, you can sequence the DNA or the proteins of any creature you like, animal or plant, and you can find genes that are clearly the same gene, but with differences in the details. And so you can literally count the number of discrepancies between um, a human and a, a possum, or a human and a beetle. It doesn't matter what it is, you can find a gene where it's the, obviously the same gene, and you can literally count the number of letter discrepancies between them. And 
you plot it all out and you find a beautiful hierarchical tree, a beautiful pedigree. It's got to be a pedigree. And so that's what you can do with molecular data. That's sort of what Darwin himself was able to do with bones and comparative anatomy. And that's persuasive enough, goodness knows. But with molecules, it's even more persuasive. So you don't have to have been there. It's, it's, it's the, the, the evidence is just mountainously high. I think this ties back a, a lot into uh, different views of knowledge, where they, when it's convenient, they would like there to be certainty. And I, I'm always happy to point out that they believe in Jesus, and they weren't there when he was crucified as well. Uh, so clearly, we can infer some things and, and come to reasonable conclusions. When we talk about science, it's a couple of the beautiful things about science is that it's self-correcting, and yet the creationists will just constantly point to, oh, here's an anomaly, here's an error, here's a mistake, here's a hoax, as if, as if they could disprove evolution and all of a sudden their creation model wins. And to me it was, even if we find out tomorrow that everything we understood about natural selection were wrong, that still wouldn't lend any credence to That's a right. No, I mean, you, you, you have two, two hypotheses, A and B, and A has a lot going for it and B has nothing whatever going for it. So, and, then, and, then, and then you find a single, a single slight discrepancy, something went wrong with A, as you say, a hoax, pilt down man, whatever it is. Right, that's it for A, must be B. And th that's the level of logic we have to deal with. Oh. You have an alibi. Oh, the butler did it then. Yes, yes. We're, we're done. Exactly, yes, exactly. So one of, one of the aspects of this is that we have a model that is testable and a model that makes predictions. Um, for example, we, we predicted, based on all of our understanding, uh, where to go dig in order to find something like Tiktaalik. What, and this is, you can feel free to make a face and scoff because it's what I did when I thought of the question. What would creationists have to do, potentially, to turn their proposition into a testable claim at all? I cannot think of what they could do, unfortunately. It would be nice if... if, if I, can you think of anything? I mean, no, that's... Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm asking you. Um, I mean, they can, they can up the ante on finding difficulties for evolution. I mean, they could... They could um, Darwin wrote a chapter in The Origin of Species called Organs of Extreme Complexity. Uh, and he took things like the eye and the heart, and he showed how, although on the face of it, um, it seems almost too difficult to explain, nevertheless, you can explain it. Um, you don't actually need to. I mean, if, if somebody comes to me and says, I bet you can't explain the elbow joint of the lesser spotted weasel frog, and I'd say, well, actually, I've never heard of the lesser spotted weasel frog, and I said, I can't explain it. Right, that's it. You can't explain it. God must have done it. Um, the, 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 the proper answer is no, I, I don't know how to explain that, but um, let's do a bit of research on it. Let's, let's go to work on it. Let's examine. Let's, let's go and find some weasel frogs and, and examine them and dissect them and see how they behave, and we'll, we'll see if we can do it. But even if we fail, that doesn't mean that the alternative theory B is the right one. It could be that we just aren't clever enough to think of the alternative. I've satirized the argument as the argument from personal incredulity. You, you say, I, I, can't be, I can't understand how this could have happened, therefore, uh, therefore God must have done it. But that's the negative thing. That's, finding, that's trying to find flaws in evolution. You've asked me what testable hypothesis could they put forward? What testable, what experiment could they do, say? Um, I used to think that something like God coming down out of the clouds and bellowing in a great, loud, Paul Robeson voice, I created everything. That would be moderately convincing, but I still... <laughs> I still would, would actually fall back on Hume on miracles and say, is it, is, isn't it actually more probable that I'm hallucinating or, <laughs> or, or being hoaxed by some clever conjurer like Matt? 
perhaps an alien conjurer from outer space. Yeah. Uh, this is, it, you know, technology sufficiently advanced is indistinguishable from magic. How the hell can I tell the difference? Yeah. This is why I changed the answer I gave about what would change my mind to I have no idea. Yes, quite. But if there is a God, he knows, and he hasn't done it, so yeah. you know, the hell with him. Mm. But, but the, uh, the God voice, maybe if he just said, I created the platypus, because that's a confusing creature for many people. Well, when, when they were first, when, when the first platypus was sent to London for, for, um, e for examination, it was thought to be a hoax. It was thought to be a, somebody had stitched together a duck's bill and a... And, and a and P.T. Barnum created the platypus right yeah. after the Fiji mermaid. Yeah. Um, I, let me, I'm going to shift topics just a little bit because we, we talked before about the world we're living in, about the information that people get and how it is, is almost being curated for them by social media that you get spoon-fed things. But I want to touch on a different aspect of this, uh, and that is uh, reaching conclusions based on headlines only. Oh, yeah. Have you seen what... Not only do we, do we live in a world where sensa headlines are already sensationalized to draw your attention, but I find over and over again people will read the headline and not the article, not the content, certainly not any references, and just broadcast on social media. They do, that's right, and I think this is one of, the, one of the reasons why science has a problem, a public relations problem, because uh, so often um, a headline will appear in a tabloid newspaper which will say something like, X causes cancer, scientists show. And then next week, the same X cures cancer, scientists show. And so um, the, the, the headlines obviously contradict each other, but the details may not. Um, it could be that um, X both causes and cures cancer. Maybe it has a, a U-shaped dose response curve, so that if you've got, if you're plotting the um, effect of the, 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 the amount of X there and the effect on cancer there, there's a U-shaped curve, and if you're on that part of the U, it has a positive effect on cancer. That part of the curve, it has a negative effect, and so it does both cause and cure. The, the contradictory headlines, though, will lead people to say, oh, well, scientists just contradict themselves, so we, we can't believe science anymore. And that's very sad. And I think that, obviously, uh, journalists have bear some blame for that, but also scientists who uh, publish, not publish, but announce their results prematurely and in a sort of half-baked way, um, so that it's almost meat and drink to journalists wishing to pick up the story. So I think that that is a serious problem and needs, scientists need to think about how to handle that. I think there's, there's so much concern that people don't value science and people aren't sufficiently science educated that some scientists are like, oh, we need to get this out here and let's do it in a way that's exciting. So I've seen headlines that uh, science has proved that we are living in a simulation and then recently that we are not living in a simulation. And if you actually dig in on what the papers say, not, they say neither of those. Uh, the, just this week, uh, even a day or so ago, g getting outside the realm of science, I saw a headline that was, Pope allows debates on married priests. And people read the headline and their immediate assumption is, oh, the Catholic Church, maybe, maybe they're coming around and they're going to allow priests to marry. And that has absolutely nothing to do with what was being discussed. It was, it was the, this has happened several times before, that the Episcopalian priests who were married the Catholic Church would like to lure mm. them in to be priests yeah. and allow them to stay married. They just yes. can't have sex anymore. <laughs> not Which, with women on, anyway. Yeah, you know, depending on how long you've been married, maybe it's not a problem. Uh, I don't know. Uh, but, but this is a marketing strategy. This is, hey, the Catholic Church is losing out to Protestants in the Amazon region. We're not really going to change Catholicism but we'll change parts of Catholicism in the Amazon region just so that we can reach more people. Yeah. Yeah, you're right. Yeah. But they're not coming around, they're not coming around on sex at all. No. So the, the headline is misleading, quite right. Yes. I wish they would come around on sex. Yes. I, I, and I'm, that's not just funny. I, I find it bizarre that this one particular church has perhaps more sexual hang-ups than any other. You know, they're going to prohibit the very thing that one would argue may perhaps makes us human, the desires that we have, the interaction, the stuff that has produced who we are. Nope. 
can't have anything to do with that. Yeah. While they hide rapists. Yeah. I think they have an, a duty to, to do better, but... Yeah. Uh, <laughs> sermon over for this. Uh, something happened today that we spoke about briefly. Uh, I found out the news and we don't have a lot of information, but there were a couple of questions that I had uh, where I wanted to get your perspective. For those who aren't aware, uh, just outside of San Antonio today, in a small town, uh, someone pulled out an automatic weapon and killed 27 people in a Baptist church, the first Baptist church of uh, this town. We don't yet know what the motivation is. Uh, the individual who, who did this was killed. Hypothetically, if we were to discover that this was some prominent member of a local atheist community who had decided to target a church, how would you respond um, to this shooting? The, these things are so appalling. I, 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 don't think, I don't think I want to get into hypotheticals like that. I think, I think uh, we, we, we don't know what happened. In my immediate reaction is um, to be obviously horrified um, and to feel this person is surely going to be insane uh, and every country has its lunatics and um, the difference is that in the United States there are so many guns around that lunatics can get hold of guns and so um, I, I I almost don't, don't want to ask what the, what the motive is because I don't think such an appalling act has a, a thing you could call a motive anyway. This is just a, a nut who has managed to get hold of a gun and uh, it's going to go on and on happening as long as guns are so readily available in the United States and so I think the, the only lesson I would wish to draw fr from it is, for goodness sake, United States, sort out your gun problem. And I, I certainly echo a great deal of the sentiment there. The, the reason I was kind of hoping to get to hypothetical is because Invariably, we don't tend to find that this is the case. Um, and uh, there's everything inside of me wants to say, oh yeah, that's, that's such an unlikely possibility uh, that we just shouldn't even bother with it. But I would like to think that the broader secular humanist community uh, would very quickly and easily just denounce all forms of violence and violence threats along these lines to show that we're in a, in a different headspace than, for example, if it was a rival church or something along those lines. You may, you may be correct about uh, you know, whether or not he was, or what his mental capabilities were, uh, but it, it, the reason it struck me was I did, had a debate. With the debate that we spoke about the other night, the, the preacher who knows nothing about evolution was talking about banging sticks and rocks together to get puppies. And <laughs> he's reported that since the debate's been posted, he's received threats of death threats and violence threats. And I immediately posted on Facebook, uh, a statement saying that, you know, if it's anybody who's a fan or a follower of mine, go the fuck away. You are part of the problem. I don't want, I don't need you. I don't want you advocating for violence and other mm -hmm. stuff. I'm not sure I believe his claim, but I wanted to make a distinction of, uh, 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 between how we are going to respond to, to violent acts because there's nothing within atheism or secularism. There's no ideology that would encourage someone to... No, of course not. I mean, that's absolutely right. And, and, and um, if, if, if it was a, a follower of ISIS, then we could say um, he probably isn't insane. I mean, the, if, if, if it was a follower of ISIS doing something like this, then it's done uh, because he thinks it's the righteous thing to do. He thinks he's doing the will of his God. He thinks he's going to earn a place in heaven, in paradise, because he has slain some infidels and, and, and gone to a martyr's heaven or whatever it is. Um, so there is a perfectly logical progression going from certain kinds of religious belief to um, these horrible acts of 
mass murder. There simply is not a logical progression that goes from atheism to doing any such thing. And so if it incidentally happened to be somebody whose philosophical position, insofar as such a person could have a philosophical position, was atheism, it would be utterly irrelevant. This, is, this would just be a sick individual who has a gun. So that al although it's possible to, to, to formulate a logical progression from uh, religious belief of a certain kind to violent murder, there is no logical progression that goes from atheism to violent murder. How could there be? Oh, sorry. Yeah. I've got one more uh, question topic I want to hit real quick. So for those of you who had questions, if you can quietly, without disturbing people, start moving out to there, we'll get to questions pretty soon. But I've heard that you're working on another book. <laughs> And I, I know that everybody here will want to hear about it. Okay. Um, I, I am, I've started work on a book which, of my, my tentative title is Atheism for Children. No. I'm, I'm I, I rather suspect that it may not end up with that title. It, <laughs> it, it, it will be th that content but uh, it may not be that title. The word children is a problem because uh, many children prefer not to be called children, especially as this is actually aimed at kind of 12, 13, 14 year olds, so it's more like atheism for young adults, atheism for teenagers. Um, I don't want it to sound as though it's indoctrinating, which would be another reason not to call it that. Another suggestion that, I, that I've had made to me is, Mum, I think I'm an atheist. Um, anyway, I, I've written about five chapters in a very tentative draft, and uh, the first one is about how many, many gods there are, and so it's not clear why the particular god that you, the child has been brought up in is the right one. And then there's quite a lot on evolution, because I think that's one of the, I mean, the, 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 the lure of creationism is quite strong. There's one on the good book, and how, utterly appalling it actually is, how dreadful, what a, and I've said before that, that the God of the Old Testament is the most unpleasant character in all fiction. <laughs> and so it, so it, it, do, it documents that. I, I plan a chapter on miracles, perhaps a chapter on prayer, a chapter on uh, why we don't need God to be good. And um, it'll be illustrated, it'll be rather along the same lines as the children's book I wrote a few years ago called The Magic of Reality. It'll be the, the same style as that, uh, but a, more of a kind of young person's version of the God delusion. And I, it wasn't clear about this, and I will catch heat for this later. So the microphones are set up, it, it, but we want people to line up on the outside so we're not blocking anybody's view, and then one at a time we'll have you walk up to either microphone. I'm assuming that the, the chapter on miracles is a, is a look into miraculous claims and and not just like a list of actual miracles, because that would be a very short <laughs> chapter. Yes. Sure, yes. Perhaps uh, just, yeah, miracles, and ju then just say, none known, next chapter. <laughs> That'd be good, yeah. I, I, find that it, I, I find that interesting, both the topic and, and the target, and I'm glad that you pointed out that, you know, this is very, something very different from indoctrination. Indoctrination, this is about uh, giving material to people who are coming of age and realizing they don't believe the things that other people believe there, that they've been taught. Um, I recall, I, I was a believer for way, way, way too many years. Um, almost embarrassing how long it took me to figure this shit out. But, uh, but everybody finds it in their own time, and so I, I keep running across young people, uh, teenagers, yeah. and they're facing, hey, how do I tell my family, or should I tell my family, and uh, how do I deal with my family? Should I do a, like a big coming out thing, or should this be you know, more organic? And I'm always just impressed that they, they've put way more thought into this um, th th at an earlier age than I ever did. I was so busy focusing on what the church wanted me to do and, and being in an insulated environment where, you know, I'd never heard of Thomas Paine. I didn't know that much about 
you know, the science you were taught in school, sure, but beyond that, I, I'm just impressed at the way the world is changing thanks to you, thanks to the various media outlets, thanks to the internet, where I don't know if we have more young people atheists than ever, but it certainly feels that way. Well, I think we do in America and in Western Europe. I, I wish I could say the same of the Islamic world. I think things are even moving in the right direction there. Um, I'm rather fond of quoting the fact that there's a bootleg copy of The God Delusion in Arabic, which... <laughs> for, for <laughs> for, for, for which I, I get no royalties. Um, uh, and it's downloadable as a PDF. And what's rather nice is that it has been downloaded 13 million times. I think, it, I think if it's downloaded one million more times, it will be as worn as a Grateful Dead concert recording. But. Can we have the house lights up just a little bit so we can maybe see the folks on the microphones a little bit? We'll start on this side, whoever's... At the front, uh, come on over, state your name if you're comfortable with that, and uh, ask your question. Okay, it, it works. It, it, it works. works. Oh, yeah. um, hi, uh, Professor Richard. Um, just because you m just mentioned about the God Delusion in Arabic. I was living in the Middle East, and my friend got a copy of the God Delusion. His name was Muhammad, and he was one of the biggest reasons why I'm atheist today. And, and it's just phenomenal to just believe how your impact just would reach all the way to the other side of the world uh, with your book. Wh and which which country is that? Um, um, well, we live in Qatar, so. Uh, the I'm going to Qatar in, in a couple of months' time. Oh but yeah, yeah. Um, I, I was I was wishing to get a copy of your sign. Uh, Planning the God delusion to be, bring it to him. <laughs> so you you have a friend called Mohammed, and he told I didn't quite get the okay, full okay. story. So, so my friend, his name is Mohammed, and he read the book called God Delusion, and basically from that book uh, he got uh, uh, basically it was the basis for him to be convert to atheism. Yeah. And, uh, it was it was big influence on my ideas. Did Did he read it in English or Arabic? I believe he read it in English actually. Okay. Well, that's very good to hear. Thank you very much. Yeah. yeah. Um, just, I wanted to ask a question. I know yes, I please, go ahead. Yeah. Yeah. I'm about to hang up, but you're so nice. Just, <laughs> just go ahead and do the question. Uh, I, I've, I guess I've asked uh, um, Sir Sam Harris in the previous uh, uh, event about free, free will, because I don't believe in free will, and he doesn't believe it, in it either. And, uh, and it sort of put me in a place where I feel like depressed about life in a way, that I feel like I don't have control over my... Um, like ability to change my life because my genetics are sort of determines everything that is going to happen to my life. So it feels like there's like little to do with how much I can change about my life with if my IQ is constant and my genetics are also sort of. So what's your question? My question is, um, I guess I'm, I'm questioning how, I guess you, your views on free will and, and, and how genetics affect people's ability to sort of control their life. I, okay, I, I hate the free will question, um, I, and I, I, I usually resort to Christopher Hitchens' answer to the question, do you have free will? <laughs> Christopher Hitchens' answer to the question, do you have free will? I have no choice. <laughs> um, I don't think you should feel distressed about it. I mean, I, I think that probably the, the consensus of scientists today would be, yes, everything we do is determined. No need to drag genes in, by the way. I mean, that genes are no more deterministic than anything else. I mean, just any sort of antecedent physical cause may determine, uh, does determine what you do. Um, but the illusion of free will is so powerful that you'd live your life as though you have free will. We all do. So cheer up. And I will, uh, I'll, I'll throw in a quick addendum that I, I am a compatibilist a la Dennett and Sam Harris and I were arguing free will the other night and I'm sure we will again. 
and when we come to some sort of agreement that I think will benefit other people, maybe he'll share that. <laughs> yes, sir. Uh, hi, Professor Dawkins. Thank you for a lifetime of everything. I just want you to complete the punchline to my favorite joke ever. Are you ready? Why are there so many old people in church? This is a, this, uh, yeah, you, you've read my quotation. Um, <laughs> It was, it was a, an Australian friend who, who asked this, this question, why there's so many old people in, in, in church? And his answer was, cramming for the final? <laughs> oh, that, that wasn't the question? No, no, that's not You're cheating. This has been a love-in. So I, he took forever. I'm going to be real I, quick. Go. This has been a love-in. This has been a love-in, and I really want to start a bit of a fight. You, I've seen you on your atheist experience, um, aren't really convinced in the design of evolution, that a polar bear is designed for its niche in that environment. I've seen you argue against that. Sorry, who, who, who are you talking to? The atheist, uh, to Matt, and I That's want you to convince him that design is real. I have real. no idea what you're talking about. Uh, I've seen you hang up on people say it's not designed, it's not... Uh, and no, 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 it's not designed. If, if, if by design you are talking about an intentional going forward with a purpose. It doesn't have to be intentional. It so can be designed. Th this is design semantic. Design is intentional. There, no, no, no. Here's the thing. This is really easy. Design is intentional. The appearance of design need not be. Do you agree with that, Richard? Well, I think, I think what, what, what you're thinking of is that Dan Dennett has redefined the word design to include unconscious design. And so it's just semantics. Um, yeah. I, I mean, you can define design as being deliberate, intentional design, or you can define design as uh, looking as though it's been designed in that, in, in, in that sense, Beauti beautifully arranged so that everything works. Dennett's definition is that, and he wants us to all change our, our usage, our meaning of the word design. And that is a semantic thing. Words are our servants, not our master. Neither, neither we, we just don't disagree on this at all, and we don't disagree on the fact that we don't need to be prescriptivists with language as long as we're communicating a topic. Yes, from this side, please. Hello. Thank you both for coming. And out. Yeah. My question is regarding several days ago, we had these Halloween. My friend went as Gida, and I thought that was pretty scary, but... Uh, the scariest thing, in my opinion, is alienation in society, best described with the scream of Edward Munn. And I ask you, Richard and Matt, to comment whether, as scientists, we are alienating ourselves. I mean, my family is more concerned with whether I earn a living than whether I fulfill my happiness of botany. Um, and Pythagoras was in an ancient civilization where they um, were looked at as elite and away from, and separate from, and distinct from society. And I believe that, I did, when I introduce myself, describe what I do, I like to introduce myself as a I study nature, that's what I'm passionate about. And by describing myself as a scientist, I believe I alienate because they don't understand what a scientist is. It's not but, sexy and, and lauded the way it used to be, is what, kind of what you're saying? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, that's their problem. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> you're, you're doing the right thing. Thank you. <laughs> okay, this is a question for uh, Professor Dawkins. Um, you have an amazing video that on YouTube that's been around for uh, decades, I imagine, about the I have been able to evolve. And until I've seen that video, I did not uh, comprehend how it possibly happened. And I understand now how the eye could But now I have another question regards metamorphosis. That seems like such an unbelievable type of process for an egg to form a caterpillar, that caterpillar wraps up a cocoon, liquefies, and comes out like a beautiful angel with wings. Can you give us any kind of insight into how evolution can that? Ladies and gentlemen, the argument from personal incredulity. <laughs> the lesser spotted weasel frog. Um, Which, by the way, 
it, it, you just made up that name, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. That, that's not, I was, I was going to go back yeah. to my amphibian. Okay. Place. I mean, the, it, it, it is a very, very beautiful problem. Thank you for bringing it up. I mean, a, 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 ca a caterpillar and a butterfly are two totally different kinds of animal, but they have the same genome, and one turns into the other. And as you say, I mean, the, the, the caterpillar feeds on plants, and it's, a, it's an eating machine. It's a, it's a machine for building up uh, the sheer amount of goods, the amount of, of, of stuff in the caterpillar. And then the caterpillar more or less dissolves in, internally uh, and uses the material that is built up in all this eating of plants, uses the material to build a butterfly or a moth, which is purely a uh, almost in, entirely a nectar feeding machine, and the nectar is just aviation fuel. It's, it's a winged carrier of gametes, of sperms or eggs. And so it's, it's the reproductive phase. And as you say, it is a very strange thing that's happened that natural selection could favor using the same genome two entirely different ways of life. A, v a vegetarian feeding machine and then a, an, an, an aerial nectar-eating reproduction machine. Um, it's happened. Uh, natural selection works on the, the, the same genes or different genes to produce these two different ways of life. Um, I, I don't think I can do anything really to dispel your natural uh, incredulity. I prefer to call it wonder. It is, it is wonderful. Um, and it's an, a very extreme example, uh, and I love it. I mean, I just, but 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 I I, I don't think I can really answer your incredulity. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. I've I've always kind of wondered about that as well. You know, nature's found a number of different solutions to different problems, and when you look at the you know the the egg to larva. Is it, is it that it's, th is that process with the chrysalis and the butterfly, is it really that much different than other me methods, or are we seeing a strange line where the early stage actually does some function and the later stage doesn't? Yes, I mean, it, it's, uh, it's less extreme in, in other creatures where, where the animal, I mean, you, you, you have to grow from an egg to an adult, and so you go through a number of, in, of, of stages. The thing that's special about caterpillars is that they go out into the world and they and they they live a, a, a life as a vegetarian. They do a completely different kind of ecology from the. Um, they, they behave like an adult. So it'd be different from uh, far far different from maggots to flies. Even well, in the world. not not that different actually, but but so a kind of more extreme, I suppose. I mean, there are some rather remarkable axolotls. A good example, where the larval stage. I mean, as you know, um, tad tadpoles have a different way of life from frogs. And, and, and um, in, in axolotls, the tadpole stage has its own way of life, and then it, gets, it becomes reproductively mature as a tadpole and never reaches the adult stage at all, the adult salamander stage at all. And Julian Huxley brilliantly um, took uh, axolotls and injected thyroid ho hormone in them and managed to turn them into the salamander that nobody had ever seen. So that what, what happened in evolution is it used to be a tadpole which had a different way of life from the adult salamander. And then it developed sexual maturity at the, at the, at the tadpole stage and simply cut off the end, the end of the um, life history. There was a rather popular theory um, by a man called Garstang, and it may still be right, that we ourselves did that in our ancient ancestry. Um, we are related, as you may know, to sea squirts, to tunicates. Tunicates sit on the ocean floor, and they, they're just sort of bags of seawater that they filter seawater. But the larva of a tunicate um, looks like a tadpole. And Garstang's theory was that we are descended from the larvae of tunicates, and we've cut off the um, sessile uh, sitting on the bottom of the sea doing nothing um, <laughs> st stage of our life history. Now we sit on the couch. Yeah. Yes, sir. Uh, evening. 
Professor Dawkins and Matt. Thanks so much for your discussion. Thank you. Um, I'm going to caveat the question by saying that perhaps I haven't been uh, as attentive to your remarks on this topic as I might have been, so forgive me if it's a bit of a redundant question. But uh, your arguments against uh, you know, the attacks on science from the so-called religious right are pretty well documented. Um, but the sort of dual assault from the left, both from Islam and also the, the identitarian left, so the, the blank slatist, the gender is a social construct type. Uh, my question is, A, did you anticipate that attack coming, and B, how do we challenge it? Well, I, I don't think I would make any... Yeah, it's difficult. Um, I find the whole left-right continuum thing pro problematic in any way, but, but you're absolutely right that, that there is an attack on science from um, people who are often called left, often intellectuals in non-scientific subjects who take the view that um, perhaps something like opinion is more important than, than evidence. Um, we're all entitled to our opinions. Um, everything's a social construct. Uh, even science is a social construct. Um, scientists claim to be objective and to study evidence objectively and logically, but actually they're pushing some kind of political agenda. I think it is pernicious. Uh, I believe strongly in objective truth. I believe that um, we need to study truth and understand truth and work out what the facts of the universe are. Um, one reason is simply that it's useful. You you, you build planes and cars and ships and spaceships and things on, spa on, on scientific principles. They work. Science works. Um, but also science is beautiful. It's actually wonderful. It's elegant, fascinating to immerse yourself in what we so far know and to work on what we don't yet know, which is also very exciting. It's, a, it's entirely worthwhile form of life, and I deplore tendencies to denigrate science and somehow make it subordinate to what I see as rather petty human concerns. Thank you very much. Thank you for being here, Pastor Dawkins. Um, do you think that because of... Um, for example, the um, abundance of certain elements in the universe and the characteristics of certain elements and the biology of the universe. Um, if we were to find life on another planet, that it would be quite similar to life on Earth? Or do you think it would be quite different? Do you think it necessarily needs to be carbon based? Do you think water is important? Yeah. Do you think if life evolved on another planet, that it would be Yes, I'm, I'm fascinated by this question. Um, I've talked to chemists about it, and the consensus seems to be, yes, it's got to be carbon. Uh, what, whatever else, Car carbon seems to be the only element uh, which has the necessary uh, capacity to form these um, macromolecules and things that, that, that you need. So I think it's got to be carbon. Um, the other extreme, you might say, has it got to be really similar to us? Uh, will, will there be legs and eyes and wings and, and brains and things like that? And that's much more problematical. Um, we do have a certain amount of very indirect evidence from life on this planet because we see convergent evolution on this planet. We see, starting from different beginnings, lineages of evolution converging on the same endpoint. You see this spectacularly in the mammal fauna of Australia, for example. Uh, when the dinosaurs went extinct 65 million years ago, the mammals, after a while, took over. But they took over separately in various continents of the world, in Australia, in South America, in Africa, and in Eurasia, and, and also islands like Madagascar. Um, the parallels that you see in these different places suggest that evolution has considerable power to push 
lineages in the same direction. So the, in, in Australia you have marsupial, they're all marsupials, you have marsupial flying squirrels, marsupial wolves, the Tasmanian, the Tasmanian wolf, uh, marsupial rabbits, uh, marsupial mice, marsupial moles. Um, in South America, there was a similar radiation of, of mammals where you get convergence. And this suggests that natural selection is, ha is powerful enough to, to make things happen in similar ways. But on another planet, however, um, oh, no, and you could also make an argument like something like an eye is such a useful thing to have on any planet which has light. Well, it's pretty much got to have light, there's got to be a source of, it, source of energy, but where there's not a sort of thick fog where light can travel in straight lines, then you're probably going to get eyes, and eyes have evolved so many times on this planet independently. So I think you could predict that kind of thing. Um, but the conditions on other planets are going to be so different. The gravitational field can be much weaker or much stronger, and we already know from the laws of physics, you can predict that in a planet that has a much weaker gravitational field, um, the whole uh, fabric of skeletons is going to be different. You'll, you'll have um, large animals built like spiders with, with long, thin legs. On a planet with a much, with a much stronger gravitational field, you could have mouse-sized animals built like a rhinoceros with huge, great tree trunk. Well, not huge, but I mean thick tree trunk um, limbs. You can do a fair bit by applying knowledge of physics to predict the kind of differences that you might expect to find on different planets. As for wildly different biochemistries, I've always wanted to persuade a biochemist to come up with a completely different hypothetical biochemistry. Do we have to have DNA? Probably not. Do we have to have protein? Possibly yes, because protein has this extraordinary capacity to be catalytic for an enormous variety of chemical reactions based upon its, its capacity to fold itself up into three-dimensional forms which determine its catalytic properties. So I think my prediction would be probably yes to protein, probably no to DNA, but definitely yes, I think, to something equivalent to DNA. A digital genetic system Digital because it has to be very accurate. Probably one-dimensional, it could be two-dimensional, a two-dimensional matrix rather than a one-dimensional string. Unlikely to be a three-dimensional gene because three-dimensional gene cannot be easily read. You can, you can make sort of inferences like this. Would there be sex? No particular reason to think that, but it's, it's worth talking about. Um, would there, would there be nervous systems, something equivalent to a nervous system? It seems probable, but would it be neurons like we have? No reason to think so. I, I love this kind of speculation, but it obviously is speculation, but it can be informed speculation. Thank you very much for the question. Thank you. Uh, hello, um, uh, this is um, less about uh, science or philosophy and more about uh, you, um, Professor Dawkins. Uh, recent, um, a while ago, you used to uh, put the videos of uh, the YouTuber Jacqueline Glenn on your website. Uh, whatever really happened to that? You've recently stopped doing that. Uh, have I? I mean, it's not a conscious decision. I, um, I, I just don't happen to have become aware of them for some reason, so it's not a, it's not a conscious decision. I, th I, th I think she's great. All right, and, uh, oh, and also, uh, my, uh, most of my family is very uh, Christian, very like Protestant, uh, and I'm an atheist. I was wondering how I could, if you have any idea, like, tips on how I could kind of let them down softly. <laughs> uh, it's difficult, isn't it? I, I'm... I, I think I'm, I mean, I'm, I'm biased in favor of the full frontal approach. <laughs> uh, but I, I realize, 
I, I realize it's difficult and it, it depends entirely on your relationship with your family, and which, which of course I don't know. But good, good luck with it anyway. Yeah. Thank, you very, thank you very much. Yes, yes. Hi. Hi. First of all, thank you to both of the role models. So, my thank question you, is you. for uh, Richard. So, this is an issue that has uh, been in me for the past year as a psychologist ever since um, Dr. Jordan Peterson uh, refused to inspire their preferred gender pronouns. So, my question, uh, Professor Doc. In, um, in modern times, our university teaching that uh, gender is a social structure that's independent of biological, and that there can, in fact, be many different types of genders uh, transgender and age gender, transgender, among many others. So, as an evolutionary biologist, there's um, modernness. Well, when I hear the word postmodern, I reach for my revolver. <laughs> um, uh, if, 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 somebody, if somebody wishes to call themselves a different gender from their biological one, then that's their privilege, and I'm happy to go along with, with calling them that. Um, it is a, um, it's a, it's a semantic issue whether they, they, they re really are. I mean, you can, you can define the, the, the sex of somebody by their chromosomes, by their, by their genitals, by their... Um, those are the two main ways. Um, uh, and, and, uh, or, you, or you can define it by, by, their, by their preference. And so, and so according to, 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 to one definition, a person may be female. According to another definition, which would be the biological definition, they'd be male, or vice versa. So, I I don't get worked up about it. So and 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 I'll jump in for a minute uh, on this because this gets back to what we were talking about about prescriptivism in language. And one of the things I I push for is to make sure that we are honestly evaluating what somebody else has to say. So even the people who you may disagree with or somebody may disagree with who are talking about gender as a social construct, uh, they're being, they, they have been pretty specific in the language that there's a distinction between gender identity, gender expression, and in no case are they denying the physical facts about biological sex. They are talking about the roles that we take in, in society, uh, the language around it, the pronouns, the him, her thing, that's, that is a uh, construct of ours. It's not like language was handed down from a god. And so this idea that one can uh, ex associate an identity with a gender, con a gender construct, a norm in society that men are this way and women are this way, which is, you know, it's a, the pink and blue thing for boys and girls it used to be reversed. And, and boys were pink and the girls were blue. The roles that we've developed, some of that is through the natural process of evolution where you had the hunter-gatherers and you had the, the going out there and hunting, and certainly there are differences genetically and physically, physiologically between genetic males and genetic females. But when they're talking about gender as a social construct, all they are saying is, I'm identifying with this particular role in society. I think the language is getting in the way, and the people who are equating sex and gender are being prescriptivist about language, and the people who are not equating those are saying, hey, we, can, we don't have a better way to talk about this yet, and we're working towards better ways to talk about it. Thank you. I have a question for both of you. I think, Matt, you've left out a little bit. Um, since both of you have been so enormously successful as popularizers of science, uh, for those of us who'd like... Well, to one of us has okay, popularized so science, not you me. You know where I'm going with this a little bit. Okay, so for those of us, like myself, who'd like to follow in your footsteps, um, what advice would you have? And uh, I wouldn't mind talking about science writing in particular. I think that I and a lot of other people love to hear. Oh, I hate the advice question. <laughs> um, but, but since you ask about, about writing, I suppose I can try and say a little bit about that. Um, well, obviously, when you're writing about science or anything, you put yourself in the position of the reader. 
and it, that seems obviously enough, but but um, m many people don't. Uh, so, how could the, how could the reader misunderstand this? Read it through, read it through, looking at it from the point of view of, so, of so a different person. How would she misunderstand that? How would he misunderstand that? What what can I do to make it to make it clearer? Ah, I can see there's an obvious way of w in which that could be mistaken. So I'll change that word there. Read it through often and often and often. Um, imagining yourself to be a different person. Um, I don't like dumbing down. I uh, prefer to, I, I like quotation from Einstein, everything should be as simple as possible, but no simpler. So don't dumb down. <laughs> um, I was once at a, at a conference on science communication and I was inveighing ag against dumbing down and a man got up in the audience as I thought with a sort of warm glow in his white male heart <laughs> and said don't you think dumbing down is necessary to bring women and minorities to science um, so, so d don't dumb down, and, and I would even take that to the, to the point of don't be afraid of using the perfect English word, even if it's not a very familiar one. Dictionaries exist, and don't be af I'm, I'm never afraid of driving my reader to the dictionary. Um, Thank you very much. So, so I'll chime in with half, half a moment here for an answer. Uh, my answer is pretty much the same as his, only without the book writing portion. If you had any idea how much time I spend obsessing and toiling over, I want to evaluate an argument, I want to do it fairly. So for me, the, the keys that I, I give is, is not so much dumbing down, make things, uh, make sure you understand things, ask lots of questions, uh, but the biggest key is to actually give a shit about what kind of world you live in. I care about people's beliefs because they inform their actions. And when I found out that I was wrong about things, I wanted to find ways of helping other people who were potentially wrong. And if it turns out that I'm still wrong, I'm open to that being exposed as well. So if, you know, that's the, the same thing, that he, whereas he's rereading it to, make, to find every way it could go wrong. This is the same thing I did you know, in software QA that I'm doing with logical arguments and debate. By the time I walk on a debate stage or step on, on the show, I have discussed this topic with myself and with several other people countless times, which is why I turned the show into a game to kind of see how quickly I can figure out where they're going. But yes. Uh, I'm Mohammed Jaban. I think I tweeted this time. I'm not sure if you remember me. Uh, but my, my, question, my question was um, one of the major insights of uh, Sir Isaac Newton was that the laws of physics could be generalized to celestial phenomena. Um, to to what, what phenomena? Uh, to celestial phenomena. Um, celestial? Yes. yes. Sorry. Um, I was wondering, uh, when, when it comes to uh, applying the same scenario to uh, the laws of evolution and the laws of, uh, laws of biology, uh, many uh, schools of thought and, and many thinkers, evolutionary biology thinkers, have pointed out the fact that um, there seems to be a lot of historical contingencies that kind of shape the past ways of evolution. For instance, uh, if you go back to the Burgess Shale in, in British Columbia, and there's 25 different anatomical body plans, out of those 25 different anatomical body plans, due to historical contingencies that have happened, only four have managed to survive, leave, uh, leave modern des descendants, including the descendants of Burgess. Um, so I was wondering, uh, uh, so what, if, if you actually, uh, that, that kind of argument goes, if you actually rerun um, the evolution backwards and go back a million forward, uh, uh, the, 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 the likelihood that they would give rise to humans would be null uh, or zero. Um, what, what's the question? Oh, so my question is, yeah. do you think that kind of likelihood is kind of exaggerated in the sense that, in the sense that you wouldn't be able to generalize those solutions? Yeah, it's very similar to the qu question that the woman asked uh, earlier. Um, the, the thought experiment of running evolution starting from the beginning and then running it again, again and again and again. That was invented by Stuart Kaufman. Uh, it's, a, it's a good thought experiment. He said, he said imagine you, 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 you could rerun evolution a thousand times. How many times would you expect to get this? How many times would you expect to get that? Sort of think statistically about the, 
probability of getting the same, and, and the extreme question would be, as you say, would we get something like humans? There are those who say you would. Um, there's a, a paleontologist, Simon Conway Morris, who is one of the people who's actually worked mainly on the Burgess shell, which, which, which you refer to. Conway Morris believes that you would get humans, uh, and uh, he's very keen on convergent evolution, which I mentioned before, at least if not exactly humans, I mean uh, upright walking bip bipeds with eyes looking forward and big brains and hands, that kind of thing. Um, and he makes a good case, and I, and I think you, you can make a, make a good case for that. Um, the, the, the whole poetry of the Burgess Shale, I think, has been exaggerated. As I think Stephen Gould's book on it is, is, is actually a terrible book. Um, uh, it, it's, um, he has this sort of... Well, actually, his book is not so terrible as the people who've taken, who've taken from it um, uh, the, the, wrong, the wrong message. Sort of poetic message that in the Cambrian you had this sort of wild, frenzied dance of experimenting with new body plans and, and um, since the Cambrian the, the spring has dried up and we no longer get new, new major phyla, you only get new um, lesser taxa. I've compared this argument to a gardener looking at a tree, an old tree, and saying, isn't it funny, this tree hasn't produced any new major big branches for years, all it produces is little twigs at the end. I mean, it's a silly argument. Uh, of course you haven't produced any new major branches, because it, major branches happen a long time ago. That's the whole point about major branches. And so, in the, what happened in the Cambrian e explosion, was, of course, that there was the same kind of evolution that you get today, and some of those, some of the diversity that we see in the Cambrian has survived and others of it, of it hasn't. So I think the, the poetry of the Cambrian explosion uh, and the sort of wild, frenzied dance of evolutionary experimentation with new phyla popping up um, every few minutes, uh, you know, I'm exaggerating, of course, um, is, is, is not helpful. It's, it has mis misled a generation of people. Uh, we've got about eight minutes left. I'm going to try to get to some more questions fairly quickly. Uh, we'll do our best. Okay. Um, what's been lovely about this evening is hearing about your thoughts and doing some of that. But one of the things I'm particularly interested in is thinking about where you are now as a thinker and where you're going. And towards that end, my question is, what are the questions that are uh, dominating your thoughts on any sphere, political, social, scientific? And uh, what questions or thoughts are helping you to unpack? Mm. Well, um, I... I mean, I, I've retired now. Um, <laughs> um, so, I, I'm in, in, in a way, I'm looking at science from the sidelines. Um, I, I, I would love to see somebody solve the riddle of the origin of life. That would be fascinating, because it, we don't really know anything about that yet. I find the, the progress of molecular genetics fascinating. Um, it's Quite, it's quite extraordinary how genetics has become a branch of information technology and how um, it's um, just, like, just like computers. I, I love it. I, I don't do it myself, but I'm fascinated by it. You ask about what are, what are occupying my thoughts in the non-scientific field. I don't know that I can answer that. I mean, I could be terribly personal, but I'm damned if I'm going to. <laughs> yes. From this side over here. Thank you for coming here tonight, Dr. Uh, you continue to be an inspiration as a uh, budding zoologist. And I was wondering, were there any uh, questions in zoology or evolutionary biology that you had that you feel we've had a uh, good or satisfactory answer to in your life? 
Uh, do, do you mean that I myself have... have um, well, the questions that you've had that you or others in the field have done work that has produced an answer that... Or well, I think, I, I think there's... I mean, I, I, I won't speak about myself, but I think that there's great progress going on in the field of sexual selection, which hasn't been mentioned uh, t t tonight. It's, it's, it's Darwin's other theory, uh, and... Um, I think a, it, it's a very powerful idea to explain a great deal about life, um, not, not just peacocks and things like that, but possibly even humans. And I think it's an interesting idea that has been pushed mainly by Jeffrey Miller that a lot of human evolution is uh, driven by sexual selection. Darwin himself thought that, and uh, Miller has taken it, has brought it up to date, and I think the, the idea that, um, for example, the evolution of the human brain, which has been such a spectacular feature of human evolution um, in the last two or three million years, uh, could it have been, could the driving force have been sexual selection? Could it be that braininess is sexy, braininess is attractive? Um, but both, both ways, by the way. Um, it, it's I mean, Miller makes the point, it's pretty, pretty well got to be both ways. It's not, it's not like a peacock's tail, where the, the peacock that has the, the brilliant tail and the peahen doesn't. Um, in the case of, of humans, the big brain is, is, is the same in, in both sexes. And so it, it's, it's rather a nice thought that this, it might be that, that braininess is sexy um, going both ways. Um, so I think that's, um, there's a lot of work going on in sexual selection. And, and I think, um, although I haven't been personally involved in it very much, I'd say that. Yes, yes. By the way, there's a sound bite there if anybody wants to grab it where he had said, sexy, going both ways. Just, <laughs> just in case. Uh, hey, Matt. Uh, hey, Matt. How's it going? Yeah. Uh, I wanted to uh, first thanks both for coming. Um, like, that's my place. Thank you. Anyway. <laughs> um, uh, I wanted to ask a question that's a little bit about evolution, a little bit about atheism, because that seems to sort of be the split on stage. Um, I can't help but get over the feeling that humans just carry this terrible evolutionary baggage that drives us towards religion. Not that it's impossible to get out or that there's like, you know, this God-shaped hole in people's hearts, but this idea that, you know, humans on this savanna had to be afraid of a shadow because it might be a predator, basically hyperactive agency detect. Um, I'm wondering... Uh, what are your thoughts on that? Is there really sort of an evolutionary force driving people to make the wrong decision all the time? And if so, how do you deal with that? Well, I, I, li I like the, I, I think the, 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 the shadow theory is a, is a good one. I, I think the, the idea that um, be, because uh, what you don't understand, what you don't know could be dangerous, and there's a kind of asymmetry that if you, if you assume that it's not dangerous, then, then you get eaten, but, but so it's probably best to, to make the pessimistic assumption. Um, and this generalizes to th seeing agency wherever you look. So it, it's not enough just to see, just for the, for the, for the rain to come. It, there's an agent that sent it, the rain god sent it, the sun god, the rain god, the river god. Um, and uh, that seems to me to be plausible. That's not in itself a theory of the survival value of religion. For that, I think I prefer to think in terms of survival value of sort of psychological predispositions which might have led to, to uh, religion. Um, are we driven to believe daft things? Um, in a sense, I mean, I can, I can, see, a, I can see a case for that. Um, well, we know that getting to the wrong, ha having a wrong belief can lead to something beneficial, at least in the short term. Yes, we know that. I mean, what other and maybe in evolutionary time, religion, we're still in the short yes. term. I mean, we, we, we self-deceive. There's a, l a lovely, um, I mean, Robert, Robert Trivers has written a book on, on, on self-deception, and there's psychological evidence that um, more than 50% of, I mean, every, 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 everybody thinks they're in the top 50% of intelligence or um, driving ability or good looks or, or, or um, which, which of course can't, can't, can't be true. And it's, 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 it's arguable that um, 
natural selection has built in a kind of optimism um, more than more than it should. Uh, uh. There's a there's a partial answer to this that I talked about in the past, so I won't go through the whole thing again. Where I said prayer works, in the sense that if you're trapped in a cave-in and you pray, your chances of getting rescued increase, not because there's a God there, but because the act of praying may calm you down, you use less oxygen, you extend the amount of time that you can be there. So that's what I mean about the wrong idea, potentially uh, having short-term benefits. Uh, I, I, I would like to think, though I can't in any way demonstrate that it's true, but having the true, the correct belief would not only provide that benefit, but not the short term, but the long term, understanding that calming down. I just don't know necessarily know that psychologically knowing that if you're calm and, and, and breathe easy is enough to make you do it. I, I would hope so. Um, my question is about um, about what? And a subjective experience and a objective experience. No, a lot of our. No, you're talking extremely fast. Could Sorry, you, uh, a lot of our experiences are obviously. Objective. You're still talking extremely fast. <laughs> <laughs> the way we observe, this, uh, there's subjectivity to it. We don't see the entire truth of something. We only see parts of it because our senses are limited. Um, sometimes it seems that since there's so many different find an objective truth and potentially maybe impossible. Um, I was yes. just wondering your, your thoughts on that. Is empirical measurement, is, you know, is it difficult given that all that we can experience is subjective? But if that were right, wouldn't, wouldn't science not work? I mean, the, the fact is science works rather well. Doesn't it? Yeah. Um, <laughs> <laughs> The fact that you have a subjective, ex the fact that you have a subjective experience or assessment something, doesn't change whether the something your experience is also can be evaluated objectively. This is why science relies on independent verification and repetition and, and, and so these sorts of things. So that the, my view of truth is that truth is that which comports with reality. Now you can fundamentally say I have no way of ever knowing truth, and uh, and you can go down the road of hard solipsism that I'm the only brain here, and you guys are figments of my imagination, which would make my imagination more impressive than anything I could have imagined. Right. But, but the denial of uh, 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 that the fact that we have subjective assessments does not mean that we cannot uh, have a reasonable evaluation of what would be objectively real. And what about the sort of maybe potentially quantum physical? But that's a second question, and we're almost out of time. <laughs> and also, I'm not going down any quantum paths this evening. Yes. Uh, hi there, thank you for both being here. Um, with the centenary of the Russian Revolution, well, here, uh, <laughs> having that in context, my question is, is there a direct link between human incapacity to live without a god and the rise of a dictatorship that aims to exploit that need? Is there a... Rise of a dictatorship in a socialist society, post-revolutionary society. W what was the correlation again with... That aims to exploit the need to live without a god in a secular society. I just didn't get that at yeah, all. Yeah, I'm not sure I follow the, follow the question no. either. Can you, can you just do the question okay. one more time? So after the Bolsheviks came to power, the first, one of the first tenets that they used, the separation of church and state, yeah. finally, in Russia. And ended up what we know as the Soviet experience now. So my question is, is there a need, inherent need, between, in, in human Society, you have a God. You cannot, have, you cannot live without God. Is, the, is there a need to have a God? Yes. Yeah, I see. Um, I don't think there is. Uh, I, I, I'm not quite sure what the link is with the Russian Revolution. Uh, I, 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 I certainly don't think there's any, a, a need to have a God because plenty of us get along very well without one. Um, I wonder if the, the purpose of the question was, correct me if I'm not paraphrasing this, but because government institutionalized atheism went so poorly, right. yeah. is it the case that we then need a God to not go so poorly? And 140 yeah. million people going no. along. <laughs> no. Uh, the fact that, so what happened in, in Russia, there's nothing about atheism that necessarily leads to any conclusion. Uh, basically, the Russians built a new religion of 
the leader and this opposition to organized religion. I would rather build a society based on reason, secular humanism. I don't see how secular humanism could lead to anything like like the problems that we experience here. So is socialism the new religion? I don't, I don't need any religion, new or, new or old, but... You could define a religion as, some, as something that a lot of people believe in, and, and in, in that sense, both socialism and Nazism could be called religions, or you could define a religion as a belief in supernatural, in which case those are, those are not. But um, certainly, um, both Stalin and Hitler cultivated a, a kind of religion in that they, they more or less, I mean, Hitler had, had grace said to him at the beginning of meals and Stalin had people more or less praying to him, oh, oh, oh great Joseph Stalin, we, we bless you for the, this, that and the other, um, and using more or less the cadences of the Lord's Prayer. Um, so you can, once again, it comes down to what we've been talking about before, is the, 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 is the flexibility of language and the fact that the language is our servant, not our master. You can define a religion as an ideology that lots of people believe in and that they're prepared to die for and kill for, in which case both Nazism and, and um, socialism would count, and so would nationalism. Or you can define a religion as belief in the supernatural, in which case those are not. And my apologies. Thank you. This Sorry. is going to be the quick last question. Quick question, yeah. Professor Dawkins. What's your favorite Nightwish song? What? He, he wanted to know your favorite Nightwish song, but yeah, we don't need. It. Go ahead. Last question of the evening. Thank you for waiting. Well, I've been working to fight air pollution and global warming as my career, and it seems to me that over the last decades, there's been sort of steady progress in education and so forth. Until maybe, the, maybe I'm misperceiving, but maybe the last five years, it feels like things have started to go backwards in terms of what's happening in the U.S. with the EPA and regulations or with what's happening in terms of, uh, I guess, anti-science sentiment, like it was said on the left and on the right. It's certainly gone backwards in the last 10 months. Oh, well, I was trying to avoid the political uh, uh, I won't avoid. I won't avoid it. Trump fucked the EPA. Yeah, okay. Uh, <laughs> right, so... Yes. <laughs> so I guess I, since both of you have spent your careers fighting against the forces of unreason, how do you stay hopeful that we'll eventually prevail? <laughs> Especially when you see numbers like growing religion worldwide, even though in, you know, maybe in North America the trend is more encouraging. How do you stay hopeful that we'll ultimately succeed? What, what, what makes you think I do feel hopeful? <laughs> Um, well, I mean, I, I, I sort of do because, because I think that if you look over the long course of history, it, it's all, on, in general, in moving in a positive direction. The problem with climate change is that it may be too late. I mean, it may be, it may be that, uh, that um, we've already gone too far. The, 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 tr the Trump disaster I regard as just temporary. I mean, I, I, I wouldn't worry about that. It's just, just he'll, he'll, be, he'll be gone and forgotten. Um, but whether whether global warming will will ever quit. And on that note, <laughs> about how we stay positive, you know, uh, I think there's a lot to be optimistic about. I, I I agree with Richard's answer. And oh, Travis has walked out. I was getting ready to thank everyone and thank Richard, but you're doing that. Hey, everybody. Uh, I just wanted to come out. And I guess it was in 2014, uh, we had a conversation, I think it was at 92nd Street Y, and I could be wrong, but I got the impression from that conversation that you were doing a lot of, a lot of work, a lot of self-reflection to try to come to terms with your own religiosity. 
No. <laughs> and um, and so, but, but uh, yeah, that's exactly right. So you came out with a very strong uh, position on that. Um, but, you know, as, as time goes by, people get older, sometimes their view shifts. So you can just give me a yes or no on this. Has anything changed in that regard since we last spoke? Absolutely not, no. Can you hear me? I don't think you can, can you? Yes, I think we... Uh... Could somebody fix my... You know, uh, we don't know each other that well, but, um, you know, this is how you get to know the person that you're going to be conversing with. You can just get that right in there. Is that tight? It's the second time it's come off. I think that's good, right? Well, let's try to go with that and see how that goes. Okay. Good. So, anyway, so... Um, so uh, nothing's changed. No, thank God. That's uh, great. Um, and, um, you, know, the, the, you know, when I think about the big questions, I tend to organize them into origin of the universe, origin of life, and origin of mind. And I'm actually teaching a course with that theme at Columbia. And we read the selfish gene, this term, as part of that. I hadn't read it since I was in college. So, you know, it was spectacular to, to re-engage with the wonderful book that you gave the world, a question came up in the class. All right. And um, I would like to check with you to see if the answer I gave makes, makes sense and aligns with your thinking. So the question a couple of kids asked was, look, we read this book and we get a very clear sense of, of evolution, you know, the gene as the basic unit of heredity, but we're still left with the question, what is life and how did life get started? So my response to that, which some of them found quite um, unsatisfying, is that that's not as precise a question as you think, right? I mean, in some sense, trying to draw the line between animate and inanimate and trying to have a very precise definition ultimately amounts to words, right? It's a continuum from, from inanimate to animate. And once we have the molecular Darwinism in place, rolling forward, life just emerges in that continuum. So my question to you, is that a reasonable way of describing I, it? I think it is. Um, I think that there's a too great a tendency in the human mind to try to draw lines and to try to, where there, where there is a spectrum. I mean, sometimes there really is a line, but in other cases there isn't. And we should not insist that there has to be a line. Well, in the case of life, I suppose you could sort of see a kind of line when the first self-replicating entity came into existence, because that was the moment when natural selection and hence Darwinian evolution could start. You can't get natural selection unless you've got something equivalent to a gene. So the first gene, which would not have been DNA, by the way, but the, the first gene um, would be a kind of watershed event, I suppose. But I agree with you, we, we don't want to get too hung up on the questions of definition which dim, like a definition of life as opposed to non-life right which demand a particular moment at which life came into existence and when you say first gene in that context can i think of it as the first molecule that discovers this capacity for making copies of itself period yes making copies of itself and that would include making copies of errors in itself right um so that there, there has to be variety in the population of these replicating entities. The reason I say it wouldn't have been DNA is that DNA has been described as a high-tech replicator that requires a rather complicated infrastructure of biochemistry in order to, to do its replication. So people in the field agree that the first replicator would not have been DNA. It would have been something else that had the property of self-replication probably much less efficient at it than DNA. And DNA would have been a late usurper of that role. It could have been RNA. And do you think it was RNA? Is I there... don't know. I mean, that, that, that's a current fashionable idea. That, and the reason it's fashionable is that, um, as you know, there's a kind of divide in, in biochemistry between the protein, which acts as enzyme, and, and the, the variety of enzymes which is the key to everything that goes on in, in, in life. The fact that the three-dimensional form of a protein molecule, when it coils up into a sort of knot, which gives it its enzymatic properties, and that is determined by the 
um, one-dimensional sequence of amino acids, which in turn is determined by the one-dimensional sequence of uh, DNA. Um, so there's this double act between DNA and protein. Uh, D DNA is not an enzyme, it's an excellent replicator. Protein is an excellent enzyme, but cannot replicate. Uh, RNA is kind of moderate at both. So uh, if, if, R if it started off with RNA, that could have done both the enzyme role, because en RNA is a kind of rather bad enzyme, right. and a kind of rather bad replicator, but it can do both roles. And so the idea is then, the DNA would have come in and usurped the replication role, and protein then came in and usurped the enzyme role. So how, how big, how big a molecule do you imagine this first replicator would be? I suppose it would be quite small, the, the, the first one. Yeah. Right, I mean... Uh, but I, I don't know, I mean, this is, this is an, an active field of, well, I suppose research, but very speculative research. Right, because, you know, you'll see people making the argument that whatever molecule you put forward as the first one, if it has some degree of complexity associated with it, you can then ask yourself, you know, what are the odds yeah. that that molecule will yeah. form? And when that number is necessarily quite small, some people see a tension with the naturalness of the process yeah. and the yeah. unlikelihood that it would happen. So how, it, how do you answer that? It, well, it, it, it is a field where, where the, there, there is no answer yet, and, and people are not, are not confident of, of it. Um, there, are, there are various problems with the so-called uh, Catch-22 um, that, you, that, 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 that you can't get um, DNA without protein and vice versa. Right. Um, there, are, uh, there are other problems with it. Um, some people have favored what they call a hypercycle, where um, there are various stages in, the, in, a, in, a, in a chain, and each stage gives rise to the next. So there's, there's no one molecule is the, is the key replicator. The entire hypercycle um, is, is the key, is the, is the replicator. Um, but it's, it's not a field which has been solved. It's not a question which has been answered. Um, it is still conceivable that the origin of life, the origin of self-replication, the origin of uh, natural selection, was a stupendously improbable event. Right. Uh, and the, the corollary of that would be that there's no other life in the universe. I mean, or put it the other way, if you want to believe that there is only one life form in the universe, which you're entitled to do, um, then it, a corollary of that is that the origin of life on this planet must have been a, a fantastically improbable event, so much so that any theory we come up with has got to be a very implausible theory. Right. Because if it were plausible, <laughs> there would be life all over the universe. Yes. Which I suspect there probably is. And just saying that if you want to believe that life only arose once, then what you're looking for in a theory of the origin of life is not a plausible theory such as you could replicate in a chemistry lab. So, I mean, so there is a lot of evidence that all life on Earth comes from a common single-celled ancestor. Yes, the, ev the evidence for that is, is that the DNA code is all but universally the same in every living form that's ever been examined. And the odds of that coming about convergently is extremely low. So I think just about everybody is convinced that every single life form, at least those that have been looked at, it descends from a common ancestor. It's because it's got the same machine code at its base. There now, are does, that, does that strike you as, as a puzzle or just something that we need no, to No, I don't accept? think it's a puzzle. I mean, it, it, it could be that more than one life form arose originally. And we just don't see and, them. And, we don't, and, and as Darwin said originally, Darwin said um, one of them ate up all the others. Right. So that, that, that's a possibility. Paul Davies, your physics colleague, um, thinks it's worth looking to see if there are other life forms. They, just, they may be around on Earth, but never been, been found. Um, I, I liken that to the looking for your keys under the lamppost. And when somebody lost his keys, and so he's looking under, under the lamppost for the keys. And somebody else asks him, why are you looking under the lamppost? Is that where you lo lost your keys? No, but that's where the light is. Right. So, um, uh, 
if we're asking the question, is there life elsewhere in the universe? We can't go elsewhere in the universe yet. It's very difficult to... Well, the, the, so let's look But the here. universe can come to us, and some have suggested that maybe the origin, you know, life in some yes. form may have come here on a, you know, um, on a meteor, or got yes. pummeled off of yes. Mars. Well, that, that's not so implausible as it, it was once thought to be. Yeah. Um, it's the theory of panspermia, um, invented by a Swedish... Um, a Swedish biologist called Arrhenius about a century ago now. Um, and it was espoused by Fred Hoyle, the astronomer, very distinguished astronomer, but he, he kind of went adrift a bit on, on evolution anyway. Um, directed panspermia is a, is a more far-fetched idea, which was actually f favored, I think, a bit tongue-in-cheek. You mean that uh, actually someone sent it yes, here to, I mean, to seed life? Uh, Francis Crick, the, 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 the great um, co-discoverer of the structure of DNA, um, together with Leslie Orgel, suggested that, um, we, that our planet could have been deliberately seeded by an alien civilization. I, I think it was a joke. I mean, I, I mean they, they, they sort of presented it as though it was a serious theory. But, but, right. Um, um, so, so when you consider the, the rich spectrum of life on Earth that all, say, arose from this singular starting point. Do you find that the, the range is sensible relative to the environment that life found itself trying to adapt to? Or do you find it strange that we don't have you know, beings with you know, nine eyes or eyes that work under completely different principles or I don't know, some being that would be sensitive to gravitational waves. Yes. And, you know. now that, I'm very fascinated by that kind of question. Um, and you can get a long way by looking around the animal kingdom and, and, and asking how many times different things have evolved. And you can work out how many times they've evolved because you can work out what the tree of life actually is. You, you know which animals are close relations of, of, of which. So we know, for example, that there are, I think it's nine different principles of eyes, different, really? different ways of doing, doing the optics. And that eyes have evolved independently several dozen times. One estimate is, is more than 40 times. Really? Um, so eyes actually evolve with great ease, with great frequency. Um, and they're got, all sensitive to the same part of the spectrum because uh, of the not sun? Not exactly the same, but it's overlapping. Right. Uh, insect eyes move towards the ultraviolet, for example. Um, but it, it's, it's nice to think that all the ways of making an eye that physicists have thought of have been thought of by evolution um, in, in rather interesting ways. I mean, the, com the compound eye works in a totally different way from the camera eye, which is what, which is what we have. There are mollusks which have a, a, a reflector eye, a, 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 a parabolic reflector. You mean like a radio dish out there? Yes, really? yeah, but, but optical. Wow. Uh, so... Um, that there are scallops that have that. Have that. Um, and there are lots of different kinds of compound eye, lots of different kinds of camera eye. Um, and they've evolved independently. Other things like, say, um, echolocation, navigating by sonar, by, by sound waves, that's evolved four times independently uh, in bats, whales, and two different families of birds, cave-dwelling birds, in, independently. So that's rather more reluctant to evolve, but nevertheless right. it has evolved more than once. Some things have evolved only once, and so you feel they're improbable things. Right. Mm. So, so in trying to understand the likelihood or not of the emergence of life, and therefore to try to gain some insight into the question that you made reference to, whether we're alone or there's other life out there in the universe, you know, sometimes people write down this, um, this Drake equation, which I, every time I see it, I always feel like it's, it's misrepresenting the situation because it's not so much an equation describing the actual likelihood of the arising of life. It's more a way of uh, encapsulating our ignorance of yeah. the whole variety of qualities of the universe mm -hmm. that we really don't have any insight into. So any number that comes out of it is really just totally dependent on the ignorance that we have regarding the numbers that go into it. But, but be that as it may, when when you think about that life may have just started once on this planet, does that 
diminish your expectation that the search for extraterrestrial life will be successful? Well, we can't escape from the fact that it did arise on this planet. I mean, yeah. That's a, it's a, it's, it's, so it's a sample it's size a, of one, and what yes. do you do with that? I would love another one. I mean, it, it, yeah. it, it, um, because we just don't know. And I'm, I'm very intrigued by the question, how much of what we know about this, this form of life yeah. had to be so, because there's only one way for it to be. For example, does there have to be a, something like a gene? I think the answer is yes. Does it have to be... I mean, just because you need something to, carry, to, 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 to propagate double, yes, the information. Yeah. Right. Um, does it have to be a one-dimensional array? Does it have to be digital? Right. I think it probably has to be digital. Does digital it, because otherwise errors would too creep much, in too, too quickly. Too much error, yes. Right. Um, does it have to be a one-dimensional string of data, which DNA is? And I don't think that's clear. I, mean, I could imagine a two-dimensional matrix. Right. Um, which could be read. Not three-dimensional, because you can't get inside the, um, right. the, the three-dimensional blob. Um, so that's the kind of question. Does there have to be sex? Would you expect to get eyes? I, I, I bet you'd get eyes, um, because, because eyes have happened so many times here. But presumably if it was a star that emitted strongly in a completely different part of the spectrum, then that's maybe you, sensitivity sure, there yes. or something of that sort. Yes, yes exactly. So... Um, so it leads to, to the question then. Um, if you had your choice, in some sense, as to what we would find if we encountered life in another world, would you want it to be the same in order that you would have a unified theory of life in some sense, or would you rather it be different so that now you just see this grand spectrum of possibility with us just being one of many? I'd be delighted by either. I mean, if, right. if, it, if, it, if it were... If it were too similar, if for, <clears throat> if, for example, you found life on Mars and it was DNA-based and the DNA code was the same... Right, then, then it's I, probably the same. Then it's got to be contamination. Right. Um, because we, kn we know that... So we mean we're Martians. It could have come from there. It could have come from right. there. It, right. But we, we know that a lot of meteorites have come from, from Mars. So right. That, so, but if, it's, um, if it were DNA but a different DNA code... That would be rivetingly exciting. Right. If it were not DNA, but something like you know, another um, uh, polymer, um, gosh, it would be fascinating. It would yeah. be amazing. Um, I think it would be the most exciting discovery ever, actually, to find, to find something like, like that. I, I mean, we, we, as you say, we've got a sample of one. L life on this planet is uniform at the biochemical level, even even great big creatures like us, we do our biochemistry quite largely using tricks that were discovered by primordial bacteria. And, yep. they, and many of them are in us doing the same trick. We've simply commandeered them. Yeah, no, it'd be hugely so, exciting. Almost exciting as string theory or something like that. Yeah. Uh, um, we'll come on to that. <laughs> yeah. But um, so, 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 you know, as we enter an age when we can begin to actually tinker with the actual structure of life, say CRISPR, Cas9. Um, do you imagine that we'll be able to gain some insight into these questions in the laboratory? As opposed I think, yes, to I mean, I, I would, I, when I'm, ever I meet a biochemist, I always ask them, can you imagine an alternative biochemistry? Could yeah. you construct an alternative biochemistry? Right. Or if you can't construct it, at least Im imagine it. Um, does it have to be carbon-based, for example? I think the answer to that is probably yes. Would you agree with that? Or well, I mean, carbon is certainly the natural go-to species if I didn't know anything about life and you gave me a list of criterion that you want to have a very active molecule, you want it to be able to bond with all sorts of other molecules in the environment, <laughs> you want it to be uh, uh, a, a species that's commonplace so that it's not a rare species that we deal with. But um, there are other pretty active species, too. Well, um, silicon is, is mentioned yeah, right, as, for as an element which, which could, could possibly do the same job. Right. Um, but um, I asked Harry Croteau, the famous organic yeah, sure, chemist, yeah. and he, he's confident it'll be... That, that it'd have to be carbon-based. Uh, yeah, it have to be carbon-based. But that leaves a lot of freedom, nevertheless. I mean, even, even within carbon, even within organic chemistry, an enormous freedom to, to divert, devise alternative biochemistries. Right. Now, do you, do you think that there will come a point when we just can create life from scratch in the laboratory? I mean, is that in our future? Yes. 
Uh, I think so, yes. I mean, well, Craig Venter has already created... Well, sort of. ...replica, I mean, uh, yeah. just sort of re re reproduced the same thing. Um, but, uh, yes, yeah, so... so I mean, do you want to say what Craig has done just to... Uh... Well, um, he, he has re recreated um, a particular bacterium from scratch. Um, but it's, it is just, a, just one that already existed. Right. Well, if you can do that, then you could theoretically create one that doesn't exist already. Uh, and and um, uh, so, and from that, I suppose you could e might even go, ahead, go on to multicellular right. life. And so, you know, does, does this, I mean, obviously this is an exciting possibility. Does it scare you? It excites me more than it scares me. Um, I, I, I'm just fascinated by it and by the, the, the possibilities. So I'm, uh, I do think we have to exercise a precautionary principle. And how, do you, how, do, how would you imagine doing that? As, do you know Sidney Brenner, a great molecular biologist? Uh, not African. personally, but yeah. Keep the lid on your petri dish well screwed down," he said. <laughs> you know, but any any you know uh, you know criterion and, and restrictions you place in this country or in your country, right? I mean, this is not a worldwide type of. Um, no. So. But there have been attempts. I mean, there was there was a meeting of molecular biologists at one point to sort of devise a kind of moratorium list of things that you you mustn't do, and I think it, it held for a while. Um, but, uh, yeah, I mean, I suppose a, a greater, more present worry would be if um, the techniques of creating of, of, or of varying um, microorganisms were to fall into the wrong hands. I mean, biological warfare yeah. has been experimented on by some of the great powers, and if, that, if the techniques fell into the hands of terrorists, um, it, it Especially if the terrorists, for religious reasons, want to die, and therefore don't care whether they destroy the world. Right. Um, it. it th I think that's probably more of a worry than than the kind of thing you were raising of, right. of creating life. Uh, but the uh, but the bottom line then um, summary, if if I'm hearing you correctly, is you would agree, presumably, with the statement that whatever, a hundred years or five hundred years from now, people will look back at this era and sort of smile at the mystery that we once thought was embedded in life, and it will just be another concoction of chemicals that happens to be able to carry out certain processes, and people will shrug as opposed to revere this entity that forms, at least on this planet. I suppose if, the le if there's a lesson from history that we always one can look back on earlier e eras and feel that way, yes. Well, I mean, you know, at the end of the, uh, you know, in 19th century, there's a famous statement in physics that I'm sure you're familiar with. Lord Kelvin is usually credited with saying it. It's unclear that he actually did. That, you know, all the laws of physics were worked out except, you know, this or that constant of nature that needed to be evaluated to the sixth or seventh decimal place. And, of course, that was before the discovery of special relativity, general relativity, quantum mechanics. So it was spectacularly wrong. It's spectacularly short-sighted. Yes, yes. Um, but um, do you think it's possible that there is a discovery, a, a phase, a step on par, say, with quantum mechanics, which, you know, for physicists is the revered step in our understanding of the natural world, that we're completely missing right now? Yes, a different kind of precautionary principle. You've got to be precautionary about what you say and not fall into the Lord Kelvin um, era. Right. Um, I think it was Lord Kelvin also said... Um, radio will turn out to be a hoax. Um, um, and um, what else did he say? Um, I well, don't know if I know that one. Uh, he said, um, uh, heavier than air flight is impossible. Um, uh, Jeez, you're really taking my hero and just cutting the legs out. Of well, no, he was a great physicist for his time. Um, but <laughs> he, he also... Um, he also gave Darwin some grief because wow, he I opened a can of worms here. This yeah. is fantastic. Yeah, go ahead. <laughs> he gave Darwin some grief because he calculated that uh, the sun was too young ah, to sure. have allowed time for evolution, and that's because he thought the sun was 
a fire burning, burning fuel um, and had no way of, of knowing that the sun is a nuclear reactor. And, and so um, Darwin was in, intimidated because physics was the, was the senior science. And so it, in a way, Kelvin kind of came a bit heavy on Darwin and, and, and said, well, physics proves evolution not possible. What Darwin should have said, well, the evidence for evolution is overwhelming, so your physics must be wrong. <laughs> Touche. <Yeah. laughs> so, so um, you know, if we go from, from life to intelligence, you know, conscious self-awareness, there's a similar collection of puzzles, obviously different in detail, but revered by many through the centuries. And in the modern era, you know, David Chalmers is famous, you know, down, down at NYU now, famous for articulating the so-called hard problem of consciousness, right? The problem that if matter is all there is, matter and fields, and if electrons and quarks and the entities that they build up, protons and neutrons, if they have no inner world, if the lights aren't on inside an electron, if it has no inner sensation, if a third person account precisely describes what's going on with an electron, there's nothing else. How could it possibly be that when these particles swirl together, they somehow generate an inner sensation, a quality that simply is absent at the level of the fundamental ingredients? Mm. So, you know, he was dividing up the problems in, in neuroscience and brain science into those that have to do with the mechanism, the function of the brain, which ultimately are, can be difficult to work out, but it's clear what to do to figure out, you know, what's going on when, you know, my arm goes up and down, what sort of brain signals are making that happen. But he considered a qualitatively different question to be the one that I was referring to, namely how can yeah. the lights turn on? Do, do, you, do you see that distinction? Well, I always confess myself baffled by it. I, I mean, I, I do see it as a, as a deep, as a profoundly difficult problem. I am committed to the view that it, that there is nothing there other than physics. There's nothing there other than, um, as, as you say, atoms and electrons. Um. And where does, where, I mean, I agree with you, hmm. but where does that sensibility come from? Is it based on evidence? Um, I suppose it comes from the feeling that, um, as an evolutionist, we start with physics, we st and then we get chemistry, and um, we get an, a process, Darwinian natural selection, which gradually builds up nervous systems step by step. They get more and more complicated. Um, I cannot under, I can't, I can't see any other way but that. Um, I, Could that be limited mental acuity and creative powers? I think it has to be that, uh, but um, I, I um, I mean, I, I'm, I'm more curious to know what you think, but as a, as a physicist... Um, I thought I was asking the question. No, well, no, it's good. No, no, we, we, we actually were going to go back and forth on questions. And um, I, I, I agree. I can't imagine that there's something beyond Schrodinger's equation of quantum mechanics and the interactions with the particles that's going on inside this physical structure inside of my head. But I still feel deeply puzzled so by how it is that I can sit here and have this, this inner world. Everything that we do in physics, and think science more generally, is so focused on the third person account. We can look out, objectively see data in the world, find the patterns in that data, articulate the patterns in mathematical equations, use the mathematical equations to predict what's going to happen next, or the probability of what's going to happen next in a quantum mechanical framing, and that's what we do. We never have this turn inward to try to have that same kind of rigor and description of what's happening inside of our heads. Now, what David Chalmers says is, he says that's, that's, that's not just a small issue, that's a huge issue, if I understand what he's saying correctly. He's saying we perhaps are missing a side of the story 
which would endow perhaps electrons and quarks and other particles with a degree of proto-consciousness. Maybe there's something beyond mass and charge and spin. Maybe there's something there, and only by taking into account that quality that we've been missing can a lot of those particles yield the sensations that yeah. we're all having right now. It starts to sound dangerously like Deepak Chopra, if you're not careful. Well, um, <laughs> you know, I'll, I'll, I'll tell David that you, that you said that. Yeah. Uh, but um, I mean, I, I'm also yeah. um, intrigued by philosophers' thought experiments where they say things like, imagine that you could um, make an exact copy of, your, of every single yeah. atom of, your, of, you, of you. And, yeah. and, and, there, are, and um, there, are, there are two of you standing side by side. Which one, which one is you? Both. I, I have no doubt that they're both. Yes, right. but then, yeah. but then um, presumably you would, you would have the same consciousness. Yeah, same but memories. Then, but then they would... Diverge. Start to drift. They would start to drift, drift apart. Yeah, so there'd be yeah. two of me. Yes. You know, I'm not sure that would be such a good thing for the world. But um, yeah, that that's that's uh, I, on 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 that question. I feel I feel secure in, in saying that. Uh, obviously, if one day we can do this, it'll be the best way to find out. But part of that sensibility for me, and I'm wondering if it's the same for you. I don't think that consciousness has to take place inside a particular physical structure, you know, the human brain or the brain of any other, any other animal. You know, I think that once you replicate the function, you've replicated the experience. Do you? Do you? Yeah, and I, I mean, I think if you, if you could somehow upload everything into a computer, that, that, that also would have to have our consciousness. And, and, but but the, the, these, I, I agree with David Chalmers, it is the hard problem, and it's certainly too hard for me uh, but, I'm, but I wouldn't take the leap to say that, therefore, I know something like, you know, every atom must have a little smidgen of consciousness right. or something like no, that. No, I don't think he took that step um, without a, a, a great deal of difficulty, with yeah. basically banging into every possible avenue that he pursued for many years, yeah. and, and it almost felt like there was no other place to turn. Um, and having not gone through the journey that he and others who spend their lives trying to figure out consciousness mm. uh, have gone through, mm. it's hard to know whether I or perhaps even you would feel the same way after hitting wall after wall yeah. after yeah. wall. Mm. Uh, but it's certainly the case that um, um, even on planet Earth, where we discuss that life may have had a unique origin, the arising of intelligence and conscious self-awareness that also seems to have been a miraculously improbable event that allowed that to happen. Yes. Right? I, I mean, mean, what if the meteor hadn't wiped out the dinosaurs? I mean, would we all be sitting here and we'd all be dinosaurs and having this conversation, or would we never have uh, gotten to that place? I suspect not. I mean, I think, I think that we, there would be lots of dinosaurs around, but, it, but it's... Yeah. it's but we would, I, yeah. I think, it's a, I think it's, a, it's a major step. We were talking about whether the origin of life was a big step, and perhaps it was. Um, so we don't, that, as I said, that was a corollary of whether we think there's life elsewhere. So, it, so there might be swarms all over the universe of bacterial type yeah. life, but if we ever discovered life elsewhere, it would have to be by radio waves coming in, and that means it would have to be technologically sophisticated life, and that means it would have to have overcome another barrier, so that the barrier from bacterial level life maybe there are several intermediate ones, and then up to the kind of life that's capable of producing radio waves that we can detect. Right, so long if it's far enough away, I mean, if it's near enough by, in principle, we could. If it's near enough by, yes, but I'm, right. I'm, I'm suspecting that's probably not. Um, I suspect that if we ever do discover extraterrestrial life, it will be by SETI, by, by and in, in that case, we have the question, do we have a second barrier, or maybe a third or a fourth barrier, right. and pr to produce the sort of intelligence? We don't have to get into consciousness. I mean, it could be unconscious, but it... But, if but it could it, talk it, to us, that would be good but, enough. But if, right. it, if, it, if it can produce radio sig signals, right. then that, that's... An, and that's a much more mundane question than the question of whether, whether the light, as you say, the consciousness sure. light is turned so, on. So do you think it... I mean, if we, if we discovered life that's not intelligent, um, would it make much of a difference ultimately to life here? I mean, it would be an exciting moment and so on, but would it then, you know, you know, 
we have what? You know, it used to be that you had a, a week news cycle, a 24-hour news cycle. Now it's like every 10 minutes. So yeah. would this be like from 10.30 to 10.34, bacteria found yeah. on Mars, and then by 11 o'clock, Trump would do something else and everyone would forget about it? I, I like to think that it, that it would change the way we think about our own life, but it, maybe, maybe it wouldn't. I think it, it, it really would if we, if we were contacted by intelligent life forms elsewhere, especially as if it was intelligent enough to get its signals here, it would have to be a lot higher level than us. Uh, and so we would, be that we would have a lot more to learn from them than they would learn from us. And so right. um, that really ought to shake our confidence and shake our... Um, now, if it was far away, it would be a pretty slow conversation. You couldn't have a conversation, right. though, that's right. Um, but you could listen to them. Right. Um, um, so, so let's say we did have this conversation going. Let's say we get over the barrier, somehow we learn how to communicate with each other and fancifully, let's imagine that the conversation happens yeah. more quickly than... You know, 500 know, year in, yeah, interval or, between. Yeah. So, so, so yeah. let's put yeah. all that to the side yeah. for just a second, yeah. uh, which is certainly a technical detail. Could you imagine that the logic by which this intelligent extraterrestrial society lived and thought and work and created would be fundamentally different from the logic here. That I love that question. With. I mean, I... I you, you, you've heard this question before? I mean, well, is this frequently asked you? I feel so hackneyed. No, I thought no, it was a good question. It's a, no, that's I why I say that I love it. I mean, uh, um, I, I mean um, clearly they would have Pythagoras' theorem. Um, they would have um, uh, numbers. They'd have geometry. They'd have... Um, but I, I'm... Like you, I'm curious to know whether they'd have a completely different kind of um, question that we don't, we don't have. Because there are, in mathematics, you're probably familiar with, uh, different kinds of logics. Yes. And, you know, uh, they're, they're interesting mathematically. People study these logics. You know, there's, you know, multivariate logic where it's not just true or false. It can be somewhere in between. You know, there's a subject called quantum logic, which in some sense is modeled on quantum mechanics, where, you know, it's not just the particles here or over here, but it's, you know, some quantum mechanical mixture of the two. So, so is it conceivable that one of those or some other kind of logic would, would yield a kind of engagement with the universe that's utterly distinct from ours. Well, it's sometimes suggested that the, 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 the way in which we think, which is not the way quantum theorists think, but the way people think, ordinary people think, um, is di dictated by what's the necessary kind of logic that you need in order to survive on the African plains. Yes. Um, and so when you're a, when you're a medium-sized object hunting other medium-sized objects and moving at medium speeds, um, then you need a different kind of logic than if, if, if somehow you could imagine that we were shrunk to the quantum lev level, we would have a yeah. different kind of yeah, logic. Yeah, right. Now, you can well imagine that some very forward thinking one of our remote ancestors who was out there in the savannah and, and actually thinking about quantum mechanics uh, got eaten. Right, so uh, so so uh, that's why uh, you know it takes so much dedicated effort for us to figure out these quantum laws because it's not built into our evolutionary structure. It didn't have any survival value. Presumably, that's a reasonable way of thinking about it. Yes, I mean that that's kind of what I meant, but not quite in, in those terms. Um, I, I mean, I I'm curious to ask a an advanced theoretical physicist, which is I don't often get that opportunity, but but. Um, the, the weirdness, the sheer, utter, utter mind-numbing weirdness of quantum theory. Um, do you, are you one of those physicists who, as it were, takes that in your stride and says, well, I don't actually, I can't conceptualize it, but the, the mathematics works, and so I, and, and the predictions that it produces are verified by experiment, and so in some sense it's got to be true. Or do you lie awake at night wishing you could understand, or perhaps you do un feel you understand it at... at, uh, at uh, well, I, I, I don't feel I understand it in the same way that I understand tables and chairs right. in a classical experiential perspective. And I do wish that I had quantum mechanical reasoning in my bones. I think I would engage with the universe in a, in a radically different and quite wonderful 
way. I mean, look, we all know if I, you know, I won't do it, but if I took this and I tossed it to you, you'd put out your hand and you'd catch it, which is an amazing thing because you didn't do the Newtonian calculation of the trajectory yeah, of the bottle. Yeah, you just yeah. sort of felt it in your bones and you yes. put your hand there and you catch yeah. it. So it's so mundane, but it's so wondrous that we're able to do it and it just shows the power of imbibing the rules that are relevant on the scale at which survival takes place. And I wish I had that same quality when it came to uh, an electron in the hydrogen atom, that I could just sort of feel the S orbital, and I could feel, you know, the P orbital, like being my bones, right? So if you ask me some question about the hydrogen atom, I wouldn't have to go calculate. I would just sort of be able to do what you did when you put out your arm and catch the bottle. So, so I don't have that. I wish that I did. At the same time, I certainly do use the mathematics to gain a confidence with the ideas. You ask me a question and it doesn't, you know, send me scurrying for cover because I'm like, okay, I don't know really fully how to think about that, but I know how to set it up. I know how to solve the equation. I know how to interpret the mathematics because it's been going on for 80, 90 years. And that gives me at least some semblance that I know what's going on. But it isn't in the same intuitive, deep right. intuitive way. And that, that is a, a strange way to live, right? You live, you know, as a physicist, you know, your career, whatever, 30, 40, 50 years. And most of the time, you kind of don't really know what's going on. I mean, do, do your colleagues, um, do, do any of your colleagues claim to have built into their bones, so to speak? Or do they all accept pretty much what you've said? You know, um, I don't know that I've ever heard anybody really say that. Well, actually, no, there is one. He came over to dinner. Uh, my wife is here somewhere. Trace, remember, Andy Strominger came over to our, our apartment, a Harvard physicist, and he was really angry at me for saying what I just said in public. He saw it in some version of this, in some conversation, and he said, you're giving the wrong impression of quantum mechanics. We fully understand it. And I was like, Andy, like, what do you really mean by that? But he, what he meant by that was, we have the equations, we have the math, we do the calculations. Which is just what you said it. anyway. Yeah. Which, yes. So, so I, I don't know that he would say that he has it. I'll have to add, you know, I, yeah. I believe that he did not say that he had that yes. deep intuitive understanding. Yes. But um, most people who think deeply about quantum mechanics um, even say that it's an incomplete subject as currently formulated. We do not know how to go from the fuzzy probabilistic mixtures of the reality that the math is telling us about. The electron is 50% here and 50% there and is in some sort of fuzzy mixture of the two. But yet when we measure the position of the electron, we always find it here, we always find it there. So somehow a transition happens from the fuzzy probabilistic reality to the single definite reality of common experience. And we don't have an equation for that. We just say, it happens. Or I should say, people have proposed equations for it, but we have no idea if they're right. Well, Schrodinger ridiculed the, um, uh, the Copenhagen interpretation with his cat, the f famous cat yeah, thought, right. thought experiment. Um, and um, I'm aware that um, there are others who talk about uh, the many worlds interpretation, yeah. who will say it in, in, in terms of Schrodinger's cat, there are there are worlds in which the cat is alive and there are other worlds in which the cat is dead. That, that seems to me to be, although a hideously unparsimonious way of looking at things, yeah. nevertheless, I can, it, it's not totally ridiculous the way the Copenhagen interpretation... Right, yeah, is. so the, just quickly, so the Copenhagen yeah, interpretation sorry, just says, hey, uh, we don't understand the process, but here's an algorithm, here's a procedure. Follow the procedure, or as it's usually described, shut up and calculate, right? That's the, uh, the summary of the Copenhagen approach. But that's not a, that's not a theory of physics, right? That, that's a set of instructions. But I, I thought in terms of the, of the cat yeah. satire, so to speak, yeah. the Copenhagen interpretation would say the cat is neither alive nor dead until you open the box. Which, and, yes, and so that, that's what I'm saying. Yeah. The algorithm is open the box, yes. and at that moment, one of the two happens. Yes. How does it happen? I don't know. But it happens. We see it happen. Now, that's a little bit of a, a cartoon description. There have been more refined versions of this story called decoherence that have been developed over the decades. So it's not like it's stagnant, but it's not really a theory. It's there just a, a set of rules. But let me just quickly add sure, yeah, uh, yeah. the one point that you did make about the, the many worlds yeah. being unparsimonious. And um, you really need to bring the right 
barometer, the, the right the yardstick. Many, many worlds would be that there are lots of worlds in which the cat is alive and other worlds in which the cat is dead. And is that, that, that's right. So the many worlds basically says if quantum mechanics says that this can happen and this can happen and that can happen with some probabilities, then actually all three do happen. They all happen in their own separate world. Yes. So every outcome allowed by quantum physics takes place. Now that sounds incredibly uneconomical, yeah. right? The world is just becoming, the landscape of reality is becoming larger and larger with all these distinct realities allowed by the unfolding of quantum mechanics. But here's the point. It is the most parsimonious theory when you look at the mathematics. Yes. So the equation is pristine and sharp and if you stare at that equation long enough, this is where the equation takes your thinking. If you just literally look at the symbols and say, what are those symbols telling me? Whereas all the other approaches add in other equations, other ideas, mm -hmm. baggage, and that sort. So if you use the art stick of the number of universes, out of control. Yeah. If you use the art stick of the mathematics, it is as simple as it can possibly be. Right, I like that. It's very good. Um, by the way, have you seen, there was a lovely New Yorker cartoon of a, a vet's uh, waiting room and the people were standing around with their dogs and cats and things. And the, uh, the, the nurse is com coming out and talking to a, a gentleman sitting there and saying, about your cat, Mr. Schrodinger, I have some good news and some <laughs> bad news. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's very nice. So, so... So I'm glad you asked about quantum mechanics because it does give a sense of how our intuition can completely mislead us. The things that our intuition tells us are true or false may not even be describable in that language. In the quantum world, it could be a mixture of both. And that is a fundamental layer of reality that our way of thinking about the world is not tuned into, not tapped into. If you're a trained quantum physicist, you can work it out, as we're describing, but intuitively, it's just sort of not there. So I, I guess uh, the question that comes from that, sort of relevant to other things that, that you, you're, you famously talk about, um, what, what does that tell you about the nature of, of truth? I mean, I mean you spend a, a lot of time, important time, going out into the world as an advocate for, for truth, and we all know what that means in sort of everyday scales, but if we can be a little bit more expansive in our thinking here, um, does this disjuncture between the truth at the level of fundamental physics and the truth at the level of intuition, excuse me for that spittle that just went halfway across the stage, um, does, does that dis distinction give you any pause? Well, we came into this by talking about um if, if, if Martians had a different kind of... Yeah. I mean, to what extent is our conception of logic and truth governed by, the, 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 by what's necessary in order to survive on this planet? And if for some reason you need a different kind of logic to survive in Mars or, or Alpha Centauri or somewhere, would we have a different conception of truth? Um, I, it's a dangerous time to be talking about this with fake truth and post-truth. and yeah. things. Um, I... I, I, I think of myself as a, as a naive realist. I mean, I, I, I think there is such a thing as truth. Um, but quantum weirdness does worry me. And, and, but um, I, I'd like to think that although um, our view of the world is no doubt shaped by the need to survive in, as I said, in, in, in Africa, hunting buffaloes and things, um, I think I want to say there is such a thing as objective truth. I mean, I, 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 I hate the idea that which we hear from some academic circles that, I don't know, truth is a social construct and, yeah. that, and that, that there's no... Well, well I, I, obviously I would agree that when it comes to the fact of the matter about the electron's um, magnetic dipole moment, right, that's a number that quantum mechanics predicts. We go out and measure it. They agree digit by digit by digit, nine, ten digits down the road. And that does feel like it qualifies as truth in, in some way or, or close, extremely close approximation of truth. But when we go to sort of higher levels, I guess I feel worried about scientists going out into the world. And, and, and you're right, it's a very curious time because 
you know, we're meant to be out there proclaiming the facts about the world and the facts about the matter and the truth of the world. But with my experience in realms that are so different from the truth that we normally talk about in everyday life, it gives me some pause. Mm -hmm. um, c can you make me feel better about that a little bit? No, because I, I, I live in a, in a more naive... I mean, I live in, in, a, in a, sim a simpler world. And um, uh, ob objective truth is, so is something that... That, that we all live live within our everyday lives, and that and that's the that's the world in which we evolved, and and so I, I I don't have that difficulty. I'm just kind of aware. I mean, I have difficulty not just in the quantum field. In, I mean, there are other parts of physics which upset me as well. Um, well, well, in in cosmology. I'm happy to help if I can. Cosmology, for example. Um, yes. I, um, uh, I I I read that. The Big Bang, it, that, that at the moment of the, of the Big Bang, everything was compressed not just into a small volume, but into an infinitely small volume. Like, I, I mean, that worries me. I, got, I, got, yeah. um, I mean, I, I can, I, I'm, I'm aware that a solid object like a table or a rock is mostly empty space, but nevertheless, yeah. if you were to compress it and get rid of all the space between nuclei, yeah. It would not just be the size of a proton. I mean, it would, be, it would still be a fairly substantial chunk yeah, in fact, of you can stuff. Calculate. I went through this small calculation that if you were to um, take every person that's ever lived yes. on planet Earth and remove the space between the electron and the nucleus and yep. all of their yep. atoms, then the remaining particles without yeah. that space would fit inside of a baseball. But a baseball is a pretty big pretty thing. Big thing. No, that's my point. I, I'm, I'm, I'm agreeing with I you. Mean, it, that, that, that is an astonishing calculation, by the way. Um, yeah. I mean, that, 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 it, it really is. Um, is that really right? It's really right, yeah. Uh, <laughs> and I have the baseball right here to prove it. No, um, uh, yeah. Uh, but, but, okay. but, uh, but actually, I'm agreeing with you. I'm, I'm, yes. uh, you know, yes. and, and, and so we have exactly the same worry that... Um, our equations, Einstein's general theory of relativity, are, are the equations that we use here. Those equations actually break down at time zero. Time zero is when everything would be crushed to yes. this infinitesimally small size. And the equations themselves break down. Which means that we don't really know what's happening at time zero. Which is why, for instance, we've developed ideas that have tried to go beyond Einstein's equations really to answer that very question. That question can be viewed as the motivation for a theory like string theory, or other attempts to put quantum mechanics and gravity together to try to resolve that puzzle. We've not yet resolved it yet, but I will say one thing that is often misunderstood. So today, we don't know whether the universe is um, finite or infinite, right? And in fact, Einstein once family said there are only two things that might be infinite, space and human stupidity. Yes. And he said he wasn't sure about space, you know. <laughs> uh, and, 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 there, and we're still not sure about space. But if space does go on infinitely far, then as you go further and further back, yes, it, it shrinks. But, you know, if you take infinity and you divide it by two, what do you get? Infinity. Take infinity and divide it by ten, what do you get? Infinity. Mm -hmm. So things in the universe get closer and closer together, but the grand expanse of reality at time zero at the Big Bang would not be infinitesimal. It would be infinitely big, but it would have infinite density. So the idea of a little tiny dot from which the entire, not the observable universe, but the entire universe yeah. emerges, that's, that could well be the wrong picture. Well, but I don't know why you make it so difficult for yourself, because you... Um, <laughs> Well, in, in, in the following sense, um, uh, uh, Hubble's law, and you, and you, you, you reverse the process, and yes, I mean, yes. I can see, you know, you cr crunch it down to something a bit bigger than a baseball. Yeah. Why go to something infinitely small? Good, good. You, you, could, you could imagine running the film in reverse, the cosmic film yeah. in reverse, and you simply stop it a couple frames before time zero. You say, Let, you know, let's just stop it right here, and we'll go forward in our explanations yeah. from that starting point. Um, we're really goddamn ambitious as physicists, right? We want to go, oh, you know, we really want to go to time zero. We really, you know, and so it will feel to us as though we have left out 
the essential quality of cosmology. If we have to sort of by hand say, oh, stop the film. We don't no, know what's going on and go further no, but, from well, there. But why when you get to time zero, does it have to be infinite? It's more, why, why shouldn't it be it may not, good. the, the, it, the it, size it, of, a, of a cannonball? Or, I mean, a, a, if our mathematics told us that, then indeed. Oh, it, so, so the mathematics yeah, tells yeah, so, you... So maybe I didn't say it clearly before, but in Einstein's general theory of relativity, when you metaphorically wind yeah. the cosmic film further and further back, imagine the universe is finite in size, so we don't yeah. have to worry about okay, the infinity, yeah, yeah. then indeed it goes right down to zero size. The radius of the universe goes right down to zero. And if somehow you could correct Einstein's equations, which we hope maybe string theory will do, so that with the correction, when you wind the film back to zero, the universe does not have zero size, but it's a little tiny nugget, like a, a baseball or mm. you know, some smaller entity, then that would be a very satisfying cosmology to start from that, yes. from that point forward. the mathematics forward. doesn't let you. Okay, that, well, I, we've come to string theory now, so... so um, I, 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 mean, I, I often hear the criticism of string, string theory is devoid of um, evidence. And um, really? so, Mr. String Theory, um, uh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, no, I, 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 I've heard that too. Uh, <laughs> taking the taxi down to dinner, the taxi guy was <laughs> all about string theory, no evidence, what are you guys doing? You know, <laughs> rational science reason. You know, I just sort of cowered in the back and paid my bill and left. But, um, so, so what's the real, the real situation is the following. So we have a real issue on our hands, a theoretical issue, of putting gravity and quantum mechanics into one consistent theoretical structure. Einstein's general theory of relativity does a fantastic job for gravity, makes predictions, and they're confirmed to high accuracy. Same for quantum mechanics as applied to the small domain. The problem is you try to put these two theories together and each claims that the other is wrong. They shoot each other in the foot and it doesn't work. So, right there you see that you've got to make progress on making these theories harmonious because they both are at work in the universe and the universe makes sense, so the mathematics has to make sense. Now, we have finally, Einstein was in some sense looking for this theory, but he wasn't really thinking about it in quantum terms, but the unified theory is what he pursued for 30 years. So we have this unified theory in hand, and then the question is how do you know whether it's right or whether it's wrong. And now we come to the issue of, of predictions and evidence. And here's the thing. We can use the mathematics to make predictions. The predictions, unfortunately, are extraordinarily difficult for us to test. If we had a sufficiently large particle collider, then the collision of particles within the context of string theory would make a prediction that that collider could test. Now, how big would that collider need to be? Well, people have done estimates, and it would probably need to be the size of the galaxy. <laughs> now, here's the thing. The cost of an accelerator goes like the square of its energy, and if you're talking about a collider of that size, it it's is. hard to get funding, you know? <laughs> so, um, so that's what it all comes down to. But, but my point is a serious one. Yeah, I get If it. this theory was not able to yeah. make contact with reality, yes. You really think physicists would, 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 would spend time on it? I mean, we, you know, we most, I think, we go around once, and I don't want to waste my time on something that, that has no chance of ever making contact with reality, but um, it's hard. Now, in, in lieu of being able to build a collider the size of the galaxy, you try to find indirect tests, clever tests, that might somehow be extracted from the theory, and we had hoped one such test would be uh, confirmed at the Large Hadron Collider, which is a collection of particles that naturally come out of string theory. They're called supersymmetric particles. The name doesn't really matter. But these are particles that no one has ever seen. And the hope was that the Large Hadron Collider slammed protons against protons. You'd produce these particles in the debris, and that would be a nice piece of circumstantial evidence in favor of the theory. The fact of the matter is those particles have not yet been produced. They may be produced shortly, which would be a triumph, circumstantial, but still a triumph for these ideas, or it could be that the machine is just not sufficiently energetic to produce mm -hmm. them. Mm -hmm. So it's not so much that the theory doesn't make any predictions, it's that it's very hard to test a theory, and this will be true of any approach to put gravity and quantum mechanics together, because, yeah, I, I see you over there. I, I'm, just, I'm ignoring you, but I see you. Uh, uh, yeah, yeah, it's a, you know. 
Uh, you know, it is going to be true of any approach to unified I mean, gravity. I, I, I get that completely. But it, it, it's, it, it's one thing to say um, it is in, in principle meaningless because there is no test. Yes. But to say that it is testable but not in practice, not, 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 not feasibly whether un, under existing... Yeah, and I think that's a, a, a fundamental distinction that gets lost. And I think it's a vital one. Well, yes. And it's, well, it's silly to lose that distinction. It's a perfect, perfectly good distinction. Yeah. Um, so, so can I go back to, to, to one line of discussion that we were pursuing a little bit before um, yes. the, the physics? Because I, um, I still have the following question, which is, um, so, so uh, do, do you mind if we talk about God for half a second? I made a joke at the front, but do you mind if we talk? Okay, are, you, yeah. are you just so tired of talking about that? Yeah, that fine, fine. That's all right with you? Good, okay. You know, because we've had a conversation uh, on, on occasion on this subject, and there's a lot we agree on, but there's some stuff that we don't agree on. And, and just as I, I feel like we made progress on string theory and evidence right now, I'd, I'd love it if, if, if like you could convince me to, to see the world differently. I would love to leave tonight. That would be a, a wonderful outcome of this evening. And if, if I could do the same for you, well, I'm not going to succeed, but you know, that, that would be a, a wonderful goal too. So here's my question. Um, I, 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 I hear you say that you would, you would like to, and, and stop me if I'm saying things imprecisely, that um, you would like to rid the world of religion. Is that, is that too strong? Uh, that's not too strong. Okay, good. All right, good. All right, all right, good. And, and so when you say that, here's my question. Um, uh, are you saying that the structure and the history of religion is something that you just want to get rid of? Or are you saying that you want to get rid of what some people do in the name of religion? Do you make that distinction? Is that one that's relevant? I certainly want to get rid of... Well, um, I, I, I see virtue in the effect that religion has had on human culture. I mean, I see virtue in music and, and art of, and things like that. Um, I, but if we think of religion as providing an alternative idea for how the universe came into existence, how life came into existence, that kind of thing, then um, as a scientist, I want to get rid of it. Um, so, um, I mean... Which I agree with. Okay. Well, what part do you not want to get rid of? Yeah, then? good. <laughs> so, so um, well, let me just give you a, an example, and you okay. tell me where you come down on it. Okay. Maybe that's the most okay, straightforward good. way of doing it. So, um, you know, in, in Jewish... So I'm Jewish. Um, uh, maybe a few others in, in the audience. Um, uh, thank you. Uh, and um, so, so, not all, of course, but... but Many Jews here in New York view their religion in the following way. They're willing to cherry pick it for the parts that enrich their lives. They're willing to throw away the parts that are archaic and just have no place, you know, in, 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 in the modern world. Um, they're willing to view it as um, almost poetry, almost as, as fiction literature, with the one difference being that it connects them to a long lineage that makes them feel part of a larger narrative. Is there something that you don't like about what oh, I just said? Oh, I get that totally. I mean, I, I no problem with that. No problem with that. No, no. Uh, I, because, um, I mean, you, you, you have a heritage, you have ancestors, you, yeah. have, you have literature, you have... I mean, that... It, it's the same as I feel, uh, you know that you feel too. Um, a, a connection with Shakespeare. I yeah, mean, with, right. You know, it, it, I, I don't have any problem with 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 saying, um, I have a Christian heritage, a Jewish heritage. In the case of a Jewish heritage, you have an even stronger reason, which is the persecution of Jews, right? Um, which has happened through the centuries, and perhaps most notably in the 20th century, but early centuries too. Um, this is a very powerful reason for a kind of loyalty to a, um, a tradition um, where I part company with it, as you do, is in, in w w where it makes claims about the universe and, and um, the, the, the nature of life and yeah. that kind so, of thing. So when you, when you say, just for my own clarity, when you say that you, when you agreed 
and everyone sort of cheered, which is sort of fun, uh, that you wanted to rid the world of religion. I wouldn't have thought that this would then be your reaction to my description. Well, I, I, I suppose by religion I meant the scientific um, falsehood of, yeah. of, um, of, of, of religion. I did, not, I did not mean tradition because, because um, there are the Jewish tradition and all sorts of other traditions, and tradition in lit literature, tradition in art. Right. Um, I don't want to get rid of that. So then I wonder about, about the following. So religion as a, you know, as a word, you know, a few hundred, five hundred years old or so. It's not one that really goes back to uh, archaic times. So, um, and, and there are some who f have thought through the history of religious development and have indicated that the use of religion in the ways that you find utterly unacceptable is relatively recent, a relatively recent development. So, if you take this structure that, you know, go back a handful of thousand years, wherever you sort of want to, you know, uh, view its origins, you know, uh, 1,500, 2,000 BC, something of that sort, let's just say, um, uh, does it not feel that you're focusing um, um, so intently on the last part of the development of that structure in a way that at least as I've heard it, and it's different from hearing it tonight, which is very interesting for me, wipes it all out by virtue of what's happening now. I'm skeptical of the suggestion that uh, the scientific falsehood part of religion is recent. The, I'm sorry, what? That the, that the scientific falsehood part of religion is recent. Um, I, I, I've, I'm, I'm aware that there are people who say that. Yeah. Um, and I, I think they're wrong. I mean, I, I just think if you, if you go back to... Uh, the Old Testament, it's just, it would just be nonsense to say that the, that the characters in the Abraham and, and, and um, David and, and um, Moses and people um, were not interested in the um, scientific, quasi-scientific aspects of it. Of course they were. I mean, they were, they were obsessed with it. They, were, they, were, um, um, they believed that there was a, 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 a person called Yahweh um, who made the world and who actually intervened the whole time, um, who, who, who um, wrought miracles and things like that. Um, I think it's Karen Armstrong who's, who's made, the, made the case that, 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 that the scientific part is recent. I, I just, just think that's not historically accurate. So, but if one takes this metaphorical approach, as I was sort of describing it in yeah. that particular case, um, um, uh, well, let me actually frame it somewhat differently. So, so um, to what extent are, uh, are, are you okay with, uh, I don't know how else to say it, but irrational ideas? Can I just give you an example again? You know, um, uh, I don't know, about three weeks ago, you know, I, I live uptown, and uh, you know, my, my mother lives over here, 81st Street. Uh, she's, you know, in her 90s. And I, and, I, and I called, she's always home, she doesn't really go out without me. I called, the, you know, the answer machine picked up, she didn't answer. I called again, she didn't answer. I'm starting to like really freak out. So I, I get in the taxi cab and I'm racing down to 81st Street and I'm telling you, in that taxi cab, I was praying to God that she would be okay. And I'm praying to God and I know that there, I do not think there is a God, okay? This is a totally irrational thing that I'm doing. Let me just quickly say, if you're there, I'm sorry, all right? If you're, you know, I just got to hedge my bets, you know? It's a conversation here. I'm just sort of saying how I feel. Uh, so, so, and, but I'm like really uh, uh, praying and, 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 and when I got there and everything ultimately was fine, um, it, it, it felt like, you know, a, a small miracle to me. Now, I don't believe in miracles. I believe that we're all bags of particles governed by the laws of physics and there's nothing else besides that. But at the same time, I find it useful to hold these irrational ideas in mind at certain moments, and I don't give a shit that I do. Yeah, um, I get that. I, mean, I, I think I, I, I'll, I'll make a similar con confession. Um, I, would, I would hesitate to spend the night in a notoriously haunted house. I'm the faintest... <laughs> <laughs> 
Oh, this is a good night, man. Yeah. Uh, that but, is so... <laughs> but, but, I mean, we're both being irrational. And, yeah. And, um, uh, and, and, and that is a sin. <laughs> I agree. <laughs> okay. All right, I'm being waved at to open the discussion for audience questions. I can't see who's out there. I don't know who has a microphone, but whoever does... We need does, the lights up. Can we have the lights up, please, in, in the auditorium? That's not in not, not so much on us. Yeah, yeah good, yeah. perfect. That's not perfect. It's, it's that was in your eyes? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I can just about dimly see people now. Yeah, whoever has a mic, just, just jump right in. Good evening, and thank you for a wonderful, wonderful night. <clears throat> I guess my question is, how do you dovetail rationality into the social and political dialogue that's going on in the not just the United States, but in the world today. How do you, how do you combat irrationality with rationality at an emotional level? Such that it's kind of... Yeah, yeah so the, the question is, yeah, yeah. How did, yeah, did you hear it? I yeah. did, I did yeah. hear it. I was hoping you'd answer it. Yeah. <laughs> I can take a crack and then you can sort of, you know, back well, clean up and, and finish it up well, for me. I, I mean, we, we, we live in a time when rationality and truth are not respected in, in, in the corridors of power. Um, and um, how do you reconcile? Well, you don't reconcile them. What you do is you get out and vote the bugger out. <laughs> but I would add one, 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 one quick thing on that. Um, it's, 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 it's virtually impossible, I found, to have a conversation with somebody who's not going to f play by the same rules. And, and, and so it's virtually impossible to use rationality to convince someone who's looking at the world and describing things in an irrational manner. And I, I, you know, I think we once discussed this, if I'm not mistaken, but I saw a video of yours once when you had a long conversation with, with a woman and trying to convince her about the, um, the you know, archaeological record, yeah. right? And, and I sat there and I, and I felt for you because I have had those conversations with people about, you know, the Big Bang and things of that sort. But it was clear that you were never going to make headway in that conversation. So, so you stayed with it, which is great. But that approach probably is ineffective, yeah, right? Yeah, she was, she was a hopeless case. <clears throat> um, <clears throat> I, know, I know who you mean. Her, her name is Wendy Wright. Uh, and um, she, she was... She clearly was not listening, and, and you're right, it was a totally lost cause. But remember, this was a television program. So although I was talking to her, right. it's irrelevant whether I could convince her, I, I clearly couldn't. But there would have been lots of people watching that television program That's true. Yeah. who, who would, would have been um, influenced by it and recognizing um, that, that she was being completely irrational. And so... Um, I, 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 I don't buy the argument of it, which I've heard often, that because you cannot convince the idiot you're talking to, um, that means that you should, should simply um, give up. I mean, right, um, right. Yeah, I guess the quick question, but we have others. Uh, it, it, would there be another strategy? And I don't know what the answer to that question is. Uh, and there are one or two questions uh, from the audience still. So I think you're, you're, you're sorry. Sure. So uh, going back to the idea of string theory, when you guys were talking about how to actually combine the two uh, formats of math, I guess. Yes. When we, since we, we are the ones that actually created math to begin with, is it possible that what we use is fundamentally flawed to describe what you're attempting to do? Totally. It's totally possible. I mean, I have, I've, I've, I've had, you know, thoughts, I don't know, nightmares that when we have these conversations with the alien intelligence that we ultimately talk to, you know, they'll come down and say, show us, guys, what have you done? And figuring out the universe, and we pull out general relativity, quantum mechanics, we open it up, and they just sort of look, math. <laughs> we tried that. You know, it takes you part of the way, but no, no, you'll never get anywhere with mathematics, you know. Um, 
And, and, and the problem is, when I then try to imagine what it is that they would substitute for mathematics, I don't have the creative imagination to think of anything that isn't ultimately isomorphic to math. Math just with some different formulation that we could map on to mathematics that we currently use. So yes, it could be that we have a limited set of tools based on the limited thing inside of our head that's taken us so far, but maybe it will not take us to the end. Thank you. So when I end up having discussions about science and religion to a surprisingly frequent uh, extent, I end up encountering the viewpoint that science and religion are actually one and the same thought process, that science is a form of religion uh, in one way or another. And I try to debate that in a number of ways, but I would be interested to hear what you would have to say to someone who says, well, science really isn't any different from religion in the first place. Well, I'll give a real quick one and maybe Richard will follow up. You know, uh, there are similarities, there are radical differences, and the most radical of all is, uh, show me how to use any religious text. I don't care, pick anyone that you want. Show me how to use that to calculate the spectrum of helium. <laughs> right? So, so there are qualities of the world that we understand rigorously by virtue of the scientific structure. It is mathematics that makes predictions that we can go out and test. And moreover, if we test a prediction and it's wrong, we throw the thing away because we are incrementally moving toward truth. And that, that, that's quite different. And, and let me just quickly also add to that, just so you know that I'm not just spouting hot air, I really will put you know, my money where my mouth is. I would be thrilled if tomorrow string theory was ruled out. I've worked on it since 1985, okay? I had, I had black hair when I started, okay? Um, but um, I'm not invested in it. I'm invested in truth or getting closer to truth. And this is the way that we can move toward truth. I, I have nothing to add to that. I mean, I, I think it's absolutely right. And, and um, there's a huge difference. There's, and the difference is evidence in massive, massive, massive quantities of evidence. And in the case of religion, there is absolutely none whatsoever. Uh, given the, um, the singularity at the beginning of the universe, the Big Bang, and the, uh, the evidence that, qua that particles are entangled, Yes that uh, if that implies that all particles are thereby entangled with each other, does that intuitively have any implications for consciousness theory? Um, it, it, it's a good question. Uh, since we don't really understand consciousness as we were describing here, it's a little hard for me to give you a complete answer to that. But I will say the following. It is the case that when particles interact with each other, they do acquire this very strange quantum mechanical quality called entanglement. Einstein, again, was a key figure in figuring out entanglement. As you no doubt know, but just so that we're all clear, if two particles are entangled, one could be over here, one could be over here, they could be on opposite sides of the country, opposite sides of the universe. You measure this particle and somehow it instantaneously affects the particle over there. That's weird, right? Einstein called it spooky, spooky action at a distance, right? Now, when you have all these particles interacting near the Big Bang, they do all become entangled, but the thing is, the greater the number of particles, the more dilute the entanglement becomes. And it can be diluted to such a degree that to some extent it doesn't really play the kind of fundamental role that it would with just two particles in a pristine environment that you set up to be maximally entangled. So while, in some sense, everything is connected to everything else, and maybe you want to think that consciousness, therefore, is sort of connected to the world through some quantum entanglement with our brains, the degree of entanglement is just so fantastically tiny that it's hard to imagine that that's how things will turn out. Richard, anything? Obviously not. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. I'm just fascinated. <laughs> Thank you very much for both coming out um, and the lively discussion. I, had, I grew up in New York City and I had a Jewish earth science teacher, but you know, and so I didn't have the conflict between religion and science that Mr. Dawkins grows up with. And he just pointed out, if you believe the world was created in six days, how, do we, how long would a day have been by that metaphorical understanding? 
Um, so I was very grateful for my public school education. But my question... <laughs> But, uh, hey, I went to PS 87, I is 44, right down the street, so I'm with you. My question is entangled with the previous one. Uh, <laughs> the double slit experiment in quantum physics implies that an electron will behave as a wave when it is not being observed, but returns to acting like a particle when we try to observe it, judging by the interference pattern it produces. This implies that the universe we live in is conscious, Without personifying this intelligence, would you agree, Mr. Dawkins, that quantum physics implies that our universe is conscious? No. I mean, uh, um, Thank the, you. The, <laughs> of course it doesn't imply that. It's nothing to do, nothing to do with it. It's, it's deeply mysterious, but there are, there are different ways of being mysterious. Just because they're, but they're both mysterious, it doesn't mean they're the same thing. Yeah. There can be a, um, an error in thinking that often tries to imagine that consciousness plays a critical role in causing the fuzziness of the quantum world to resolve into a definite reality, such as in the experiment that, that you uh, described so well. But there's no evidence that consciousness is a vital part of that story. We believe, I mean, there were people in the 30s and 40s who, who put this idea forward. And it's very hard to rule it out, just like it's hard to rule out many things in the world because we always bring consciousness to bear on any data that we look at, that we become aware of, that we can speak of. Consciousness is part of it. You could say, therefore, consciousness was part of ensuring that that reality arose. But as far as we know, it doesn't need to be conscious that brings a definite reality, doesn't need a physicist with a PhD, it could, it doesn't, it could be a mouse could do it, it could be a dust moat that could do it, it's any kind of interaction. It could be a photon in the microwave background radiation that bangs into the electron and that forces it to snap to attention. So I, I don't see any direct role for consciousness, but who knows, we could be wrong. Good evening, gentlemen, thank you. Uh, one of the tangents we went down tonight was exploring the concept of extraterrestrial life or life outside the galaxy. So from Richard's point of view, you said we're a sample size of one. So all our concepts of what one may be is what we see before us, regardless of our imagination. And when you look at Hollywood and you look at aliens, they're sort of humanoid. And I kind of, my thinking is any superior race has to be sort of like us because we got to be able to make something. I can't see something with tentacles making a watch. So are we limited to what, are you limited to what you believe a race may be outside of our existence because we're human and you, you, we have no other concept to measure against? Science fiction writers are often criticized for lack of imagination and, and uh making them sort of humanoid, but with three eyes, or you know, some minor difference like that. There are biologists, uh, Simon Conway Morris, at Cambridge University is one, who actually thinks that um, the likelihood is that life would produce humanoids. Uh, and and um, he goes, I think, too far. But he does make the point that convergent evolution is very powerful, and we have spectacular examples in the animal kingdom of different radically unrelated animals converging on the same uh, design because that's a very good way to be uh, and uh, um, you're probably familiar with well for example Australian uh, mammals the marsupial fauna of Australia produced a range of mammals which were um, niche for niche convergent upon the mammals in, in Asia and in, independently in South America. Um, so he, he deploys the, the power of convergent evolution to suggest that if there is life elsewhere in the universe, quite probably it will look pretty much like us. Um, I don't think I go along with that quite, but, but the point has been made. Um, we talked a bit earlier about uh, different kinds of life, whether it has to be carbon-based, that kind of thing. And um, I think it's an open question, and I think we can get a sort of handle on the question by looking at the animal kingdom and looking at the, the different things that have evolved in the animal kingdom, both divergent and convergent. 
Um, but I think it's an open question, and I would, as I said before, I would love that. I would love to come across a second sample of of, a, of life. I'll look around outside the parking lot. <laughs> yeah, I didn't hear that. I didn't hear it either, but it was definitely funny. <laughs> Thank you. Hi. Uh, you guys have talked a lot about T0, what happened after that. I don't think there's been a lot of talk about what happened, or not what happened, at, at T0, what, what happened at T0, what created it, isn't that? And the universe happened, four and a half, well, 14 billion years later, we have life, so everything was so precise. Does that imply some kind of God, watchmaker, or something? I mean, could you delve into more what you think about what happened before that instant at the Big Bang, not everything after? Well, I'll start with the Big Bang, and then Richard maybe take it in, in, into the biological domain. But uh, the, the, the question you're asking is, why is there something rather than nothing? And it is the key question, and it's one that we really have absolutely no idea how to answer. And I think we're all upfront about that. But once we allow for stuff to exist, space, time, matter, in some sense, the laws of physics, with that minimal architecture, we can then run things forward. And as far as we know, we don't need anybody from the outside tinkering with things in order to get things where they currently are. So could you say that some god created it and then stood back? Of course, and this has long been said, and there's very little that we can ever say to refute that. The point of the matter, though, is it's not very interesting. It may be true, it ain't interesting. Why? Because you're just replacing one mysterious collection of words with another word, which to me holds as much mystery. So from the standpoint of explaining science, I don't find that it takes us anywhere forward. From the standpoint of understanding the rich structure of, of human heritage, and our ongoing attempt to figure out who we are and how we fit into the cosmos, I do find there's a lot of value in that way of thinking about the world. But I don't find any value in terms of trying to find scientific explanatory power. I think it's worse than that. I think it's worse than, than um, just not interesting. Um, because the, the point is that um, although it's very difficult to know what happened at the, in, at the, at the beginning uh, and where the laws of physics come from, where the physical constants come from, what we can say is that it is relatively easier to understand how simple things came into existence than complex things. And um, a god who thought it all up and created it, even a deistic god who didn't uh, subsequently intervene, Whatever else he, she, or it w w was, was like, they could not be simple. I mean, if, they're going to be, if we're going to credit them with the brain power to devise the laws of physics and to, devise, and to set the physical constants to some optimal value, then they've got to be the kind of entity that requires explanation in its own right, of exactly the same kind of explanation as we in biology are used to providing in the theory of evolution. So, it would have to be intelligent, in other words. And intelligence, intelligence, creativity, uh, inventiveness, qualities like that, come late in the universe. We understand where they come from. They come from evolutionary processes. To suddenly smuggle in intelligence at the, at the very beginning is to betray the entire scientific enterprise. So it's much worse than being uninteresting. It's positively anti-scientific. So, so the one thing I would say is, um, uh, well, since you got applause, I'll, I'll sort of agree with you. But, um, <laughs> you, you know, um, you know my, my, my suspicion, or at least I raise it as a possibility, the judgment of the complexity and intelligence required to give rise to the universe as we know it, I feel like you're coming at it from what we currently understand, which could well be completely misleading. There may be this incredibly simple starting point that a divine being could have invoked, and all of this might, by virtue of some deep symmetry in the structure that isn't even apparent, it's all simple from the standpoint of the ingredients and, and the laws, and it may be the... So, so I guess I slightly worry, even though I, I largely agree with you, I slightly worry about saying what would be required, because we don't know what would be required. 
that's what I mean by yeah. us not being able to figure it out. But if it's simple, why call it God? I mean, I, I, no, no, I agree. That's exactly the point that I made. It would be just replacing one word with another. But I guess I worry about the argument of trying to uh, delineate the degree of intelligence and complexity required. Uh, I have no idea whether what you said is true in that regard. But if it's just plain simplicity, just call it simplicity. What, the, the, what? Yeah, so, 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 so that, I, uh, that I agree with, but it was the uh, attributing a certain necessary level of complexity and intelligence that, that uh, I, I find hard. But, but I agree with the, the larger point that we're just replacing one word with another. So you see I'm unsatisfied with that. <laughs> I should have stopped when I convinced him of string theory. Okay, go ahead. <laughs> Uh, yeah, if I was listening carefully enough earlier, uh, I think it was said that uh, the whole range of physics from quantum mechanics to general relativity, you could understand the machine of the brain, but not consciousness. And two things occur to me about physics that aren't understood, and I'm wondering if you have any comment as whether consciousness might be fueled by dark energy or by the collapse of Schrodinger's multiplicity into the actual measurable yeah. singular. So for dark energy, I, I, it's hard for me to see where there'd be any connection. You know, the amount of energy in dark energy is so feeble in any volume compatible with everyday experience that it's hard for you to imagine that energy making a significant difference. But when you come to uh, the collapse of the wave function, the Schrodinger equation that you described, there are some very smart people who do draw a connection to consciousness, right? Roger Penrose is a very smart man. He was my graduate advisor at Oxford for two weeks. Uh, and, um, and, and, uh, and he is convinced by virtue of uh, analysis that he's done for a decade and experiments that he's done with neuroscientists that there is a connection between microtubules in the brain that can collapse the wave function and he believes that that's the seat of consciousness. I've looked at it. I'm not, I don't, I don't see it, I'm not convinced of it, but I can't say that I've studied it in great detail. So, so is that a possible link? I, I guess it, it conceivably could be. Thank you. I don't know if you... I've tried to read Roger's book, but, uh, but um, I, I must say I didn't, I, I, I don't understand quantum theory enough to... Right, right. <clears throat> Hi, so my question, um, it's a fun question that I thought of because we were talking about a little bit um, how Lord Kelvin, though a really brilliant scientist, was astoundingly wrong about certain things about the universe and <coughs> Earth. And so I wonder if we took two well-known scientists from your respective fields, let's say Einstein and, uh, and uh, Darwin, and we brought them to our time, what do you think that they would be the most astounded and amazed by with our current scientific understanding? And what do you think they would find the hardest to accept or be most skeptical about. Hmm. So, so I could do Einstein <coughs> if you want, or do you want to leave with Darwin? I, I, I once um, had to do a television program in which a Japanese television company uh, brought an actor dressed up as Darwin um, <laughs> to visit me, and uh, I was supposed to bring him up to date as to things that had happened. <laughs> Since, since his death, um, and uh, it, it was an interesting experience because he, 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 he was well made up. He had pl plenty of slap on, which kept on dropping off. Um, and um, I, so I sort of bowed very low and said what an honor it was to, to, to meet him and things. And then um, I had to explain to him about modern genetics. And uh, he... Um, Th this would have been very surprising to him, very interesting, not so much surprising as revelatory to him, because in his own lifetime, um, not only did Lord Kelvin's estimate of time worry him, he was also worried by a man called Fleming Jenkin, who um, made the point that uh, because of the prevailing genetics of D Darwin and Jenkins' time, which was blending inheritance. They were aware that, of course, that animals inherit from both parents, but they thought of it as being a kind of mixture of the mother and father, almost like mixing two liquids. Uh, and Fleming Jenkin pointed out that if that were the case, um, uh, offspring should be intermediate between their two 
between the two parents. And if that were the case, then there would be a, a rapidly, natural selection would run out of variation on which to select. Um, and this did worry Darwin. He shouldn't really have worried because it was quite obviously not true that um, variation disappears. It's, it's, not, it's not the case that as the generations go by, animals become more and more gray and sort of un uniform. They do retain their, 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 their variation. But nobody understood why. And it wasn't, well, M Mendel, who was a contemporary of Darwin, actually did discover why, but Darwin never knew about it. It wasn't rediscovered un until after Darwin's death. Um, so I had to explain Mendelian genetics to this actor posing as Darwin, and also um, d d DNA. And, and um, he did his part well. He said, yes, that's it. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so I don't know whether that, I mean, I, I think that is, that is one thing that, that, that would have, as I said, not, not quite surprised Darwin, but, but, but he would have felt, yes, everything clicks into place now. And, and I, I now, that was the one thing that Darwin got wrong. He, he got precious little wrong. I mean, if you read The Origin of Species, it is an amazingly prescient book. As Michael Gieselin said, he was working a hundred years ahead of his time. Astonishing man. Um, but the but genetics he did get get wrong, and and so that perhaps the answer. Yeah. So on the, quickly on the Einstein one, I, I think Einstein would be surprised that quantum mechanics is still with us effectively in the form that he detested, um, and he thought that advances would do an end run around quantum mechanics, and somehow all the weirdness would disappear with a deeper understanding, and it hasn't happened. Um, I also think that you know, as we describe advanced, you know, as we describe string theory and, and, and all the qualities of the theory, and, and I, I think you just say you guys are geniuses, <laughs> utter geniuses. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I have a question for Brian regarding mass. Um, I understand from Einstein that a particle's mass increases with acceleration. At CERN, they take protons and accelerate them to very close to the speed of light, over 99.99% over .99 of the speed of light. My question is, what is the change in the mass of that particle from rest to the point of collision? Multiply by 1 over the square root of 1 minus v over c squared, v is the velocity, c is the speed of light. Thank, thank you. Yeah. Thanks very much. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't understand that answer at all. <laughs> and so I have to write this, but I'm going to ask, hopefully, for a non-pessimistic answer to this question, which is um, I'm a little puzzled by the disappointment in the search for extraterrestrial intelligent life, because it seems challenging by or severely limited by two elements. One is astrobiology, which seems to suggest that the combustible energy sources that would be, uh, they, they would, they suffocate the species that create sufficient advancement to support radio wave broadcasting. We're suffocating ourselves. And the other element that I find challenging in terms of evidence for extraterrestrial life is the time synchronization needed to collect a radio signal. The duration of a species that broadcasting is probably short. Yeah. The universe, when I was growing up, we thought it was expanding. Now you guys have changed the rules again. No, no, it's still expanding. But it's accelerating. Yeah, it's accelerating. Ex so in some period of time, we're only going to see our own galaxy. So you've got a dual prong problem of combustible energy suffocating us or others and getting the signals to synchronize. So why would we see Yeah, well, I, I agree. Life? You're pointing out how unlikely these programs are to succeed. I mean, look, life on this planet uh, began very early on in the history of this planet, but uh, in that four billion year window, as you're saying, we've only been radio broadcasting, what, for the last 50, 75 years. So even if an extraterrestrial society, civilization, was trying to find us and they sort of knew where to look, it wouldn't just be a matter of pointing their scopes in the right direction. They'd have to be waiting for just the right interval of time. So, so I, th I think you're pointing out how hard it is and therefore perhaps not surprising that we haven't found any if indeed 
life is commonplace throughout the universe. And the other thing is, look, you know, we, we, we now know of so many planets, right? That's one of the major changes in the last decade, right? There are so many planets out there. And if a, a fraction of them support life, right, there could be whatever. There could be, you know, a uh, hundred million civilizations scattered throughout the galaxy, okay? But that's one per, per enormous number of stars. So it's still very sparse, even with a hundred million civilizations out there. So it's hard to find. And what about your take on astrobiology and the likelihood of a species suffocating itself? I'm curious to hear what well, you're talking Yes, I mean, there's a, a, f a further source of, of pessimism would be that the interval of time between a civilization working out how to use, send radio waves and destroying itself by warfare right. of some sort, yeah. it could be, I mean, there could be civilizations winking into existence here, here or there, and then winking out again um, after a rather short time. Uh, I, I guess that's another aspect of your suffocating. I think. So quickly, we're at 10 o'clock, but I think we start a little bit later. Are you guys okay to do another five, 10 minutes? Is, is that okay? Okay. Uh, there seems to be a widespread idea in the culture that in order for life to be meaningful, we all eventually have to die. And I'm a little skeptical of that idea. Um, it seems meretricious, like makes us feel better that there has to be some meaning. Um, but if you imagine asking someone 50 years going by in their life, is your life still meaningful? Are you involved in useful projects? Are you advancing things? It seems like life could still be meaningful no matter how old you're getting. So I wonder what your thoughts are about the necessity of death for the meaning of life. I'll let Richard uh, Well, the, I mean, that. There, there is a, a pretty sound Darwinian reason why, why, why we die, um, which um, I can perhaps briefly explain. Um, genes uh, mature at different, I mean, when I say mature, have, have their effect at various times during life, and most of them have an effect during early embryology, um, but then they have effects later and later and later. Um, and if you imagine a gene that makes you die of, for example, cancer at the age of 10, and then another gene that makes you die at the age of 20, another gene that makes you die at the age of 30, 40, etc. Um, the ones that make you die at the age of 10 are never going to get through into the next generation. The ones that make you die at the age of 20, a few of them will get through. The ones that make you die at the age of 30, quite a lot will get through, etc. And ones that make you die as you, when, you're, when you're 100, will certainly have got through by the time they kill you. Um, so we are um, a kind of dustbin of late-acting lethal genes, or sub-lethal sub, sub genes, which is why, from a Darwinian point of view, we die of old age. Um, and there's a more sophisticated versions of that theory. But you seem to be um, talking rather less in a Darwinian way than in a, than in a sort of subjective way, saying, wouldn't it be nice if we... Wouldn't, wouldn't life feel more meaningful, I think, was the way you put it, um, if we didn't die? No, I, I was challenging the idea that people spread that in order for life to be meaningful, we have to die. Like, people say life wouldn't be meaningful if we lived forever. And that just seems... Well, I don't know who says that. I mean, uh, well, like, I, like Bernard Williams says that. I mean, there are philosophers who've, who've thought this issue through and have made cogent arguments that um, all the things that give life meaning that we usually list, um, many of them would evaporate if we didn't die. Right? I mean, you know, if um, you know, those of you who, uh, you know, your abilities could always uh, improve over time, well, if you have infinite time, you'll be able to achieve anything. So there'll be no real challenge, there'll be no sense of success. Those of you who your abilities will plateau and hit a limit, well, for eternity, you're going to be stuck. Right? That's not going to feel too good either, right? So, so you know, uh, but, you know, these are nice, interesting thought experiments. Uh, it's hard to really know, but I guess from a flat-footed, straightforward perspective, I just wonder if you had the opportunity, hey, Professor Dawkins, you've done so much for humanity, uh, we're going to let you live forever. W would, you, would, you, would you choose that? No, I, 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 maybe 200 years, but... But, but, um, but at the end of the 200, they came back to you at the end of the 200 and said, you know, your 200's up, uh, hey, you want a couple hundred more? Tell you what, I think the, 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 the only frightening thing about death, really, is it, 
is eternity. And I'd rather spend eternity under a general anaesthetic. <laughs> which is what's going to happen. All right, so yeah. we, have time for all, we only have time for two more questions. I have a question for both of you. Uh, I'm curious if you think it's possible or even likely that the true nature of reality and physics could be something that's fundamentally just inaccessible to the human mind um, because yeah, the I, way I, our I, brains are wired. No, I, I, you know, I, um, I had a, a NOVA program years ago on a book I wrote. And in one of the scenes, I'm at a blackboard lecturing to somebody who clearly is not getting because I'm getting frustrated. And ultimately, the camera pans... And it's a Labrador retriever that I was, that I was you know. And, and it was misunderstood by many people. They thought we were trying to say the audience is like the dog. Uh, but that, that's, that's not what it is. The point was uh, there are intelligent species that walk this planet that seem to have a limit to what they can understand, right? Dogs and cats are smart, but they seem not to understand the general theory of relativity, right? And every time I say that, I always think the dogs are like, right, he thinks we don't understand relativity, a stupid human, you know. Uh, but, but barring that possibility, there are these smart beings that have a limit, why would we be any different from that? That's the point. So exactly like you're saying, it could be the truth is right out here staring us in the face, but we just don't have the brain power to grab hold of it, and maybe we never will. Now, the optimistic way of saying it is, even with this limited brain power, look what we've been able to figure out, right? We can figure out laws that tell us how the universe evolved from a split second after the beginning. We're able to pry apart matter and understand its constituents. We understand how time elapses, how space expands, why stars shine. I mean, that's pretty great stuff. So maybe we have the brain power and it's just a matter of time, but nobody can say for sure. One of my favorite science fiction stories is Fred Hoyle's The Black Cloud. Uh, despite its obnoxious hero, it's probably modeled after the author, I should imagine. I um, but I at the end of the, of the book, um, the, the, the humans are in touch with a superhuman intelligence. And the human, superhuman intelligence, the black cloud, communicates to them its knowledge of physics. And they can't take it. The human brain just burns up. And, and two really smart physicists die as a result of overheating of the brain. Um, and, and so that, that I think is perfectly possible that we are not capable of it on the other hand I agree with Brian um, I'm amazed at the fact that a brain which was naturally selected on the African savannah to hunt and gather is capable of devising special general and general relativity quantum theory and it's, a, it's astonishing what the human brain can do given the much more limited tasks which it was required to do when it was being naturally selected. These are emergent properties. It's a, a wonderful testament to the power of emergence. Uh, and so the, the, maybe there isn't a limit, but um, I don't know one way or the other. Thanks. Hello. Uh, do you think that modern physicists are worried enough or spending enough time on uh, realism and ontology? And specifically, what do you think of Bohmi and pilot waves? That is exactly the question I'd hoping we'd end on. <laughs> uh, so, so um, yeah, so uh, it, it, we just had a, a conference, for instance, at Columbia last week where the focus was uh, uh, philosophers were involved and, and some physicists have sort of described philosophers as having no role in physics. That's utterly ridiculous. These are folks who've thought hard about quantum physics, forcing us to really try to link up the mathematical symbols with real things in the world and to shake those dictionaries and make sure that they really work. And we're uncertain at the moment. So uh, on the ontology side, people do think about it, but it's typically more in the philosophy side of things. And I do think that physicists could do more to advance that, uh, that project. In terms of this Bohmian approach that you mentioned, this is a very interesting story that I'll just tell in 30 seconds. The approach to quantum mechanics that Richard was describing, you know, the Copenhagen approach, that was really in some sense promulgated by some very convincing physicists in the 1920s, 1930s and so forth, Niels Bohr being sort of the famous father of quantum mechanics. Um, if the Bohmian approach had a champion 
of that magnitude and that level of uh, respect, I think it would likely have been the dominant way that we would have thought about quantum mechanics. Why? In the Copenhagen approach, you have to give up making definite predictions. You can only make probabilistic predictions. That's hard to swallow, okay? But you also have to give up particles having definite trajectories. Particles no longer go along trajectories as in the Newtonian picture. In the Bohmian approach, yes, you also have to deal with probabilities, but particles do have definite trajectories. So you only have to sort of give up one thing in the Bohmian framework, and you have to give up two in the Copenhagen one. So I think people would have had an easier time and would have latched on to this way of thinking about things. People still push this theory forward. Whether or not it's actually right in the sense of it's the real description of the world, nobody knows. But it's a worthy contender in an arena where many are still competing to win out with the right way of thinking about quantum mechanics. And with that, thank you very much. Let's give a big round of applause for Brian Green and Richard Dawkins. Thank you, sir. Thank Terrific. You. Thank you. Well done. Thank you very much. Please forgive me if I croak. <laughs> it's because I've had a stroke. Basal ganglion on the right makes me walk as if I'm tight. So if I fall to croaks and squawking, Matt will have to do the talking. <laughs> and it, I think anybody who knows me knows that talking is not a problem. It's, <laughs> ceasing to talk is, is probably a bigger issue. Hello, Vancouver. Thank you so much for coming out. Oh! I know I, I know I have some friends here and uh, some other people who commented on stuff from the show. I'm thrilled to be here, and especially to be here with uh, Richard. I almost forgot his name. It's, it's, uh, it's been a really weird experience. Now, we met, first met 10 years ago, although there was no reason that Richard should remember it, because he was touring promoting the God Delusion and came to Austin and I had just got an out campaign tattoo on my arm and happened to be with CFI and came up and showed him and he rushed over to get his phone to take a picture of it to prove that it was the first out campaign tattoo. So I know a bunch of other people went out and did it, but I, I got there first. Um, but we, I pulled some people saying, hey, I'm gonna have this opportunity. Are there questions you'd like to ask? And the one thing that came up that I wanted to ask about uh, has absolutely nothing, or perhaps absolutely nothing to do with religion. And it is this idea that was in, I believe, your second book, The Extended Finitype. And you've given explanations for it. When I look around the world at the general ignorance on science issues, and I'm as guilty as many other people, what is it, could you give a description of the extended phenotype, I'm, we're starting heavy, um, that also gets to what people really need to understand about it. About the extended phenotype we need to understand, well, um, that takes a whole book to explain. That's why I, <laughs> that's why I wrote it. I, I, I just... <clears throat> okay, let me, let me have a go at explaining the extended phenotype. Um, phenotype means those things that a gene affects, and from a Darwinian point of view, those things that a gene affects, which get it levered into the next generation. So my view of life is that it's all about genes manipulating the world to get into the next generation. The world, in this case, largely means the body in which the gene sits, but it doesn't have to mean that. So normally when we talk about the phenotypic expression of a gene, we mean the effect that it has on the body in which the gene sits, and the body in which the gene sits is the vehicle that carries the genes around. And if the body survives, the genes survive. At least if the body reproduces, the genes survive. It has to survive in order to reproduce first. So that's the ordinary meaning of phenotype. Extended phenotype means that the phenotype of a gene, those aspects of the phenotype which enable the gene to pass on to the next generation do not have to be confined to the body itself. A good example would be a bird's nest. A bird's nest is quite clearly an adaptation 
for the genes to survive. It's not for the body to survive, for the genes to survive. Uh, its shape, its color, everything about it may have Darwinian survival value, but it's not a part of the animal, of the bird's body. If you buy that, and you have to do the same thing for spider webs and, and beaver dams and things like that. If you buy that, then a parasite sitting in a host very often manipulates the behavior of the host in order that the parasite shall get passed on to its next stage in its life history. Uh, there's a lovely worm called, uh, called the brain worm, a little, a little fluke, which uh, parasitizes ants. The, from the fluke's point of view, it needs the ant to get eaten by an ungulate, by a sheep, say. Normally, ants during the heat of the day of this species, the ants would go down into the ground. The, the fluke wants the ants to go up onto the tops of the grass stems where, the, it, more, where they're more likely to be eaten. So the fluke actually burrows into the brain of the ant and makes a lesion in the brain of the ant which changes the, beha the behavior of the ant so it goes up instead of down. That increases the chance that the fluke will be eaten by the sheep, and that's the, what the fluke wants, using the word wants in quotes, which of course you all understand what I mean by that. Um, this is an adaptation by the fluke genes. The ant is the proximate, um, manipul the proximate manipulee, let's say, the proximate victim of manipulation of the, of the fluke. Um, you could call the ants' behavior, the change in the ants' behavior as part of the extended phenotype of genes in the fluke. So in other words, genes in one animal can have, can have extended phenotypic effects in another animal. But if you buy that, then a parasite doesn't have to be sitting in the host. A cuckoo, as you know, it's a, it's a bird that parasitizes other birds, makes them rear its young. Uh, very, very sophisticated adaptations, highly sophisticated adaptations. The genes in the cuckoo are manipulating the behavior of the host, even though the host is, is not, even though the parasite is not actually inside the host. It's still extended phenotype. And if you buy that, then any kind of animal communication, bird song, singing from one end of a wood, influencing a female at the other end of the wood, that's extended phenotype too. So, um, well, that's the extended phenotype, and I haven't really had time to do it justice, so sure. you just have to go and read the book. By, <laughs> by all means, read the book. One of the reasons that I ask is because I, when we begin to talk about uh, <coughs> w what we typically view genes as doing, and when we extend this to perhaps behaviors, the thing I wonder is how far can we extend it, and where do you draw a line? I mean. We, do we have, there's been a lot of talk about, you know, the God gene and things like this. If we are, if we are our genes and they're dictating behavior, is it a stretch too far to suggest that the type of thinking that leads to religious thinking is also in our makeup and, and how do you escape that? Yes, it might be a stretch too far. I'm not sure about that. I mean, I think, I think it's probably true to say that religiosity is influenced by genetics. Um, and the kind of way you would test a, a claim of that kind would be perhaps to look at twin studies, to look at, to compare monozygotic, that's identical twins, with dizygotic, ordinary twins. And if the characteristic you're interested in, in this case religiosity, is more likely to be shared by identical twins than fraternal twins, even if the identical twins are reared apart, which they sometimes are for accidental reasons, then we have evidence of genetic influence on variation. And there is some influence, of, of, not surprising. I mean, genes influence just about everything else, so there's no reason why they shouldn't influence religiosity. Um, to be interesting in a Darwinian way, you would need to show that the genes engineer their survival by increasing the religiosity of the body in which they sit. 
Maybe they do, but that might be a bit of a stretch. Yeah. One of the, there are people who call the show frequently. I'd love to ask you why people call to ask me questions about science, but w we know that, that, you know, the most common answer that I've given when people are calling into the show to ask, um, hey, this disproves evolution, and I ask them, why the hell are you calling me, uh, a non-scientist on a public access show, why aren't you out seeking your Nobel Prize and publishing to get, you know... That's a good point, yes. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I think it speaks volumes about their hypothesis, if it could even be called that, that they are calling to present it to me. But this, this uh, that one of the questions that I got, which I have my thoughts on an answer, but as, uh, as somebody who's not as versed in the science, I'm probably wrong. Have human beings trumped evolution? Or have we escaped natural selection? Have we... Have we and I know I despise this idea of advancing so far to a point, but are we at a point where we control our own fates and natural selection is just out the window for us? If we have, then that has nothing whatever to do with this disproving evolution. I mean, that's the, that's the important point to make. If that's what they're trying to say, then it just simply is, is illogical. There's no, there's no connection whatever. It is an interesting question. Um, it does appear that uh, we have largely removed ourselves from at least the, the cutting edge of natural selection. Um, as far as survival is concerned, natural selection matters if it kills you before you have time to reproduce. Right. And in our civilization, it's rather... <laughs> in our civilization, it's, it's rather hard to die young. And um, so most people reach the age when they could reproduce. So we're no longer being selected for fleetness of foot, keenness of mind, um, keenness of sight, that kind of thing. Because with, with handicaps in any of those fields, you can still, re you can still survive long enough to reproduce. Um, so probably, if there is any natural selection going on in, in an interesting way, there, of course there is natural selection of, 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 for, against diseases and things like sure. that, but if, if the sort of interesting natural selection is going on, it's probably with respect to reproduction rather than survival. Not everybody has the same number of children. Some people have lots of children, some people have none. If there is genetic variation in the desire to have children, then, then that, could be, that, that would by definition be natural selection right. in favor of, of, of something. Well, I don't know whether there is, but as I said before, there's genetic variation in most other things, so it would be a little bit surprising if there wasn't a genetic influence, a statistical genetic in influence on the inclination to have children. Or, or it could be a statistical effect on incompetence in using contraceptives. <laughs> oh. The Catholics are going to come after you for that one, because... <laughs> It's not incompetence, you're just not allowed to do that. Actually, let, let me tell you a story about, about, the, about it's not, well, it's kind of about that. Um, I was doing a television program, uh, and I was sent out to, <coughs> to Kenya, <coughs> to Nairobi, to the slums of Nairobi, to interview a prostitute, because um, there is evidence in Kenya of a genetic resistance to AIDS, and there are some prostitutes in Nairobi who are, who are massively um, exposed to HIV, but who don't get AIDS. And this woman was one such. And she's being researched by actually a Canadian team of geneticists. So I was sent to interview her and I said, um, how long have you been a, a prostitute? And she told me 20 years or 25 years, something like that. And I said, what's happened to all your friends who joined at the same, who did start at the same time? They're all dead, she said, of AIDS. So I said, um, well, why do you think you're not dead? And she said, well, God must be looking after me. So then I said, well, then why didn't God look after all your friends? <laughs> and she said, well, I don't, I can't understand that. But well, I tell you this, she said. God loves condoms.
I want to go to Kenya and interview prostitutes too, but for completely different reasons. Uh, so, one of the things that, that was curious to me is we come from very different backgrounds and fell into uh, what we do for somewhat different reasons. I mean, you're one of the world's most eminent and popular scientists, and you have a passion for science education. And I'm just some redneck who was raised a Southern Baptist and figured out this shit makes no sense. <laughs> And I've spent the time on the show uh, doing what I can to try to have the conversations. You've done something that I haven't done and, and, and may never do, and that is you have an entire foundation dedicated to science and reason. And I want to make sure that there's an opportunity to talk about that. What's, what has the foundation been doing and the goals um, so that people who aren't, weren't aware become aware? Yes, um, after The God Delusion was published, uh, I, I founded the Richard Dawkins Foundation for Reason and Science, both in Britain and America. I suppose mainly at, at first as a, as a way in which I could uh, give, m give money in a, in a charitable way, uh, both in Britain and in America. Uh, it, it's difficult for a British taxpayer to give money to American charities. Mm. Uh, you can do it, but it's kind of hard, and you don't, and you don't get the tax benefits. Um, so I, I founded these two foundations. The British Foundation was mainly used as a kind of conduit to get um, money into America, where I thought it was <laughs> more, more needed. <laughs> um, it, it, it's also... Uh, part of this is because... Uh, for whatever reasons, most of my fellow Americans, if I say something, they can blow it off. But if it has your accent, they pay attention to it a little bit more. Uh, I was afraid it might be the other way around, actually. I once was unwise enough to, re to reply to the Guardian request to give, give advice about two elections, American elections ago, and I, and, and I gave advice about how no, nobody should vote, vote for George W. Bush. And I got the most incredible lot of hatred, hate mail. Um, you lie me, stay out of our, our affairs. And, and, um, and to, to which my, my reply was, the American election affects the entire world. And I kind of resent the fact that we can't vote in it. <laughs> um, but I, I think so do I. I. I got off the point. <laughs> I came through, when I came through customs, the, uh, the customs agent said, oh, you're going to be giving a talk tomorrow night. And I said, yes. And I flew in Saturday. And she said, so you're only here for Sunday, and then you fly home on Monday. And I was like, yes. And th this seemed to baffle her a little bit, so she wanted to repeat it. So you're here for just one day to give a talk. And I said, yes, but depending on the election results on Tuesday, I might be back the following <laughs> weekend. Anyway, uh, I, I, got, I, I, I digressed. Um, the American Foundation is the one that actually does most of the work, mm. and, um, uh, that, and it's now extremely flourishing, and it's just about to merge with the Center for Inquiry, which is a much larger flourishing organization in, um, in America, and I think also in Canada. Um, and between us, we're doing a lot of exciting things. One of them is the Openly Secular campaign. You're probably aware that in the United States, it's very, very hard for an atheist, or an open atheist, to become a member of Congress. In fact, there aren't any. Out of 535 members of Congress, not a single one admits to being an atheist, and that's a statistical nonsense. They've obviously got to be. Large numbers of them must be. Um, I mean, they're all presumably reasonably well-educated. <laughs> um, and, 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 yet it, and yet it doesn't seem to be possible to get elected if you're honest in this, in this regard. So you've either got to be religious or a liar <laughs> to get elected. So the Openly Secular campaign is a campaign to raise consciousness of Americans, I must, I must use, use that word, of United States citizens, to raise consciousness um, by 
making YouTube videos, getting celebrities to make little vid videos saying, I am openly secular. And we get ordinary people to say, I am openly secular, just nice people, sort of people you'd like, people you know. I'm, I'm, I'm not, I don't, I'm not a, a devil with horns, I'm an ordinary person who you probably like. And I'm openly secular. So that's one of, that, one of our campaigns. Another one is TIES, the Teacher Institute for Evolutionary Science. This is to teach middle school teachers how to teach evolution, because they get a lot of pushback, they get a lot of hostility uh, from parents, from some of their children who refuse to listen, stop up their ears or turn their chairs to face the wall when evolution is being discussed. Um, I've heard stories of teachers who, as soon as they mention the word evolution, their pupils scream, no, 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 I don't believe that. Don't even listen. Well, you could imagine that if you're a teacher who perhaps doesn't have very much um, specialized knowledge, that's quite intimidating. And so, uh, unless you're rather brave, you'd be, you'd be likely to sort of shy away from teaching evolution uh, for fear of getting that kind of pushback. So TIES is a campaign to help teachers by telling them how to respond, telling them how to teach evolution, giving them resources they can use, giving them a PowerPoint presentation, giving them lab materials, that kind of thing. It's enormously successful. It's run by a magnificent middle school teacher called Bertha Vasquez from Florida. And she has run a large number of workshops for other teachers and they're enormously successful. The, the, the teachers love them. So that's one of our, and that's one of the programs that I'm most keen on. And when we merge with CFI, the Center for Inquiry, we'll suddenly inherit uh, a, a whole lot of other programs, which I'm also very excited about. So it is one of the main things that I occupy my time with now is, is the Richard Dawkins Foundation for Reason and Science, and now the Center for Inquiry. And I, I'm hoping that, um, well, you can come down and visit me in Texas wherever you want, but th there needs to be a focus in Texas in particular, and I don't want to spend all this time talking about my screwed up country, but Texas is probably is the largest purchaser of school books, and it's a single adoption state. <laughs> and so there is the constant battle going on with the State Board of Education, because they're not just deciding what students in Texas would learn. It would be tough to write off the entire state, even if that were the case, but the, student, the school books that are purchased for Texas get farmed out to other states as well. And uh, I'm, I'm a big fan of the Texas Freedom Network, which constantly monitors what the State Board of Education is doing. Um, and getting your organizations and theirs and others to work together uh, we've had some really, really close calls in Texas. And right before I started with the atheist experience, uh, the atheist community of Austin had been in the school book hearings uh, fighting. Change, some of the changes are incredibly bizarre, uh, scrubbing different people from history. But every couple of years, it's a new course that comes up. So we do history, and then it's maths. And then, and I said maths just for you. <laughs> well, and, and can they, uh, what, what do Canadians say? Is it? There's no S here, right? I knew I loved you guys. <laughs> but, but, but this fight that goes on is, it's bizarre, and it reflects what you and I deal with when we're dealing with religious individuals as well. And some of it, if not the majority of it, stems from religious individuals. When you have the, uh, the head of the State Board of Education proudly saying, there has to be somebody to stand up to these experts. <laughs> ah, yes. <laughs> We get that in Britain, too. Um, you, and you know about this awful thing called Brexit, um, which is a catastrophe. Um, one of the leaders of the Brexit campaign, Michael Gove, who was then a cabinet minister, um, actually went, went out and said, mistrust experts, you are the experts here. <laughs> well, I'm afraid that's exactly what happened. And, and um, we had a vote from people who are manifestly not experts in the complicated, sophisticated economic question of whether Britain should leave the European Union. Uh, and um, it, 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 is, it is a major 
catastrophe. What's, e what's even worse is that now um, the government is trying to deny even the right of parliament to decide the details of what, what Brexit should consist of. And um, the uh, High Court has just ruled that parliament should be involved. And they're now being threatened by people. You'd think you were in Trump's America. And they're now being, th being physically threatened. These judges are being physically threatened because they want to uphold the constitutional right of parliament, not to reverse Brexit, but simply to decide on the details. There's really only room for one person in Trump's America, so. Uh, but this issue of experts is something we, we spoke briefly about earlier. The, the average person is not going to develop an expertise in every area. You couldn't possibly. And so I'm often accused by people say, oh, well, you have faith too. You have faith in, in the scientists. And, and I continually point out that what I have is not faith. I have a particular definition of faith that it's the excuse people give for believing something without a good reason. And I have confidence and trust that is proportional to my reasons and the expertise of individuals. But if somebody said, Richard Dawkins is the world's foremost expert on biology and everything that he says is true and you become their expert, that is a massive influence that can be abused. And we see individuals going out and specifically getting degrees that they then ignore their teaching and serve as experts for the creationists. How can the average person know who they should rely on and how much? That is very difficult, and, and you're perfectly right that uh, what, certainly one of the leading um, so-called experts in the Discovery Institute, the so-called Discovery Institute in Seattle... Um, I'm waiting for their discovery. Yeah. Um, he actually... He's, he's, a, he's a Mooney, um, a, a follower of the Reverend Moon, and he actually said, Father... That, that's their word for the Reverend Moon. Father chose me to get a PhD in biology so that I could go out and preach against evolution. So you're entirely right there. But it's a serious question you raise because you're perfectly right. We cannot all become experts in everything. Um, I'm a biologist and I'm manifestly not an expert in physics. So is it just faith when I accept the Big Bang, uh, quantum theory? Not really, as if for just the reason you give. Um, it's not blind faith, it's reasoned faith. We know that the scientific method, the scientific enterprise, has checks and safeguards. We have uh, refereeing papers, we have peer review, we have uh, repetition of experiments which are controversial. If, some, if somebody publishes a paper which, uh, pr which is um, uh, imp an important um, finding, it will get replicated, it will get repeated, and if it's not repeated, then something's wrong. So we, we have the scientific method in place, which is, has been honed and developed over centuries to guard against self-deception, to, to, to increase the, to, to, to make it highly likely that the truth will eventually come out. It's not really faith. Um, so we have a kind of trust in, not so much the experts, but in the, we don't say that he's a Nobel Prize winner, therefore he must be right. We never say that. Um, Although Bob Dylan is right. <laughs> <laughs> yes, Bob Dylan. And I, I think that's rather a nice idea for the Nobel Prize for Literature. But don't you think it's high time a scientist got the Nobel Prize for Literature? <laughs> It, it's not just in the realm of science where we are going to struggle with this difficulty over who to trust. We see it in news reports as well. Which news station do you happen to listen to? That's going to dictate what you think the facts are. And it's bad enough in, in for example, in the United States. I've had a bunch of arguments over the past week or so uh, about politics, imagine that. And one of my longtime friends had made the comment of, oh, well, um, Hillary's getting ready to be indicted to, you know, on two more uh, issues, and, but I bet you wouldn't accept this particular Fox News source as credible. And he was right to assume that, but as it turns out, that source recanted, and now, as the news today, the, they're not going to be in indictments. And I'm waiting to see if, if this person acknowledges, okay, I made a horrible claim based on faulty 
uh, information and I'll retract it because I don't see that retraction often. Instead, it's, yes, but she's still guilty of this, this, and this. Yeah. And if we have that issue in politics, and we have this issue when it comes to religion, and we have this issue when it comes to science, is it just we're all too damn lazy to do our homework, or is it the, our day-to-day -day lives are not consumed with matters of biology or matters of fact-finding on a, on a political issue, and so it doesn't seem as important to us even when it should be that important. I think in the case of news sources, it, it, it is, there is the echo chamber effect has often been, been mentioned. People tend to tune into the television station that they agree with, and so they just get their, um, their views uh, reinforced. I do want to come back, though, to the point that science is a bit different, because science is, has been tailored to, to, to put in place mechanisms for avoiding that, that kind of thing. Um, just take one example, the, the double-blind control trial, which is now so important in medical research. With the best will in the world, a scientist is in danger of s subtle biases in experimental work. You, you don't mean to, you're, you're desperately trying not to be biased, but it's extremely hard not to. If you're doing a medical trial, you're testing some new drug against, against a control. If you desperately want the drug to succeed, then your diagnosis of the patients who've had it may be slightly biased in favor of the drug rather than the control. Mm. Or you may be so conscientious that you're even biased in favor of the control. Either way, you want to avoid that kind of bias. So the double-blind control trial technique, where neither the doctor nor the patient nor any nurse who's administering the drug or the, or the control knows which is which. This is secret, locked up in code numbers. It's locked up in a computer. It, the, the, which is the control and which is the experimental drug is not known to any of those people until the experiment is finished and only then is it unlocked from the, from the computer. So that totally guards against bias of this kind. Science is full, modern science at least, is in, in, quite recent. I mean not, 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 I mean, not that long ago that kind of safeguard was not in place. Now it is. So science is hedged about with safeguards against that kind of thing. And it's, you know, I've been accused of scientism and, and perhaps I'm even guilty. I think probably the biggest frustration is that most individuals are going to get their information about science from news sources, and we live in a world where every sensationalized headline is the one that's going to get the attention. So it seems like every other day, science, which I'll put in air quotes, has found God or found this, and, and people don't often go beyond the headline even, let alone to find out what the sources are. And I liken this to what I saw I was a fundamentalist Christian for more than 25 years and, and thought that I was supposed to be a preacher. I read the Bible as a child, as a teenager, um, and then other times as an adult as well. And I remember as I was finding my way out of religion, even though that's not what it felt like at the time, I was studying with the goal of trying to find a way to convince my atheist roommate that he needed Jesus so that we could be in heaven together. And I would read what atheists on some occasion would have to say about the Bible or what non-Christians would say about the Bible. And when I'd hear what they'd say, I'd say, oh, no, 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 that's, that's not right. I've read this. I've read it many times. I was in Sunday school. You're taking it out of context. You are missing some extra thing. And then I would find the more I studied, the more I began to realize that, no, it wasn't so much that non-believers were taking it out of context. It's I was putting it into a context that completely biased the way I read it. If, in fact, there is a God who is morally perfect, then when he orders the slaughter of the Midianites, well, that must have been a good thing. There's no way it was a bad thing. When, when he says that you can have slaves, there must have been some good reason for that. Certainly, a morally perfect being if slavery was actually wrong and this wasn't the case, would it, so you make all these excuses. And it, I don't know that it's that different. 
when we're talking religion or politics or just in general what we believe about the world we inhabit. This, our biases impact everything and I think the biggest fear I have is that, okay, I've discovered my biases that led me to these conclusions. So now I'm right, now I'm free of bias, right? So <laughs> I'm good. And then you find another one, and another one. And I, have, uh, I was a fan of professional wrestling, and so there's this idea of smarts and marks, and, and then half smarts, and the same thing works in the, in the con artist field, and, and with magic, if you know how people are deceived, you exploit that. And as soon as you think you can't be deceived, you are doomed. You're the one who is now in this position where, ah, I am the enlightened one. I'm not going to fall prey to that again. And that almost guarantees that you're going to fall prey to 10 other things because you've blinded yourself to the possibility that you could be fooled. I'm very interested in the profession of magic in, in conjuring because um, it is a professional deceit, but it seems so much like a miracle mm. that um, I sort of feel it ought to be a salutary lesson to people who are influenced by apparent miracles. That, that, that I mean, when you, when you think about what a great conjurer can do, I mean, turning water into wine with child's play, wouldn't it? Oh, yeah. <laughs> Barry and Stuart do it, and they do it very well. <laughs> so th there's one thing that, uh, kind of a side subject that I, I thought we'd talk about for a minute, and that's debates, because that's what I do. Uh, I live to debate. I will debate almost anybody, although there are some people who I won't debate again for reasons some of you probably already know. Um, there's a couple of, of different issues here. There's a constant battle over, should scientists be debating creationists? Uh, I think the general line is, is no, that it seems to elevate that. But we're in this position where, as bizarre as it feels to us, we represent a minority view. The overwhelming majority of people have some sort of God belief, and so we're in this constant struggle as this minority uh, how should we engage on those topics? Should it, should it not be the scientists doing it? Should it just, is it so much theater that anybody who happens to be good at it should be doing it? I'm fond of quoting uh, Robert May, um, who, an Australian scientist working in Britain, who became very distinguished. He, he became the president of the Royal Society, which is the sort of most distinguished position you can hold as a scientist in Britain. And when he's invited to have a de debate with a, with a creationist, he says, that would look great on your CV, not so good on mine. <laughs> Which is one way of expressing the point you make about the elevation. I mean, having two chairs on a stage, one with a scientist and one with a creationist, it gives the audience the impression that there's uh, a kind of equality to start off with, that there's really something here to debate about which, of course, there isn't. There is no debate to be had. Um, so well, the, 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 the downside to refusing to debate these people is that they then portray you as a, as a coward, or they say, you, you know you lose the debate, so you don't want to do it. Right. I, I've even had somebody who I won't name um, use the empty chair ploy against me, to actually invite me to have a debate with him. I refused. Actually, I refused. I, I already had a prior engagement in London at the, at the time. Um, so he put an empty chair on the stage to signify the fact that I wasn't there. Um, I sort of feel it's, 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 it's one thing to exploit a scientist by, by using him. It's to, to use his absence seems to me to be... Um, I, 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 wrote a, I wrote an article in The Guardian explaining why I wasn't going to debate with him. And I said, not only will I not be appearing on the stage in Oxford with this man, I will not be appearing in Birmingham, Edinburgh, Glasgow, Dublin, <laughs> Bristol, um, <laughs> and if time allows, Penzance, you know. 
And, and out, of, out of deference to your desire to not name him, I won't name him either, but I will say that while this individual desperately wants to debate you, he is desperate to avoid debating me. And he refuses. We even tried to arrange an event where instead of doing a debate, the two of us would sit in chairs exactly like this and talk about our views. And no, our, there's no way that's going to happen. And that's fine, because you get to decide who you want to engage with, yeah. and so does he, and so does I. But he did something rather peculiar. After multiple refusals, he stated that the reason he wouldn't debate me is because I don't have a terminal degree in the relevant field, which is strange because we hadn't even chosen a topic yet. <laughs> and if the topic were perhaps secular humanism, then I do have a terminal degree in secular humanism because to my knowledge, there's not one. And I'm pretty sure most secular humanist organizations would gladly give me an honorary terminal degree in order to do the debate. Uh, and yet this, this person runs around desperate to debate scientists on issues in fields where he doesn't have a terminal degree. He's got a degree in philosophy, but he doesn't have a degree in uh, astrophysics or biology. And so my suggestion would be to all of the godless heathen cohorts of mine who happen to have terminal degrees, stop agreeing to debate him and just say that he doesn't have a terminal degree in the field and you're just using his own criteria uh, to avoid debating him. So. I've never heard the phrase terminal degree before. It, it, it sounds a bit ominous to me. Like, <laughs> and that's why I've avoided getting one. It was just terrifying. I know in, uh, in a few minutes we're probably going to start taking questions from the audience and they'll have you, have you guys line up because uh, the two of us just asking questions isn't necessarily going to get to what some of you might want to hear. But there's a potential point of disagreement Dun, dun, dun. <laughs> and it's, so I've said before that I've disagreed with everybody in the movement, including me, over and over again. Um, but there's a question that I get that I know you've received as well. And it seems to be one of the most common questions people ask and what people want to hear most. And unless your answer has changed, I think we may give different answers. And so I wanted to explore that for a minute. On the issue of God, what would change your mind? Well, I used to, and I still really, I think I do say that um, I, I, like any good scientist, I would, I would change my mind if evidence came in. Um, and I used to think it was obvious what that evidence would be. Uh, I mean, Jesus would return in clouds of glory and, and um, there would be no question about it. And I suppose I would be convinced by that, but I, I'm somewhat Really, really it's, by, it's by the conjuring again. How do I know that it's not a, a very clever trick put on by Penn and Teller? Or, or, or <laughs> <laughs> I mean, when you think of what, what you guys can do um, with, with just, just card tricks, um, I could imagine some gullible person being convinced of, of the, this, the, 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 that's a miracle. Um, Hume's criterion um, for, um, for, a, for a miracle, which, which, which is more probable, that there really is a violation of the laws of physics, or that you've been deceived, or you're hallucinating, or you've gone mad, or you're dreaming. Um, and the, the, it, it all comes down on the, on the latter. Um, so I'm not totally confident that I know what would convince me. Yeah. Um, that that's, that's, that's fabulous. There's no disagreement. <laughs> so I, I had heard, um, actually, I imagine No Religion 5, I emceed an, an event, asked you and uh, Lawrence Krauss questions, and this question had come up, and I've, I've heard both of you give an answer, and I used to give the sort of glib answers of, you know, voices and appearances in the sky or yeah. writing and those things. And I realized, you know, this, the same thing. Going back to Arthur C. Clarke, any sufficiently advanced technologies indistinguishable, indistinguishable from magic. So glad I speak English, American English, partially. <laughs> but the answer that I came up with, which is both honest and frustrates the crap out of theists, is I have no idea what would change my mind. I don't, and I find it a bit arrogant to presume that someone should think that I would have the capability of distinguishing 
a god from some amazingly advanced trickery. I don't know. But if you're right and there is a god, that god should know exactly what it should take to change my mind. And the fact that this god has not done this means that either this god doesn't exist or does not want me to know that he exists. Either way, not my problem. <laughs> I, th I think there's a bit more that we can talk about. If you guys would like to, there's microphones set up on either side. And if you have questions for either or both of us, please just step up and we'll try and uh, alternate between uh, microphones a bit. Uh, did you have anything to do? we have the lights up? In yes. Oh, we can see faces. So I, I guess perhaps we'll start on this side. You got there first, you win. <laughs> okay. Hi, this is Armin Navabi from Atheist Republic. Hey. Yeah. Uh, thank you. Um, I think you both have heard about Majid Nawaz and Ayan Hirsi Ali recently being listed as um, anti-Muslim extremists by a uh, law firm. And I was just wondering if you think what are your comments about that? And also, if you, if you have any suggestions for how we could criticize Islam without being grouped with uh, bigots uh, and racists, and if you think we have had ma made any progress on this in the past 10 years, because it seems like we get, it's getting worse and worse, and we're just being grouped with these other people. Yeah. So the Southern Poverty Law Center, which tracks hate groups and things, recently listed both Majid Nawaz and uh, Ayan Hirsi Ali as, I don't remember exactly what the category is, but, but labeled them as uh, hate speech with regard to Islam. They're wrong, um, in my estimation. Uh, is, is there hateful thought directed at Islam in general? Sure. Um, it's weird when you get into the online community, quite often, there are people who will do the hashtag not all X. And some, on some occasions, they'll get mocked. Basically, if we make a generalized statement about some group, somebody will point out it doesn't qualify to every member of that group. Well, of course it doesn't. And th this wasn't the presumption. But if there's a fair general criticism of uh, the tenets of Islam or something from the Quran or a uh, regime that has power that is implementing their version of this. I don't get to decide what a true Muslim is and what a true Muslim is. I don't get to decide what a true Christian is. I don't even get to decide what a true atheist, skeptic, or humanist is. But I do know that saying, ah, oh, well, they're not all bad, is focusing on the people and not the doctrines. And if I focus instead on the doctrines and the actions that some people take, I'm being fair and honest. And if somebody wants to call me a racist for that, okay, fine, too bad. Because I'm not looking at this in terms of race, I'm looking at it in terms of here's a doctrine, when implemented in this fashion, is dangerous and harmful and counterproductive. There, there are great people in almost any religion I can think of. And my point is they could be better if they dumped the religious baggage. And there are bad people in every religion that I could name, and they would be way better if they dumped the religious baggage. It, it, it's a curious thing that um, the, the evils of Islam, and I think that Islam is among the great evils of the world, um, the, the chief victims of it are actually Muslims themselves. They are um, the ones who are most likely to be persecuted, especially women. Um, so that, that's one point. Another point is the accusation of, of racism um, as though Islam were a race, which of course it isn't. Um, Ayan Hirsi Ali and Majid Nawaz are struggling to actually reform Islam from within, to actually recognize uh, that it doesn't have to be bad and um, they should be, obviously be applauded. I think the worst thing of all is the way decent liberal people, our, our kind of people, give Islam a free pass, which they don't give to any other um, religion when it comes to things like 
the betrayal of women, the, 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 the misogyny that is officially promulgated by Islam is revolting. And yet, fe feminist thought in Western liberal democracies completely ignores that and more or less allows Islam to get away with the misogyny and the, all the other terrible things that they, that they do. Um, because of this special treatment, which, for, which I, I suspect it maybe stems from the fear of being thought racist. So, to, re to repeat, the, the chief victims of Islam are Muslims them, themselves, and, and Majid Nawaz and Ayan Hazi Ali are doing their best to help, their, to help the victims of this un, 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 unfortunate creed. And th there are great organizations uh, working alongside Maram Namazi's organization and Next Muslims of North America. Um, if the chief complaint is not tied directly to what has been said, then that's just posturing. So I'll have people comment on various videos or whatever and say, oh, Matt might be good on the God issue, but he's terrible on this, 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 or this, you know. And, and they'll use language uh, that, that's obnoxious and annoying. But I ask them all the same question. What is my position that you disagree with, and why do you think it's wrong? Nobody's ever even gotten the first one right. Instead, they will saddle me with somebody else's position or something they heard or something that they have interpreted based on their own confusion about what was said. And if we can't get past, we, we've lost sight of, of nuance. And it's, if you sometimes say anything that is even vaguely in opposition to somebody's position, you become immediately the worst thing ever. And if we are going to shelter uh, medieval, harmful, misogynistic thought, as if, well, we can't criticize that because that would be racist. I don't know how you can possibly criticize anything at that point. Yes, sir. Hi there. Um, with a recent poll coming from Google saying that internet memes are now more popular than Jesus Christ, I was wondering, <laughs> um, have, have we won? And if not, when, what's the defining factor that would say that atheists have, have won? Uh, did the Google poll say that atheist memes were, or no, just memes? Just memes. Yeah, because cats don't get us a win. <laughs> Jesus Christ is a meme himself. I mean, um, <laughs> memes simply are uh, um, cultural, the equivalent of cu cultural genes. They're, they're, that, they're that which spreads through the culture by any means, whether it's by, by um, humans imitating other humans or radio jingles or that kind of thing. So I, I think you're using the word internet meme as, uh, for a particular subset of memes, which are kind of rectangular spaces with, um, <laughs> with some kind of words in. Um, and and, and that, that, for some bizarre reason, has come, to be, has come to be used as the only kind of meme. It's just one very little example of a special kind of meme. Um, and um, some of them are quite funny. And, and, <laughs> and some of them are awful. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I hate bad arguments, and I hate bad arguments, especially they come when they come from people who are defending positions I hold, because I want the other side to have the bad arguments. And so when I see bad memes from uh, atheist organizations, I look at this Bible contradiction, and it's not. Uh, okay, we can do a little better. And but right before we get to this question, I want to say to all the people who are back here who are staring at the back of our heads, you don't know this, but for about 10 or 15 minutes before we started, I stood below you and I can see up and I stared at the back of your heads just to make it fair. <laughs> yes. Hi, uh, my name is Reese. I work hey, Reese. at Science World. You guys should come visit if you're in town for the next couple days. Uh, earlier you were saying that, which is true, that the large majority of the world has some kind of concept of God or some kind of belief in God. Also, the large majority of the world is very poor, and often these two things go together. What is atheism's role in addressing 
the poverty of the world and the ignorance that comes with it. That's not really their fault. I mean, it's, it's a demonstrable fact that um, there is this correlation you talk about. It's, um, the research of Gregory Paul um, shows this both across European countries and across states in America, um, that poverty, lack of social welfare, lack of so uh, social security, that kind of thing, um, tends to go with religiosity. And, and uh, pe people tend to lose their religion when they have security, welfare, that sort of thing. And Scandinavian countries have the most advanced welfare systems in the world, and they're the least, the least, the least theistic. Um, atheism's role, I mean, I, I don't see atheism as a political movement. It's a, to, to me, it's a, it's a philosophical position. Um, but um, obviously, as a, as a citizen, Politically, I'm, I'm in, in favor of re reducing poverty, reducing inequality, and from that, uh, th this research seems to suggest um, atheism will flow. Yeah, and I don't, I don't, I, I agree with Richard. I, I think that certainly atheist communities are more than just about atheism, because we're people. Uh, but it's my humanism that makes me want to fight and eliminate poverty. And I try when I'm, deciding what I'm going to do. Uh, there's the think globally, act locally idea. I also try to think about what would the entire world be like if everybody did the thing that I want to do and try to work along those lines. And so if everybody donated a little bit more, if everybody worked to uh, encourage politicians to instill policies that reduced uh, poverty and suffering. Um, but there's there's also the limit of what can any individual do. Well, one of the things that individuals can do is vote, run for office, support the sort of policies that are going to put an end to this. A collection of atheists on Reddit can raise a bunch of money and do good, as we've seen, but they're not going to end poverty. And while we as atheists and, and those of us who are humanists certainly have a, an incentive to go there, it may be that we need to set aside our differences in other areas and work with people towards specific goals. And so, like the Reverend Barry Lynn is the uh, CEO or the president of Americans United for Church State Separation, and I adore him. I've shared the stage with him before, and I will again. And I will share a stage with him for Church State Separation and then argue with him tooth and nail over whether or not a God exists if he wants to. And I do the same thing. I don't, when I decide what charity I might actually donate to, my first question is not, hang on, is there a religion behind this? My first question is, are they actually doing good with the money? How much of my money is going to go to those issues? What efforts can I, can I contribute besides money to help them out? And then I will compare, hey, is there a secular version of this? Which is why I love Foundation Beyond Belief. Um, and organizations that are working to improve secular charities. I would encourage everybody, if you're not familiar with Foundation Beyond Belief, to investigate that. There's also uh, SHARE, I believe, which is Secular Humanist Activists. Uh, I'm going to get the acronym wrong, but it's out there to do good and help people. And I'd like to see a lot more effort there. And there's always room. If you, if you don't have the money to donate, which I was unemployed for four out of ten years for a while there, um, you can donate your time. And you can show the world that instead of the view that they had of who atheists were, we actually are your neighbors, we are scientists, we are jackasses, we are <laughs> the people who deliver your mail, and we actually care about other people. We care about what kind of world we live in, and that's the reason that we talk about religion, because we see religions, while certainly people do good in the name of their religion, there is a lot of harm, and it could be, as I was saying before, better without the baggage. Thank you. Hi. Thanks for coming to Vancouver. Um, I just finished reading a book by one of the murdered editors of Charlie Hebdo, and he talks about the problems with the word uh, Islamophobia. So I'm wondering, what are your opinions on, on using that term, Islamophobia? I, th I think we've dealt with that in the pre previous question, haven't, haven't we? I mean, is, is Islamophobia is an absurd word. Um, it's a, it's a made-up word to describe uh, this privileged position that Islam has in our, in our society. 
And um, I, I, I do not think it's a, it's a word that, that should have, have currency. And, and the only thing I'd add is I don't, I'm not overly concerned about the labels for things if they get in the way. Uh, I just released a video recently about the atheist label, the agnostic label, and things like that. At the end of the day, um, if Richard had called himself an atheist, and I said, oh, no, no, I don't want to call myself an atheist, but neither one of us believe in a god, and we're both working towards it, then if, if the label's in the way, then get rid of it. I don't think the label for atheist is necessarily in the way, but when I, there are attempts to label people as Islamophobes, merely to avoid having the discussion about what we should or shouldn't address and what are the limits and is somebody going too far and should we actually oppose certain things, if, if the d label discussion is preventing that one, then that just needs to go away because the other discussion is far more important. I am, I am phobic about beheading people, about whipping people, about apostasy being punished by death, uh, women having their clitorises cut off, uh, I'm phobic about all, all that. If you want to call that Islamophobia, do, but I prefer not to use the word. Yeah. Uh, thank you both for coming. Uh, Mr. Dawkins, I've read most of your books, and I've been a big fan for several years, so it's good to see you here. Um, my question is more about AI. I watched a uh, TED Talk with Sam Harris, and I know you've been into computers for several years as well. Um, do you think we will ever achieve AI? And if so, would that AI ever become religious? <laughs> it's, an, it's an interesting question. I'm not quite sure why, why it gets a laugh. Did, did... AI meaning artificial intelligence? Yes. yes. Why is that funny? <laughs> if I had to guess, I, I think they're anticipating an entertaining answer <laughs> on whether or not AI would become religious. Okay. Um, <laughs> well, um, I think it's a fascinating topic, um, scientifically, philosophically, actually. Um, the, the question of consciousness is um, uh, deeply, deeply mysterious, and it may well be solved by AI research eventually. So I think that's very interesting. Um, I, did, I now understand why there was laughter. I, I misheard it. I, th I thought I didn't hear the word religious. I thought I, you said pernicious, <laughs> <laughs> um, which in, maybe. Yeah. Um, it's, it's a toss-up as to which one is more dangerous. Exactly, yeah. <laughs> um, well, it, I th you, you could program it to become anything, I suppose. So you could certainly, you could, you could program a religious robot if you wanted to. Um, some of you may have read Douglas Adams' uh, Dirk Gently's Holistic Detective Agency, where there's a character in it called the Electric Monk, which is a robot... Um, device, a, a machine you buy to do your believing for you. <laughs> In the same way as you buy um, vi video recorders to do your television watching for you. Save you the trouble of watching it yourself. Um, the, elec the electric monk does your believing for you. And the Mark II electric monk is capable of believing things they wouldn't believe in Salt Lake City. <laughs> I suppose you could you could ask a, a sort of philosophically interesting question would would evolving artificial intelligence robots evolve towards religiosity in their own right without being programmed to do so um, and I can't see how that would ever happen Although if they evolved to eventually believe that they had a creator, they'd actually be right. Hello, Richard. Uh, I just want to first thank you for all the work you've done for evolutionary biology and public understanding of science. I first read your book when I was a young boy in, uh, growing up in Nashville, Tennessee, uh, in an evangelical Christian family, and it really impacted my life for the better. So thank you so much. Um, my question is, um, Richard, we know how difficult it could be for a gene 
to be eradicated from gene pool, especially the gene is um, somewhat resistant to some of the um, antibacterial substance we're trying to use to eradicate. For example, like in the case of SARS, we often use quite um, aggressive measure to interrupt that. So in a, in a meme of religion, when it often could be resistant to the supposed Q, that is logic, um, what kind of confidence could we have in eradicating those memes uh, in a foreseeable future? I, I only heard half that. What, what, was it, what confidence is re eradicating? What confidence could we have for eradicating memes of religion when those memes seem to be resistant to logic, often, that is? It's very oh. difficult, isn't it? Yes. Um, it does seem that people who are indoctrinated in childhood, at a sensitive age in childhood, have uh, an, an almost total, can have an almost total resistance to logic. Uh, and it's, it's I, I know of some examples of people highly educated in science, for example, who, because they've been indoctrinated as children into the belief that the world is young, they cannot accept, even when they see the evidence, even when they at one level understand the evidence. So there is extreme resistance, and I'm constantly impressed in a negative way by the tenacity of uh, religious belief in the face of evidence and logic. It's one of the most pessimistic things, I think, about the human species is that it is possible to indoctrinate children so thoroughly that they are immune to uh, logic and reason. Um, but I think it may only be a minority, and I think that what, what gives me more hope is that there are lots and lots of people who are perfectly open to reason and, and logic and science, but who just haven't been exposed to it. And therefore, if we um, try to expose them to it, try, try, try to give, give people the, the, uh, knowledge of, of science, um, that um, they will learn. I, I, was, I have a very encouraging story about a young man who came to Oxford. He was a young earth creationist. He came from, I think, somewhere in Washington State. And uh, he b believed the world was young and be didn't believe in evolution. He attended my course of lectures uh, at Oxford in e evolution. And he the end of the last lecture, he came down to the front and thumped the desk with his fist and said, gee, this evolution, it really makes sense. <laughs> and it was cl clear that he just never met it before. I mean, he'd, he'd, he'd been to university, he'd, he'd majored in biology, but it was left out of the curriculum, as if it was possible to leave it out of the curriculum in biology. The, there are some people who may, in fact, be immune. How do you tell the difference between somebody who is and somebody who isn't? Um, I generally ask the question of what would change your mind, and if they say nothing, that's, the conversation is over. I almost agree. I've had people say nothing. That's an expression of their confidence level currently. Doesn't mean it's an expression of their confidence level after an actual conversation. The fear that I want, that I, that I have, that I'd like to disabuse people of, is. You're never going to talk people out of those things. Yes, you can. I have thousands upon thousands of emails of people who've changed their mind because of what we've done on the TV show or in debates or from Richard's books or the blogs and things like that. And I know he gets emails on this as well. People change their mind. We have to be vigilant in presenting good information to combat bad information. And with some people, it's going to stick. And with some people, it's not, or it's not now. now there could be a theist that has listened to the show, my show, and still hasn't changed their mind, and yet a friend of theirs comes up and says the same thing I've said, perhaps in a slightly different way, where they have some connection to him, and then their mind is changed. Until I can tell the difference between the person who will never change their mind and the person who might change their mind, I'm going to keep talking, assuming that they're both in the category of the people who can change their mind. Because that's the only way that you're going to make progress. If you begin with this assumption that this is a waste of time, well, that's entirely your prerogative. I, there are people who say, oh, you're never going to change people's minds. Well, you're probably not, not thinking like that. 
But those of us who do this for a living are going to keep working on it and keep being optimistic because I want, seriously, my goal is to change the world. I don't think it's going to happen during my lifetime. I don't think it's going to happen on my own. I have tons of people helping in this effort. I am blessed uh, with a great many intelligent colleagues that are working towards the same goal. But having a goal that I can't possibly reach or probably can't reach is not disheartening to me in the slightest because I see constant and increasing progress. And when I read Steven Pinker's great book on the better angels of our nature talking about we're not, we are living in the best of times. When I get emails from people, when I meet people out in the lobby at events who are, you know, hey, I was a fundamentalist Christian, I was a Scientologist, I was a Buddha, whatever, and because of things that you've done, I've now changed my mind, that's all I ever needed. And I told the story briefly, uh, after a debate, there was a 12-year-old girl who came up and said that, you know, her parents had let her explore different religious views, and after this debate, she was an atheist. And I would debate for another 10 years without changing a single mind, just in the hope of getting one more 12-year-old girl. It's good enough for me. There, there are, I mean, uh, we get lots and lots of such things. It's very, very heartening, the number of people who come up in, in, when I'm signing books, for, for example, time after time after time. They say they've changed their minds. It's very, very encouraging. One more encouraging thing, let me tell you. Um, there is no legal Arabic translation of the God Delusion, um, but there is a, an illicit, illegal Arabic translation of the God Delusion, which can be downloaded as a PDF. And it has been downloaded 10 million times. One, and one, one third of that, uh, three million or so, has been downloaded in Saudi Arabia. Wow. <laughs> and by the way, I wanted to mention that it's the 10th anniversary of the God Delusion. It's also the 40th anniversary of the selfish gene, which was essentially your introduction to the world. And while I was, sorry, I was seven at the time, I read it as soon as I could. <laughs> so. <laughs> Yes. Um, so Dawkins, welcome to Vancouver. Um, it's been, I think it took 21 years to see you in person. So anyway, I've been a fan of your books since 1995 and Selfish Gin was the start. Um, my question is about the uh, God module. Um, as you know, there have been some research done on um, the fact that, well, if it's a fact, that um, believing God and superstitions is hardwired. I'm talking about the research that uh, Michael Persinger did at um, uh, Laurentian University, and you yourself actually try, uh, tried the uh, God helmet as well. So if that's the case, if it's hardwired, then I don't think any education can convince the people who are hardwired to believe in superstitions and God and gods. Then I don't think education can do any enlightenment for them to, to see the reality, and it seems like believing superstitions and God is an evolutionary tool for them to survive the horrible life that we have in terms of survivalship, that they can rely on some sort of supreme source just to go through the hard time of whatever that is. And personally, I think that there is an offshoot in the, evolutionary, um, in the evolution of human mind, and it's us, the atheists, who have the hard wire again to see the reality, to realize that there's no God, there's no creator as such. Um, after, I would say, 20 years of the internet, information is free for everyone. I expected that by 2005, there would be no theist ever. All the information is out there. I can understand, I can see where we come from, 3.9 billion years of evolution on Earth. It's pretty easy to see. I see it, but it seems like 80 to 90% of people can't. If that's the case, that believing God is hardwired, why educate them about something that would be futile? Yes, I, I, think, I think the phrase hardwired can be, uh, can be overdone and can be understood as being too, too rigid. Uh, I, I, have, I did submit to Michael Persinger's helmet. Um, this is, he's, a, he's a Canadian researcher who puts a modified motorcycle helmet on your head and passes magnetic fields through your brain and claims that in 80% of cases he can induce 
mystical or religious experiences. I was looking forward to this. I didn't expect to see God. I, th I think I expected to sort of feel a strange oneness with the universe, that kind of thing. But I, I got nothing at all. Um, <laughs> The, 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 this, this was done as, a, as an experiment by the BBC, and um, because it was television, there was only one control, um, and uh, the, this, the control was a local vicar, and uh, he, he also claimed to have no religious experience under the influence of the helmet, but Michael Persinger told me afterwards that whereas my EEG, uh, my brain, brainwave patterns, were exactly those of the 20% who don't, get, who don't get this experience. The vicar was a prime candidate. He was right in the middle of the 80% who do. But he was, his, his, his brain waves indicated that he was struggling not to submit to this. And he was doing something like reciting the multiplication tables or something to try, <laughs> try to, to shut it out. Um, I, I, th I, think, I think you're seduced by the phrase hardwired um, and, and because you, you, you take it to mean irre irrevocable and so, so it does when it's normally used. I don't think anybody would really want to suggest that there's neurological evidence that it's hardwired in, in that sense. We've already discussed the probably m perhaps minority of people who, who, who cannot be changed but then we had this in the answer to the previous question this more encouraging um, evidence that, that a lot of people do actually change their minds. Many of the activists in the atheist movement are actually ex-vicars, ex-priests, ex-preachers, and, and ex-fundamentalists uh, like, like, like Matt. Um, yes, yeah, which is why I reject the premise. Um, and actually, I'd like to see him put his helmet on all the members of the clergy project to see. Now you've, now you've got people who were ostensibly very religious for a great deal of time and are not now. Uh, obviously, we can't go back in time and put the helmet on him beforehand. Um, but yeah, I, I, I don't think that... I, I don't, like I said, well, I'll just go back to my previous answer. I can't tell the difference between somebody who may be irrevocably religious and those who are able to see reason. The, the, but we really got to move on to another question. The, the Clergy Project, by the way, is, is another initiative of the Richard Dawkins Foundation. Um, it's to, it's to take um, preachers, pastors, vicars, rabbis, um, imams who have lost their faith, and there are lots of them. There are more than 500 of them in the clergy project now, and give them a, a website, a refuge where they can there go. There are actually more than 666 because I even know better. the person who got that number. <laughs> even, even better, even better. Um, so these are, these are clergy people who have lost their faith and who are in many cases struggling on and carrying on preaching in church every Sunday. Um, and they can go to the Clergy Project website and cry on each other's shoulders and discuss their predicament. Because it is a predicament. I mean, they're, they're, they're stuck with this profession that they don't believe in. Um, and uh, it's very difficult for them to leave, not only for financial reasons, but, um, but because they lose respect of the community and things like that like that. Sorry to interrupt. Uh, we have time for three more questions, Matt. Three more questions. Number one. Thanks, gentlemen, for... Um... <laughs> hello, hello. Um, so what, thanks what, what was that very much. Uh... I, I did that at a debate and got in trouble for it. <laughs> I just wanted to say thanks to both you guys uh, for sharing your time today. Um, it's been four months on my skeptical journey, which has started at Hitchens and went to Dawkins and Dennett and Harris and eventually Dillahunty. So, this so you're is... moving downhill, is that? <laughs> <laughs> no, I know. You, no, you jumped me. there. You jumped there. Um, so yeah, it's actually it's kind of a special night for me. Um, and and Richard, I don't know if you did this on purpose or not, but those socks just ironically remind me of Christmas. I just had to mention that. Oh, uh, remind me of, of of who? Christmas. Oh, Christmas. <laughs> But the question that I had was, in your experience, um, which God and subsequent argument have you encountered that you find the most challenging to refute? I think literally none. <laughs> um, uh, 
And, and I would say the deistic God, because it is so poorly defined, it is untestable, unfalsifiable, it's, it is a nothing. And how do you, I mean, at least some of the other religions are trying to identify and label their God in a way where we can say, ah, this contradicts, you know, this is in conflict with nature and everything else. The deistic God, my thing is, why would anybody believe that? What, what possible justification could you have for believing, oh, there's something, but I don't know what it is? I mean, aren't you at that point claiming to detect the undetectable, or at least be able to reason yourself to, well, I just can't believe that there's nothing, so there must be something that it is... It is as useless a concept to me as the, the word spirituality, which is tossed around, oh, I'm not religious, but I'm spiritual. I, this is spiritual. What the hell does that mean? <laughs> you talk about whether or not you put on the God helmet and you have a mystical spiritual experience. I don't even know if I would have one if I would use any of those words to describe it. Maybe. Maybe I'll put the helmet on and I'll finally understand what spiritual means. But for now, it's gobbledygook. Yes. Hi, good evening to both of you. Uh, my name is Madhvi. I'm here on behalf of uh, what we call SAHA, South Asian Humanist Association. Uh, after 12 years of struggling to keep my thoughts uh, to myself, I recently, a few years ago, have come out and started to voice my opinions, my views, and I've made uh, most of my friends have they're there in my life, but they don't like me anymore. Uh, we, <laughs> I, I've been fondly uh, labeled atheist terrorist, and um, I've been told that I'm bombarding them with atheism, and it's too intense for them. So they like me, but they don't want it. If I don't talk about atheism, I'm included, but if I talk about atheism or humanism, I'm not. So, and my husband tells me, maybe you're overdoing it if you want to keep any friends, maybe you don't want to do it as much. So I'm torn between uh, do you, do my your friends talk desire about to talk about it, talk about my, express my views, and keeping these friends that have been in my life for over 20 years. And what boggles my mind is, um, 95% of them are all doctors and practicing um, professionals with two, three uh, university degrees. And I'm not able to get to them. Uh, like you answered, you said, where do I stop? Do I stop or do I keep talking? Not caring about whether or, or, I'm, uh, or I'm accepted. So do they talk to you about their religious views? I get... I'm born uh, in a Hindu family. All my Hindu friends send me, we have like a million festivals every year. And I get, I get uh, 300 uh, or so from different WhatsApp groups and Facebook, uh, different religious uh, messages. And I post one uh, related to atheism or humanism or non-religious post. Um, I'm, I'm an enemy. I, I Sorry, what was that? I'm like so delight. I'm so uh, elated here, looking at all these people. I'm like, I want to make friends with everybody. Do. <laughs> okay. so. Motley, this is everybody. Everybody, this is Motley. You guys can exchange numbers, friend each other on Facebook. <laughs> so. I'm a big, so the, the standard joke is that I don't make outgoing calls on the show and I don't go knocking door to door saying, hey, if you stop believing in Jesus yet, I can help. <laughs> I engage in conversations with the people who want to. Now, my Facebook page, my social media, of course I'm going to talk about this stuff. Anybody who is disinterested in that can piss off. Uh, but I don't want to, I don't want to minimize the impact of losing people who are, have been in your social structure for years. And this is something that we deal with um, all the time. I get email from people who've been ostracized from their families and uh, have lost their friends. This is one of the reasons why there are a lot of atheist organizations creating good landing places, Sunday Assembly, Oasis. Now, they get labeled as like atheist church. They're not that, and church is a necessarily Protestant term, but now I'm being pedantic. Um, 
what they are are attempts for secular people to say, no, religion, you don't get to co-opt this aspect of humanity and claim it as yours. We are social creatures, we want to interact. And my friend and co-host Jen Peoples has said repeatedly, you're family if you act like family. And so on some occasions, as unfortunate as it is, you may need to build a new family and a new group. And that is what humanist organizations and Sunday Assembly and Oasis and these, they're trying to do. Let's build better ways for people to network so that you don't feel like you're alone. I get email all the time saying, I'm the only atheist in my town. No, you're not. You're not even, unless you're the only person in your town. <laughs> And maybe not even then, if you have like multiple personalities. But <laughs> I, I go back to V.S. Ramachandran's research on hemispherectomies. But you're, you're, I'm glad you're here. And please talk to the people around here. And I'm sure, is there anybody here who's a member of a secular organization in Vancouver who would like to help build networks with other people like her that would want to be here? Just. Interact. I'm a member of Vancouver Atheist Republic. I think some of my friends are here. Yes. <laughs> Unfortunately, I never, I never ended a relationship with somebody after I gave up my religion. They were always the ones to end it with me. And it hurt, and it hurt, and it hurt. And then I was like, hang on. I actually want people to like me for who I am. And if, if you being a part of my life is conditioned on me accepting what you believe or not challenging what you believe or not being allowed to speak about who I am and what I think, I don't need you in my life as much as I thought I did. And it hurts, but sometimes that's the okay. case. I said that. I think... I think it is one of the most pernicious aspects of religion that it has the power to divide families and uh, divide people from their, from their friends. And I, I regularly am greatly saddened by getting letters from people exactly like you say, who, who say, well, how, can I, how can I do this? My, my parents disown me or, they, or they, I'm making my parents miserable. And so I, I suppose there are other things that can do that, but, athe but um, religion has the almost unique power to sever people from the people they love. And, and, and it's one of the most wicked things about religion that it can do that. And we have what I guess is the last question from this side. Thank you so much. Um, first of all, thank you very much for your time, both of you. And just a quick response to Matt. You said you're not sure whether you would ever manage to change the world. I would submit that both of you certainly have, and for the better, and thank you very much for it. Thank you. That's, uh, that's, a really, that's a really good way of taking the pressure off having the last question, so good job. Um, my question is mostly to Richard. Um, in my time at UBC and hearing from my friends at other universities around the world, um, I've noticed that the climate on campuses has gotten significantly more toxic and more difficult to navigate to have a free and open discussion about many topics. And uh, drawing on your experience as chair for the public understanding of science, what are specific policies, notions, ideas, ways in which universities as institutions specifically can work to improve public discussion, airing of ideas, and a campus culture that is conducive to the public understanding of science and the general improvement of the illumination of mankind, to give it a lofty title? Universities need to, to rediscover what universities are all about, which is a forum for discussion, civil discussion, civilized discussion uh, of in intellectual issues, and not to become, well, I, mean, I think the, the most distressing examples of, of, of what's going wrong is the university where I first taught, uh, University of California at Berkeley, the home of the free speech movement which in recent times has been also the home of disinviting people because there's a fear that they might offend somebody. Well, you go to university in order to be exposed to things that might offend you. That's what you're there for. You're not there to be... So I think universities should, should revert to what universities are for and to hell with safe spaces and Play-Doh. And... Uh, 
grow up, in other words. <laughs> Thank you very much. Yeah. <laughs>